What is up, YouTube? Welcome in to another edition of Bucky and BK, live on Texas Sports Unfiltered and on the free Texas Sports Unfiltered app. Today is Monday, March 11th, 20 and 24, and the Buck and I are with you for the next two hours. On today's show, we'll talk some Texas basketball. The men's team wins its seventh straight game against the Oklahoma Sooners. We'll recap some Texas hoops. Also, Texas baseball bounces back with a big series win in Lubbock. Texas softball picks up a series win. The Texas women's basketball team is in the Big 12 semifinals of the conference tournament. We've got some Longhorn football to get into. We've got some NFL free agency to get into because that really gets started here today. We've got some golf to talk about. A Scotty Scheffler won the Arnold Palmer Invitational yesterday. And, uh-oh, a Kim Mulkey appearance. Oh, yeah. On today's show, we are locked and we are loaded and we are ready to get you started on a Monday morning. What's going on, Buck? Just another beautiful Monday. It was a great weekend, BK, and just ready to roll for this week, knowing that Kim Mulkey is out there and she's ready to brawl. Don't mess with Kim. That's right. Don't mess with her. Whatever you do, girls, coaches, assistant coaches, stay away from her. She's, mm. laughing, she's, she's after body parts when she gets to rumbling, so be careful. She probably started that deal, too. I have said it before, and I will say it again. I would rather be trapped in a dark alley with Ray Lewis, Aaron Hernandez, and O.J. Simpson than I would with just Kim Mulkey. I think i got a better chance of survival if I'm with those three murderers than I do if I'm with <laughs> Kim Mulkey, okay? I want no part of that, and I agree with you 100%. She will start something. She will end something, oh, yeah. and she will not fight fair along the way. She's the type to do whatever she's got to do to make sure she is the last woman standing. Yeah, Don Staley looks a little rough around the edges. She's always got that frown on her face, that scowl. Kim Mulkey will eat all of her toes in one sitting. Yeah, <laughs> She'll eat her toes? She will bite them off one by one in a brawl, oh. I guess. God. It is very, very special. Good morning to the soldiers at Fort Cabasas, Texas. The soldiers in the state of Texas and all those that fight for us each and every day, thank you so very much for what you do. It is appreciated, and please be safe out there. Amen. Yeah, we'll talk about the brawl between LSU and South Carolina in the SEC Women's Basketball Championship yesterday. I can't believe I even missed that whole game. Didn't see a thing. Didn't see the brawl. Have not seen. I haven't seen any videos. Nothing. Nothing. Mm. I like the way you pronounce that word there. Yes, that, I don't yeah. want to ever do that again. Don't ever let that happen. There are videos. Well, you said it right a moment ago, and now you're going back to saying it wrong. So, yes, you, know, you, you shouldn't be trying to avoid the proper use of the English language, but uh, that In is the proper okay. use. Yes, I got that. I, yeah, I got it. You said it wrong. Well, it is a misogynistic Monday here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. So, no surprise that you are not watching women's sports over the weekend, but we'll get into that. Uh, I, didn't realize, I didn't realize March was women's month, BK. It's not a day, they, they have a month too. Yeah, it's women's history month. Women's history, there's history, women history. Did you say the <laughs> word history like Gettysburg? Uh, I, I get right of Paul Revere, not Paula Revere. I mean, there, I mean, really? No, I don't think it was Paula Revere. Oh, there is Betsy Ross. That's right. I'm, I was born in Philly. I know that. Mm -hmm. There you go. It wasn't Paula Abdul either. Oh. One, if, one if by Hollywood, two if by <laughs> they're going home. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I didn't know it was the month. I thought it was like a day. Yeah, well, that's that's got to be rough for your people, right? I mean, because Black History Month happens in February every yes. year, and you guys get shafted. Y'all get the shortest month every year, even with leap year being this year. You still got a shorter month than any other month. And then women with their history month, they get a 31 day or yes, the month absolutely. of March. Women are very important. Very, that's, very important. That's a that's a one eighty from what you asked what do you mean? two what do you minutes mean? ago. I mean, this is what I mean. Yes, women I, are important. Women's history. Women's well, I don't know about yeah. Well, that too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, Pocahontas. Oh, that was a yeah. dude, wasn't it? Nah, no, no. Who's the guy that was had the girl's name that was the dude though? 
Bruce Jenner? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not Bruce Ginger. No, no. No, no. Always always there is always a a Native American, or back in the day, an Indian, you know, that had a name, a female name, but it was a dude. Sure, that's not Pocahontas was not a, a dude. I thought Pocahontas was a woman. At least the animated version of Pocahontas was a woman. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure the historic version of Pocahontas, also a woman. I don't we'll know who you're that out. We have, we have people. Boy, I don't know if you gave him a good enough hint to figure it out. <laughs> A woman that looks like a dude. This could be dangerous. <laughs> oh yeah, what a weekend! And now the start of uh, the start of tampering. Now this is great. Yeah, we could uh, start with the NFL. Obviously, plenty of uh, Longhorn sports to get into. We'll talk basketball. We'll talk baseball. We'll talk some football. But yeah, NFL free agency doesn't officially begin until Wednesday afternoon. But starting the day at eleven o'clock, players can start negotiating deals with agents. So the agents can talk to the teams today and deals can basically be agreed to today. Now, nothing will become official until we get to Wednesday and the start right. of the new league year. But you are going to see Adam Schefter and Ian Rappaport and all of the other NFL insiders tweeting out deals starting a little bit later. And we've seen a bunch of guys re-sign with their current teams. Hell, we saw a couple of trades made over the weekend, including a quarterback getting moved. So we've already seen some stuff, but it will really pick up at about 11 o'clock today. So, uh, yeah, the NFL is about to dominate the sports calendar today, Buck. Well, yeah, now I understand why Bill Belichick's no longer the head coach there because their pick, their Heisman Trophy pick of a couple of years ago is gone for a sixth-round draft pick. That doesn't happen that often. Yeah, two major headlines from the two NFL. Years? Over the weekend, right? Both yeah. involving quarterbacks. Mac Jones, the former first round pick of the New England Patriots, got traded to Jacksonville for a sixth round pick. Nobody was quite sure uh, what the Patriots were going to do with Mac Jones. Of course, New England has the third pick in the draft. I think everybody assumes they're going to take a quarterback when we get there. So you figured Mac Jones's run as the starter in New England was over. Weren't sure if they were going to keep him around as the backup, but instead they ship him off to Jacksonville for next to nothing. Or right, well, he'll never play. No, no. I mean, Trevor Lawrence is obviously the guy in Jacksonville, so it feels like Mac Jones has been relegated to backup status. And, and he, you know, he does it right. He could be Colt McCoy and have a nice long career in the oh, NFL yeah. as a breaking backup. Out, breaking out, making about six, seven million dollars just with a ball cap on. Hell yeah. Yep. If you do it right, then uh, you can have a nice career in this league, but yeah, nice I don't know if Mac Jones, I don't know if he'll ever get another opportunity to start in this league. And it's crazy because he had such a great rookie year, right? I mean, the Patriots made the playoffs and Mac Jones played really well. And it felt like, okay, he's only going to go up from here, but he did the exact opposite. Obviously the Patriots came back down to earth hard and Mac Jones regressed in a big way. And he got benched a couple of times the last two seasons and, it turned into a disastrous run in Foxborough for him. Wow. Yeah. A disastrous and then, run for Bill Belichick, too. Yeah. And, I mean, Mac Jones was a pro bowler his first year in the league. He wasn't quite rookie of the year, but people were arguing that he should have been. And he was phenomenal as a rookie. And then it just, once again, all fell apart very, uh, very And I'm not going to blame him. I'm going to blame they didn't have a quarterback coach. You know, I'd like to say it's that it's the player, but, boy, it was more in the coaching. And the organization itself, as you see, that organization has fallen apart. I mean, yeah. and slowly but surely, that thing has disintegrated all the way up to the head coach, you know? Yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, you know, Mac Jones, at first he had Josh McDaniels as a rookie, and then McDaniels took the head coaching job in Vegas, and that didn't work out for him. Uh, but then they brought in, yeah, Pencilier, Matt Patricia, the defensive guy. How about that? Yeah, they brought in a defensive guy to be the offensive coordinator. And then, well, it was Bill O'Brien last year yes. who they brought in to save the day. Like, if you're relying on Bill O'Brien to turn your career around, then you're going to have a bad time. By the way, so, he didn't have any receivers. He didn't have any players. No, no receivers at all. No running backs. I mean, look, I, we don't mean to absolve Mac Jones of all the blame here. If he's good enough, he would have found a way to play better than he did. But you're right. I mean, bad coaching, bad talent around him. And oh, that's why Bill Belichick lost his job. And that's why the Patriots are picking in the top three of the draft here next month. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. That is a sixth round pick 
former Heisman Trophy. I mean, it wasn't like it was 10 years ago he won the Heisman. You know? uh, he did not win the Heisman. He was oh, he not, a oh, finalist. He, I'm sorry, he was a finalist for the Heisman. He was there twice, was he not? I don't think so. But his receiver, Devontae Smith, did win the Heisman. Right. In 2020, which you could argue Mac Jones should have won the Heisman that year. I mean, he had a tremendous, tremendous season. But look, he was the Davy O'Brien Award winner. He was a first team All American that year. I mean, he was spectacular and he did enough. Hell, people thought the Niners were going to take him in the top three. They ended up going with Trey Lance. That didn't really work for them either. And Mac Jones fell to the Patriots. And I remember, like, Mac Jones had that solid rookie year, and everyone's like, oh, here we go again. The Patriots got themselves another really good quarterback, and they're about to be great for the next 20 years, and this dynasty is going to continue. That was the conversation. Nobody will admit to having those takes today, but people were talking like that in 2021. And then, yeah, once again, the last two seasons for Mac Jones, just horrific. I, mean, I just bad. looked at it as if that guy has nobody to throw to. You can say what you want to. There's, you know, that whole running back by committee. At, at, a, at a certain time, sometimes you're going to have to help the quarterback. So you can't have some guy off the street playing running back for you, which they got away with with one of the greatest players of all time, Tom Brady, and a great defensive you know, mind in Bill Belichick. But offensively, dude, you had to have some help. He had no help at wide receiver. It was like throwing to me and you, hey, Scarecrow, catch this. I mean, it, oh. I mean, <laughs> there was some bad stuff going on there. Um, and, and then to bring all those guys, when Matt Patricia was calling plays, I, you had to know that was the downfall of New England. That, how do you do that? How does that guy start calling plays? I'm glad that you're embracing your new nickname, by the way. I'm not, D.D. The, the Scarecrow. It will rain on Friday, by the way. That's the call? That is the call, yes. Well, guess what? What? I'm not listening to what you what? have to say. I'm waiting for the official TSU forecast, and that comes from D.D. Yeah, that, so. it, I mean, I'm like Mac Jones. How easy have the, the mighty have fallen in a hurry? <laughs> I mean, really. Yeah, we're trading you for a sixth round pick and some wow. cash considerations. That is so sad. So sad. Well, yeah, and, and another Russell Wilson headed to. I think everybody kind of knew that was about to happen for just a million bucks. I mean, I mean that's Mike Tomlin. That's that's going to be the culture there. See if that fits in their run game and their defense. See how that's going to work out. He's got enough guys to throw to there, though. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was the other big headline from the NFL weekend is Russell Wilson signing a one-year deal with the Pittsburgh Steelers. It's one year, $1.2 million. Nice. I mean, when can you get a starting quarterback for that price? Almost never. Well, Russ can take a deal like that because Denver is paying him $37.8 <laughs> million. How about that? He's getting – he's playing – He's at that. He'll take that, whatever that money is at one point two. Who knows? That goes. That goes in a special fund, golf fund, or something like that. He's getting big coins still from Denver, so he's you know he's happy. Yeah, it's a great deal for the Steelers, right? It's as low oh. risk as you could possibly get, especially for a quarterback in today's NFL. I don't know what Russell Wilson has left in the tank. I think it's clear that he's not the guy that he was in Seattle for the first decade of his career. But he wasn't as bad in 2023 as he was in 2022. I'll do it for so, over 3,000 yards. Yeah, 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 yeah. Obviously, things didn't work out. He got benched towards the end of the season. Denver started the year 0-3 and never really got into contention. So you, you see why Denver is making the move that they made. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Pittsburgh gets to benefit. Russell Wilson, 3,000 yards, 26 touchdowns, 8 interceptions. Still got sacked too much. You talked yes. about this last week, Buck. He doesn't have the mobility that he did no. in the early stages of his career. But I think he's better than Kenny Pickett and Mason Rudolph and Mitch Trubisky and some of the other slappies the Steelers have been throwing out there. Well, we'll see about the Kenny Pickett deal. That's just hard to, you know, Kenny Pickett, hometown boy. I mean, that's hard to give up on. They generally don't give up on you too quickly the Pittsburgh Steelers. So I think Russell Wilson will be in a battle. And if it's close, I think Kenny Pickett wins that out because remember, they still don't like to look bad because that was their big signee was Kenny Pickett. No organization, no matter what, they'd rather go ahead and bite the bullet than to say they were wrong about a guy, you know, could lose his job to a 37 year old quarterback, you know, hall of famer. So I don't know. I, I lean, if it's close, Russell Wilson will have to outright win this job. I don't think, He's going to be just given the job at quarterback at Pittsburgh. 
No, I think you're right. And yeah, I mean, look, Kenny Pickett, former first round pick. You're right. He's from the Pittsburgh area, played his college ball at Pitt. And teams will generally give longer leashes to first round picks than they will sure. any other draft pick. It's the fact that they don't look stupid. And even, I mean, you're like, well, why would you bring in Russell Wilson if you don't think he's going to be the starter? Well, uh, 1.2 million is cheap for a backup, right? Like uh, most teams are paying their backup quarterbacks like four, five, six, seven sure. million a year. So even if Russ is going to be the backup, at least to start the season in Pittsburgh, like it's not like you're paying him an arm and a leg to not play for you. Plus, he can help that kid out. He can help that kid out for some of the things that he's learned. And he's, you know, they're, you know, the mobility wise, Kenny Pickett moves around pretty well. Russell Wilson can help him, you know, help him with reads, things like that. I mean, that's not going to hurt that organization if Russell Wilson is willing to, if he's the backup, to help that kid out, you know, you think, for uh, 39, 30, well, 40 million now, a little over 40 million that he'll make. I'll help out anybody for 40 million. Oh what do you need God. me to do? What is it that you need me to do? Should have been a quarterback, man. That guy's being paid $38 million to not play for a team. That's amazing. Isn't that something? Ah, oh, it's a great bit. Yeah, you think uh, Sierra's going to be moving to Pittsburgh? She's not moving anywhere. She's she probably never moved from Seattle. She probably never moved to Denver. But it sounded like they it, well, it sounded like they did. They were part of the community. They did some really a lot of community stuff there. They ain't moving to no Pittsburgh though. I feel like Denver's a pretty crazy. cool. Denver's a pretty cool place to live. I don't I don't know if Pittsburgh is considered that. It's not. I'll, that. I'll let you know. It's not. At all. And look, you need a good quarterback to compete in the AFC, right? I mean, you it's look at true. all the great QBs in that conference. Obviously, Patrick Mahomes, the back-to-back -back Super Bowl champ. You've got Lamar Jackson, the MVP. You've got Josh Allen in Buffalo. You've got Joe Burrow in Cincinnati. C.J. Stroud looks like he's entered that conversation, too, down in Houston. So you've got to have a quarterback to have a chance in the AFC. And Pittsburgh's always in the mix. That's what they do with Mike Tomlin, right? That guy's always well, – They were battling Pittsburgh – I mean, battling the Bills last year. Yeah, and that guy finds a way to have winning records every single season. So that's great, but you're kind of in purgatory if you're just going 9-8 and eight every year uh because you're not getting a high enough draft pick to draft somebody who's going to change the fortunes of your franchise and obviously you're not good enough to compete for a super bowl so you know, russell wilson's won a super bowl before he's played for a couple i don't think he's that level again but i think he uh i think he makes the ceiling for the steelers higher than what it would be with kenny pick well they can win a couple playoff games with that defense you know if he gets the ball you know get they get turnovers he gets the ball they run the ball as well as they do i mean it I think it's still an upgrade from Kenny Pickett right now. Yeah, I do, too. I do, but like I said, he's going to be in a battle during the camp. They don't like to be wrong when they make you the first-round draft choice, you know, and they just don't – just for the sake of saying, oh, no, we were right, Kenny Pickett's our guy. I mean, he'll he'll get the nod, I believe. Russell Wilson will end up being the backup for $40 million. Very nice. Very nice pickup, you know. You know uh, let, me, let me ask you, speaking of the, the world champs, what what is what has Kansas City done with Snead? Is he now a is was he the guy that was franchised already? Yep. So Chris Jones still needs to be paid. Yes. Chris Jones has to be paid, right? Yeah, I don't know what Kansas City is going to do. Um, it sounds like they've made Legereus Snead available in a trade, right? Wow. Like I know, which is crazy because he was one of the best corners in football last year. And he was a huge part of that Super Bowl winning team. I think of those two, Chris Jones is more important. I know Chris Jones is yes. a little bit older and he's going to cost a little bit more because he plays a more premium position. But I think Chris Jones is more important to the success of the Chiefs. So if they can only bring back one of those guys, I think Jones should be the priority there. But still, it's crazy. Yeah, considering just how dominant Legereus Steed was, especially in that Chiefs playoff run that they would just kind of put him on the trading block the way yeah, that I don't, I don't even see that happening. I see them finding a way to get him, both of them, the money. Somebody's going to get shorthanded in that group because they need those guys for the Super that, That's a Super Bowl winning team again. Nope. With those nope. Guys. I was, uh, I didn't see this yesterday. Appreciate Steven and appreciate Thank Double you. R. Chris Jones, they got a deal done yesterday. Five years, awesome. five years, $158 million. Nice to be old, round shouldered, and Good. How about that? $31.75 million per year average. Wow. He's got 90, 
five million dollars guaranteed in the first three years of that deal. <laughs> That's a deal there. Man, it's crazy. Think about where we were last year, right? The Chiefs were coming <laughs> off of a Super Bowl, and Chris Jones was a free agent, and neither side would budge. Like the Chiefs weren't willing to pay him, and Jones wasn't willing to accept the deal. And in training camp, they finally work something out like right, right before the start of the season for Jones to come back for one year. They want and, that three Pete, man. Yeah. <clears throat> they want they it as they should. So that's, yeah, I mean, Chris Jones, like, I don't know if he's going to be good in five years because he's already in his 30s, but you're paying him for the next two or three years of Absolutely. that deal. And, and he is uh, good. Yeah, that's the most. It's an NFL DT record in terms of average annual value at that $31.75 million. Is he a quarterback? Uh, no, he's not making 50 mil, <laughs> but he is making a lot. A yeah, good move by the Chiefs, and I don't know the entirety of their financial situation, but my guess is it's going to be tough to give Chris Jones that contract and also Legereus Sneed top cornerback money because I assume he wants to be one of, if not the highest-paid corners in the NFL. And with the Chiefs paying Mahomes what they're paying him, they got a few other guys under big contracts. It, it might be tough to. What do you do as that. a What do you do as a ball player? You know your 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 life in the NFL is very short-lived. You've got two Super Bowl rings. You're that guy, possibility of a third. I mean, you can give them a, a, a bargain deal and still be a rich son of a gun mm. and, wear, and possibly win a third Super Bowl and then be on your way. Yeah, I mean, Chris Jones took a little bit of a hometown discount last year. Yes, and, and won a Super Bowl. Yeah, and this year he's like, nah, I'm not doing that shit again. Like, well, no, he doesn't have no. Yeah, you know, he could have uh, – maybe he could have made more money on the open market, but he got paid handsomely. And, yeah. of course, uh, we found out late last week that the salary cap had jumped more than $30 million in the NFL from last season to this season. So teams just got that automatic financial flexibility from that news alone. And, yeah, you, you saw a few big money agreements made. Once again, nobody can sign with other teams yet, but except for Russell Wilson because that's sort of a weird – released deal caveat that they have in the NFL rules to where he could negotiate with other teams because of the way his situation yeah, you ended got in Denver. Fired. That's what it was. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But now you're just seeing guys resign with their current teams and you're seeing a lot of money thrown around. And once again, starting at 11 o'clock today, when guys can agree to deals with other teams, you're going to see even more money being thrown around. Justin Fields is just hanging out there because I think Justin Fields, if they can't get it done in Minnesota, I think he's going to end up in Minnesota. If they can't get Kirk Cousins signed. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're still waiting to see what happens with Kirk. I mean, Atlanta is the Vegas favorite right now for Kirk Cousins, and that's news that could come down today. Once again, yes. at 11 o'clock, we might find out that Kirk Cousins is leaving Minnesota to go to Atlanta or somewhere else. You know, Pittsburgh was kind of in the running for him. You assume they're not anymore because of the rust news. But, yeah, I think it's an Atlanta-Minnesota battle right now for you like that, you like that. Yeah, I mean, I they may find a way in Minnesota. Things are kind of quiet there, which means they still may find a way to bring him back. But if they don't, Justin Fields, they may take a shot on a guy, sure. you know, like that and see see what's going on. So I, he's going somewhere. Yeah, it's the worst kept secret in the NFL right now, right? Like the Bears are taking a quarterback. Oh yeah, they're taking yeah, they're taking. And they're moving on. Games. Yeah, and they're they're trying to increase the value of Justin Fields on the open market, and I don't think it's going to happen, right? Like they wanted a first round pick. I think they found out pretty early on that that was never going to happen. No, I think they I think they would like a second round pick, but I'm not sure even that is. I don't going think to that's going to happen either. No. Yeah, if you're Minnesota, like the Vikings are picking outside of the top 10, so they don't have a clear path to one of the top QBs in this draft. And if they lose Kirk Cousins, then they don't really have much of a plan at quarterback right now. It would no. make sense. If you can if you can give up a third, I assume Minnesota has their third this year. But if you can give up a third to go get Justin Fields, then I, I think that's the move they should make. Yeah, they're not going anywhere anyway. No. Yeah, they're picking 11th. Oh, of course, they don't have a third-round pick this year year that's what i get for assuming so i don't know i don't know that they're picking number 42 overall that's their second round pick would you be willing to part ways with that for fields i don't know that's that's kind of borderline of right that's about it you know what i mean you're right on the border of 
how good a quarterback is he really? Yeah. I mean, he's going to run around and do some things in Minnesota. They're going to like that for a while. But remember the young guy that they had come in there when Kirk Cousins got hurt and they they, were, they had the two guys battling. Uh, they had the – what was it? Uh, Dobson, was he there? Oh, Josh Dobbs? Yeah, Josh Dobbs was there and he had, you know – he had a couple of good games. Yeah, then disappear. There, he's done. Then they brought in the other dude. Two games, he's done. I mean, they can't get any consistent play. You know, Kirk Cousins was a consistent player for them, so they're going to yeah. try everything they can to re-sign him. Yeah. It I, I, enough, but maybe it's just too much. Right. Well, I, I think money's going to talk, so if the Vikings really want Kirk Cousins back, they will beat Atlanta's deal. I don't, I don't think Kirk Cousins is like, oh, I hate Minnesota. I would never go back there. I think he's no, just no, going to go. No, no, it's not that. It's money. Yeah, I think, I think he's, yeah, he's going to go to the team that gives him the best contract. And uh, Atlanta is very desperate. I don't know how desperate Minnesota is, but Atlanta, it's been a while since they've had like a, a, a real franchise quarterback. I mean, since Matt Ryan left, and even his last couple of years weren't great. They've been kind of playing musical chairs at that position. Sure. They know they know what they need. That owner's getting old. Uh, they bring in a new coach. They have not won a Super Bowl, so they're desperate to do something that's going to get them in the mix for their first Lombardi trophy. And, uh, yeah, I think Cousins in the <laughs> NFC especially, right? They're, the balance of power with the quarterbacks is shifted heavily in favor of the AFC right now. Yes, it has. I mean, the NFC, it's, you know, it, it's, it's not great right now. It's really not. You got Dak, who has been a huge talking point in the NFL offseason because of his struggles in the playoffs. Uh, Jalen Hurts took a big step back last year, of course. Uh, by the way, Baker Mayfield, we haven't talked about him. He re-signed in Tampa Bay. Baker, Baker, so is Mike Evans, too. How about that? Yeah, Mike Evans is back. Baker <laughs> getting $100 million over three years. So good time to have a good season there, Bake Show. Good job. But, yeah, you got, I mean, Jared Goff, you've got Brock Purdy, like, there's not a lot of great QBs in the NFC right now. So if Atlanta does end up with Kirk Cousins, with Bijan and Drake London and Kyle Pitts and some of the other talented pieces that they've accumulated through the draft in recent years, they could easily, especially in that shitty division, they could easily be a playoff team next year and maybe win a game or two if uh, if things work out. So, uh, yeah, if I had to pick right now, I would say Kirk Cousins ends up in Atlanta and, and your Vikings are scrambling to figure out what they are going to do. At QB. Yeah, and they're, you know, of course, as you say, Chicago's bringing in Caleb Williams. He's playing immediately. Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. All, all three he of those. Will, he'll be, he'll just be shit because he's playing in Chicago. That won't last long. Oh, you're, uh, you're going to label Caleb Williams as a B before he even starts. Oh, he's a bust. He's going to, he's going to Chicago. What are they going to do? They're not going to surround him with anybody. They're going to make him do all the, he's going to have to be everything. But nobody to throw to except for you know they like drafting like eight tight ends, so he'll he'll have the tight end of the month that's for sure. They always do. Remember that year they drafted like six tight ends. I mean they had a whole roster full of tight ends. Yeah, yeah, that was the last three years. I think they've drafted a total of eighteen tight ends. Wow. Now uh, they do have DJ Moore. He's good. They got him in the uh, Bryce Young trade last year. They've got Darnell Mooney, who's fine. Yeah, I mean, look, they don't have a ton of great weapons, no. but it could be worse. Like we talked about the Patriots. They have more weapons than the Patriots do. Yes, yes, they do. Speaking of the Panthers, right, the team that traded yeah, DJ Moore. Travis has more weapons than the than they do, for sure, than the Patriots. My goodness. You think you think Lake Travis has a better wide receiving core than New England oh, does right oh, now? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, you might be right, actually. You might be right, so – uh, yeah, a lot going on in the world of football. Bucky is calling Caleb Williams a bust already. There's a true Vikings fan right there. No surprise that the guy going to the Bears. Gotta get it done. Might as well get it in there now because yeah. eventually he'll be good, you know, and that when they make that trade in four years. Oh, right. When they dump him, he'll be just he'll come into his prime. He'll end up in Green Bay, and he'll be that next thorn in your side. But yeah. They're going to get rid of Jordan Love in the next three years? Come on, he's gone. I, well, I hope so, because he looks like he's pretty good, which is unfortunate, because I, I was hoping finally the Packers would not have a legit fit franchise quarterback, and, well, that hope didn't last long, because Jordan no. Love looked, looked to be the real deal. 
All right, we'll get back into the NFL a little bit later. Once again, free agency really gets started at 11 o'clock, so we'll be talking about that news all day long here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. But we've got plenty of Longhorn stuff to get into. we got to talk Texas hoops, some Texas baseball. But before we shift gears here, Buck, how about our first sponsor shout-out? Folks, if you're seeking that specialized patient-focused orthopedic care, you've got problems with your back and your shoulders, your knees, the whole works, contact the experts at Texas Orthopedics. Their physicians offer comprehensive surgical and non-surgical orthopedic care for children and adults, spinal care, sports medicine, uh, trauma care, joint replacement, rheumatology, and even more. Dr. Christopher Danny and Chris Stockton, dedicated orthopedic surgeons there, and their goal is to get you back into good health and that great quality of life that you deserve. Visit them at TXOrtho.com. Texas Orthopedics is the largest independent orthopedic practice in the state of Texas. Once again, for more information, go to TXOrtho.com. Yes, indeed. And how about a word from our buddy Tom McKay over at Audio Visual Consultations? Hi, this is Tom McKay with Audio Visual Consultations. Today's home electronics can be a bit daunting. My company has spent the last 36 years making sure they are not. For those of you who have not experienced our services yet, we'd like to invite you to give us a try for all your home electronics needs. We carry all the major brands of televisions and stereo equipment at prices you can't find in stores. And we come to you. There's no need to leave your home to find great pricing and incomparable service. No traffic and experienced sales geeks or pushy showroom tactics. We believe in having some fun and dreaming big. Do you have a dream for your home entertainment? Let us know. We can make it come true. And we are always there to help after the job is done. We cultivate clients for a lifetime by treating everyone like their family. No, not those family members. I'm talking about the ones you actually like. So relax, hug your kids, make love to your wife, and smile. Then, when you have a moment, give us a call at 255-8678. It's 512-255-8678. Or online at avconsultations.com. Let me a quick shout-out to our good friends over at Relax the Bag BK. Yesterday, I sat around watching Scotty Scheffler win at Bay Hill. But I sat on the couch and, oh, no. Oh, my goodness. I mean, that couch, it folded me up like a ham sandwich. Like, lay sat in and just folded up like this. My back is all jacked up. But, folks, now I'm back in my chair feeling good. And they have got all the chairs, the, the pillows, everything that you need at Relax the Back with their two locations. And BK at the Hill Country Gallery across from Whole Foods and then North Austin at the Gateway Shopping Center for, across from the Container Store. Live pain-free when you get off that couch and get into that relax the back chair at relax the back. Yeah, don't get off on your couch. Get off on your relax the back chair instead. Oh, if need be. Mm. But that can be a little messy too, so. Get you a better couch. Uh, you know, that couch took forever to get up here and together. Now, my wife is making changes. She wants to make changes. You know, we've been in this house for four years. And now it's like everything, there needs to be an overhaul. I mean, really. That, you know, that like, is the most. Like your apartment, you're going to overhaul your apartment here no. in another year, probably. No, dudes don't do that. Like, dudes, that's, dudes don't that's do the that. most stereo. That, like, I've, I've been married zero times, so I am far from the foremost authority on all things marriage. But I've heard so many stories from guys talking about how wives never stop remodeling the house there's always something that has to change something that has to be fixed something that has to be upgraded so you're going through that right now it sounds it's, like yeah it's that town you know brand new house we have four years and now my rug up here it's just me up here that doesn't it's ugly now it doesn't work and i'm like it works oh, for me she's trying to mess with your man cave no the rug has to go i mean well, what did you do to that rug? Were you out of toilet paper or something? Oh, no. oh, I didn't scratch my ass across the rug like a dog. No, it's fine. I'm I'm fighting for the rug. I'm fighting for the rug. Just, you know, where I sit and I put my feet down in front by the table, it's worn a little bit there. But it's not worn all the way down to the floor. I mean, it's fine. It's a rug. I mean, what's a rug supposed to look like if you're most of the time you're the only dude up there? Yeah, I, I I don't, it's supposed to look like a rug and I'm sure it still does look like a rug. Yeah. It's, it looks like a mighty fine rug in many places, you know? So how often yeah. do people even go upstairs at your house? Uh, it's just me probably 10, 15 times a day up to 18. Well, you got 18 flights. It's not easy for folks no. without the elevator to get up and down here. Not 18 flights. 
18 stairs that feel like 18 flights. What do you live at the Frost Bank Tower downtown? (laughs) Even 18 (laughs) flights? Give me a break. Yeah, but it's it's that time. It's changing time. So, I mean, it's I'm like, oh no, here it comes. It it doesn't have to happen. You know that. I mean, things don't like move. I mean, it's they're not like falling down or anything. But it's just, I guess, it's just different look for that for the person's eye who who decorated the home originally. Because I didn't do any decorations. I mean, I just. But so this needs to be moved. That's not no longer good there. It's Really? It's a losing battle you're fighting, my friend. Oh, I'm not even fighting that battle, except no. for this rug. This is rug. I'm 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 gonna have to be dragged down the steps, rolled up in the rug and pushed down the steps. Oh my god. Other than that, it is all good, brother. And I'm I'm excited to, I'm excited to say hello and thank the folks over at Academy Sports and Outdoors, you know, with their help with the mullet open and gathering all that stuff, tractor supply, dripping springs, wonderful folks. Been getting in the truck, getting stuff done. Going to have a little mini bike there. It's one of the big raffle prizes. You know, I've got to get down to Cohen and Sons and all my jewelers around town that want to want to jump in there and help. But I know um, the Cohens will have something special for the mullet open. They always do. And so I'm now gathering. It's the gathering time now. So I'm in the truck and I'm in the old brown truck making sure that that uh, Trey gets what he wants in the raffle. You know how that goes. Oh, the, yeah. random, the randomizer doesn't work with certain people. You know what I'm saying? It works for Trey. Oh, it last time remember he got the uh he got the chainsaw from um where was that chainsaw from? Tractor supply? No. The uh, Brandon Mars. Yeah, it was from uh, Brandon. Top gun? Top gun. He got that and he made a switch with somebody. He said, what the hell am I going to do with a chainsaw? The following year, we had the storm mm. and all the branches. And he goes, damn, I wish I had that chainsaw now. He was telling me, I wish I had that chainsaw. I could get some of these branches off my house. The last thing we need is Trey Elling III operating a chainsaw. That's for sure. That would not end well for anybody. Hey, speaking of Academy, I went to Academy twice yesterday because I, I played golf at Great Hills. And please don't tell me you needed balls. I just gave you a whole case of balls. They're all gone already. No, had the balls, lost a few of them yesterday, but had those. I needed shoes. All right. I've only played golf. I would say yesterday was the third time I've played since I moved back to Austin like seven months ago. And I, I just haven't been able to find my golf shoes. Like the last two times I've played, I've just played in sneakers because I, I don't know if my shoes made the move back from Houston. They're at the, the swimming pool. They're down by the pool. I don't know. I called the guy I lived with in Houston and because he's still at that same place. And I'm like, hey, do you see him in there? And he said, no. I don't think I left them down there, but I, I can't find him. And I, I've given Goodwill. up. They're at Goodwill. Well, I, hope so. I, hope, yeah. I hope somebody's using them, right? Like, I hope they're, I don't know. I'll probably find them in a couple of days. But I, I needed golf shoes. I was going to play at a nice club. I'm not going to show up in beat up sneakers. Oh, or, or cutoffs there? Muni man. Yeah, I wasn't in Muni mode yesterday. Collared shirt. Did you have a collared shirt on and everything? Had a collared shirt on, tucked very, in, was wearing pants, nice. the whole shebang. But yeah, I went to Academy, got some new golf shoes, and I played so bad. They had good prices at Academy for that. I played so bad that I tried to return the shoes after the round, and they wouldn't Whoa, take them. whoa, they don't do that. They're not doing that. I left the tag on. My goodness. I kept the box. I put them back in the box. I went back to the same store. I had the receipt. Said, well, yeah, you, you know, the, these- the, the, the shoes that I had, and I stepped in the dog shit, we were brand new, too. Mm. And I didn't try to take them back. <laughs> yeah, they're like, what's this mud and sand on these shoes? And I was like, they came that way. I don't know. <laughs> Somebody used them. Oh, I that's. Just, I just bought them a few hours ago. Like, what are you? You're accusing me of something? Like, I just I know bought you, them. I know you played. Did you hit any homes out where you were there? Uh, ooh. yeah, probably. So you knocked one out in the cul-de-sac, though, huh? I, de- I definitely. I don't know if I hit any houses, but I I came close. We were in the neighborhood. Uh, little Johnny riding his bicycle might have taken one to the oh, dome. Good, take one for the team, kid. And I oh, I hit I hit a like pepper to drive right off a tree. I mean, it was a tree about seventy five yards forward, and then it bounced. Oh. And ended up going next That's to me on the tee box. You know? Dude, you know what? What's what do they say about riding a bike? Like you never forget how to ride a bike. 
That's not the case with golf. No. My no, game, sir. like, not, I'm not going to sit here and act like I was ever a, a great golfer, but I had had some things figured out towards the end of my run in Houston, and then I just basically have not played at all in the last eight, nine months. And now I, it's like I've never picked up a club in my life. I'm so bad again. I got, I can get good. I just have to play all the time. And yeah, if I don't, if I'm just like – yeah, if I'm just like the casual, like, I don't know, every two months I'll go out there and hit, I, it, it's horrible. So bad. So I mean, I'm so bad, and I play once a week, and I have to play once a week. In order to be really, really good, you got to generally, you have to be really, really kind of rich, and you got the money to go do that twice a week and then play on the weekends. But you know me, I'm not going out there on weekends. You know who's out there on the weekends? It's ladies' month. They're there. No, <laughs> I'm not going out there on the weekends. I don't do that. I don't play golf on the weekends. I just because the women are there. Did I say that? I just said it's ladies' month. I mean, it's. I don't. I don't play golf on the weekends because the olds and other people are out there. So, what do you mean by other people? It's ladies' month. Wow. It this to be is their fat little girlfriends. Too bad. <laughs> I, mean, I just, I just don't. I don't like eight, nine hour rounds. I just, I can't do that on weekends. And the I'm women not, play slow. Yeah, it's, it's. Mm. You know what? But I, I find this at the actually at the clubs that I do have an opportunity to go play. You know, the women play faster than the men. They, they understand. They don't have to put them all out. They, they, they don't. They understand. Got to the green. Chalk that up. Is putt made. I'm like, cool, let's roll. Yep. I like that. The guys are playing for like a dollar. They're making guys put out, you know, six-inch putts instead of picking it up and go. Oh, Lisa, defending <laughs> the ladies today, saying you're afraid to get beat. That's why you don't like playing golf with women. I didn't say I didn't like playing golf with women. I just don't go out while they're out there. I don't, oh, okay. I just, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't. What is this an Orthodox playing. Jewish wedding? You got to put the women on a different course than the <laughs> No, man, I'm not getting to that. I got beat by some ladies about 20 years ago playing golf, but they were professionals. They had left their families to go play professional golf. Yeah. And they, oh, yeah, and they beat me. And that's, money. you know, that's, that just wasn't right for their families. You know, their husbands stayed at home while they hit the tour. So mm. and they beat, on, beat up on me. I'm just happy to be able to hit it. 170, 180 down the middle and have fun doing it. I just like to get outside. Yeah. No, it's fun. I always love playing golf, even though I suck at it. But it was a good but That time particular course you play that, they have homes now on every hole. You can oh yeah. You can slide one off into somebody's big sliding glass window. Yeah, my buddy Joey, who's uh shout out to him, a good friend who's a member out there, and he's like, uh, he would he would warn me, like, okay, don't hit it here. He's like, there's a golf cart with some kids to the right. <laughs> yeah, that, they're yeah. always there. Yeah, they're yeah, always yeah. hanging out there. So like, like whatever he would tell me, I'd like overcompensate and just hit it in the exact opposite direction. So oh, yeah. I was I was missing people, thankfully. But uh, no, shout out to uh, Joey. Also, shout out to Naraj and Jason. A couple of hopefully future TSU listeners who I met out on the course uh, fun day yesterday and shout out to Academy for the golf shoes, but not shout out to Academy for not taking them back after the round. I can't believe they turned me down, man. You know, I, I love Academy and you know, I don't do a lot at uh, Dick's, but that's where I get my golf shoes. Yep. I go to yeah. Dick's for golf shoes. They have, always have these sales. I don't need to be, why do I need to, it's like, it's like um, me and jeans. I'm not paying a lot. I mean, I'll pay a lot for the jeans, but once again, I don't pay a lot for the golf shoes because I don't change the spikes. Once they wear down, you know what I do? I buy another pair of golf shoes. Oh, because you're rich. Yeah, you can afford it. No, that. that's not it. I just don't – I'm not going and turning little screws. And I know. I know people that do that. I just don't. When I wear those bad boys out, they're done, BK. Mm -hmm. They are done. Hey, speaking of golf, shout out to Scotty Scheffler. Yes, we big transition win. into some more Texas talk this morning. Scotty Scheffler picking up the win at the Arnold Palmer Invitational yesterday. Shot a six under sixty six. He wins the event by five strokes over Wyndham Hotels Clark. Yes, largest win at Bay Hill since Tiger Woods in twenty twelve. That five stroke victory. Anytime you're doing anything since Tiger. 
Yeah, uh, you're doing something right. And look, Scotty's the number one golfer in the world right now. The best part of Scotty's weekend and why this could be the start of a really, really special season for the Lifetime Longhorn. He didn't miss a putt under 15 feet all weekend. Dude, he just crushed it with his new putter. He's got a little mallet putter now that, boy, that thing was right on the mark. Maybe a little bit added weight. He's doing some different different things with his putts now. And if he gets that thing going, forget about it. I mean, yeah. forget about it. Now they got they got the, the players this week down in Florida. So, I mean, he'll be sharp shooting that place too. This will be a lot of fun for him. This could be a huge year for Scotty Scheffler. Oh, man. I think you're right. I mean, if he puts half as well as he did over the weekend, yes. then he's got at least one major coming his way in 2024 because he, he's been best, you know, off the tee and best oh, yeah. with the irons. I mean, you talk about strokes gained. He's awesome anywhere except for the green, but he's been one of the worst putters on tour the last couple of years, and he's still in the mix every weekend. And everyone who Absolutely. watches golf is just like, oh, if he figures out the flat stick, then he's going to be unstoppable. Well, he figured it out, and once again, a, uh, a five-shot victory at a – in a pretty stacked field out there. Oh, yeah. Today, they yeah. Nice, well, they always do. They come out to Arnie's uh, tournament to play. So that was a good field. Yeah. 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 So great news for, uh, for Schaffler. And hopefully, once again, the start of big things in 2024. We got you watching the PGA. What happened to Liv? You let them down? You, they, you didn't have any Liv golf in you this weekend? Uh, no, we had, uh, we, had, we had a little Liv golf action where, this where weekend. Were they Mo Willie this week? No, I don't I mean, think it's were, Mo Willie, but the live guy. I mean, maybe they were there. I don't think they were playing at Mo Willie, but I do know it was Abraham Lincoln Answer who took home the title. <laughs> Traitor. Where, where were they in Hong Kong? Where were they? I think they were in Hong Kong. I didn't watch too much live. It's overnight, you know. It's tough watch sometimes when they're playing wow. overseas and the time zones are tough. I wasn't getting up at two or three in the morning this week. Playing weekend. in your boxer shorts, yeah. Yeah, uh, the answer was playing in briefs. <laughs> great. <laughs> That's great. Good. All right, Texas basketball. Yes. Nice win for the Longhorns to close out the regular season. 94 to 80, the final score <clears throat> against Oklahoma on Saturday. How about this? Texas has beaten Oklahoma seven straight times in men's basketball. Three straight regular season sweeps of the Sooners. Uh, the Longhorns have won seven in a row and eight of their last nine against OU. So it's 849 and OU still sucks. Uh, Texas was up by five at halftime, but they started the second half on an eight nothing run. They went up double digits. They made nine of their first 11 shots in the second half to take control. And it turns into a really nice double digit quality win. Dude, that was an ass in the game. second half. That really was. And yeah. <clears throat> for Tyrese Hunter, you know, I said, you know, I'm just, I'm going to, have faith that, you know, you, you, one of these times is just going to happen. Well, it happened on Saturday. He was an all-around player, defense, offense, assists. He was he was spectacular watching him play. And he, he was having a great time at it, BK. He yeah. didn't have that hang dog look of, well, you're dependent on me. They depended on him because you never knew what you were going to get from Dylan DeSue, you know, coming off that knee. Hell, Dylan DeSue played way more than I thought he should have played. But um, – and he got through it towards the end. He took that really weird step. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. It was like four minutes, five minutes left in the game, mm. which I was thinking, why is that guy sitting down? I mean, he should have been at the eight minute point. He should have been on the bench somewhere, but he took a weird step and he kind of hobbled. And I'm like, this can't, this is not going to happen now. You know, towards the, towards the end of the, the game, towards the end of the season, you're getting ready to play conference, conference games and trying to get into the big tournament. And he's hobbling. Well, you didn't know what you were going to get, and somebody had to step up, and Tyrese Hunter did just that. I mean, I, I don't know if that was the best game of his career, but it was one of the best games I've seen him play overall ever since yeah. he's been here. I think it was the best game of his Texas career. I mean, 30 points on 9 of 13 shooting, got to the foul line nine times, made all nine of his free throws. He was aggressive, and he was playing with confidence. Yes. Right? Like that. We've talked about that a lot on this show. It's just Tyrese Hunter has been lacking confidence as of late. He's a good player. And it's like, dude, you like, believe that you're a good player. Yes. And if I'm Rodney Terry or somebody else on this coaching staff, I'm like constantly going up to Tyrese Hunter and saying, you're a great player. We believe in you. Be aggressive. Okay? Take shots. 
drive to the lane. Like, just be more confident in yourself. And Tyrese Hunter was playing with confidence. And you're right, the swagger was back in Tyrese Hunter. He was talking. He was pumping up the crowd. He was chirping the other team a little bit. I mean, he yep. was he was engaged. And I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, if Tyrese Hunter plays engaged, he's going to do that every time out. No, he's not going to give you 30 points a night. But when he is engaged, he can be a really, really good number three option for this team. And on Saturday, he was the number one option. Yeah, I was so excited when he hit 22 because I had talked about that Friday. Can you get me 22 points from Tyrese Hunter? And I'm thinking, no, you're going to get – on a good game, you're going to get 16. But I was wondering if you could get in the 20s. And dude got to 30. And I mean – but his just level of play, the way he just played the game was really good. Overall game was ex exceptional on Saturday. For a junior that could come back again, that probably should come back again. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I like. I don't think Tyrese Hunter would be drafted if he went to the NBA after this season. Now, could he have a career playing professional basketball? Absolutely. I mean, sure. I, I, think, I think he'd get shots in the G League with a chance to work his way up to the NBA, or he could definitely play overseas if he wanted to. But yeah, he could use another year. Or hey, maybe maybe what happened on Saturday is the start of a really strong final absolutely. couple of weeks. You're and, right. And, Tyrese Hunter puts together some strong performances in Kansas City, the Big 12 tournament this week. And, you know, if he helps Texas go on a deep NCAA tournament run, then, OK, maybe the iron is hot and he decides to head to the NBA. But, yeah, I mean, look, he could come back for another season, but that was great to see. Uh, he was awesome for Texas on Saturday. Well, and they all played they well. I mean, everybody, Brock Cunningham, everybody played well. Everybody was in into that game. For for the seniors, they were – they were – that was that – was, a good team effort right there by everybody in that basketball yeah. game. Yeah, 94 points, the uh, second highest total for Texas this season. Uh, yeah, offensively, they were they were really good throughout. The ball was moving a lot. Once again, they were playing downhill, so getting some easier buckets at the rim, uh, a lot of fast break points, some second chance points as well, sure. a lot of points in the paint too. Texas just bullied Oklahoma yeah. down low. I mean, it was uh, it was clinical. It's a really, really strong performance by this Texas team. And I thought and Dylan DeSue moved pretty well for a guy coming off. Yeah, off and he looked he, really he looked fine. Yeah. yeah, he looked fine. And I, I like I said, I thought he was going to play. I, most people were like, "No, nah, they're going to rest him." And look, I would have understand understood that logic, right? You've got bigger games to play. You're already in the tournament. You don't really need to play Dylan DeSue because you don't really need to beat Oklahoma. But I figured he'd try to get out there. It was his senior day, after right. all. And, it, and apparently the coaches and medical staff felt like he was good enough to go out there and play. And he only played 24 minutes, but I think more of that had to do with foul trouble. Like he picked up his third oh, yeah, foul You're right. early in the second half. So he, he sat on the bench for a while. And the good news was Texas was able to go on a run without the Sioux. So they didn't need to rush him back in there and feel like, oh, the only way we're going to win this game is if the Sioux plays 30 minutes or more. And they were able to build up a lead while he was sitting on the bench and yeah, that's that's why he, he only had to when, like I said, when he made that that funny step, he was yeah. in there. I mean, I thought he would would have been on the bench by then, but he was still in there. They were still a little worried, but there was nothing to worry about. Oklahoma didn't have anything going for them. They, yeah, they, they didn't. I think you know it's it was probably like ten to fifteen point margin yeah. at that point. I think OU cut it to eleven at some point with like seven or eight minutes to go, and you know crazier things have happened. Uh, teams you, have blown. You know blown bigger leads than that in that amount of time. So I, I wasn't too upset that Dylan DeSue was on the floor. But you're right. I remember what you're talking about. He did have that sort of weird misstep. Uh, but thankfully, all good. Stayed in the game. Yeah. Finished it out. Texas gets a win. Also, Dylan Mitchell played great, too. I mean, we'll, yes, we'll, get, we'll give him some flowers. His best game in maybe a month. I mean, 14 points on five of seven shooting. Came off the bench. He was pretty aggressive. Did his thing on defense as well, but it was good to see Dylan Mitchell provide a little bit of a spark for this offense. And, you know, that's like Max A. Smith didn't play all that well, and Texas still scored 94. And you know why? It's because Tyrese Hunter and Dylan Mitchell stepped up and had good games. That's right. If those guys can, I mean, they, they combined for 44 on Saturday. If those guys can give you 30 combined on any given night, with A. Smith and DeSue doing what they usually do, then this that's team right. has a chance to win a couple of games in the tournament. So if I, they play, I, I agree. If they play like that, I mean, they won three of their last four games in the regular year. Their only loss came in Waco, and Dylan DeSue was basically out for the entirety of that game, and Texas was still up by 14 at one point there. Like, this, this team is playing pretty well right now, and you hope it uh, translates into the postseason.
Now, who will they play? Now, it's already been determined who they will play, right? Yes. So Texas finished the year nine and nine in conference play with that win on Saturday. They are the seven seed in the Big 12 tournament. They will open up play on Wednesday night against Kansas State in a 7 10 matchup. I like that. Uh, yeah, Texas and K-State, they only played once. It was a game here in Austin. It's kind of close. Ugly game, low scoring, something like 62, 56. Yeah, Kansas State can make it an ugly game. Yeah, and that's, you know, it's in Kansas City, so it's not a true road game or anything like that, but you're not playing at home like you did the first time you got to you're see right. them. So, you know, it, it was looking like if TCU just beat UCF, then Texas would have played Oklahoma again which would have been kind of weird. It would have been round three, but also back-to-back -back games against the Sooners. But because TCU lost to UCF, Texas jumped up a spot to the seven line, and now they will play Kansas State. If they win that game, they will play two-seed Iowa State on Thursday. Um, so that will obviously be a tough one. But look, Texas is in. They're in the tournament right now. They can, they can lose by 20 to Kansas State on Wednesday, and they're still sure. going to make it. Now, you know, right. they don't, of course, that goes without saying. But no, we, we talked about it going into the last four-game stretch of the year. If Texas won two games, I thought they were going to be in. They won three. Yes. And, you know, a nice road win over Texas Tech. That's a tournament team. And a nice home win over Oklahoma. They're a tournament team. So, uh, yeah, the Longhorns are in the dance. If they have a good showing at the T-Mobile Center this week, then they could play their way up a seed or two. But they are in. You don't have to worry about uh, Texas missing the dance anymore. They will. Uh, they will hear their name called in six days. Buck selection Sunday is six yes. days from now. We might be doing a selection Sunday special somewhere, there you go. and that's also St. Patty's Day too. So, a few reasons to celebrate this coming Sunday, huh? Very nice. Yeah, absolutely. Let's. Uh, let's it didn't take much for you to celebrate. No, I celebrated yesterday, Sunday. <laughs> not only did I go play golf, I went uh, over to William Scripps, the owner of the Altstadt Brewery, went to his house yesterday and drank a bunch of Altstats. And yeah, I, you know, I was out too late. I drank too much. I had too much fun for a Sunday. So on a school night. Sunday on a school night. On a school wow. night. Yeah. There. Wow. Uh, I don't take a lot of naps these days. There will be a nap in my future. Got a nap day today. Very day. nice. Yeah, today is going to be uh, a nap day. After the midday program with Trey, there will be uh, a couple of hours of shut eye for sure. Uh, shout out to Old Stab Beer, by the way. Was drinking that on the course. Was drinking that at, uh, of course, I was drinking that at Williams' house last night. That's all I drink. It's the best beer in the world. If you haven't tried it yet, you are missing out. If you have tried it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They've got a bunch of different brews, too. Something for every beer drinker out there. The lager. That's my favorite. That's the OG. It's a German-style lager that is fantastic, tastes great. They've got the Kolsch. They've got the Hefeweizen. They've got the Light. They've got tons of great seasonal brews as well. Something for every beer drinker out there. It's all stab beer. No impurities. No regrets. And, folks, we will be at Sue Patrick once again on Wednesday, our home away from home. We'll be there Wednesday. Love being there. BK and I will do the show from 8 to 10. They always say, they said, so what's better? Do you want is it better? Jay always says, no, we want the eight to ten show. We want people hanging around the door trying to get in. Yeah. They open up the doors at 930, folks, for you. But Sue Patrick's got that incredible selection of longhorn apparel, collectibles, accessories, and even more. And they've got tons of Texas themed gifts and items there just for you. A variety of clothes for men and women. I was there, bought the golf bag, BK. I have the black golf bag now. The one that was just sitting in there, sitting in there. I have the longhorn bag. That's right. No longer do I have the Tito's bag. I have the Longhorn bag. So I got that from Sue Patrick on, I think it was Friday. It may have been over there. But, uh, yeah, I can't wait to get over there. Folks, they give you free shipping. Online offers over $49. And curbside, they've got everything that you need. There's a parking space just for you. 5222 Burnett Road. Say hello to uh, Sue when you're there. Go to suepatrick.com for more information. But we will be there on Wednesday. Yeah, they've got all kinds. Of, they've got it going on. Hey, they've got. They're getting ready. They're getting ready for maybe a three peat in volleyball here. So yep. you know, you know, Jay is in his mind. His mind is working already to figure out what they're going to do. They've got all the baseball caps there. If you're a little leaguer. You still want to wear that Longhorn big boy cap? They've got them just for you, and they're all fitted. They'll even fit the scarecrow's head. So they've they've got it just for you at Sue Patrick. So we'll see you there on Wednesday morning.
Yes, looking forward to that. I've got my national championship volleyball shirt on right now. There you go. And love the great folks at Sue Patrick. And it's like a foot locker on Black Friday when we're there. You just got people banging on the door trying to get in. <laughs> then you got people running over each other, trampling over people to try to get into the store to see us mainly, but also – to uh, cash in on the best. I wish they had the. Long, I wish they were in the SEC a little sooner. They're gonna have to wait till July first, which we will probably be there on July first for that party too. The changing of Texas from yep. the Big Twelve into the SEC, so they'll they'll have some specials there that day for sure. Yeah, thanks. Did you say Scarecrow? Yeah, <laughs> nice head, <laughs> Scarecrow. Look at those jeans from Goodwill. Really. Oh, yeah, that's the call? You got Goodwill a, jeans on those? No, God, don't put those on your your backside ever. Get a little bit more of a zoom for you there. Wow. It's the that's Bucks, Bucks Halloween costume this year. Mm. Definitely dressing up as a scarecrow. I like that. All right, let's hear from Rodney Terry. This uh, came from after the game on Saturday. Once again, Texas beating Oklahoma 94 to 80. Seventh straight victory for Texas over OU on the hardwood. They complete their third straight season series sweep over the Sooners. Here is RT. He was asked about his team's play and are you guys capable of playing this well moving forward? I think, Eric, I think we've been playing really good basketball, over, give or take, over the last five, six ball games. You know, um, you know, we had a game or two that uh, that we didn't play particularly well or the way we thought we were capable of playing, you know, maybe a Houston game or something like that at their place. But we've been playing pretty good basketball. We've been taking care of the basketball. We only had 10 turnovers a day, and I took one of those at the end there, really nine turnovers uh, in the game. But uh, we value taking care of the ball. We played really hard on defense. We got an offense from our defense. Uh, we've executed, you know, after timeouts, we've executed – you know, in the half court, um, I think we've been, we've been playing some of our best basketball right now at the right time of year, to be honest. Yeah, they they are using that defense to play some pretty good offense. They're getting out on the break. Dude, Weaver is going to the rack. I mean, he'll go face first into the to the back stand there of the back. But he doesn't care. He's going. When he gets going, when he gets his ahead of steam going, BK, he is head on towards that basket. You know, he's yeah. doing a great job. I mean, he's doing a great job because he's so active with his hands and stuff. But he will go and and he will get he will go. He'll get fouled. He'll go to the free throw line. And I like the way he plays. He yeah. is a go getter, man. He is, man. High energy every time he's on the floor. Yes. And yeah, he's not much of a shooter. You kind of yell at your I screen. Don't, I don't. Yeah, I do. If he's in that corner and he's alone, pass that pass that shot up. No matter what, just pass it up. Yeah. Somebody will come open. Yep, absolutely. But he uh, the yeah. ones, he'll take it. And he didn't, yeah. he just didn't take that many shots. It didn't seem like in that game. Uh, he didn't play that well on, on Saturday. And once again, that's another positive sign for this Texas team is that they didn't need Max Acemas to, to play all that great for them to get a win. Acemas was five of 13, had just 11 points on, on Saturday. So yeah, didn't shoot a ton, but didn't make a ton. Didn't do a whole lot. Thankfully, Tyrese Hunter was awesome. Dylan Mitchell provided some juice off the bench. Dylan DeSue in his limited minutes uh, did his thing. And, yeah, Texas, once again, another really, really quality win against a quality opponent. And I think RT's right. Like, they've won three of their last four. They've won four of their last six. To do that in the Big 12, never easy. I think this team is playing its best basketball of the season right now. You, know, you hope that that carries over into Kansas City, right? I mean, if they stumble against K-State and lose on Thursday, then all of a sudden – or excuse me, lose on Wednesday, then all of a sudden you're like, ah, shit, I don't know what version of Texas we're going to get right. in the dance. But if they beat K-State, hell, if they beat Iowa State, you'll be feeling great. But even if they don't, if they play Iowa State close in that uh, second round game uh, of the Big 12 tournament, then sure. I think I think you're like, okay, like this team might be capable of winning a game, if not two, in March. And it's been a long time since Texas has made it to the second weekend of the tournament in consecutive seasons. Uh, two wins in the NCAA tournament will get them into the Sweet 16. That's that's the goal. I, I've said all year long, that feels like the ceiling for this team, and I still feel that way. That's the ceiling for this team. Now, they could lose in the first round. We know what the floor can be for Texas. We've seen it this year. Yes. But if it's all clicking, and right now it kind of feels like it's all clicking, then they've got a shot to uh, to be one of those last 16 teams standing, I think.
Yeah, I, I think Brock Cunningham became the, the – he has more wins, you know, than anybody yep. in the history, right, individual. Yeah, I think he uh, surpassed A.J. Abrams. A.J. Abrams, wow. There's a yeah. blast from the past. The great A.J. Abrams. Probably yeah, Brock favorite. played pretty good Saturday. He was all over the place. He, he <laughs> defended. He, re, he rebounded really, really well. I mean, he's there for re- – I mean, he's done a great job of rebounding this season. You yeah. know, it's the little things that he does and the little irritating things he can do to defenders, but his rebounding was really, really good on Saturday. Uh, yep, had six points, six assists, five rebounds, four he fouls. Those five rebounds. He pushed it up the court. I mean, they got some nice fast yeah. break points too. Yeah, Cunningham was good, and it was his senior day. I think they keep telling us he's not allowed to come back, but I'll believe that when I see it. It's almost like they say that, like the, the, the announcers – you know, say, I think this is it for him. I'm like, is it? Uh, with that guy, you never know. He's, he's already got 14 degrees. Like, he's running out of things he can study in school. Man. So, yeah. Now, the last home game for Brock Cunningham. Good way to go out. He's also playing with a broken pinky, too. He was wearing that little cast. Do you see that? I saw a little pinky cast. Yeah, he hurt his hand in that loss in Waco uh, last week. And toughed it out, played on Saturday, and like you yep. said, he played pretty well. So, uh, nice win for Texas. By the way, the Big 12 award uh, awards were announced yesterday. So I struggled to speak this morning. Dylan DeSue, named to the All-Big 12 first team. Max Aspis, named to the All-Big 12 second team. So, congrats to both of them. A couple of well-deserved accolades there. Dylan DeSue was also named the most improved player in the Big 12 Conference this season. Very nice. Coming off last year, coming off the end of the season, the mid midway point last year, he's only just gotten better. I mean, he's fantastic. You know, the, the key for them, BK, now is Shedrick. What will, what will he be able to do in the tournament play? Not the conference, but once they get into NCAA tournament play, I mean, how effective will he be? He's, he's, he's a little bit different than he was in the beginning of the season. As you said, I think it's just – health reasons why that he's he looks so much more active whether it's defense or offense yeah. he's a little bit more uh, a little bit more aggressive on the offensive end of the court too yeah it's a great point Chedrick had eight points in 18 minutes I think he was three of three from the floor I'm pulling up his game log real quick I mean yeah the last five games for Caden Shedrick eight points 14 points eight points 10 points eight points yeah. like okay you sign up for that in a heartbeat and he's not playing a lot. It's not like he's starting these games playing 30 minutes and only giving you right. 8 to 14 points. He's he's playing like 15 to 20 minutes a game and just giving you some spunk off the bench. So you're right. He's in there for defense and rebounding, but he's added a little bit of offensive game yes, to has. his arsenal in recent weeks, and it, and it helps. So this is a talented roster. I, I keep telling people, like, Texas was a top 20 team in the country going into the season, despite having a newish coach, despite losing, you know, Marcus Carr, Timmy Allen, Serge Barry Rice, Christian Bishop, all the guys from last year's team, despite the uncertainty with Dylan DeSue's injury, like people looked at this roster and said, this is one of the 20th, uh, 20 best rosters in college sure. basketball. So there is some talent on this team. They've just been incredibly inconsistent this year, but if they put it together, once again, that's why I think they could be a sweet 16 team. They, they can be with all the guys that they have. They just, they need good Tyrese, confident Tyrese. They need yes. Dylan Mitchell to give them something. Caden Shedrick doing what he's done the last two and a half weeks. That's all, all great. The guys we were talking about Saturday, they, they were contributors to that yeah. win. And yeah. they got to continue now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not only is it a win over a tournament team in Oklahoma, it's a blowout win over a tournament team in yes. Oklahoma. And they had a blowout win over a tournament team on the road in Lubbock. Uh, against Texas Tech less than two weeks ago. And once again, they were right there with Baylor. They were in control of most of that game. So they, they've they got it right now. But we'll see if uh, it carries over into the postseason. Now the real basketball starts. Once again, Texas K-State Wednesday in what's technically the second round of the Big 12 tournament. You'll have the four lowest seeds play tomorrow. And then uh, I guess, what is it, the Second round, it's not the quarterfinals yet, just the second round of the tournament is when Texas will open up play in that 7-10 matchup against K-State. Okay, we'll get back into Texas basketball a little bit later. How about that baseball team? Give me that Give me that series. That's all I want, win the series. 
That's all I was asking for a Friday. Nothing more. I didn't need a sweep. Well, you know, we'll, we'll start off our Texas baseball conversation with some not so wise words from Texas Tech football coach Joey McGuire. I'm telling y'all right now, the country's going to find out everything runs through Lubbock. Everything runs through Lubbock. Back to high school, Joey. Come on. Give me, give me that speech. I'm not jumping up and down for that. These guys in the background, they really didn't want to do anything. You see the guys that were standing behind them? They're like, should we jump up and down, coach? What should we do? He should have told those players what to do. Other guys in the foreground over there, you could hear them trying to – guys beside him weren't really riled up about that. About that. Because it no. doesn't go through love. They understand that. The players themselves know. Coach, well, we, it doesn't go through here. We found out in the fall that uh, Big 12 football does not run through Lubbock. No. And we found out over the weekend here in the oh. spring that Big 12 baseball does not run through Lubbock. Oh, no. We found that out, too. Neither, because Texas baseball did take two of three against your mark U over the weekend, and they needed it. There's a four-game losing streak going into Friday. About 22 runs for Texas in that series opener. 22 to eight, the final score. Texas had 22 hits, four home runs, two grand slams. Rylan Galvan and the true freshman Will Gasparino both hit salamis on Friday. Man. Game was actually four to four. At one point, and then Texas put up seven in the fourth and then five in the fifth to take over and not look back. This baseball a, team can score runs. They can. Yeah, and that's a small ballpark, too. So it's pretty easy to score in Lubbock. And even though it was kind of cold on Friday night, uh, the Texas baseball team, yeah, it was a full power display on Friday. That was great to see. They lost on Saturday, 7-2. to two. So yesterday was a big game, right? Like Absolutely. Hey, Score 22 ones on Friday, that's great. But if you lose the next two, you lose the series, and then it's like, okay, you don't really care that much about that Friday performance. So they needed to find a win in the rubber game yesterday, and they did. And it was not easy. They were down three to nothing in the first inning. They were down five to two at one point. They were down six to three at one point and came from behind to get a nine to seven win. Uh, Max Ballou, huge weekend for him, four for five yesterday, a homer and a couple of doubles. I think Gage Bohm was the uh, the story for Texas coming out of the bullpen, nice. pitching the last four innings of the game, giving up just one run. So Tech's offense had some success early uh, against you know the Texas starter and against some of the other Texas bullpen arms. But Gage Bohm came in and kind of shut the door over those last four innings to give the Texas offense a chance to come back, and they did just that. Jared Thomas, Peyton Powell, big days for them as well. So, yeah, much needed for David Pierce, much needed for the Texas baseball team, and they start off conference play with a road series victory. I like that. That's all I was looking for. I wasn't looking for anything more than that. I wouldn't look at – or anything less either. They did. They needed to win the series on the road, and they did just that. That's That was a good team that they played against. You know, putting up that that amount of runs, that's that's a big – that's a nice weekend. If you even that out in three games, that would have been a nice – those have been nice runs to just, you know, on average, you know, and obviously they pitched pretty well in that, in that third game. So that first game, wow. 22 runs, 22 runs. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. I mean, they jumped out to a four, nothing lead in the top of the first and then they gave it up, right. It was four to four. And it's like, ah, shoot, like we are really yeah. about to waste this. But uh, now once again, back to back innings, Texas scoring seven in the fourth and then five in the fifth. Uh, and I was still a little nervous, like, uh, with this bullpen in that ballpark and Texas Tech's offense has been one of the best in college baseball in yep. the early stages of the season. It's like, okay, maybe maybe this isn't completely done just yet. But, no, nah, Texas was able to step on Tech's throats in that Friday game. And then Saturday was a dud. Uh, but once again, series wins. We do not complain about series wins no. on this show. And no. to get a road series win over anybody is good. But Texas Tech was ranked number 17 in the country. Like, that's a ranked road series win against a rival. You love to see it. And how about what Texas has done to Texas Tech this year? I mean, in football, beat them by 50. I know they split in basketball, but the last ever game in Lubbock and the last ever matchup between these two teams, Texas dominated. And then in baseball, the last ever series between UT and Texas Tech, uh, the Longhorns win a series in Lebuttics. Very so, nice. Yeah, not uh, not too shabby. It appears that the country has not found out that everything runs through Lubbock because that is not true. It does not run through Lubbock, Coach. I'm in sorry. The, in the words of Maury Povich, the lie detector determined that that was a lie. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So nice win for Texas baseball. And look, they've got a chance here. Like the next 10 games for the Longhorns are all here in Austin. And Texas has been very good at the dish. I know they lost their most recent home game to AM last Tuesday, but Texas is seven and two in Austin this season. Their next 10 games are all at the dish, and it's against inferior competition, right? They've no got SEC Incarnate. teams in there anywhere. No, no SEC teams in there, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, they got Incarnate Word tomorrow. Then they dip out of conference play this weekend. They will host Washington for three games. Hopefully can avenge uh, some losses from the football team. Then they've got Air Force in the midweek next week. Then Baylor for a weekend series. And then AM Corpus for a midweek game. So there you go. Yeah, the next 10 games here in Austin, the Longhorns won't play a road game until March 28th, 17 days from now. The next time the uh, Longhorns will suit up away from UFCU Dish Falk Field. So a chance to put together a nice little run here. For a lot of guys to get some opportunities here too. Yeah, yeah, those midweek games especially. Yeah, um, yeah chance for some of the younger guys to get some playing time. And look, we said it going into last week, right? Texas needed to go at least two and two against AM and Texas Tech. Obviously, you would have preferred 3-1 and one or 4-0, and oh, but anything worse than 500, then the calls for David Pierce's head would have been even louder. I think, uh, look, I, uh, one weekend is not going to change no. people's thoughts on the head coach, but I didn't see as many hate tweets towards David Pierce yesterday as I did on uh, Tuesday night following that loss to the Aggies. So I think he's calmed the masses a little bit with what they just did in lobotics yeah you throw 22 on somebody yeah that's going to calm them down a little bit you know that'll that'll get them all fired up and toasted up for the weekend they can go drinking and you can go coach baseball that's good it's uh, a good way to start the players can drink or the fans can drink the fans can go drink all during the weekend oh, they the would do that anyways coach. coach can go coach yeah you drink to celebrate or you drink to forget if you're a texas <laughs> baseball fan there's always a reason to have a cold one and uh yeah Texas baseball, especially our friends out in Occupy left field, they uh, always know how to have a good time. You said softball had a win, too, had a series win? Yeah, we got some giveaways today. So softball was actually upset on Friday. They lost at Houston in the series opener, which you know, Texas was number one in the country on a couple softball of Softball running games. through Houston, Cougarville? Well, Not they got quite, some Cougars huh? down there now. There's Cougar a few down, down there, actually. Cougars yeah. down there in yeah, Houston. Yeah, yeah. So that was a bit of a surprise, but uh, the Horns bounced back and they won Saturday and Sunday to win that series. So thanks to our friends at Cabo Bob's, we've got some giveaways today, Buck. I'm going to be giving away two $50 gift cards to Cabo Bob's. Very nice. That's right. Whenever the baseball team wins a weekend series, we do a giveaway. Whenever the softball team wins a weekend series, we do a giveaway, which means when both teams win their weekend series, we do two giveaways. There's my UT education coming Is through. Is that a right randomizer there. deal, or you just picked that? The randomizer's back, baby. It's ready to go, huh? It's ready to go. There it's you been go. Working. Stay in there, randomizer. Try come to there. get out? Don't Stay come out there. yet. We don't need you just yet, all right? Relax. Oh, God. Whoa. Just keep scary. the randomizer in, man. It's getting scary over here. Scary hours. The randomizer will be making a return. If you want to be entered into either of those Cabo Bob's giveaways. Hell, we'll do one today and one tomorrow. What do you nice. say? All right, so if you want to be entered into today's giveaway, all you got to do is hit us up on the code of text line, 512-222-9328. Or if you're watching on YouTube, just leave a comment and you'll be entered to win. It doesn't matter what you say. There's no keyword or anything like that. Obviously, no purchase necessary. Uh, you just send us a text. You send us a comment on YouTube and you will be entered in to our Cabo Bob's gift card contest. Can't wait to talk to Rodney at the end of the show, find out where NASCAR is up to, because, you know, boogity, 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 let's go racing. We're coming to Austin here soon. The end of the month, two weeks, huh? Two weeks. Nice. Yep, NASCAR will be coming to Coda. What, two weeks from yesterday is the big race. Wow. And, uh, yeah, fun race yesterday. Congrats to Christopher Bell on winning the Shriners race yesterday. Yeah, I was watching some NASCAR. What? What about it? Drinking all stat and drinking and watching NASCAR? Absolutely. Wow. What a Sunday right there. Oh, yeah. That's how it's done. You had it all, you, and you didn't get any rest, though. You didn't sit back like I did and get engulfed by the couch. 
although I was outside, I was a yard dog yesterday, overdoing it, not drinking water, just moving stones, getting yelled at for moving stuff that I shouldn't be moving. How'd you, get one, how'd you get one of those young boys to move that? They're not going to move that shit. They're paying them too much. They're, that was an impression of your wife right there. Nope, their parents pay them just to go away, just to leave them alone. They don't have to do any work. Kids these days, you know what I'm saying? Hey, Dad, I need 100 bucks. Here, just leave me alone. Here's a hundy. Do you want me to do anything? No, I just want you to get away from me. Here's a hundy. Go away. That's, that's not what works. happens. That is what happens now. Well, that's Lakeway or Westlake money, I guess. That's. I, I guess I didn't piss my dad off enough to get that treatment. Oh, you, you don't get. You never got that treatment where here. Just get out of here. Yeah, he'd, he'd maybe pay me to do some. Yard- nah, he wouldn't even pay me for that. The only the only time I remember getting paid by my old man for like chores around the house is when I painted the fence. Oh my god! And he got, dude, he got such a good deal on that deal. He paid me five hundred. I was in high school. I'm like five hundred bucks. Hell yeah, to paint my fence, dude. It, I mean, well, a, a company would have charged like five grand for that shit. Let me ask you this. Was he out there or did he just leave you alone or was he out there? Was he being a foreman? Well, I, I tried to use a sprayer and you know, one of oh. those like the machines and I sprayed it over the fence and it went all over uh like some cement we had in our backyard. My dad was pissed. Oh I just wasn't paying attention at all. I was just shooting the gun, like, oh, this shit's easy. Marking territory back there, graffiti, doing all yeah. that stuff behind the house. And then after right. that happened, he's like, You're done with this machine, you're bringing out the brush. Oh, the brush. That oh, was it work. Took, it took forever. Yeah, it woke up early, like every every day. You know, I had to do it before the sun came up. Oh, yeah. Before it got too hot. And I was in Dallas. Obviously, it was hot as hell there. And, uh, yeah, I think it was 500 bucks for that. Once again, I thought I was rich at the time. And then I, like, got a little bit older and realized that, no, I, I should have charged my dad, like, 10, 10 times deal. that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You but find I was never, the real paint with the real guys would charge for that? The real guys, the real guys who would really the real painters. That's that's not what the former president would call them. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, they would have been a couple of grand at least, at oh, least. Boy. Yes, but it was it was good character building. But no, my my uh, my parents. I'm sure they wanted me to leave a lot, but they never told me like, here, get out of the house. Here's a hundred bucks. Is that that actually happens? Yeah, it happens. Come on, yeah. listen. You, no, I don't want you. No, I don't want you to do that. No, you don't have to do that. Here, take a hundred and just leave me alone. Don't ask me anything else. Just quit asking me for stuff. Here's a mm-hmm. hundred. Go do something with your Game Boy or something or whatever you got going okay, on. Okay, that's definitely not being said anymore. <laughs> no, go do something with your Game Boy. <laughs> the kids these days don't know what a Game Boy is. Did okay. you ever have one of those, BK? I did, yeah. Oh, pe- people my age know what a Game Boy is, but people. Not the buck, Buck never. No. Once again, another another piece of mechanical equipment. Buck never touched. Well, no yeah. thanks. That's because you were playing with a Model T or something back in the day. That was what? your your toy that you had. I was going fishing down the creek looking for crawfish and water moccasins during those times when kids were in the house playing with their Game Boy. And their Rubik's Cube and all that crap. You probably had one of those silly ass things too. God, the Rubik's Cube. Did you ever try to mess with that thing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but like, I mean, everybody has. I never owned one. I never enjoyed one. Like, I, I don't like I don't like using my brain, okay? Especially outside of business hours. I don't want to play games that require brain usage. And I think the Rubik's Cube does. Kind of require you to think. That's why I had the Duncan, the Duncan yo-yo and the slinky. That's you didn't have to do anything brain power wise to do that. Those were the new inventions when you were a kid, a slinky and a a, yo-yo. I was a yo-yo king. I was a yo-yo master. I could walk the dog, rock the baby. I could do all that stuff. There you go. Yeah, man. When's the last time you've yo-yoed? It's been a while. Been a while, but not that long ago. I mean, I had a yo-yo. I picked up one and threw it around. You know, around the world and all that stuff with it. Make that thing, bake the baby, you know, rock the baby, make the thing sleep and then wake it up. I was, I do it. I did all those tricks with the Duncan yo-yo. I don't remember the make the baby trick. And I'm here to tell you right now, if your pickup line involves a yo-yo, you're not going to be making any babies. (laughs) I used to walk the dog with the yo-yo, hit the ground and the thing was walk across the room. Yeah. I did all those tricks, man. Man. I had the Duncan yo-yo. I had the yo-yo that lit up at night. Cut the lights off and get it going. 
Nice. There you we, go. We had, uh, God, in PE class, in elementary school, we had yo-yo days. Get out of here. No, real oh, thing. Keeps keep, keep the kids healthy? I guess so. Yo-yo, yo-yo, yo-yo. Remember doing that? And cup stacking. You're, you're No way you're old, or young enough for cup stacking. No, no. That was, a, that was the dumbest shit ever. Cup stacking? Cup stacking. Yeah, you had like these little plastic cups, almost the size of solos, and you would like – how fast you could stack them up into a pyramid and then how fast you could de-stack them. That's worse than my former partner who is at that other station that you can't hear doing something. I don't know what, trying to steal the blitz or whatever. But mm-hmm. other than that, they used to play this game nuts up. He told me where they'd go to the pool and they'd, you know, all the guys would line up in the wall with their backside and you'd take a wet tennis ball and you get to chuck it at them from behind. You know, they were trying to hit them in the, they should be hitting them in the, the rear end. But it's called like nuts up, and they would get you under the undercarriage with a wet tennis ball. Some what? kind of weird game. Yeah, I never heard of that. I never played that. Not that's, not played. A, that's not a game. That's assault. <laughs> yes. you, just, you just throw yeah. a tennis ball at I'm, some guy's nuts? I'm playing Marco Polo thinking that that's cool. They're playing nuts up in Houston. I'm like, wow, that's these nuts. <laughs> that just seems that seems a little different. Nuts up, you know. Yeah. Nothing like getting hit it. under the other undercarriage with a wet bathing suit on and a wet tennis ball. Yow. Yeah. Wet tennis ball, dry tennis ball. I don't want any part of that. All right? <laughs> no. I'm not trying to get nut shotted by anyone or anything. That's ever. Give me, ever. A, Rub- give me a Rubik's cube over that crap. God. I did a, yeah. Rubik's cube. No, didn't do that. Didn't have mm. a Game Boy. Had a yo yo. Had a slinky. That was the dumbest. Yeah, that was the dumbest thing of all. I used to watch the Slinky go down the steps and stuff. That was weird. Goodness gracious! All right. Well, it's I don't know how we got there, but uh, you did. I'm glad we did. Before we shift gears, I got to show you this Kim Mulkey video. Uh oh. From that fight in the LSU South Carolina SEC championship game yesterday, uh, and then Kim Mulkey had some pretty strong comments in her post-game press conference. But before we get to that, we also have some Texas football to discuss. Let's uh, let's give another shout-out to another great sponsor, Buck. How about our good friend, Dr. Greg Eckert? Love Dr. Eckert. You know, I've got a, I've got a little something-something in my tooth here, and I keep on digging and digging around, but I need to get a teeth cleaning. He does all of that because he does general dentistry. He also does the most advanced work, and that's restoring teeth. Folks, I had my teeth restored in just two visits with the good doctor. And I'll tell you, I couldn't be happier, but that was about six years ago. Find out if you're a candidate, though, for veneers or dental implants by giving them a call at 512-345-3166. The good doctor would love to take on you as a new patient for 2024. Now, folks, she's done over 1,500 cases of restoring teeth, over 28 years of service in Central Texas. Nobody does it better. And if you've got dental anxiety where you're really scared to go to the dentist, you big baby, Don't be scared. He's the guy that you want to see. If you need IV sedation in order to have all these things done, he will do that to you because he knows your dental health is important to your general health. He's our doctor. Should be your doctor also. Dentist or doctor? Dentist or doctors too to me. I I call him Doc Ecker. Yeah, we're supposed to call him doctors, but I don't know if I'm going to doc you if I break my arm, you know? No, no, he doesn't do that. Now, he can give you that IV sedation if need be, though. If that arm is jacked up, or if you just need some good sleep. I need a nap today. I'm going to go to Doc <laughs> News office and get sedated. I just sit there and just lie there in the chair and sleep. Yeah. Like uh, one of his assistants will walk in and be like, oh, does he need to be worked no. on? Doc, no, he's good. He's just, he's taking a nap here. Yeah. He's, this this is post all that nap now. Oh my gosh. Shout out to Doc U. Also shout out to CentexTickets.com. If you're looking for tickets to any event here in Austin or anywhere in the country. Yeah, you can get those tickets at CentexTickets.com. Of course, NASCAR at Coda two weeks from now. If you want to be there, you can get those tickets at CentexTickets.com. All the great concerts coming our way. You can find some South by tickets, I'm sure, on CentexTickets.com too. Any live event, they've got you covered. 100% guaranteed tickets. You get them right from your phone or your computer. It's so easy to use. Shop local. Shop CentexTickets.com. Also, shop 7-Eleven. Oh, yeah. 
We love some 7-Eleven. I need some 7-Eleven pizza in me today. Wow. I think it's time, Buck. Yeah, you've been messing around with the rollers, touching everything that everybody else touches. They don't touch the pizza. I don't believe. They're in the little boxes there mm-hmm. inside inside the oven there. The rollers, you get to put your fingers on, don't you? you like I, I, I use the tongs. Oh, really? You do? I do it right. I use the tongs to grab the roller and put them into the little bag so there's no hand-to-hand contact. And then just to be safe, when I get home after leaving 7-Eleven, I spray the roller with Lysol to make sure. <laughs> no, no. Before you leave the 7-Eleven, you give it a little split. That's wrong. They don't want no. to put Lysol on there. Well, just to make sure nobody else's hands are still on there. Come on, construction guys. Yeah, worried about that. Love 7-Eleven. If you need the, the pizza today, the donuts today, the rollers, the, the coffee, the drinks, the pre they got everything. I don't need to tell you all what's at 7-Eleven because you've been there and you should keep going there because they are the best convenience store in the world. Make sure you have that 7-Eleven app to cash in on the 7 Rewards program. You're missing out if you're not on that app. Love Ashish, love Wendy, love all of these 7-Elevens all over the state of Texas. They have you can been find uh, your Olipop there too, by the way. I had a little Olipop this weekend, but yesterday I did not. I did not have enough to drink. And boy, did I feel it in the middle of the night. Whew. It was not good for me. Did not have enough. Olipop would have been a perfect drink for me out there working, doing my yard dog work as I was yesterday, lifting up. BK, I was lifting up stones and and then they were they were to the point where I couldn't lift them anymore. I started to roll them to spots. And I am getting just hammered my wife said do you would you like something to drink you know what i said no i'm good mm. and, yeah, you could get fooled because it wasn't that hot yesterday but the sun was still out and if yes, you're out well, working you, you you dehydrate pretty quick scarecrows they do they you get dehydrated really quickly if you're a scarecrow now round shoulder people can you know they have enough within their their stuff because they have stuff round shoulder people fat what is that what you're insinuating when you say round-shouldered? I no, their shoulders are just round. They have more liquid that they can hold. They can hold bot in their body. They can hold more water. That's what I'm saying. Water weight. That's what it is, right? Water weight. That's accurate. Yeah, I think that's and an of accurate course, statement. Scarecrows, we don't have that much, so you got to keep drinking and drinking and drinking. You know, I found that out during the summer last summer when I was having amnesia, trying to figure out how can I get home from the airport. How do I find my way home? Because, oh, you didn't have enough water there, Scarecrow. Mm. How about a little fire, Scarecrow? <laughs> Is your <laughs> wife calling you Scarecrow now? Oh, she's she does. She was. I don't like that. I don't uh, like that. She's I love how it, on that. It, it, in the span of three days, you went from the big man big to the man, Scarecrow. I know. I know. And this is called- your fault. You. This is a self-appointed nickname, the Scarecrow. And you keep calling yourself that, so now it's going to stick. Dude, when I went from when I went from one day I was 155 to 149.4, I'm like, wow, Scarecrow, how did that happen to you? Mm. You know what? That's that lack of sugar. So maybe I need to get a little bit of sugar in my britches again. You know what I mean? Probably not. No, okay. I need to get a little bit more sugar in my diet. So you know that that cake of hers, her birthday cake is still in there. She said, no, grandson has a birthday on Wednesday. She goes, There'll be cake there. Okay. I was like, are you going to re-gift the cake? No. For your grandson? She, she, you, the other, last week when you said, give that frozen cake to the homeless, they'll eat it. Maybe yeah. the, the dirty little homeless girl over there at McDonald's. Maybe I should see if she's still hanging around there. Dirty. Oh, she was filthy. What but, did y'all get into? No, she's just dirty. Face oh. You know, oh, cake. okay. Like smells and is not clean. All right. I was like, I did not, no, don't say that. If she hears that. She may be listening. I never said she smelled. She did not have a, a, she did not have any, there was no odor to her. She didn't, she was just had dirt on her face. Well, you, I didn't, I never said she stank. You but, just said you did the dirty with her. So I wasn't sure what you were talking about. Dude, if she's got splotches of dirt on her face, that's a dirty girl. She's dirty. She was dirty. Like in that sense of being filthy, dirty, you know what I mean? But I didn't, she was not odiferous. I did not have an, there was no odor coming from her. So okay. But I should take that cake over. I bet you I can find her. And I would offer her that cake, and 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 she would say, "No, do I look like I need a cake?" Everybody I just need needs cake. No, no, no. She would probably want a hug again, and I would have to say, 
Sorry, filthy little homeless girl. I don't do hugs. She Sorry. wants to she wants to touch your cake, I think. No, she doesn't get a hug. Mm. Old Uncle Buck. That's still not happening. Yep. Because yeah, you not- hate the homeless and you hate women. So oh my God. I don't I don't do touching. No. No. Some okay. of them they may have lice. They may that's true. That is very true. I don't want those lice jumping on me. Hey, speaking of the women, shout out to the Texas women's basketball team. They are in the Big 12 tournament semifinal. Nice. They will take on Kansas State at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, Texas, the two seed. K-State, the three seed. The Longhorns got a first round bye. They took care of Kansas on Saturday. Kind of weird. They didn't, they didn't play any games yesterday, which is uh, unique. You usually don't see an off day in conference tournaments like that. But uh, the Texas women will be back at it this afternoon. Once again, if they beat K-State today, they will be in the final of the Big 12 tournament. And I think that game will be tomorrow. But, uh, yeah, the Longhorns could not win the regular season title. They lost that heartbreaker in Norman to end the year. Also got shafted by the refs in that one. Uh, I don't know who said that. But uh, we'll see if they can win the conference tournament on their way to the NCAA tournament. I think the women are probably locked into a two seed. Maybe they could be a one in the big dance if they win the Big 12. Yeah. But I think win or lose at this point, Texas is more than likely a two seed in the NC2A tournament when the women's bracket comes out next Monday. So, um, yeah, we'll be pulling for the Longhorns. We'll be watching today. Hopefully they can, once again, get one win closer to a Big 12 title tournament title on their way out the door to the SEC. Very nice. Speaking of women's basketball, I got to show you this. So this is a little – Dual action going on here. So the top of the screen, you will see and hear LSU women's basketball coach Kim Mulkey at her post-game press conference talking okay. about a little bit of a brawl that took place towards the end of the LSU South Carolina women's basketball game, the SEC championship yesterday. Oh, no, that's oh. not what I meant to put up there. Wow. Why would well, you do that? About Doppelganger right there, Cruella DeVille and Kim Mulkey. Man. They don't look yeah. anything alike. They, they look like identical twins, Buck. <laughs> they just found each other after uh, decades of being separated. So that's the top half of the screen. The bottom half, you actually will see the brawl itself and what took place on the court. But uh, here's a little bit of Kim Mulkey from her post-game press. No one wants to be a part of that. No one wants to see to, to see that ugliness, but I can tell you this. I wish she would have pushed Angel Reese. Don't push a kid that you six eight. Don't push somebody that little. That that was uncalled for, in my opinion. Let those two girls that were jawing let them go at it. Yeah, let them go at it. That's right, Coach. How about Kim Mulkey? Like she started off that bite by saying. Yeah, that's bad. Nobody wants to see that. That's and then she started coach getting speech. going. Yeah, and she's like, "Shit, make it a fair fight. Put our six eight girl against her six eight girl and see what happens. Let him go." Wow, she's, she's promoting fighting. Come on, Kim. Hey, you you start it, we'll finish it. Another reason why I'm scared of her. She's just like, no, yeah, she shouldn't have done that. That was a cheap shot. That situation never should have occurred. She's like, no. She should have fought somebody else instead. We wish we had our best ready to go at her. Angel Reese would have been ready to go. Let's go. That's not that's not what you get from the coach that much. Is she fought the wrong player? Well, maybe we need more of that. Come on now. Know, it was the biggest story in women's sports from the weekend. Six players ejected from that game yesterday. Now that doesn't carry over. That doesn't carry over to tournament play. I don't think so. Um yeah, I, I mean, I guess there's a way the NCAA will go back and they can look at that incident and see if anybody deserves more of a punishment, but it's not like it's more pushing than actual throw throw downs. Yeah. I mean, there was a little bit of a flop too by the LSU player on the initial shove. I'll sh- I'll show it again. No one wants to be a part of that. No one wants to see to to see that ugliness. But I can tell you this. I wish she would have pushed Angel Reese. Don't push a kid that you six eight. Don't push somebody that little. That that was uncalled for, in my opinion. Little guard, that's right. Listen, listen to the little guard talk right there. 
Don't push. Don't do that. Kim Mulkey would have gone down there and bit her right in the kneecap. <laughs> Back in the day when she was playing, she, she's gone right for that knee. What is she, Sorry, Dan Campbell? She's playing for the Lions now? Oh, yeah. She'd have munched right on that kneecap. Hunched. Yeah, her and Don Staley, that would have been a wow one if they, those two got loose. Oh. Because Don Staley has that mean look. she got a mean grimace on her face, man. Yeah, she doesn't mess around either. No, those two going after it. That's what, I, that's what we should have seen. Oh, coach fight. Yeah, why, why not? Come on let now. The, let the coaches drop the gloves and get after one another, huh? I didn't see them. They kind of stayed away. Yeah. You know why? Because that was good of Kim Mulkey. That's right. That's how. That's being ladylike. Kim Mulkey was too busy punching some guy in the stands. <laughs> Who said something? She yeah. went straight up to the stands. She went, she went Ron Artest and jumped into the crowd. Oh, and my goodness. Took down the wrong dude. Wow. Yeah. So I like, I mean, the LSU, look, th that game was chippy. I watched some of it. I read about some of it. The game was pretty chippy throughout. It was physical. There was a lot of back and forth jawing uh, throughout the contest. But in that cut, like the LSU player started this. And why the South Carolina player went after that LSU player instead of Angel Reese was because that LSU player just pushed the South Carolina girl. The girl was standing up for her teammate. So what, she's supposed to like run, not push that girl. She's supposed to run and find Angel Reese and push her. I'm not putting up for the girls. I'm putting up for the coach. You know that. My worry is about Kim Mulkey getting hurt, getting hit in her face, or something happening to her. The girls can take care of themselves. I'm worried about the coach. Okay. Yeah. You're worried about your hall pass. Nothing can That's, happen to you. Can't hurt her. Although that look that you. Oh, that look, the two side-by-side -side look that you threw up there, just not right of you. You just – I guess beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Is that how that works? Uh, she's not beauty regardless of whose eyes are beholding it. <laughs> I'll go ahead and say that. Here's what she was rocking yesterday, by the way. You didn't get to see the uh, the sleeves. You've got – Oh, I, mean, I see that. That pom -pom? looks like the scare scarecrow sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> she replaced the cuffs with pom poms on that sh on that jacket. That's not a good look. Oh, you're not a fan of this one? No, that looks like she can wash the windows with that deal. <laughs> Spray the Windex and then use that as a <laughs> towel. Yeah. Like she gets into her car and gets the windshield before she gets out. She starts to drive. That's not a good look. Mm. Well, that's what she was Man. wearing yesterday. She can wear whatever she wants. That's what I'll say. You know. I would not be want to be an official in one of her games. No, I wouldn't either. She is nonstop in your face. She yells, she claps, she stomps, everything. Terrifying. I don't know about all that. She's just a lovely female. She is a female. I will <laughs> say that. I don't know if I'd use the word lovely. Okay, before we get into some Texas football here, we've got some jersey numbers to talk about, some updates to the official uh -oh. Texas football roster. Of course, spring ball gets going a week from tomorrow. So the uh, UT students and most students are on spring break this week. Yep. There's obviously no practice going on. Uh, Steve Sarkeesian and company decided to wait till after spring break to start. I think he's break. done that since he's been here, right? That's yeah. his deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's weird. Like some schools have already started their, their spring practice and they'll take a break midway through for spring break. But yeah, Texas goes a little bit later. They will start next Tuesday, the 19th. And, of course, the spring game is April 20th. Uh, yes, 420 for those of you keeping track at home. We'll get to that in a second. But first, how about a word from our great friends over at Covert Bee Cave? Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert Bee Cave. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much, folks. Indeed. Also, some love to Woods Comfort Systems. My heater kicked on overnight. Got a little cool last night. A little chilly over the yeah, weekend. Yeah, I, I was more in the air-conditioned mode last night. Yeah, I didn't it's want it. It's cool this morning again. Yeah, it is a little cool this morning, but, you know, 
whatever. If you've got a Woods Comfort System unit, you're covered. You don't have to worry about that. That's right. Whether it's the heat or the AC, and it's about to be all AC, we know that, uh, Woods Comfort Systems has your back. They are dedicated to keeping you comfortable in your home all year round, and they've been in business here in Central Texas for almost 70 years that's right. These guys are not fly by night. You see some of those trucks riding around. It's like, oh, another new HVAC company. Those guys don't know what they're doing. Woods Comfort Systems, they know what they're doing because, once again, they've been at it for longer than Bucky's been alive, I think. Or at least no, close. around the same time, 68. Yeah, around the same time. Well, yeah, the Bucks old as shit. Woods Comfort Systems, they are old. You don't last that long unless you know what you're doing and unless Absolutely. you take care of people. The buck can uh, attest to it. He's got a Woods Comfort Systems unit at his place. They will take care of you. Just go online to their website, woodscomfortsystems.com, to find out more information. Or, of course, you can give them a call as well, 512-842-5066. It's Woods Comfort Systems, where comfort is our middle name. You got any any bands that you're going to see this week? For South By? South By, you're going to head downtown for some stuff? You don't go to this crowded down there, isn't it? Yeah, man. Like I'll, I'll probably end up going to something, but most of my South by days are behind me. Like in college, I loved going to South by and right after college, I loved going to South by, but the older I get, the less I enjoy crowds and lines. Lines. That's what it is. It's lines. Like- lines is what kills me, man. Like I, I'm, I'm a very patient person. At least I'd like to think so, but I just, I don't want to deal with lines. I mean, nobody likes dealing with lines, but there's just so much to do in in Austin to where it's like, I can go somewhere without a line and still have a really good time. Yeah, you're right. So, you know, South by there's some free stuff, uh, but if you don't have a badge or a wristband, that's the deal, the badge, huh? Yeah. You're going to be waiting a long time and there's some bands or some comedians or some events that I think are worth that, but it's, you know, I just, I'd rather no, go. Not to, worth it. It's not worth it. You're not, not scared. I'll, I'll go to a bar. Like I got invited to something. There's a concert on Friday night. Could have gone. It's like, no, I'll just go have some old stats at a bar somewhere with some friends instead and not have to stand outside for two hours in downtown. Oh, Thank no. you very much. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm out on that. What about you're not going to any South by stuff, are you? No. Okay. So, no, maybe. no, no. I only go to concerts that I can sit down at. Yeah, sitting is nice. I'm at that age now. I don't stand. I went to a, a taping of ACL Live um, probably three years ago, and that was Paul Simon. And, I, I mean, I, when, when you go to ACL Live, you see the people dancing in front and stuff for like two hours or so. I'm like, how do they do that? Well, they got young legs. I got to go sit in the bleachers. That's mm-hmm. right. I just, I just don't stand for concerts. I'm, you know. The GA seats, yeah, not your yeah. thing. You yeah, I mean, to... no, I'll give you a standing ovation for about a minute and then I'll sit back down. Let's yeah. roll. I'm not standing up. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that. How was that show? Paul Simon was great, really. Yes, Paul Simon was great. He played a lot of stuff from his album Graceland and he had a bunch of the, the band. You're talking about bandsmanship, it was unbelievable. The musicians were incredible. You can call me Al. Did you call him Al? Yeah, I played that. Played it all. Good. And he's living right down here in Wembley. Is he? Yeah. I, can you hear me right now? I can. Well, I, I, I could hear you, but I couldn't. You froze there. Your okay. face. I, I was like, I froze and my internet said not responding. And I'm like, uh-oh, this could be really bad here. But oh, I no, think no, we're... you're good. You're good to go. Yeah, Paul Simon lives down in Wembley. Nice. Okay. He and E.D. Brickell. Is that it? That's his wife, is Edie Burkell. She used to be with the New Bohemians back in the day. Check Gigi that out. You, probably never, you never probably listened to Edie Burkell. I don't, I've never heard that name before. That's a real person. That's his wife. Oh, well, that is, he's not attracted to balloons like that guy we had last week. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, he is not. That oh, sick God. son of a gun. Yeah, wow, that was, pretty, that was pretty sick. I concur. Yeah, it was a sick uh, year. Any? Uh, did you watch Austin FC? Michael's asking. They they drew on Saturday night against St. Louis, two to two. Struggling. They gave up a goal in stoppage time, like the ninety third, ninety fourth minute. 
They were up to one. Looked like they were headed to their first win of the season, and it, it uh, did not. We happen. need to bring them some good mojo. We need to. They need to be involved with us, and us involved with them because they need something going. They've got the big crowds, but there's a certain mojo that they're missing. BK, they just mm-hmm. hadn't been able to take them over the hump, and they'll be looking for a new coach if they if they end up being the way they were last year, not making the playoffs. We'll be careful because we're trying to interview that coach at some point here yeah. soon. So we'll be bashing them too much. Make sure we get to talk to them. But you're right. Now they've uh, they've played three matches, two draws, and a loss to this point. Uh, but yeah, they were close on Saturday. That one stung to give up that equalizer late in the match. But you were obviously still showing up. Up. see him. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Always great crowds at Q2, and I think I think they're home again this weekend against Philly. If I'm not mistaken, I might try to get back out there. For, uh, for this coming match on Saturday. Awesome. Te- Texas football, Buck, we got some roster updates, and we might save some of this conversation for tomorrow, but Texas football, the official roster on texassports.com has been updated for the spring. And one thing that always catches my attention, the single-digit numbers. Those are the most coveted. And you've got to earn a single-digit number anywhere, but especially at a place like the University of Texas. So if a player is awarded a single digit number, that means the coaching staff feels like they've got a chance to do something special. You okay. Gotta some, you got to have some talent. You got to be putting in some work and you've got to have some game. If you're a single digit number guy, I was not a single digit number guy. I wasn't good enough at sports for that, but a few of these really stick out to me about John Tay cook. He'll be rocking the number one next season. So Xavier worthy wore number one last year. And was really good. One of the best players on this team. Potential first-round pick in the NFL draft. Jontae Cook, who has been compared to Xavier Worthy at times. He is getting the number one, which uh, more evidence as to why you should expect a breakout season from Jontae Cook this fall. Yeah, I would expect – yeah, I mean, I expect him to be a big part of this offense and what they do in all kinds of ways, whether it's carrying the ball out of the backfield, you know, sweeps, everything else. They, they'll need him to be something special this year. I, I don't know if they have a lot of special wide receivers, but it seems like a, a lot of folks think this kid is, is the guy. You know, we didn't see much of him because they didn't they, – they stayed with that, that lineup that they had last year. There was a lot of switching in and out. He played every once in a while. He catch a deep, a deep pass, but not a consistent player in that offense last year. And then again, he was just a freshman, so – We'll see. Their expectations are probably really, really high on him. So it'll be interesting to see what he does. My expectations are really high for him, too. And I I honestly think Jontae Cook's going to be so good that there are Texas fans who are mad at Steve Sarkeesian for not playing Jontae Cook more last year, which is crazy because this team had Worthy and Mitchell and Whittington. Like The receiver play was obviously very, very good here. But I think Jontae Cook's going to be so good to where it's like, God, we we couldn't get that guy a few more snaps last year. Well, he, he, he didn't play enough that I don't know how good he is. Sure, I yeah. He, I mean, he only had eight catches last year, so it, it's it's all projection for me. I mean, he was a five star out of high school. It's projection, and it's also just yeah, hearing the insiders and yes. what they have to say, and also hearing you know John Thay Cook's teammates like at the combine, Xavier Worthy and I think Jordan Whittington both were asked questions about like, hey, who's next up at Texas? And they both said John Thay Cook, like they they saw him every single day. And of course, you're going to hype up your teammates. You always sure. will, but I don't think it's lip service with that guy. Like I'm, I think uh, he's going to be a problem for opposing defenses. Yeah, I'll be interested to see what kind of route runner he is. Not just a speed guy that can can beat you deep. You know, yeah. get through the zones and 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 put pressure on your secondary. I want to know can he run routes? Are, are, are his routes precise? Is he going to be in a spot that he's supposed to be in when the quarterback gets ready to throw the ball? That whole group will be under the gun, I believe, this year. You know, we knew you. we knew how good they were last year. We knew how important they were, and they they lived up to it. I just don't know. I don't know sure. because his name is the only name that, that I can recall that's that's a big time player. I know they have some, but we don't know him. We didn't see him, so we'll have to see. Well, yeah, you've got the transfers obviously coming in, and one well, of those transfers is Matthew Golden coming over from the University of Houston. He's going I to be, be in the right place. He's a veteran wide receiver. He, I mean, he knows the game of football. He knows the nuances. So that'll be interesting to see. I don't, I have no problems thinking that that guy's not going to be good. He's been good for four years. So, but I, 
uh, you got to have about four or five of those guys. So who the hell are they? Well, Matthew Golden is downing the number two. That's the number right. that he wore at the University of Houston. But yep. um, yeah, excited about him. He was down at Houston for two years. And you're doubling him up. You're turning him into Brock Cunningham here. He's only been in college for two years. Okay. Um, but I'm with you. I think he's going to be good. Ryan Wingo, the true freshman receiver, getting the number five. Five-star kid out of sure. high school. He could be one of those guys in the mix for serious playing time, even as a true frosh at wide receiver. If he's as good as advertised, one of the top receivers in the class this past year, 6'2", 208 out of the St. Louis area, then, uh, yeah, he could be a weapon for this team. And single-digit number, the coaches are telling you they expect him to be a weapon for this team. And then Isaiah Bond, the Alabama transfer, number seven. That'll be his number. That's the guy, right? Like Yes. He's if you had to pick, we haven't even started spring ball yet, let alone gotten close to the actual season. But if you had to pick like a number one receiver for Texas right now, it would be Isaiah Bond because of what he did in Tuscaloosa. That's your deal. Oh, yeah. Oh, he was a big time player. I mean, he making big catches, big moments, you know, touchdown catches. He seems to have consistent hands. That took a while because he had to get in, in into into the rhythm with his quarterback. But when, you know, when the, when this young quarterback was struggling last year, but they seem to have, have caught on, you know, towards the middle of the season and the end of the season, they were dynamic. Those two are pretty dynamic together. So I'd expect that he's just looking for a guy who can be accurate and get the ball to him. Yep. Yep. I agree. And uh, I think Quinn Ewers, like Jalen Milrow is really good, but I think Quinn Ewers has a better arm. Sure. He's more accurate than Jalen Milrow. So uh, yeah, I think Isaiah Bond's going to be great in this offense and yeah, this, scheme, this, here, this, right? this offensive scheme throwing the ball will be better than what Alabama's did. So I expect them to, to do really well. I expect them all to do well. It's just what level will they be at? You know, we talk about them going into the sec and how good the secondaries and how good the players are there. Everybody's got to be on the same page. You know how that works out. Sometimes it takes a little time and boy, spring is going to be big to these wide receivers here. Last year, they were just so talented you knew they were going to be good. Individuals yeah. were going to be good as a group. But as a group, they ended up being pretty good all the way to the tight end. I expect the tight end group to be good this year again, too. I don't expect to have much drop off at tight end. Well, last year you knew who was starting at wide receiver and you knew who was starting at tight end. Sure. This year this year you don't, right? Like you've right. got a bunch of names. I, like I, I feel good about the position being really good this season. And hopefully Quinn Ewers is even better. So maybe the numbers can look even more impressive for the pass catching group at Texas this year. But last year, it's like, okay, Worthy's a starter. We just got A.D. Mitchell from the two-time defending champion Georgia Bulldogs. He's going right. to be a starter. Jordan Winnington's going to be a starter. Like, boom. Th those are your three guys. Everybody else is playing for fourth place. Tight end, you knew it was going to be Jatavion Sanders, right? Because of the year he had in 2022. Everybody else is trying to be the backup. This year... Yeah, you don't know what it's going to look like. I mean, you, you brought in three transfers with Bond, with Golden, and with Silas Bolden, who's not here yet, coming from Oregon State. And then also, yeah, you've got Jonte Cook, a former five-star. You've got DeAndre Moore. You've got Ryan Niblett. You've got guys who are returning, but they have a combined eight catches to their name in college. And then, yeah, you've got these true freshmen as well coming in, including Ryan Wingo, who we just talked about. You got a lot of bodies, but you just you don't know – who's one, who's two, who's three yet. Right. So you're right. Spring ball is going to be important. Same thing with tight end. Like you've got Gunnar Helm back. He was your number two last year. Okay. Maybe he's number one, or you brought in Amari Nye Black, who was given a single digit number, number eight from Alabama. He could be your guy. So it's, we, we won't be forcing spring football conversation this year. Some years you're forcing it a little bit this year. Oh, there's no. going to be a lot of stuff to be paying attention to. Yeah, and that, that's that's a position, that, especially on the offensive side. We know what we have in the backfield. We know what we have out of the running backs. That's that's a pretty good room, pretty good coach there. We know Chris Jackson's a hell of a coach at the wide receiver position. That's going to be the one that's going to help some of these young guys in a hurry. You know, it won't be it won't be because they they're a year older. It'll be because they've got a pretty good coach there too to help them along the way. I like that fact. Boy, that was yeah. a great pickup by Sark last year. Man. Yeah, right. It was, yeah. Chris Jackson had a tremendous first year as the uh, passing game coordinator and wide receivers coach. Brought him in from the Jacksonville Jaguars, and uh, yeah, that NFL experience paid off because he's yes, it did helping to send three receivers to the NFL this year, and two of them might be first round picks with Worthy and Mitchell. So.
There you go. We'll talk more about uh, some of these roster changes. We've got some weights to get into, including a, a guy who weighed in at more than 370 pounds on this Texas roster. Making Devondre Sweat look a little skinny at that weight, Buck. We'll talk about that and some more Texas football on tomorrow's show. Nice. But it is 10 o'clock. Oh, we got to bring out the randomizer real quick. Bring it out. Hold Where on it? here. Let it, let it out of its cage. I mean, you've been holding it back for a whole morning. Wow. Whoa. Whoa. All right. Come the on. randomizer has spoken. The winner of today's $50 Cabo Bob's gift card is somebody on the Coda text line. A 512 number. That doesn't help very much, does it? No. 0298. Is the winner of today's $50 Cabo Bob's gift card. I'll reach out to that person. We'll be giving away another Cabo Bob's gift card tomorrow. 50 bucks. Shout out Cabo Bob's. Also shout out Texas Baseball and Softball for winning their series over the weekend. We'll be doing that all season long right here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. Two baseball teams feeding the people. Very nice. Absolutely. Feeding the people. I don't know if they'd feed that dirty little homeless girl you're talking about. Do I look like I need a delicious burrito? No. No. No, but I need a hug. I need hey, a chef, hug. I want a hug. And you won't give it to me because you're ruining my life. Chef, hey, chef, give me a hug. Hell no. Chef. Not giving you a hug. No one Ronnie, what chef. do you think of that? What do you think of what do you think of people that instead you offer them a nice lunch, but they said, I don't want lunch. I said, Do you need some money? Do I look like I need money? I need a hug. And I said, Well, I ain't giving hugs. I don't do hugs. What? I'd have been like, let's go to the car. Come on. No, see, let's head out no, to the car. No, I'll can't. give you a hug. No. <laughs> how, see, do, how do people react when you say you're going to give them a hug, though? Like, do people take the hug? No, this little homeless girl and dirty little filthy homeless girl with, like, dirt marks on her face. I mean, she like pig pen from Charlie Brown. Oh, and nice. I said, uh, I said, I, I'll buy you lunch. She goes, do I look like I, do I look like I need a lunch? Do I look like I need money? I said, no, I'm just offering, since you're sitting out here in front of McDonald's, you know, twiddling your thumbs, looking like you were going to ask somebody else for money. She goes, I just need a hug today. And I went, uh, I don't do hugs. Oh, oh, well. <laughs> and BK said, I'm so wrong. There's Wags with that his head down. What do you mean, Wags? What do you, what do you mean? I would have done the same fucking thing. <laughs> I would have so, just kept walking. You put your head I'm down like, that, fuck, what a that's piece before of the days well, of like George Washington for you. I don't have a, a hug for that's you. That's before the fist bump. You could have given her a fist bump. Been like, oh, she would have punched me right in the face. If I put the fist pump out there, I'm sure she would have socked me in the jaw. You've been like Kim Mulkey. And dude, I she came back. Kim to, Mulkey on your ass. Not only that, as I came back the next day to see if she was there, she was there. And I said, how about lunch today? She goes, hey, you're the guy that wouldn't give me a hug. And I said, yeah, I'm the same guy that's not giving you one today either. Because you're wearing the same <laughs> damn shit. <laughs> that's it. Of course she yeah. was. <laughs> you might get stuck to her. It's like no, trying see, to get yourself apart. See it's how, like, see no, how man, I'm. See how they're I'm, treating people, BK? I'm not thinking like that. I just don't hug them. These guys are treating them poorly. Just well, I can't poorly. help it that I say what people think. <laughs> I'd have hugged her. I'd have hugged her. I, I hug anybody. I mean, I'm like always patting people on the back and doing all these different things. You know, I'm not. If she I am said, not like that. That is, right, I'm, I'm, I'm being straight up on the ass, with you right you know? now. I will not do that. You, if if she would ask you for a hug, I, I will help. I will help find shelter and give you money. But I. I mean, if you need help and aid, I'll, I'll administer aid enough, but I'm not just giving you a hug to give you a hug, no. If she went down and she needed mouth to mouth, she's dead, huh? He's you got give him AIDS? He's got AIDs. No, no, no. I, I, I delegate. <laughs> I find somebody. He's got AIDS. <laughs> Big Magic Johnson. What has he done? <laughs> what has he done lately? I mean, serious. Wags, I tell you what. I In Boston, there was a guy who went down at a trolley stop. He got off the trolley. It must have been 1,000 degrees. He took a step off, took one step, and went down. I went over to him and all kinds of stuff was coming out of his mouth. And I was a lifeguard and I had to do the mouth to mouth deal. I, I, I put a, I put the cup with my hand over it. Oh, I would yeah. not go mouth to mouth. I, I, I couldn't do it. When the, when the white stuff started coming out of the side, Rodney, I was like, damn, is this my duty as a lifeguard to put my mouth on his mouth, wipe that <laughs> shit to the side? I wouldn't do it. Now no, roll it, roll them over on your left side, let it, let it all scrape out. And then, <laughs> yeah let the good lord do years something. ago i worked for a company and and yeah years ago i had a real job and um what we we had to do like cpr training 
Yeah. And it was like, uh, at one point they made me the safety director. So I had to go to the, had to go to the CPR training and they're like, you know, teaching me what to do. And I'm like looking at our staff and I'm like, oh, man, who's I, I dead? Who's I, not I, dead? I'm like so, <laughs> Some of these, I had one guy in there. Uh, we had one of the other managers that came in and he goes, I don't know about you. He said, but one of these motherfuckers passes out, they're going to die because I ain't helping them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to I got a nice letter from that guy's wife, though. And I, I helped him. He had he had not only had foam coming from, he had already peed in his pants laying mm. down. And I was like, oh, just oh, I, the person just, in Boston. Yeah, the yeah, okay. I, I know that you don't get a good seal when you did that when I put my hand there, but I just couldn't go mouth to mouth with that dude. I, I just couldn't see myself going after the white foam came out. You yeah, know what I mean? I'm with you. I'm with he, you. You he, ain't gotta he, preach to me, you're preaching to the choir. He had <laughs> He had jizz coming out of his yeah. mouth. Yeah, he had that white creamy stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah, what was it? Oh, what were you doing before? I can't say that. I don't, know where that I, don't, I don't know where that comes up from when you're when something's happening to your body. I've never had it happen to me. I know where it comes out of. So if he had it in his mouth, it's, it's like, I'm like, hey, did right, you see that? Uh, I'm smashed. No, you can't leave us like oh, that. Left you early. can't, the chief you can't leave us like that. In. We got to have a rule. He can't leave us like that. You can't yeah. do that. You can't talk it up like that. Give us mouth to mouth creamy white shit coming out of your mouth and then leave well, us. It I'll tell you what's weird. Like He's talking about creamy white stuff and then he wipes his face and closes the computer. <laughs> he says, I got to go real quick. Something just came up. Okay. Hey. And he had those Kleenex in his hand too. He did. He did. He was. He was. And he was on his way to the bathroom. I'm kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He's probably yeah. on his way. I mean, whenever you get after forty, Rodney will tell you, you got to pee like every ten minutes. So. Yeah, that's true. That's BK's right. got ten more years until you're looking forward to that, buddy. Yeah, I'm gonna go throw up now. There yeah. you go, my yeah. guy. <laughs> All the parts you got. Happy Monday. Hey, man. We started a new week today. It's spring uh, forward. It's spring, it's spring break, my guy. Spring break. Happy um March 11th here. Those of you guys that tuned into the Wagner Wire yesterday it was Happy Mario Day yesterday. So uh, belated Happy Mario Day. If you guys didn't celebrate that, we'll get nerdy and get geeky for you there. Um, also, man, yeah, we just mentioned it's a start of a brand new week. It is spring break. I don't know if the kiddos are home with you or not, but. No, celebrate. Do what you need to do. Welcome to uh, Chaos Theory on Texas Sports Unfiltered. That is my beautiful co-host, Double R, Rodney Rodriguez. I'm Wags, the Wagner Wire. You can find me on oh. Instagram there. And then you can find uh, Rodney on Instagram at the underscore Rodney R. And then uh, on Twitter at the Rodney R. And then you can just find me on Twitter at not the fake Wags. If you are mobile listening to us on that code of text line, 512-222-9328, please do chime in and hit us up. Rodney will read your messages and then all you guys usual suspects and all the cats hit us up on that youtube page that you uh do quite frequently and if you haven't hit the subscribe button please make sure you set you smash that subscribe button and then tell five friends like our guy harge always says over at the zone what's up my guy how you doing how was your weekend how, Man, you, look, you, know, you, look, you know houston didn't do a number on you you look like you're pretty good well actually it, it was one of those things you, you know he had to spring forward and it never it never i thought fails. it was fall back no, spring forward. No, you're right. We lost. We yeah. lost an hour. Yeah. We lost an hour. It should be nine oh nine right now. It, it it never fails that I, I end up at a race event when that happens. And a lot of times at race events, especially when they're here in Texas, um, I'm up at the time of the spring forward, which I was at, at this time uh, this year. So it um you know it's like you literally lose an hour while you're awake. And I woke up yesterday Sorry. morning. Everything was fine, but this morning. It's like, I mean, I wake up and wags. It's like, it's like seven, it 10 dark. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, my body's all not adjusted. And my, 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 my puppy's sleeping with me. Hell, she's not even up. That's my alarm clock. It and it's like, it doesn't bother me that much though. Really? I don't, yeah. I don't know why. Like, I mean, maybe it's cause I don't sleep through the night as it is. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I'm constantly tired, but I mean, uh, I, I don't know. For some reason, even when I w when we get the extra hour, I don't yeah. feel that energized or that engaged. I think it's just because I struggle with sleep. Yeah. Yeah. No, I actually, well, I mean, the game changer for me, I've talked about it on here before. You know, they did that sleep study and put me in a CPAP machine. And it's like, now I go to sleep, dude. And it's like, it's the best sleep I've ever had. Like when I went to Houston, it was an overnight thing. I didn't take you have it to wear the machine every night. You don't have to, but it's a good idea to do it. I mean, oh, it, it, it changes. I don't know. See, changes your didn't life you build a uh, didn't you build um kind of like a reliancy to 
to the machine, right? If you want to have do. a good night's sleep, you no, really do. about that. Have that natural, bro. Have that natural, man. I don't that know. Maybe I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not the guy to ask for modern medicine, though. Yeah, it's it's it, it's really cool. I mean, it's and when you really when you really get in and they explain to you sleep apnea and all this shit, it's scary. And it's like holy smoke. So anyway, but it's all good now. Now I'm awake and rolling. And man, now I'm now I'm all dude. All this free agency. Were you stuff. able to? Well, yeah, I mean, of course, there's free agency news. But were you able to watch any basketball? I mean, uh, we had some pretty saw, damn good I, basketball on Saturday. I saw the second half of the game on Saturday. I saw the 54 point second half, and that was just well, not just. Throttling. I mean, there was all there throttling. was also Kansas and yeah, oh yeah, uh, Houston, yeah, yeah. and then there was also Duke and North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were. We had our hands full with college basketball. I mean, hell, he did. Kansas State, Kansas State taking down Iowa State, and and I think hell, that's, man, Big Twelve. You talked about Big Twelve just beats up on each other, bro. And I think that's a big thing, right? There, right there for Kansas State. And I think now, you know, when we start the Big Twelve tournament on Wednesday, that game for Kansas State against Texas, that's going to be so big, right there. I mean, they, they may be playing to get a to get a bid or, or to get invited. Um, so I think it's going to be pretty massive, um, for Kansas state, cause they're kind of on that list that I've seen where it's like, okay, if, if they can win a couple of games and maybe get to round two of the big 12 tournament, maybe they'll get in, but the Iowa state win bodes extremely well for them. So for me, it's tough to give a, I mean, they're probably going to have to win the conference championship, right? Like, uh, like honestly, like the, the tournament or whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. for me, it's tough to give a team a bid when you have. It, when you're not at least 500 in your conference, I mean, it's tough. Like the like the Longhorns, I, I'm really on on the fence with the Longhorns getting in. The only reason why I would give um, a team that's kind of 500 in the Big 12 is because you're in the fucking Big 12, right? You're in, yeah, you're in the yeah. most yeah. the dominant conference of all college basketball, right? It, it, it just is. You can uh, Big Ten people, you can give me all your hype, you can give me all your your antics about how you guys are dominant. You're wrong. You're 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 lying to yourself. Because you can't lie to the eye in the sky, man. And what we've seen from the Big 12 is dominant basketball all throughout yep. college basketball. So um, Purdue, I, I'm, I'm sure Purdue, you're going to have your your fan base going to sit there. Well, what about us? What about us? All right. Well, uh, you can't go one and done. Th um, I, I, don't, I don't know if it was last year or two years ago, but I think they lost to like the 16. So, um, yeah. I don't know so, if Purdue's trying to repeat that or not, but I I highly I highly doubt it. Have, they have you get seen the uh, Have you first, seen the latest Joe Lenardi uh, bracketology on ESPN? I uh, have not. Um, but also Baylor going down too, man. So Texas Tech, uh, being able to beat Baylor, yeah. Um, uh, the, of course, it's just shaking up. We'll see how it, how it pans out here, but um, yeah. well, and that, yeah, big that's big days on Saturday, happen. Rodney. Big games, man. Um, North Carolina. North Carolina going into in the Cameron M door, man, may have been able to take that down. And then, of course, Houston. I told you it was going to be a different story with Houston going up to Fall Gallon and then having um, uh, Kansas come down to uh, to fill or Fertilla, right? Mm -hmm. Am I saying that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Tillman Fertitta, sorry, Fertitta, Fertitta um, Arena. So, I look, that would Houston be a lot proven closer. that they are the best team in college basketball or giving you an argument why they should be an overall number one going into this college uh march madness tournament man i'm excited dude uh kansas look it looked like furphy was struggling dickinson man dickinson got hurt again or got uh busted up a little bit again so we'll see you know what kansas wants to do towards this towards this conference i don't think they're going to be playing so much of their their studs or their stalwarts here they're probably going to give a lot of people some rest kansas doesn't need a win or doesn't need to win the uh the Big 12 tournament to get into March Madness. They're already in, man. And usually, I mean, I, I don't want to take anything away from the conference tournaments or not, or anything like that, but I, honestly, it's only good for, you know, an automatic bid. Like, for a team that needs, you know, help yeah. getting in for auto automatically or whatnot, that's um that's usually what only the, the Big 12, not just the Big 12 tournament, but usually what, you know, all the uh, the tournaments at the end of the year is. Yeah, these things are set. I mean, these things are pretty much set. I mean, it's the body of work throughout the season. I mean, the conference tournament, it it, it is. It's it's one of those things like we're talking about with Kansas State or somebody like that, to where you, you know you 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 can't you can't rely on. I mean, your body of work. Yeah, I mean, Kansas State has been able to win some games that they I guess shouldn't have, but that's where that's where they can go in and make some noise. Everybody else, I was listening yesterday with, uh, to you guys on the way back. Uh, like, as do, I was you driving. Give, do you give an eight to ten team a bid, Rodney? Seriously. I mean, consider the Big 12, but do you give an 8-10 and 10 team a bid into the 
into March Madness. See, that that's where I think it's a team like that. That's where the conference tournament's more important. If they can get in, they get in there and, and, and knock off a win or knock off two wins. That that kind of changes least everything. Two, yeah. yeah, but like even I was listening yesterday to, to you guys, and like when, when, when Justin was talking about Texas, how important the Big 12 tournament is to Texas, yeah, I, I mean – I, I just I don't get that. This is a twenty win team. I mean, they're projected to be an eight to ten. I mean, right now they're sitting as an eight. I mean, they're going to be fine. You you don't need to go in there and, and smash yourself yeah, in the tournament. Yeah, I mean, if you do that, because I totally agree with you. I mean, if you go in there and do that, I mean, like with the Sioux, uh, I mean, still maybe a little banged up or whatever. I think if anything, yeah, it'd be great to win a conference game to be able to to carry some of that momentum in that we talk about, but. Texas is fine. I mean, all these. Yeah, I'm good. Teams. I'm good with healing up. You know what I mean, dude. That, that's what you do. You got a week right bench here. minutes. That's uh, that's what I'm good with. I'm use use the Big Twelve tournament as a practice tournament. If exactly. you're if you're RT, right? Shape some things up, and then uh, you know, get some get some people that really don't get the minutes, some playing time. Get them, uh, you know, get make maybe get them some uh, some game speed moments Agreed. to where it might actually come to fruition, where they'll need to have some playing time coming in for March Madness. I'm not look. I'm not going to sit here. I'm not. I'm not going to do this to everybody, man. I don't expect a a Sweet Sixteen run. I, I just don't. Um, and I'm I'm tired of being the pessimist, but. It's just kind of how I've been. I've been a realist this year for uh, for Texas hoops. I just have, man. It was in. It was a difficult turnover uh, with the roster, and it's it's Coach RT's you know first year going into it, having a, a full uh, a full year under his belt. Um, <laughs> you got one. You you really have one. Sh- you had one shooter coming into this year, and you had a player develop into uh, a three level score. Yeah. Um, you got to and then some nights you have your third shooter pop off for 30 points and then other nights you don't have a guy show up that's in the gym you have some support every now and then but you always get beat on the boards it's 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 tough and you only play man defense they they got beat on the board saturday in that ass whooping that they, they still got beat on the boards and it's like geez louise and you, you know you look at this i mean and you said that man i mean maybe if anything in the conference tournament maybe that's where you hope that you, you know with, with i mean what tyrese hunter did the other day there's your number three Hell, that's, that's, your number one. that's an anomaly right like how I know. That, that's it's come maybe happen. four or five times a season yeah yeah, and and remember, Wags, we were talking about it a couple of weeks ago when they uh, – I forget what game it was – where it was like three dudes in double figures and you had one with nine. Same shit. <laughs> all over again. It just doesn't happen all the time. And that's, and that's the thing. The expectations needed to be different at the beginning of this year. And I know that it's hard to set realistic expectations when you have what you have last year. But but like you're saying, you got to be real when you see everything that goes out the door. Right. And we, we've been flirting with it, Rodney. It, like, if, if you really want to have a key recipe for success – you have to win the re- you have to yeah effort it's effort it's effort on defense and it's it's battling uh on the glass it's it's winning the rebound uh battle it, it we lose it every every damn game it feels like yep. so um you can expect you know from that nine times out of ten you're probably gonna lose because the other team's getting second chances absolutely and, and it's, what it's, we're, it's it's simple logic it is and we've been talking about it all year this team has no identity i mean the identity that they have is that I they, think they get, do that they i think their identity is high pressure defense and trying to create scores off of fast breaks right like yeah. that's just what they yeah. are i mean well they're, they're gonna two, they're gonna get dominated and beat up in a half court set right Right, and you got two great scores, and occasionally you get a third that steps up. That's kind of the identity of this team, and that's only going to take you so far. That's only going to take you so far. And yeah. playing in this league, playing in this league, I mean, you're going to get exposed. You, they've been exposed all year, Wags, and it's, I mean, it's uh, to Rodney Terry, I mean, to try to get an idea. I mean, there's times where I look at him on the sidelines, and, and hell, I think he looks as confused as we do. Yeah, Rubbing exactly. That brow. Exactly. Rubbing that brow. Yeah, yeah, in the Moody Center where it's sixty degrees, it's like he's not I, even. I tell sweating. you what, though, I mean, Longhorns win at home. Oh, Longhorns win at home. I mean, I mean, you're supposed to, right? You're absolutely supposed to, dude. So, uh, yeah. again, the the road record is the eyebrow raising thing there, or the the eyebrow rubbing thing. If you're Coach <laughs> RT there, and that's what you're going to be doing on the in the tournament, you're going to be on the road. So, yeah. look, don't look, guys, don't expect much. All right. If if we get a miraculous run, so be it. You know, you're playing on house money. But honestly, yeah. like if you get out of if, if you're an eight, 
and you get out of the first round of of the tournament, I mean, you could be a scary eight. You really could. You could you could make some noise and make some thunder as as an eight. Um, but I'm not expecting much. Like I'm not expecting a crazy sweet sixteen run. If I get one, I'll be absolutely thrilled and absolutely happy and and um satisfied. So, well, anyways, the, on um, you want to talk about some football? We had some football. Hey, there was right a little quick bit of with that. that. Right quick with that, with that, with with what you're saying right there, the latest Lenardi thing. I mean, Midwest going to Detroit as an eight seed, taking on number nine Florida Atlantic. You know who they would face if they were able to get through round one is number one projected number one Purdue. You're one and done. Maybe. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I can make an Can't argument break. that you could beat Purdue. You think? I could make an argument that you could be. I mean, you got, everything's got to be firing on all cylinders for you, right? Like the Sioux's got to have uh, a double double. Um, a Smith has to come in there and hit, uh, you know, three for four from the perimeter at least, and and have their defense not sucked in so much to where they're just guarding the paint and, and you know having so many rim protectors because that's what you're going to need out of the out of a uh, hunter and you're going to need yeah. out of um, Jesus. Uh, out of Weaver, you're going to need uh, penetration. You're going to need defense to kind of rotate over and get people in yeah. foul trouble, right? And you don't get that unless you get perimeter shooting from um, or lights out shooting from the perimeter. You got to have their defense stretch out and get them in the foul or get them into uh, vulnerable spots where they have to rotate over. I, I could make an argument that Texas could be Purdue. I mean, I mean, they could only if because you, of speed. Like yeah. Texas, is fa- Texas is very fast. Um, they're they're gonna they're gonna lose the the board battle anyways right um yeah, but if you yeah, if you get fast if you constantly go fast and and force you know turnovers like they usually do which is their identity there is a argument that you can make for texas to be purdue and then you know if you if you if you get what you get on saturday i mean with dylan mitchell i mean dylan mitchell stood up and you know his time uh, what, what did he play uh 22 minutes 14 points two rebounds two assists i mean that See, kind of I need stuff more right on the there. boards for mitchell i need more on the need more on it yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, and I mean, I've I'm not going to uh, tell you. It Timmy can't Horton's, be done. Timmy Horton's coming out there, A.K.I.T. Horton. We're going to call him Timmy Horton's. I don't know if you guys are hockey fans or not, but I know you guys see the billboards there along the hockey uh, the hockey billboards at the hockey rink or whatever that says Timmy Horton's or whatnot. Yeah, mm-hmm. I.T. Horton, A.K.A. Timmy Horton for this squad. Um, oh, you, there it is. He should not be re- leading in in rebounds. So I, I feel like I've seen him leading in rebounds a few times, and he's a guard, dude. So that can't be uh, well, that can't be happening. Um, anyways, we will talk more there's Texas basketball tomorrow. Uh, we also have some NFL news to talk about, Ooh. which could, could could consume a bit of time because I got some got some questions to ask, not just you, but also our wonderful fan base and listeners here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. Um. Remember, if you are mobile, 512-222-9328 is the code of text line here. Uh, Rodney, Russell Wilson to the Steelers. Pittsburgh Steelers on, an, on, a, on a discounted dime if you are Pittsburgh because the Broncos are paying a nice little penny to get this dude yeah. out of the locker room. What the hell is going on from the guy that says he's going to win multiple championships wherever he goes? And this, you know this, right? There's no way in hell Russell Wilson is inking that deal if he knows he's not the starter going into that because that's he's he's not going to fight for with Kenny Pickett. And I know Zidick's going to come on here at some point and saying, "Oh, well, it's going to be you know a a, 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 a quarterback um, contest for it, right? Like you know, there's going to be an actual competition, and you know, Kenny Pickett could emerge as a starter. That is not happening and for yeah. all those Steelers fans out there that's saying you know you got to give Kenny Pickett his one year give him one more year put some pieces around him with that offense co- coordinator we got Canada out of there now now we got Arthur Smith think great things are going to happen now you're putting Arthur Smith with Russell Wilson I'll give you a little bit of uh a little bit of reprieve there but my god guys Russell Wilson hasn't looked good in a while and if Sean Payton can't make the guy look good I don't know who's gonna make him look good I think I think this is kind of a two two way win for Pittsburgh, where we're talking about Kenny Pickett. What do you do? Um, oh, it's a win. I, I'd say it's a win for Pittsburgh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 But K- Kenny Pickett maybe gets to learn from Russell Wilson. Maybe Russell Wilson isn't as great as we thought he was. But uh, here's the other part of it. Appa- apparently, these were, this was like an extensive um meeting or conversation like i'm talking like four to six seven hour uh meeting between russell wilson and the steelers and you know that mike tomlin had to be in there saying okay dude look 
this is the way it's going to work because Mike Tomlin is that kind of coach. It's going to be – it's the Mike Tomlin way. It's not going to be the Russell Wilson way and all this zany, corny, stupid shit that he was doing over in Denver. But he, here's where I think that this can be something – You don't think or, we'll see that? You don't think we'll see a little bit of those antics? I don't think I don't think Mike Tomlin's going to allow that shit. I mean, I, I, I think I think Mike Tomlin – The Steelers locker room has been one of the most craziest locker rooms in the past five it, years. Uh, I don't know what the hell way. Mike Tomlin's going to allow or not, but I'm sure you'll see some Russell Wilson antics at one point. Well, but, you, you know, the whole thing is they just win. I, I mean, they have winning seasons, I guess is what I should say. Here's what I'm thinking about with this whole situation right here. And, and, and like you said, it's a great fit, but – you know, when Russ was in Seattle, he had a great defense. Uh, uh, this defense in Pittsburgh isn't bad. If Najee Harris can run the ball. It's a really I mean, good defense for T.J. Watt on the field. It, it is. It and is. then it's a mediocre defense without T.J. Watt on the field. That's right. If you get Najee Harris to become, you know, running back one the way that Najee Harris can be, there's the running game right there. And that uh, that allows Russell Wilson. There, Here we go again, Wags. First time we're going to say it uh, this week. To become a game manager, and 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 that's what he needs to do. Warren, I mean, I think I think Pittsburgh's got a good one-two punch with Warren and, and Harris, uh, and we'll see. Like, like you, you want a guy that utilizes a good you know backfield of one-two punch. That is Arthur Smith. So we'll see yeah. how he can um, how he can scheme there. Uh, but maybe keep you know, look, I, you got to think that it's elevated play from a Ritter or a Heineke, right? Which is what Arthur Smith had in uh, Atlanta. Uh, and I'm again like even even Kenny Pickett is elevated play in the quarterback room than Ritter and uh yeah and Heineke right Russell yeah. Wilson I, I'm gonna give a nod and say that Russell Wilson is better than Kenny Pickett I just think yeah. I, I am based off of yeah. off the tape that I've seen so far uh guys if they're going to Trubisky and if they're going to uh to Mason Rudolph man there's got to be a que there's got to be questions in your quarterback room. There just has to be, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Maybe you don't. Maybe you did that so you didn't injure Kenny Pickett or or mess up your your franchise moving forward uh, going into this year. Um, may maybe that was your knee jerk reaction to the quarterback debacle. Okay, but you know hindsight's twenty twenty. You're bringing Russell Wilson in for a reason. We all know that uh, he's taking a franchise friendly deal. Uh, One point two yeah. million is what Crazy. the Steelers are actually paying him, and then the rest of that check, thirty seven point eight, is being paid by the Denver Broncos. Yeah, uh, yeah. You want to talk about? We talk about franchise friendly deals all the time, right? Or at least that's what I think. You know, quarterbacks or, or running backs can do in this situation, especially going into this year, thinking about you know trying to trying to have a little bit of longevity if you're a running back, or maybe get a little more. Um, eyes on you for, a, I guess, a better deal. Um, but uh, again, we all know that that the better deals aren't coming for um, for the running back. So maybe if you're that quarterback, though, like Kenny Kenny Pickett or whatnot, trying to get like that that last year extension or whatnot, maybe this will help you having Russell Wilson coming in there and you get to learn for him. Um, but yeah, like this tells me that the Steelers aren't really going to be going forward with. Kenny Pickett either, right? Because yeah, I think he's on his last year of the contract, and they're not going to get to see enough of the game film. <coughs> excuse me, on Kenny Pickett uh, to warrant in the uh, an extension or whatnot, unless you know Russell Wilson goes down and um, Kenny Pickett steps in there, slides in there, and then takes the Steelers to the playoffs and uh, another winning record. But I, I'm just I'm not seeing that. Or maybe we got this all wrong, Rodney. Um, you know, maybe. Pickett's going to be the starter, and Russell Wilson's rolling in there as a, no. a 1.2 oh, no, million backup. So, no, I don't know. Maybe that, we got it all wrong. I don't know. I mean, they, they, they may call it an open competition, and maybe that was the discussion that was had, you know, over the weekend when they were talking about this. Well, we're going to call it an open discussion, Russ, but uh, it's really not. Wink, wink. But, I mean, the, the thing is, I think what it does, it's going to push Kenny Pickett to be better. And, 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 it, and this really could, like I'm talking about the double-sided win to where maybe – I hate to say that it's a bridge, but it's a bridge that helps the Steelers this year. And at the same time, it helps them moving forward to where Kenny Pickett does get to learn from a veteran. Because look, I mean, I so, say what you want to say about Russell Wilson. Talk yeah, about what I would take did. Russell Wilson as the giant for 1.2 million. And, and, yeah. and the Broncos pay the rest of the check. Yeah, I would yeah. take that in a heartbeat. Yeah, this is this is a fucking I mean, it's like people are questioning why is Pittsburgh doing this? That's why. 
1.2 million dollars and i mean if you're if you're russell wilson i mean if if i mean the dude's a, the dude's a professional athlete the dude's a competitor i mean you go out there and it's like okay let me stick it to denver watch this you know go out there and rebound and then all that, that. you would think that russell wilson's you know auditioning for the next two or three years of his contract exactly. right like um, exactly. somebody if, if he wants to have an extension or if he wants to play a little bit more football somewhere he's got to make this work in pittsburgh or else it, it, he's done um yeah failed in denver it was failing in seattle when they shipped you out they traded you for uh drew lock and noah fant essentially right yeah uh, and yeah. Uh, seriously that's that's that was the value that russell wilson went for um it looked like it was sexy when it was signed. He got the bunny. His his agent got the bag for him, but it just didn't pan out. Uh, if it doesn't work here, he's done. Well, and here here's where I think that kind of with the scenario that you're laying down right there to where it could be, you know, let's say he has a great year. I mean, let, let's say Pittsburgh to the playoffs. I mean, well, hell, they were in the playoffs. But, I mean, let, let's say they improve. Are they better start. than – are they better – this doesn't make them better than Baltimore. It doesn't make them better than Cleveland. God, no, no Cleveland – um, and then you got Cleveland's the Bengals in there. Busy with free agent, or, well, I guess not free agency. They're they're signing people for trades or whatnot. Free agency, free agency doesn't start officially until um till the thirteenth, until March thirteenth. Yeah. yeah. So so here here's the way that all lays what's out. Up, Sal, I'm glad what's that. up, brother? Here, here's the way it happens today. Teams can be, begin engaging with agents at eleven our time right. 11 right. In, in just a few minutes deals can be agreed to but not finalized no deal can become official until after the 4 p.m our time 3 p.m uh, on wednesday teams can speak to players who represent themselves without an agent before wednesday at four so that that's what's happening right here so this is all this is all just kind of laying this you know we're, we're talking about the 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 russell wilson thing they've just agreed to it it's not done right but, you gotta but it's yeah. going to be but it's going to be so that that's kind of the way that all works out. And when you talk about Cleveland, when Cleveland goes out and, and they get Jerry Judy from Denver over the weekend, that, that tells me that they're telling no in full mode, buddy. Well, I, I mean, not uh, Denver's paying. I don't know if how much in cell mode they are, if they're paying, you know, 37 million for to the quarterback, you know, a quarterback that's not even on the roster anymore. That's 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 how bad Russell Wilson is. That's how bad he is. All right, yeah. if or or that may I'm sorry, let me walk that back. That's how bad Denver wants him out of the locker room. Yeah. That's yeah. Ter- that's that's telling to me, guys. That's telling. That's, that's a big thing. And, and it's Russell Wilson. I mean, dudes won a Super Bowl. I mean, but but again, th- and this is where we go back to like the whole Belichick thing. We saw the move with Mac Jones this week, uh, this weekend uh, with the Patriots. But it's like this is where you go back to Russell, and it's like so. So maybe Russell just wasn't uh, Russell wasn't that good. Maybe it was more what Pete Carroll was doing. I mean, same conversation here, and, and that that's where this is so intriguing. But I think of when I saw that whatever was going to happen to Russell was going to happen. I pretty much thought that it was going to be okay. Well, Russell, I'm. I, I'm not, I didn't forecast anything too great for him, but if he's going to land anywhere, I think Pittsburgh is much better than Atlanta. Yeah, you, say, you did, you were saying Pittsburgh. Yeah. Um, yeah I don't I, know I if think... you had your crystal ball, you know, popping and shining or, or whatnot there. Who was giving you little, you know, sweet nothings in your ear, but you got, you got that one pretty right. Double R there. It, it just um, seemed, it, it just seemed better. And it's like with the fields thing. I think a field is going to go somewhere. I just think that, that Atlanta. So, so I mean, I don't know. We can get to that, but this free agency thing. I mean, Baker. I look, at the, I look at the money. Like to me, what makes sense for all these quarterback carousels and, and where everybody's going is the money. Like I look at the front mm-hmm. office and see what's better for their money, what their bottom line is. Right. Um, surely they can get a quarterback friendly deal with uh, Caleb Williams. We all know that, right? But they're not going to get the return on investment for Justin Fields. It's just not. Regardless of how well he played in the latter part of the season last year. It's not going to happen. You might get a second at best, right? If you trade the first overall this year, which is Caleb Williams, you will get the eighth overall in return, which you could argue that you're going to get Romeo Adonze. And then yep. turn around, you had the nine right there, um, the eight, nine, you'll get an offensive tackle. You would like to think that you get an offensive tackle. You, of course, you, you, you wish for Alt to be there. But if he's not, then um, the the guy from Alabama is looting me. Uh and also, like the tackle from Penn State, he's probably going to be yeah. gone too. But the, the yeah. tackle from Alabama will still probably be there. But also, yeah. you acquire a first round pick next year, right? So you yeah. have two first round picks going in the next year as well. That's more mm-hmm. draft cap. That's more uh, uh, people that you can put around Justin Fields, right? Sure. And 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 if sure. you thought that he was playing decent, right, or or he was able to win you some ball games with the 
lack of talent that he had and the lack of line. Imagine what he could do if you shore up some spots. Hell, you can get right into the playoffs. Look at what Detroit was able to do in a matter of three, four years. Yep. And to me, and, and if you take a step back, with that, and that's just it. If you take Caleb Williams, sure, you are getting a quarterback-friendly deal, right? You you absolutely are, but you're also taking a step back. You're, you're going to lose out on your draft pick because you're taking that one draft pick on a quarterback that you already had, essentially, because you're trading, a, you're just getting a, a second rounder in return for the quarterback that you have. Yeah. It, it, Front office. If I'm the front office, I'm trading the I'm trading the first overall pick, or I'm taking suitors for the first overall pick. And if I'm Atlanta, yeah, I'm going up and yeah. getting Caleb Williams because that's the only thing that you need. Justin Fields would make that offense pretty damn special too. But you'd like to you'd like to have Caleb Williams there with a friendly uh, a rookie deal with Bijan Robinson and a rookie deal with Caleb Williams. Not that you're going to be paying mm -hmm. Bijan Robinson his money anyways when his time comes because he's a running back. That's yeah. just how well, it is. At least you have them on the same yeah. path. Uh, I mean, you kind of have those guys on the same path when it comes to that part. And I'll tell you where, where it's even bigger for the Bears right now. I saw this weekend Courtney Cronin from ESPN reported that I guess apparently last year the Bears organization went in and bought a 325 or so acre plot of property south of of soldier field and now they are going to actively try to figure out a way to get out of soldier field and build themselves a dome stadium and so forth on that new property so i think if you're going to be doing that you're probably going to be asking for taxpayer money and all this different you know how all of that's going to be funded right. so if, if that's going to be the case that's where it's so important that you get this right and again you can't you can't forecast or or use the crystal ball like you're talking about but i just think it behooves them to continue moving in a path like what you're talking about where you go out and you solidify and build around the quarterback that you have it's one thing if it was mac jones but I yeah, think mac, how about really that mac good. jones mac jones getting shipped to jacksonville there what is foreseeable a, a, backup. a backup spot yeah um yeah, yeah. i i just I, and i'll tell you what 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 was so interesting when when i heard that was that that i i had read something i think it was I don't know, it was in the offseason I, I, or, or before last season that last year Belichick wanted to trade Mac Jones. And and Bob Kraft, Bob Kraft was like, no, 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 no. No, we got to keep him. <laughs> now they trade him and they get a for a sixth-round pick. God. I'm not surprised. But hey, maybe that sixth-round pick can turn into Tom Brady. Hey, never say never. I mean, you never say never, uh, but then that's a question. What do they do? Uh, I mean, uh, do you go get, do you go find a veteran? Do you find one of these veterans to be the stop gap and draft a new guy or a, uh, one of the young guys? Do you, is Rob a new England Patriot fan? Uh, he may be. Rob, are you, Rob, are you the residential new England Patriot fan? There's always one. There's, there's always one. Yeah. Everybody. I don't know why. Pe I don't For me, it's just tough. It's tough for me to like Boston sports. I don't know why. Um, everybody says it's a great town. Uh, my wife's been there. My sister-in-law used to live there. Uh, and Rob has confirmed he is mm. the, the residential Boston sports. So Rob, who do you, Rob, do you I love you. I just don't love, I don't love Boston sports for some reason. Yeah. So, so who do you want, Rob? I mean, what, what, what should they do? I mean, you go to the, you go the veteran route or are you get, you're going to go get Daniels or, or, or what are you going to do right here? I, I would mean, think because I would think to answer for Rob before Rob, you know, types, maybe I'm a faster talker than Rob's a faster typer. Let's race, Rob. Ready? One, two, three, go. All right. So I think that the Patriots could take a Jaden Daniels, but also I think they're going to give that trade away, or excuse me, I think they're going to trade that number three spot and go back. A, a typical Patriot move is to trade your, your draft pick at the third spot and acquire more draft picks, and you're probably going to take either a Penix Jr. or a Bo Nix towards the latter part of the first round. Uh, if I'm the Patriots, I'm taking Bo Nix because, one, the Patriots like to take the most uh, quarterbacks with game films, the quarterbacks with the most reps. We all know that that's Bo Nix, and we also know that Bo Nix has the strongest arm. You could argue that Bo Nix has the strongest arm in the draft. Yeah, and and, and I mean, that, that, that yeah, that's a good scenario. And maybe Surplanta or, or, you know, with Stidham as the as the mentor or whatever, whatever you want to call it. So, yeah, I, I mean, I like that. But the other part of it now, it's Gerard Mayo. So, so we talk about, you know, typical Patriots in the Patriot way. Let's see, let's see if that changes up any, or if it's allowed think, to change it up. I mean, I is, think, um, I think Mayo is going to keep some of the cornerstones, the pieces of yeah. success for, I mean, for 20 years, you can't lie. You can't go up against, um, a, a, a franchise or excuse me, a free agent friendly, 
uh, era in football for a decade and be dominant, right? I'm, right. I'm, we're talking dominant. We're talking continuously winning your division and representing your conference as the as the champions to go to the Super Bowl, right? That's what they did for 20 years in a, in a free agent era uh, NFL. Yeah. I think you have to take the cornerstones of that success and apply that to your future, right? If you're Mayo, right? And I'm, I'm sure be progressive and, and go after and have new settings and whatnot, have a new frontier, but also keep some of those um, those cornerstones in place that were allow were allowing you to have 20 year reign of success, mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. But but I, I definitely think you know he should definitely put his stamp on this. Oh, one hundred percent, and he yeah, will. Yeah, yeah, he, he absolutely will. And, and a lot of what you're talking the, the about, the way right that you here, can do that, the way that you can put your stamp on it is going out there and getting a Bo Nix or a Michael Penix Jr. and then having that rookie quarterback. You know, because you could argue that both of these quarterbacks have the most reps out of all these other quarterbacks, right? right. I mean, well, they do. Yeah, well, they've fucking been around forever. Caleb, yeah, Caleb, yeah. it feels like Caleb Williams has been around for a century too. But yeah, I mean, does, Bo Nix has been. Bone, I've we've watched Bo Nix grow up essentially in the damn college football landscape. So uh, yeah. it started at Auburn and then ending his career up there at uh, at, at Oregon. And look, um, on a strong note too, man. You know, having a you know, being a Heisman contender as well, and you know, mm -hmm. having the Ducks you know contend for arguably a national. I mean, right there on the doorstep to get into the college football playoff. Yeah. And, and, and the other part of the kind of the Patriots thing is, you know, it's, it's, it's not just a new coach, it's a new GM. So, so maybe they do things different. So, so I don't know that that's where all these pieces starting to fall into place with Mac, with Mac, say Mac Brown, with Mac Jones being gone, you know, it, it's like, okay, uh, they're definitely starting a new and they need to, because it was a shit show um, at that point. Hey, by the way, from the uh, Coda text line, uh, Elvia Rosales, it looks like was the winner of the uh, Cabo Bob's gift card uh, oh! that was given out. So uh, it looks like uh, Elvia and you and I wags will be heading over to Cabo Bob's. Elvia, that's part of the, that's part of the gig right there. You have to take wags and I. We'll We're going to Cabo you. Bob's. She's got to take Are us. We? Oh, you and I can go. She doesn't have to, but. I haven't been there actually. Haven't, but I mean, are they are they actually taking them? Were we a part of the deal? We got to do like a song and dance. No, no. Unfortunately, we don't. She'd be like, I don't want I'm, the card. Hey, I ain't guys, taking I'm them Canadian Idol. You guys know this. I'm, I'm I wasn't good enough for American Idol, but Canadian Idol, man, I won it. I'm shit. Won that three times, man. It's like the CFL, baby. Canadian Idol. Hey guys, uh, for look me up, man. Look look it up. Look it up. Me and the Jardians. Me me and Jardians. Jill. We were doing musicals. Well, yeah, me and Julianne Huff did a dance together too. Pretty good. Is that right? Oh yeah. All right. <laughs> then, I watching, up, then I woke up. Then I woke up. Watching the Guardians like... commercial, the Guardians musical, or you're watching NHL, you're watching NBA or NBA, and you know the fresh start of spring ball with Major League Baseball because those Orioles are hot right now. I can't miss a beat of it. Um, you got to do it all with audiovisual consultations. Five one two two five. 512-255-8678. Saw Jardine's comment. Sorry. Uh, 512-255-8678. That's avconsultations.com. Again, you can watch the Jardine's musical over and over again, the OG Jardine's musical, um, or you can you know go to their gallery of projects that they have on their website that they've been doing over the past 35 years. Um, and maybe you'll get an idea of what you want. Maybe it's the two, the two TV setup or the four TV setup. Maybe you want some arcade units like I got. Or you want a dream theater system downstairs so that you can see the perfect optimal vision for the Jardians musical. I'm telling you right now, it's no jobs too big, no jobs too small. 512-255-8678. That's apconsultations.com. You can watch Jardians all day and long. I, and I just want to watch Rooms to Go commercials with Julianne Huff dancing. So, so there you go. Hey, uh, speaking of that. <laughs> new or pre-owned car truck or SUV there is only one place to go and it is our great friends at covert v cave how about a word from our great friends it's monday guys please be nice to Hayden. hi i'm dan covert with my wife hayden welcome to covert v cave our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes buick gmc cadillac chrysler dodge jeep and ram and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from we have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car truck or suv with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about covert born and raised in austin Hey, Wag, so do you think that um, you think Mike Evans got on the phone and called Baker Moneymaker and think, said, look, look, bitch, you need to sign? <laughs> yeah, I think he called, He said, look, man, the only reason why I came back is because you said you was coming back. Now, you ain't going to put this, uh, you ain't going to put word to mouth or whatnot. You're going to 
ink this thing or, or get it done or am i gonna be sitting here with kyle trask so um it looks yeah. like uh looks like the two worked out a deal because hey look we are we we told you that this happened already this we already it. said it had happened yeah yeah it, it, i mean it was the only place they for made it official it, it was well i guess it, it becomes official on wednesday on wednesday yeah they, and, and this they is just, come to an agreement and this is this is just another kind of in this whole story of Baker Mayfield, like him or not, you know, where it's like the dude, the dude's like got a chip on his shoulder, and it's like the odds are always against him. I mean, just just follow Can the I, chronology of everything, and now it's like Rodney. Let me ask you this. Let me, yeah. and, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but let me ask you this, and let me ask the rest of the 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 show this: How can you not like Baker Mayfield? Uh, if if you want. I, 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 I have never disliked the guy. I mean, I think you you walk on and and you you win Heisman trophies and you you're planting flags in the middle of the field and shit. I mean, if you're proving everybody man, wrong, how do you? And, and and I think that's that's like his mission. You know, it's like people have their mission. And I think this whole thing right here, when Cleveland when Bay, sold him out, exactly, and he still fucking won him a playoff game. And, and the, the, whole, the only quarterback. Well, <laughs> did Flacco did Flacco win? Did they win? A, uh, did they, no, win they got beat by Houston? They got beat by Houston. They, you're right. You're they right. Baker Houston. Mayfield's the only quarterback to win Cleveland and, a playoff game. And, and then this whole thing last year when Tampa Bay signed him, you know, oh, on wow. the cheap, it's like, okay, he's just coming over. He's he's just going to be a stopgap here while we figure out who's going to replace the greatest of all time. And he goes out and throws four thousand yards or for four thousand yards and twenty eight touchdowns, and now he signed a hundred million dollar deal. Uh, I mean, this is a whole. It's just in the line with this dude. I hope when he's done. I hope when he's done. Somebody does like a Netflix thing on this dude's life. Oh, you, it, you, <laughs> you, think, it's, you like, think it's coming, right? You got to think oh. it's coming. Um, no, I mean, and there was times where I would have my, you know, doubts on Baker Mayfield because, uh, hell, like very quickly he fell into that. Uh, I'm going to take, you know, uh, a four step back pedal and kind of throw the ball away. And then that started turning into interception. So it just wasn't working out. Maybe the pieces weren't around him in Cleveland to to allow him to continue to have winning success. Because a lot of times, and I'm not saying it just because we're talking about Baker right now, but a lot of times Baker put Cleveland on his back and it was allowing them to win some ball games. Now, of course, you got a dominant backfield with Nick Chubb there, um, but yeah. those two seem to work out. I mean, look, and anybody that talks about Baker in the in the locker room will tell you how good of a, a teammate Baker Mayfield is. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the guys to me, he's he's a winner, man. The only stain that I have on the guy is that he went is a sooner. <laughs> you know, that's really the only stain that I that I have on Baker well, Mayfield, man. And, and I get that, but if but he to was me, a, if he was a Longhorn, y'all would love the shit oh, out of him. Oh my God! Right now, we, we they'd have a shirt of him at Sue Patrick's right now with with him as a buccaneer. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let me yeah. tell you, we would all be wearing Baker. I, I kind of go the other that. direction with that. I get that he was a Sooner, but at the same time, I knew this kid at Lake Travis. So, so to me, it's Michael like, C. Michael it's, C. You know damn well if this dude was a Longhorn, you would be loving the shit out of this guy. Oh yeah, I, I, I feel you, man. Look, I I believe the burn orange too, and it's it really is. It's tough for me to to it's tough for me to get over to that crimson. It is, but I mean, the guy just wins, man. He does. Um, despite his odds, he finds a way to win. Which I, I, well, I just I I gotta give the guy props for that. Yeah, I have to. Well, and it's like with these rivals that I, mean, I know I know that Oklahoma's our our biggest rival, no doubt about it. Even over A and M, in my opinion, at this point. But it's like right now, Ad Mitchell comes over here and is like setting the world on fire at Texas. It's like it, we we discount the fact. Oh, he he was at Georgia. Well, he came from Georgia. You know, if it was opposite, if he went to Georgia and left here, I hate him. He's not worth a shit because he's because he's at Georgia. That's our fan base, man. I mean, that that's just. I think that that's not just our fan base, Rodney. That's every fan base. That's uh, that's fan just base. it's just natural, it, and right? that's and that's where we go back to what you were talking about earlier with the basketball team. That's where our expectations needed to be a little bit more realistic with what we were expecting. I mean, like you're saying right now, sweet sweet sixteen right now, shit. Hell yeah, we've exceeded what we're supposed to be doing instead of people talking about getting to the elite eight. No, no, it's not going to happen, unfortunately. Did um, did you watch? Did, are, you're a Austin FC fan, aren't you? Uh, I'm a what? I'm sorry, I'm reading the code of text. Austin, Austin FC fan. You watch? You watch MLS? I watch Austin them. FC. I watch Austin FC. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know exceedingly a lot about soccer, but I do do watch them. The very you know, trees. you you might not know enough about, but you know enough to where if you give up a goal in the last 
seconds. If you concede a goal in the last seconds, <laughs> you know that that's just absolutely brutal, right? Especially if you're at home and you don't have a win yet on the season. I know it's a young campaign, but you still don't have a win, and that's a damn club that you should be. It, I mean, St. Louis is a St. Louis FC is a club that you should win. You should you should be able to beat. Um, not to mention you're up a goal and you really only have to park the damn bus. And what I mean by that, Rodney, is you have to put all of your defenders back there. You got to put your midfielders back there and create a lot of lanes and take and create a lot of lane blockages. Right, so give me one second. I'll be right back. Go ahead. Do what you need. I'll knock it on I'll, the door. Go ahead. Do what you need. But you, what you have to do is be able to park your bus and uh, not allow the opposition to get in there and have St. Louis, you know, be able to constantly find plays and make runs into the box and score. Um, now, look, you you know that you're going to be giving up a lot more shots that way, and eventually some something might break. But my God, guys, people are calling for Wolf's head because it's a managerial decision, right? Like you should know. They call him the great one for a reason. When I refer to the great one in soccer, I'm referring to Jose Mourinho. Mourinho would always play boring soccer. In term, boring soccer, right? He would get the lead. He would get a 1-0 lead or a 2-0 lead, and he would take all of his defense and all of his midfielders and be in a defensive strategic position to where it would make it harder for the opposition to score. It's called parking the bus, and it's boring. It's absolutely you know, hideous to watch, but it's very tactical. Um, and... I, I don't understand why we keep making the same bad decisions from the sidelines. And I'm not trying, I know we're, that we're trying to get the coach on here to, to talk. Maybe, you know, these would be some great questions to ask him, um, but something's got to give. Uh, the talent is there uh, personnel wise. Um, we've made some moves. We continue to make some moves as a club. Um, but again, we just got to be able to put it, put it all together and write the ship and, that last night was a, or excuse me, Saturday was a match that you thought definitely could have be won, that could be won and get three points. Uh, but you weren't even, it's not the fact that, uh, you know, you dropped two points or yeah, it is like you could have had three, you dropped two. I mean, and, and you allowed a, a tie. So anyways. yeah, yeah, that I saw that and it was like, man, and this is, um, this is it's really going to not, I mean, three points. If you continue to get ones oh, yeah. while everybody else is getting threes, Ron, you're going to be at the bottom of the table or, or the no. bottom of the standings, however you guys want to talk about it. That's exactly right. I mean, it's a blown opportunity. And that, uh, I mean, you can't blow opportunities like that. And I think what's going to start happening now is you're going to start having that no, same no, discussion. Michael, that, exactly. And that's why people are questioning Wolf. They're, they're like, Wolf. well, that's what, you know, say. What, are, what are some of these decisions that you're making, uh, sub decisions that you're making? Um, in terms of if you're if you're trying to hold the damn line and i agree with you man if you're going to be in a five man defensive uh defensive back line you got to have the right personnel in there that's it that's it and and that and that seems to be the question that i keep hearing where it's it's the questions more on wolf than anything else with with player rotation and player movement and substitutions and so forth and that's uh, there's your recipe for um for calling for the coach's head um you know is that going to happen i don't know but i mean if you continue to if you continue to tie or lose and and then things happen in this manner that's where the people are really going to go after the coach i don't know like to give and then you have a penalty you don't even give up the one goal that you gave up early wasn't even in play. It was a penalty, right? So, I mean, that that's basically a free goal. Um, and then to just to get, to give up the equalizer with ninety in the ninety third minute of of stoppage, it, it's just it's just absolutely a kick in the dick. It's brutal. It's absolutely mm -hmm. brutal. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, yep. uh, Austin FC remains winless um, in this young campaign moving forward. What else we got to talk about, my guy? You know, um, I wanted to get your thoughts because I was reading uh, earlier on the X uh, where the Kirk Cousins thing seems to be finally. I mean, we're into the we're into the week now where stuff is really going to start happening. We're already seeing with everything that's going on, but it really seems like some of this Minnesota Kirk Cousins stuff that 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 stuff is really starting to stall. So so maybe Minnesota is deciding, okay, it's time to it's time to do something different, and maybe this is going to open the door for him to go to Atlanta. I'm you so. Think? I'm I'm so curious to why all these teams that are are reluctant to bring that their to bring back their quarterback, especially Minnesota, right? Like it, it wasn't that Kirk Cousins was playing bad or mediocre at all. Like he was in an MVP level right before he ruptured his Achilles or or tore his Achilles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is is the is the quarterback room or the quarterback uh, I, I guess market that plentiful? 
to where you feel like you can just give up certainty for an uncertainty? You know that that's that. I, let's let's talk about Dallas. It, it's like I mean, with the Cowboys, yeah, I I, I don't want. I, I mean, I don't think Dak should be the highest paid quarterback or the highest paid player in the league, but he's going to be. It's like get rid of him. Who are you going to replace him with? Uh, I mean, Trey Lance. Uh, I mean, Cooper Rush. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Cooper Rush. Is Cooper great Rush can win some ball games. He can win some ball he, games. He won some ball games, but I, I think the whole thing is, I mean, the league will figure him out. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty easy to figure him out. I mean, who, who are you going to replace him with? I mean, and this thing right here with 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 Kirk Cousins. I mean, if I'm Minnesota, I am clinging to this dude. And, and I mean, and then you better work. You better figure out what the hell you're going to do with Justin Jefferson. Um. And, and and I saw this morning T Higgins T Higgins yeah he's who, T Higgins is requesting out of Cincinnati he's requested um, out of Cincinnati so it's like God bless America man it's this is crazy if I'm Minnesota I am absolutely trying to see if Kirk Cousins wants to come back on a franchise friendly dime no right and I'm sure they are I'm absolutely sure they are because that's it's it's go with what you know right and. Yeah. Is, is as much as people are you know in love with this quarterback class coming out this year, I don't even think it's that good of a quarterback class. I, I just I don't. I think it's a knee jerk reaction for uh, front offices trying to take all these quarterbacks because there's not that much talent in the NFL right now in terms of quarterback in terms of quarterback play. Yeah. Um, if if there were, you would not have been seeing Mitch Trubisky roll out there for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Case in point, you wouldn't see Mac Jones, you know, <laughs> compete with with Bailey Zappi. Um, yeah. There's, there, I don't, I don't. So if, if you're Minnesota, you're looking out into the market here and saying, all right, well, he's got, they got quarterback problems, they got quarterback problems. We seem to have a decent quarterback here. We don't know about the you know, if his Achilles is going to hold up or not. But, I mean, he was playing at an MVP level. Why don't we try and ink the guy or maybe – I don't know if I don't know if their tag's available. And I don't – I don't I don't Minnesota's? know if that's – Yeah, Minnesota's. I, I don't, don't know if they're the either. either. Um, or they're, they probably want to hold it and, and put it on somebody else. I didn't see that news. I got to follow up on that. But yeah. anyway, that's, that's – the point well, is the, the quarterback market can't be that great or, or that plentiful to where you're like, oh – yeah, we we can put this guy on the shelf yeah. real quick and go yeah. see what this guy's offering because there's just so much so much good quarterback talent out there. And it's exactly what you're saying. I mean, you look you look at it, look at the Redskins. I mean, hell, they hadn't been able to get a quarterback. I mean, since Kirk Cousins, they, they got Sam Howell, man. They got <laughs> well, Sam Howell. Well, yeah, yeah, it could be right there. But he can, he can put he can put some yards up for you. And now he's going to throw you some interceptions. But that's just it too, like. I mean, maybe Sam Howe becomes one of the best backups in the NFL because I, I thought Sam Howe could sling it. So yeah. we'll see. Well, and, and it goes back to like what you were just saying with the quarterback class. Yeah, man, this quarterback this quarterback class is pretty damn impressive looking at all the numbers and all this thing, man. But when it's all said and done, is it going to surprise me if Michael Pinnock or, or Bo Nix is, 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 are, are the ones that come out of this and they're the better ones? I mean, because the 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 top three or four, whatever, the, you know, that they flame out. I mean, is that going to surprise me? No, because we don't know. We have no. I don't freaking clue right now. I don't think Caleb. I don't. I don't think Caleb Williams ex exactly flames out. I'm not. Um, I'm, not so, I'm sorry, Wags. I am just not sold. And, and and I hope he proves me wrong. I don't know what my problem is with him. It's like maybe I think he's a sooner. Oh wait, wait. He was. Maybe that's my problem with him. Hell. <laughs> Um, I think he's been in one hell of a system, right? Like Link, we all know how good Lincoln Riley is, is at Boom. at making the the quarterback look fantastic, just look phenomenal, right? Um, Kyler Murray, take Kyler Murray, uh, Hertz, Hertz was in his system for a while. Uh, there's hell. I mean, it, it feels like all Lincoln Riley does is just put Heisman Trophy winners into a damn NFL uh, league. Yeah. Anyways, my my point being is that I think if you get Caleb Williams out into another quarter or into another uh into another offensive system, I'd like to see, you know, how he does and how he, you know, if he does struggle with that. Maybe, yeah. He's only been in one system. That's that's my point. He's yeah. only been in one system. We'll see how it works. Everybody's putting a lot of stock into one dude um that really only has three three years of, of good tape yeah. on him if, if yeah. you really i mean you saw the freshman success that he had uh coming in in spell of uh what the hell was that guy's name spencer spencer rattler, rattler um yeah. against texas i mean he's he is the reason why they beat texas that year so yeah well, well and, and i think uh, 
Jordan Jordan thinks Jordan Scruggs says that he's the closest thing to Patrick Mahomes, and I I kind of tend to see what Jordan's saying there. So, well, and and here's I, I think here's where I'm going back to it so much, and that's that's a great point right there. Thank you, ninety three. I, I think that's a lot of it right there. But this is where where this year, obviously USC, he um, uh, you know, defense was not good. Um, he didn't have uh offensive line was horrible he didn't have the pieces that's why i'm saying if he goes if he goes to atlanta if he ends up in atlanta if there's a trade made or yes he's going to thrive he's going to prove me wrong but if he has to go to one of these franchises if he goes to to washington or if he goes to new england where those pieces are also missing there that's where we're not going to see this phenom that that folks and he is the kid is good the kid is good. I am just not sold on the fact that he's going to be the next Dan Marino or you insert the name. Wait, is Michael know. Pittman going to be the next Jerry Rice? Because Michael Pittman signed a $70 million deal. It's only money. Man. Three three only. years for $70 million. Michael Pittman to the Colts. Are you serious? Yeah. yeah. Isn't, isn't that crazy? It's absolutely crazy this month. What, man, I am, I'm, what am I missing? What am I missing here? Yeah. Yeah. I bet that's where T. Higgins said, "Hey, hey, hey. yeah." So that he's just like, "Whoa, I want the fuck out of here. Get me out of here. Take a twenty. Do whatever you need to do. Get me the hell out of here so I can get a paycheck." Yeah, are you serious? Like seventy million dollars for three million? That's crazy. And they were trying to put the tag on that guy. Yeah, it's like you you ain't you ain't tagging me," says T. Higgins. Rodney, Um, let's talk about where we can lay some uh, some money down and try and get some green in our pocket real quick before we get out of here. That's right. Only one place to do it. You see the banner right there on the top. If you're checking in on YouTube, it is BetUS, the best online sports book and casino that you're going to find out there. Game lines, props, over-unders, you name it, they got it. And the sport, you name it, they got it. NHL, NBA, college basketball. We're heading into March Madness. We all know that. You're going to be able to blow it out of the water right there if you know what you're doing. Um, and you can do it right there on BetUS. You can even do some NASCAR futures right there. Really cool stuff there as well. Um, if you're checking in on YouTube down at the bottom in the uh, show description, you can click the link right there. It'll take you right to it. If you're on the free Texas Sports Unfiltered app, explore our socials, hit that, and it'll take you to the link. $50 deposit, and you're ready to pay to play and get after it and go make yourself some bucks. The best place to bet on sports online is BetUS. Check them out. I would go Kirk Cousins 120 fully guaranteed. Yeah. It, I would go Kirk Cousins three years, 120 fully guaranteed. Yeah. But but still or, excuse me, four four years, four years, yeah. 120 fully guaranteed. To 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 your point there with Minnesota, it's like, yeah, who who are you gonna go get? I mean, you're gonna try to go get Fran Tarkington back or and, what the fuck? All, like you gotta all, the four years <laughs> Kramer? Probably, that's what Kirk Cousins is gonna be looking for is the longevity, right? I mean, he's that's in the latter force, he's in the, the the back end of his career. It's not really the money. I'm sure he's got the money already tied up. He's probably looking for a longer, uh, lengthier contract. But that's the thing. Like, which which team is going to be willing to give what is he, 34? How I I don't know how it, Kirk Cousins coming is. I'm taking a stab Achilles at 34. Tear. Coming um, off of an Achilles tear, yeah. Exactly. Com- coming off of an Achilles tear, Jeff. For yeah. quarter for quarterbacks, for quarterbacks, that's not as drastic of an injury as a skill guy coming off of it. But right. still, it's still um, a it, 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 it. I think it's his plant foot too, man. So, yeah. But it, here's the deal with that though, Wags. Like we we see, I mean, Tiger might Tiger Woods might be the best example of it. Once the once your body starts breaking down, mm-hmm. it's, it's it's almost like when you're uh you know that round of, of adult beverages you're enjoying at the bar, and you keep holding your bladder, and the minute you break, break the seal. The seal, it's like boom. Yeah. The rest of the night, I just got to go. That's like what injuries are yeah. for professional athletes, man. Like once one happens and the body starts to overcompensate, then everything just kind of starts falling apart. Well, I'm not a professional athlete, but I am a professional, and i got to tell you that my body is breaking down piece by piece <laughs> as we speak. So. Yeah, same here. How was the weekend, brother? Was it good? Uh, it was good. I'm trying to – Kirk Cousins tur- Kirk Cousins turns 36 in August. 36. Wow. Damn. 36 well, young. 36 so years young. If he wants a fully guaranteed deal, I don't – you can't do more than two. That's, Maybe. You'd probably have to do three to get it done. But man, that's pushing it. That's Atlanta, Atlanta might be the best setup for him just because 
you know, it's pretty I much think Atlanta is the best setup for any quarterback at yeah, the moment. Yeah. Right now. Taylor made for you for a quarterback to go in there and just be a plug and play option. And, and for that team, he's cousins. My, I, I know I said what I just said. You got a guy that's about to turn 36 coming off of an Achilles tear. He might be the safest option mm-hmm. out of everything we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Caleb yeah. Williams, Justin Fields. There's volatility there, right? Well, yeah. I mean, with with Caleb Williams, you get the you get the rookie deal. That's the only thing that you get with Caleb Williams there. But you also get you know high risk, high reward probably with Caleb Williams. But yeah, I'm I'm with you. If you're laying up and taking Kirk Cousins there, uh, you 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 pretty much know that you got a quarterback that can complete some passes to Pitts yeah. to London and and utilize Bijan Robinson out of that. Yeah, game. and and having those younger dudes like that, I mean, th- that may extend Kirk Cousins two to three years to to where it's a situation there where he falls into place. Like, yeah, you know the 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 Russell Wilson thing in, or in Pittsburgh makes perfect sense. One year and let's see what happens. But of course, that's a very friendly deal. But um, yeah, I, I think that's a great spot for Cousins to go to. You got to think, you know, if he goes, if if Kirk Cousins does go to Atlanta, Atlanta's got to be bolstered up at the top of the South immediately, right? You'd think at least. I don't know. You got Baker and Mike. You win in that really. South, that's for sure. But yep. ba- yep. hey, Baker, the fighting Baker Mayfields, the fighting the fighting Baker Mayfields out of Tampa Bay, man, one million dollar so, man. Legend lives on. Russell Wilson to Pittsburgh Wags is that a done deal? That is a Agreed that to. is done. Yeah, it, it's yep. it's not inked. Nothing's going to be inked until Wednesday. But yeah, um, yeah. thirty seven one point two is what 1.2 million is what Pittsburgh's picking up. And then the rest of the 30, uh, 38 or 37 um, is in the bag of Denver. So that's how bad Denver wants him out of there, bro. Yeah, so. man. That's just what a, what a disaster. I mean, dude, you know, it's not bring like- CR around the locker room a little bit more. Maybe you'll, <laughs> maybe people want you to stay. I think about some of the worst sports contracts ever and worst Bobby trades Bonilla. ever. Bobby Bonilla. The Russell Wilson deal, it's man, it's it's not as as much of a dumpster fire as like the Josh Hamilton contract. Mm-hmm. But like when Josh Hamilton signed with the Angels, like I think everybody knew. Like speaking of bodies breaking down, like yeah, dude, it ain't was- gonna be too much longer before this whole Josh Hamilton thing. You know, father times a mother. He's undefeated. Josh Hamilton out in California. Yeah, oh, and oh. you know, you, you look at it now, like with Russell Wilson. I, man, I thought Russell Wilson had. Two, three more Pro Bowl type years left in him when he got to Denver, and dude, he that was one. terrible. Brock, yeah. uh, Brock yeah. Osweiler, that that oh, yeah. deal right there. That, that was, was another guy too. that got paid to go. Well done, away. Houston. Yeah. Well done, uh, Houston. Sam, I, I always said that. Uh, who the guy? Who was the? Who was the dude? Sam Bradford. Sam Bradford's agent was the best agent in all of NFL for <laughs> you know damn near a decade. The guy never even played a damn down, but was making more money than Tom Brady for almost ten years. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. Great. Hey, Jeff, I wanted to ask you. Uh, I was going to bring this up while I go, Wags. We were trying to uh, talk about Yeah, guys, about I got to get out of here. Mondays are my meeting day, yeah, so I got to get ready to roll. 10 4. Y'all have a good day, man. I'll see you all tomorrow. Yep. Later on, buddy. Uh, that running back market, you know, with the Cowboys, you know, who are you going to go after? I mean, whatever. I saw uh, Mike Fisher reporting today that uh, with Green Bay not being able to get anything figured out with Aaron Jones that they want to lock into, that the Cowboys are ready to jump on Aaron Jones uh, to try to sign him as a as a free agent running back. Your thoughts on that with the running uh, back? Yeah, I want to look up Aaron Jones' age first of all. That's yeah, yeah, and uh, there's been some injury stuff there as well too. Cause he's um, gonna be, he's twenty nine. Man, just honestly, I know the Cowboys have. They've got few. They they don't have that many draft picks, but they got their premium round picks. They've got one yeah. through three. Yeah, man, just take your running back. Just take your running back. Right. If you you know if if you're in a second round and and there's, I would th- I think by the time the Cowboys get to their pick in the second round, there might not be a running back off the board yet. So mm-hmm. you'd have your pick, man. If you. If you decide that, look, man, we can, you know, if Jonathan Brooks is ready, you know, middle of the season, we can bring him in, uh, whatever the case. Or if you like Trey, you just like Trey Benson from Florida State better. Mm-hmm. I would take a running back in the draft. I would yeah. not, I would not sign one of free agents. Get one of these guys that's all beat up and a little longer in the tooth. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree. Jordan checks in. All right, gentlemen. I myself, I have to run as well. I uh, hope you all have a great show. Chaos Theory. We're back tomorrow, 10 to 11 a.m. Check us out. Now it's time for these guys taking over the ship. Y'all have a great show, guys. Thanks, Rodney. It's Jeff. It's Jordan. It's only an hour. Jordan, you get some rest after Under Armour yesterday. It's weird how they're doing that. So they do like the linemen in the morning and then skill guys in the afternoon. Um. So actually, I can tell you the exact schedule. Oh. However, they don't really stick to that schedule. Um, yeah. 
because you know things like that are always getting delayed. Uh, but or the way it works, off, real quick, man, just go ahead and run down that schedule. You're good. D line to O line is nine to eleven thirty. Run back linebackers and running backs ten to twelve thirty, and then uh, QBs, receivers, DBs, tight ends eleven thirty to two thirty. Um, and also in the first hour for like all of those sessions, they're doing testing uh, indoors, which you know they do the forty five ten five. Uh, you know, pretty much every camp combine shuttle you can think of that's useful. Um, they're doing, they're also getting measurements, height, weight, wingspan, arm length, all that great stuff. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what happened in Dallas yesterday. It's always at Arlington Martin high school. They're one of the under armor programs in the DFW area. So it always takes place there. They knock out the testing indoors and they come outside. They'll do some drills, um, you know, some warm up stuff, run some routes on air. They'll do their pass set, stuff like that. And then they'll get into one-on-ones, which is, you know, the most fun part of it. Um, and, you know, you get to see some matchups you would have never seen before or, you know, couldn't see elsewhere. Um, so that's why these camps are always fun. And also they're always fun because the only guys there are guys with offers, right? And yeah. not just guys with offers. 90, meh, I'd say about 75% of them are like legitimate dudes. Like that actually yeah. have a chance to play in the NFL. Yeah. Um, whether just body type or for whatever other reasons, like they're they're at this Under Armour camp for a reason. So for sure, yeah, they're they're always loaded. Uh, and like I said, yesterday's was Dallas. Next week's will be Houston on Sunday at a uh, Planet Ford in Spring, uh, Planet Ford Stadium, um, in Spring. So uh, looking forward to that one. But yeah, long long day standing outside. Mm-hmm. But it was much better than last year. Last year was like. 50 degrees and it was super windy the whole time where I legitimately had a wind burn. Um, whereas this year started off 40 and ended in the 70s. So just had to take a couple of jackets off, but that's wasn't the, too bad uh, at all. Got to layer up. And that's typically how those spring spring camps go. And I, I was thinking about this because I know I, I saw some, some social media back and forth where one fan base is trolling the other about recruiting news. It's going to break the internet. I saw that this morning and, uh, I think it was some AM people in Texas, people going back and forth, but whatever the case. Um, I started thinking, you know, Arch Manning's commitment was one that kind of broke the internet. Uh, and, and and maybe not break the internet, but because it's hard, it's it's gonna be hard for anybody to replicate the the buzz and the aura around the Arch Manning recruitment. But we talk about man, every year there's one of those those recruitments that if you win it, it sets you up really nice to be able to cash in and reap the benefits of that because that guy, there's just one one or two guys in every class, man, that everybody's just going to gravitate towards. Is there is there a guy in 2025 for you like that? Like, I know you mentioned Decoria Moore as maybe being a guy like that, but is there is there a guy? It doesn't even have to necessarily be a five-star guy, just one guy that, man, if he when he commits somewhere, that school, the, the commitments, the quality commitments are going to start flooding in for that school. Um, man, I mean, to be honest, I don't think we'll ever see a, uh, kind of follow up domino effect to a commitment like Arches ever. No, 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 no. Um, like <laughs> and I can't remember if I've told this story, but, uh, I remember being in called station at the state tournament. Go ahead, Jordan. Hey, real, real quick bef- before you continue, my daughter's on spring break this week and my wife is going out of the country on a school trip. So I'm, I'm playing mr mom by myself this week so i have to get up and tend to something real quick but jordan go ahead tell the story no and i'll be back as soon as i can no problem so uh arch if y'all remember obviously committed summer 2022 uh he actually committed while mike roach and hudson standish were working at horns 24 7 at the time a uh, pair of mentors for me they were on the way from dallas to to called station while you know they got word that it popped um like, I'll, I'll be honest, like I was talking to people in September of 2021. They were telling me, like, not Texas is probably getting Arch Manning, just that Texas is getting Arch Manning. So it wasn't ever really surprising to us that a uh, commitment would happen. It was just about um, when and not if. And so a heads up was always going to be really uh, interesting with him because his family kept everything in such a tight circle. So, you know, once they committed, Mike and Hudson only got a 10 minute heads up. They obviously had a bunch of stuff prepared, um, you know, to release because, you know, it's the biggest commitment of all time. Um, 
But the story I'm getting to, while we're at the state seven on seven tournament, so sometime that weekend, I don't remember the exact day, it lasts three days. While we're there, sweating our asses off in the called station heat, I remember talking to Hudson Standish about guys that had silently committed but hadn't popped yet. Um, but guys that had silently committed because, you know, Arch had just obviously went public with his decision. And I wrote it in the behind the scenes, but uh, Freddie DeBose had a really close relationship with Hudson Standish. And he actually called him like that same day that Arch committed and told him like, I don't know when I'm going to do it, but I'm going to Texas. Another thing, the main reason I'm telling the story, CJ Baxter, per, per Hudson, he told me this. Not, not direct info, but per Hudson. CJ Baxter was at a and on a visit whenever Arch Manning committed. Saw he committed. FaceTime Texas in his hotel room and committed on the phone while he was on an AM visit and called station. Do you remember AM was one of those schools for, for CJ Baxter? It was really always going to be, you know, Texas or Florida State, one of the other Florida schools. But man, AM made some very legitimate pushes. I mean, we know the last staff, we know how they got down. So, you know, they they were in it. And the fact that Texas earned a commitment from the number one running back on their board while he was on the Arch Rivals campus on a visit in a hotel room. Yeah. Pretty epic stuff. So, yeah, that's like the arch effect is what I'm trying to bring up. It, where I don't think real. it can it ever was, be replicated. Yeah. Um, just because, like, we talk about, like, aura for quarterbacks and all that shit. But, like, arch legitimately has it. You know, people want to play with that dude. He's the, the biggest name, you know, high school recruit of all time. The yeah. biggest high school recruit of all time. Like, there's so much, like, there's so much money to be made, even from, like, a marketing perspective. Like, if I'm one of these receivers, obviously, like, everyone who's watching this is like, well, if I'm a receiver, I'm going to Texas. But, like, I would just look at how much money you can make from being Arch Manning's, like, receiver one or receiver two and just sharing a field with him as a starter and having him throw you passes. Yeah. Like, you're raking it in. Yeah. Um, it's the most it's the most impactful recru recruitment, recruiting win Texas has had since Chris Sims in 99. Oh, even, yeah. I think even more so than Vince Young, because by the time VY got there, there, you know, Mac had pretty much stocked the cupboard. And, you know, Vince came into a situation where it was an older team he came mm -hmm. into. But even once some of those older guys funneled out, basically they were able to bring Vince Young along. They redshirted him and he kind of got to grow uh, with those linemen that he was with on the scout team as freshmen. You got to remember Justin Blaylock, Casey Studdard, Lyle Sinley, they all redshirted as freshmen. But Chris Sims, if Chris Sims commits and signs in 99, you get him. Then you get Roy Williams, Sloan Thomas, and B.J. Johnson in the class of 2000. You know, class of 2001, which I think pound for pound, uh, it, it's right up there. Maybe not pound for pound is not the right term. Pound for pound, the 05 class was the best Max sign. But 2001 might be the most decorated class Max sign. That's Cedric Benson, Derek Johnson, Michael Huff. Aaron Ross was in that class initially. That kind of laid the foundation, but you don't get that foundation without Chris Sims. Like it was, he was the Super Bowl MVP son, USA Today Player of the Year, all that fun stuff. That was that was back. Jordan, USA Today Player of the Year used to be the big thing back then. And Texas got both at ninety nine because Sims was the offensive player of the year. Core Redding was the defensive player of the year. But you're talking about nineteen ninety nine and two thousand twenty four. That gap right there. Of that's how long it was between the Sims commitment and the Arch Manning commitment to talk about two commitments that really had the potential to change the trajectory going forward for this program. And I think, I think if you, you know, hindsight, we know what the Chris Sims commitment did, but depending on what happens with Arch, you know, you got to the playoff, you won a conference championship with a roster with guys. Some of them came to Texas specifically. I don't know, I don't want to say specifically to play with Arch, but it was kind of the cherry on top but now you go into the sec and if arch manning leads you to a conference championship or you win one while he's on your roster you look back at that recruitment with i don't know maybe maybe holding a more high esteem maybe than the chris sims commitment just because of just because of how much college football has changed and i think you look at how chris sims his career in particular played out but there's no question, man. Texas has reaped the benefits of Arch Manning. And I'm with you, Jordan. I, it's it's going to be a long time before we see another one like that happen. But do you think there's that guy in 2025? Does that guy exist? Yeah. So 
uh, like obviously no, like I said, no one will ever be to the degree of Arch, but um, you know, in 2022, I don't know. I don't know for a guy in 2022, probably Kelvin, I think is who the staff focused on is their just number one target across the board. Uh, in 24, in 2024, we all know that dude is Colin Simmons, at least in my opinion. Yeah. Um, when I'm saying that dude, I mean that dude is in like, this is the guy that the staff is sitting down and saying like, we're not missing on this guy, yeah. right? Like we can't. <laughs> that's that's how much we need him. Um, so in 25, I think that could be DeCorian. Um, Also, I don't know. I mean, DeCorian. That one is just that one is going to be a long one to cover. Um, yeah. And honestly, until we get later on in the spring, probably late April, you know, he's going to be at Texas for the spring game. But coming out of late April, you know, seeing where things are. Um, but, you know, with the, the big name guys like him, like a lot of the, the months of spring that we're in right now is just staging leading up to. You know, where things actually happen, like official visits, the end of summer, some commitment, stuff like that. This is all just staging and everyone's feeling each other out. Right. From mm -hmm. their point of view still. Yeah. Um, but honestly, I think the Corian's the easy answer, in my opinion. And I mean, the opinion of 24-7 sports, uh, we think Devin Sanchez is a better prospect. I think so, too. Um, as much as I love the Corian, Devin is just. It, I don't even I can't put words into like describing the how I view him. Can I can I ask you a question that's somewhat controversial? This might be a better question for Hudson, the hmm. people that are on the rankings committee. Does the fact that North Shore's had some guys that haven't panned out at the college level, and, and the flameouts have been spectacular, whether you're talking about Zach Zach Evans or Denver Harris, does that hurt Devin Sanchez? You think? Or do, or do people do do or uh, is nobody looking at it like that? Am I just overthinking it? Um, you know, I don't think they like consider things like that into ranking just because. I mean, that's that would be uh, put you in effect ranking, yeah, exactly. And like, you would have had to have heard something specific about the prospect in question to for it to impact the ranking. Yeah. Also, and like. Just because, I don't know, two kids might not have worked out. You can't slap that label on the rest of them. Like, every kid out of Lake Travis isn't getting asked about fucking peanuts. You know what I mean? Or, like, that type of stuff. So, um, I, like, I, I don't think it went into it. I know our staff doesn't factor stuff like that uh, into it. But, um, man, I mean, look, I, I played North Shore when they had all those teams or all those guys on the team. Mm -hmm. I watched them play Lake Travis, too. Like, look. Devin, again, Devin is the best defensive back prospect I've ever seen in my life at the high school level in person. And it's not remotely close. It's not close. And I have this tweet of him where he's a baby. It's in spring of 2022. Um, he's a fr It's spring of his freshman year. And he looks like six years old. And he had like eight offers. And I remember I was out there with uh, one of my buddies, Jawan. He does a lot of video photo content in the Dallas area, but he's all over Texas. Uh, Weedham Bows is his username. You've probably seen him. I was at the spring practice with Juwan, and I remember seeing Devin Sanchez uh, because he didn't start as a freshman. He rotated a little bit on varsity, um, but he was coming in and getting ready to start going into his sophomore season that fall. And just seeing him move um, and the way he practiced and all these other things about him, like that I could just – this is another reason why I think, like, <laughs> when Devin Sanchez committed to Ohio State, all the AM and Texas fans are like, well, pfft, North Shore kid, we don't want another Denver Harris. And it's like, well, you don't understand. Like, one, he's 10 times better than all the other kids. Uh, and two, like, he has, like, a pro's pro mindset. Like, he's an okay. awesome, amazing kid. Yeah. Um, never got to worry about him. Always in class, always at school, always at practice. He's a true leader. He's been their leader since the sophomore year. Um, but I remember telling Jawan – at that practice, 10 minutes into it, I'm like, I know this is crazy to say, but I think Devin Sanchez is going to end up being better than Denver, even though Denver just graduated. And he's like, yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's not too crazy. By the end of the practice, I was like so in love with him as a prospect <laughs> that I told Jawan, I'm like, where he's at as a freshman, where he's going to be at as a sophomore, I think will be further ahead than Denver ever was in high school. 
And like I've talked to a bunch of people about this. I think the way I felt about Jonte and Malik Muhammad as seniors, that's how I yeah. feel about Devin Sanchez as a junior. So okay. I I just I, I worry about the North Shore thing because I, I know look, all it takes is one bad apple to spoil the bunch for the stigma to be there on guys that come out of some schools. You know, the NFL does it with colleges. Like, you know, believe it or not, after, you know, Ricky Williams career went sideways and now it's, it's funny, you know, Ricky missed a bulk of the prime of his career for something that wouldn't even, you know, nobody bats an eye at it now. Well, you know, if you test positive for, for weed, but, you know, the stigma on it was, well, all Texas guys must do that. And you ask, you know, Rod Babers, Corey Redding, anybody that went to the combine after after Ricky's deal, they all got asked about it. Like, how much have you done it? You know, is it, do you have a problem with it? This, that, and the other. How much so, have you done it? So you wonder, yeah, so you, you, you that I know that happens at that level. And, and I've heard plenty of buzz at the high school level, whether it's, you know, fair or not, that tends to happen to guys. But, you know, hopefully – Devin Sanchez works out and is a three and done guy to the NFL. And then, you know, whatever, North, nobody, nobody bats an eye about North shore, North shore kids having issues, but man, my, I guess my point Jordan is like, can a, you know, can a court and a non quarterback, like can a wide receiver or a corner have that much pull in a recruiting class? Um, yes, I think it's got so. a feeling on it. Like, right? Well, okay, I don't know about, and I've talked about this on the show multiple times. I don't know about poll in a singular recruiting class, like that that same class. Mm -hmm. But, like, and again, I've talked about this a lot. But, like, Jonte is a, a guy that so many, like, young kids looked up to and continue to look up to and, you know, mm -hmm. want to be like and look at as a role model because he went, like, mega viral. Yeah. He has changed the perception of Texas for a lot of young kids. Um, and also, uh, obviously, you know, <laughs> Texas having the best season they've had since I was in diapers uh, is going to have an effect as well. Yeah, that, But, that, you know, having really popular players that are really well liked and especially re really well liked in their communities and where they're from and in the South Dallas area and Dallas is a whole DFW. And Texas guys like that, John T. Cook, Malik Muhammad, Colin Simmons, like those aren't just high school players like those are damn near celebrities and. And, and the parts of Dallas where they're from. I agree. Okay. Um, I, I agree with that. Like, I, and, I can remember uh, just a couple of examples what you're talking about. I can remember over the years, like, I know back in the late 90s when Joe Walker came out of North Shore, you talk to any of the Houston guys, especially like, uh, again, two guys that I just mentioned, like, you talked to Rod, you talked to Corey Redding, guys that were in the Houston area at that time. Man, Joe Walker was one of those guys that kind of opened the door a little bit for guys to go to Texas because Joe Walker was at Texas when Texas started becoming the cool school. Uh, and he was he was a guy that a lot of those guys looked up to. So to your point, uh, the Dallas area, <clears throat> the one guy that I remember kind of changed things kind of the late, late aughts, early 2010s, the guy that changed things there was Christian Scott. When Christian Scott was coming out of Skyline and went to Texas, all of a sudden now it's Texas can't recruit DISD. Nobody from DISD wants to go there. Christian Scott goes there. Now it's like you open this pipeline to Skyline and all these other schools that Texas suddenly had a foot in the door with. So, yeah, I I need to remember that and file that away because you have mentioned that. So, I mean, I'm looking at it too. Uh, I'm looking at I got too much tunnel vision on that thing. I got to look at the bigger picture there in terms of what kind of pull those guys have. Yeah, also like like <laughs> – it's not like I can make a chart or that or of that or like a stat or anything. Like we'll never be able to measure that. But right. you know, I see the influence they have and all that. And you know, it's always like there's only so few um there's only so few players I've seen that and I've seen it in playoff games too, which kind of blows my mind. But there's only so few players where the team they play on whoop the other team's ass. And then they shake hands, and the kids from the team they just played against are asking for pictures, their autograph, and their glove. <laughs> I've yeah. seen it happen with Garrett Wilson, Cade Klubnick, Micah Hudson, Colin Simmons, um, and, I mean, Jonte. But Jonte pissed off everyone in that district, so it would only be non-district and playoff stuff. Um, so, 
Yeah, but yeah. uh, but and then Evan Stewart was like in Frisco ISD. I never saw him and like didn't play his senior year because he was stupid. But yeah, um, yeah, like those are the those are guys that that have a lot of pull, and you know, kids look up to them. It always helps having well like players, well you know, popular players, and it's like the the same bonus you get from you know having guys like that is the same bonus you get from having a guy like Chris Gilbert on the roster. Except, you know, the people looking up to him that want to be like him aren't 15, 16, 17, 18. Uh, yeah. They're in their 30s and 40s and have major influence in a lot of these guys' decisions as right. high school coaches. So. In in general, what kind of feedback do you and Hank get? You and Hank, because Hank South was there yesterday too. Got a shout out. Yeah. To uh, in general, because I, I know you talked about when you went to Under Armour Atlanta, there was no buzz about Alabama, which still, I, I still can't wrap my head around that. But yeah. how much how much buzz was there for Texas? I know you and Hank did a good job of taking pictures, making sure you got pictures of guys rocking Texas backpacks walking in there or whatever it was. How much buzz does Texas have right now? Yeah, so uh, Hank actually talked to like 80% of the kids we have content on just because, I mean, y'all kind of know how I got in the media world. I'm a you know photographer. So at these big events, I always get stuck on photo duty, which I don't mind at all, but just not a ton of talking with kids, mostly just watching. Um, but uh, a lot of buzz of Texas. Um, there wasn't a ton of Texas kids there. Like, actually, there's less than there usually is, uh, mm-hmm. like Texas targets. And I think it's just because, like, we're getting to the point where it used to be like, okay, he's a senior. He's not showing up to anything. Now it's yeah. like he's a junior. He's not showing up to anything, <laughs> you know. Um, so the ones that do show up and compete, like Riley Pettijohn, uh, Fasusi, Ty Haywood, you love guys like that. You know, yeah. they keep showing up and whooping ass, showing they're the best. So, I uh, love to see stuff like that. But um, Texas buzz, I mean, I, I don't know. They they just came out of the playoff. There's always going to be people excited about them. And one thing that I've thought is really cool, I mean, and I would have never heard about this because uh, this is my first spring doing spring ball visits for Texas recruits. But – Asking high school coaches, because, you know, I've been to a bunch of schools already. There's a lot of kids who I think are Texas-level talents, but they don't have an offer from Texas. Yeah. Well, not not a lot. There's a very select few. Cause right, they, right. You know. And I'll ask the coach, like, this kid has other big offers. Texas is a big in-state school. Like, how long do you think they have to where it's, like, too late for them to offer? And he was like, well, what do you mean? And I'm like – well, Texas kind of has a tendency to piss off some kids <laughs> sometimes by taking long to offer, taking too long to offer. And honestly, you know, majority of the time it's because it is Texas's fault that they did take long to, too long. And he's like, man, I mean, I think that's a thing, but like they went to the playoffs last year. Like <laughs> people have a lot more patience with them now. Yeah. And I was like, no, like you're right. And as far as Chris Gilbert goes, Again, I wasn't talking to a ton of uh, of the recruits, so you know, don't know if other guys might have brought him up. Probably a better question for Hank on the board, but uh, you know, Adam Mesquite Horn, um, and I, I wrote about it in the Stampede this morning. But that whole Mesquite Horn staff came up from under Chris Gilbert's uh, like tutelage and coaching under him. Yeah, and one of Chris Gilbert's first calls was Mesquite Horn and Lamont Rogers, the top 100 offensive tackle they have. You know, Ty Haywood and Michael Basusi are, you know, the two biggest names, but there is another top 100 offensive tackle prospect in DFW in 2025, and his name is Lamont Rogers. Yeah. Uh, great basketball background. Um, really, really funny kid, cool kid, very blunt, which I like. Um, and another fun thing about him, he also plays soccer in his Mesquite Horns goalie on the, at the varsity level as really? well. Really? The only other – the only ever football prospect I've heard that plays goalie was Micah Hudson, but he played on the JV because the varsity goalkeeper for uh, Lake Belton, I was told, was that track kid I, I talked about a couple of weeks ago, Kevin yeah. Jones Jr. And they were like, Mike, you're not better than this guy. Um, but, but yeah, so Lamont plays goalie, and that whole staff has a lot of ties to Dallas and ties to Chris Gilbert. And uh, Jamal Fenner's also working on it as well because – not only do they have ties to Chris Gilbert, this staff spends a lot of time with THSCA stuff. If you're the director of high school relations, you're going to spend a lot of time with those guys as well. So it's kind of been a group effort there. Um, Kyle Flood 
and Lamont they're talking, but uh, you know, with where the recruitment's at right now, it definitely feels like they're trying to get more of the support staff involved. Um, yeah, and I I'll say a couple things too. Just you know, this will be what the fourth cycle, fourth full cycle for Sark and the staff, and we're kind of getting an idea of how they operate. I'll say twenty two. It'll be the. I mean, yeah, it'll be the fourth full cycle, the twenty five classes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The twenty two, yeah. twenty three, twenty four, and twenty five. Um, sorry, I had to do math on my fingers on the air. No, but, you're you know, so good. The years always mess me up too. Oh, it's all good. Um, you know, knowing how Sark and staff operate, they've got kind of the early workings of their board. Basically, like, hey, we'd be we're doing ourselves a disservice if we don't offer this kid, and we know that next wave of offers is going to go out during the spring evaluation period when coaches have a chance to get on the road and see guys. And then usually by the time they get to their summer camps, the board kind of is what it is at that point. And maybe they've moved some guys up. Maybe they've moved some guys down. They prioritize some guys. Maybe they drop some guys in terms of priority. Maybe they're guys that weren't on the board that are now priorities. And I think it's worth mentioning, too, you talk about the patience factor. That's going to help Sark because I know one thing Sark, I don't want to say he's worried about it or is trying to curry favor with anybody, but he's cognizant of the fact and I think this is something that Mike Elko has to be too. Those are the two the two coaches in the state that it applies to. If they offer a kid and then suddenly that kid tries to commit and they tell him, well, now you don't have a spot. We won't take your commitment right now. I think Sark would almost rather be late on an offer, making sure it's the right move than having to tell a kid, no, you can't commit. As a matter of fact, I, I could almost guarantee you that's Sark's line of thinking. He would much rather do that be laid on an offer than tell a kid yeah we're not ready to take your commitment yet you know that that is true um that that is true and it's a great point and it's it's a point i don't think a lot of people bring up enough that are complaining about the lack of a texas offer but um because think about it jordan have you ever heard have you ever heard any recruits be pissed off at tech or tcu or baylor or houston well yeah I have, <laughs> and, but but where it gets in the public sphere and it's a big uh, deal. No, but that's oh, also who? because uh, like the Horns twenty four seven site, thousands of people are reading my shit within hours. Yeah, the Baylor site. I'm lucky to get a hundred views by the end of the day. Yeah, you know what I mean. The it's same concept. Big... Pe- people care more. There's more money in the school, more money in the football program. Like it's gonna go nuclear if it's something that people care about. When any other school in the state makes a mistake in recruiting. It might last in the news cycle 24 hours and then it's done. If it happens, if Texas or Texas AM messes something up, it's like a nuclear bomb went off and it's the end of the world. And this staff is terrible. What are they doing? They don't know what they're doing and so on and so forth. It's those two schools because those two schools are the two biggest brands in the state. Yep. Um, I don't know, like what what you said about the offer and kids wanting to commit and trying to combat that. Like, I don't know. Like, I know some schools will sit the kid down and be like, "Hey, we're offering you, but we want to see this, this, and this from your junior year or your sophomore year." Yeah. Or when you come camp this summer, we need you to be the best guy there. Right. Like, stuff like that. Yeah. Like uh, Nick Saban, Alabama. Like we we talked about it a lot. Yeah. You know, unless you were a Micah Hudson or Garrett Wilson. Um, your offer wasn't worth shit until you showed up to camp and sweat your ass off all day for eight hours. Yeah. So, yep. You know, like Tavondre Sweat, if you look at Tavondre Sweat's profile, he had an Alabama offer, but I think that was one of those offers. And by the time he committed to Texas, I don't I don't think T. Sweat ever made it to Tuscaloosa. Yeah, no, a lot of cats didn't. And even there'll, there'll be a lot of cats who do make it to Tuscaloosa on visits, but – Again, can't ever commit to nothing. So. You know, you know who the first the first recruit. There were two recruits that kind of opened my eyes to the Bama thing, and this guy. Keep in mind, this was this was early early Nick Saban's tenure. I remember uh, Samaje P. Ryan kind of telling me that that's how the <laughs> process at Bama worked because Samaje had one of those Bama offers. Yeah, and uh, Jake Rollerson also told me that you know dealing with Alabama is a different. It's just kind of a different deal. Like if you. If you want to major in something specific, man, Nick Saban might tell you, all right, well, if you want to major in that, I don't think Alabama's the place for you then. 
Yeah, because uh, we're here to major in sports ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, man, we need to – somebody needs to put that Cardell Jones quote on a throw pillow. I didn't come here to play school. <laughs> on a throat pillow? Yeah. A throat pillow. Know, how are you going to fit a quote on a throat pillow? A throat pillow? Are you talking like the things people wear on planes? A throw pillow that you have on your couch, dog. Oh, I thought you were saying throat pillow. Throat. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, R O W. I was so I'm like, I've never heard it called that. I think that's what he's talking. I'm like, how does a quote fit on there? No. Jeez. Um no. CB, CB brought up a quote. He said he, Mike Elko said Texas AM was a flagship school in the state. And he said it with such confidence, too. Um, I don't know why, whenever we're talking about quotes, why I think about like the Michael Jordan memes. And like it's a picture like Jordan posing with the six rings on his fingers. And he's got his hand kind of right here on his head. And the quote just like below is like F them kids or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Michael Jordan F them kids memes uh never get old for me. It's kind of yeah, like uh it's kind of like when I watch uh commercials or watch TV and watch animals doing human like activities. That'll always be funny to me. Yeah, yeah. Until the uh fuck man, what's the name of the <laughs> What's the name of that that company or brand that's like, if only you donated ten dollars and it's like the saddest like dying oh, yeah, the uh yeah I forget what it is. it's not the dying dog commercials or whatever. Oh, it's the like, AS, the AS, where it's yeah. like Jesus Christ, turn it off. Like <laughs> the I don't want to see the this. society or whatever it is. Yeah. yeah you got the one know. about you know sending uh sending money to Africa too, like for six cents a day, you can feed a starving family. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's gonna be more than six cents a day, man. So you're talking about Michael Jordan just now. Have you seen on Twitter some folks my age are starting to pull up videos of Michael Jordan where they're debating he might not uh might not be the talk of the town like everyone from your age. Well, I mean, really older than you, my dad's age, talks about him like. What do you mean? Who's your goat, Jeff? It's Michael Jeffrey Jordan. There's no question. But see, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I don't hate LeBron. I love LeBron. Who's number two? Disclosure. LeBron. Okay. LeBron's the most impressive athlete I've ever seen on a basketball court. Like, no question. It, it's, it's, a, it's a spectacle watching LeBron okay. play. You know what was a fucking spectacle last week at the Mavs game? Luka Doncic moves so slow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like he, he genuinely moves slow as hell. He's the slowest moving person on the court, like outside of the centers. And, and like you look up and it's like, yo, how the fuck does this guy have a triple double? <laughs> like, I, I was genuinely blown away by that. But um Luka. and I love Luca. Luca's my favorite current player, even over LeBron. Just because yeah. I'm a Mavs fan, and it's cool. It's cool that the Mavs have one of the best players in the world. But yeah, I will say th this though for for the Michael Jordan stuff, the videos I was talking about were just <laughs> it was someone like doing commentary over like one of his like game tapes, and like he was just refusing to use his left hand for like multiple clips and different series or whatever, and just kept driving right, and it showed like him breaking for it was you know it's people my age being stupid on Twitter. I know what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's what that was. But uh, Jordan, Keelan Russell killing it this weekend. Look, man, uh, we, we've written about it on our site. Like Keelan Russell is the uh, – that's where Texas is going if KJ Lacey decommits. That's who Texas is offering. That's who they're pursuing. That's who they're recruiting. Um, and with the intent to land. So I've always liked Keelan. Uh, I remember his sophomore year – I can't remember what game it was when I first saw him. Um, I really liked him as a thrower. I thought right then and there, he mechanically is the best Duncanville passer I'd ever seen, which isn't saying much because Jaquindon Jackson was really just like a running back with a arm that could throw a football like 100 yards. <laughs> like yeah, He could, throw a, fo he could throw a football over. He was like, if you took Joe Milton's arm, tuned it back like 20 throw power at the high school level, and then put him on, uh, I don't know, the legs of Jaquindon Jackson. That's what Jaquindon Jackson is. Jaquindon was Jaquindon was interesting because when I saw him in high school, I left a game thinking I watched him play a playoff game. I can't even remember. I don't know who they were playing. Mike and I went, 
Uh, it was the night before Texas played OU in the Big 12 championship game. <clears throat> Mike and I, it was at Mansfield. Mike and I went, and I, I left thinking, like, you know, he he's a good enough athlete that if quarterback doesn't work out, he's going to help a team win games somewhere. I felt like that could even be as a linebacker, like a hybrid, almost like a Shaq Thompson, like a like a jumbo, like a jumbo safety that could yeah. play in the box. Like he was just just a different athlete. Yeah. And so um with Keelan, I mean, my immediate takeaway is this mechanically the best Duncanville quarterback I've ever seen. Uh, as he came along that sophomore year, he started to just really turn it on. And by the playoffs, he was just throwing straight piss missiles uh, week in and week out. And it, he's kind of deceiving because he, he has a, a skinnier build um, off the top of my head. I don't know what his height weights are. We got him at 6'3", 175. Um, but he looks skinnier than that just because yeah. he has such long arms and long limbs. Um, but as a sophomore – I think that's when people first started, you know, picking up on how athletic he actually is. Uh, he had, I believe it was 80 yards. It might have been 60 yards. I believe it was over 50, though. Uh, rushing touchdown versus North Shore as a sophomore in that state game. Um, and then this past year, he also had a rushing touchdown because, yeah, I, I did say piss missile CB. Um, he had a uh, he had another rushing touchdown this year at state as well. And, look, man, I always am going to have respect for – quarterbacks that can lead their team to state i know he had a lot of different you know weapons around him but i'm always gonna have major respect for quarterbacks at a school like duncanville where a lot of their success is keelan figuring out how to manage all the personalities he has to throw to yeah and like because you know a lot of kids at duncanville have offers there's a lot of personalities there he's a leader of the team that everyone's looking to and he kept it steady got him all the way to state so and all, and uh, he really earned a lot of my respect. The week one sock SMU game this year, or the week one sock and Duncanville game that was at SMU. Yeah. Um, because everyone was talking about how DeCorian Moore had like 180 yards and three touchdowns and four catches by like the end of the first quarter. But like, no one brought up how Keelan was hitting him on the money 70 effing yards down the field, yeah. you know, in stride in the bucket. And Hudson Standish was at that game. I spent the game on the field taking photos, videos, um, you know, recording from the field. He was in the press box just getting a good scouting view on everything. And afterwards, you know, we obviously spent a lot of time talking about Decorian, but me and him were both like, yo, Keelan is better than SMU, like yeah. much better. And everyone else has realized that as the season went on, he got a big offer from Florida. Uh, A&M's offered him. A few of the big ones are coming after him. Obviously, Texas recruiting him. They, they won't offer him until, you know, KJ gives him a reason to, I guess. Um, but he's very much a Texas-level quarterback. I love his new ranking. I believe we have him like 63 or somewhere in the 60s like that. So, happy he got his new ranking. And, I mean. Yes, he, he is 63 he, in the country. He had all of us at 24-7 sports feeling really good about, uh, you know, our scouting and knowledge of the game. After he showed up to Under Armour yesterday and was by far and away the best quarterback there. It, it wasn't remotely close. And not only was he the best quarterback there, like he was ripping piss missiles every throw, every single throw. And he won alpha dog because it's pretty much unanimous decision that he was the best player there as a quarterback, which is kind of impossible to do at a camp like that. That That is interesting because Keelan Russell being ranked as high as he is, and maybe he drops outside of the top 100, but it's it, it's hard to – unless something just totally unforeseen happens, it's hard seeing a kid conceivably drop from, like, top 60 in the country to out of the top 247 by the end of the year. But he's – Jordan, he pretty much saves the in-state crop of quarterbacks, man, because we were talking uh, a couple of weeks ago after signing day and looking ahead to 25, it's one of the – leaner maybe the leanest year at quarterback i've ever seen in state like it i i'm sure there's another one that i'm forgetting but off the top of my head i'm like man i can't rem i can't recall a time where at the at that time there was really nobody that was on the radar i mean there's a reason why texas went out of state to get kj lacy yeah and and i mean to be honest with you keelan isn't like i didn't get the respect keelan didn't earn my respect to being a texas level prospect until that week one game, I'd say. Um, and even then, 
with quarterbacks and uh, the situation that he's in at his school with, you know, the number one receiver in America and a running back who runs like in the 10 threes. And then you go on defense and you have a five star edge rusher as well. Yeah. You want to see him continue to do that. And that's what he continued to do. He didn't, you know, have 300, 400 yards passing every week because they're whooping ass on everyone and having to hand the ball off by the second quarter. Um, but he's incredibly productive. I mean, Duncanville is 14 and one, second state championship in a row. He's 189 of 262 with a 72.1%, at 3,500 yards with 38 touchdowns to three interceptions. And he ran for 361s and six touchdowns. Um, but Keelan is the only guy in the state that has my respect of looking at them as, as a Texas level prospect, uh, yeah. at least at quarterback. And not only is he the only dude in the class and it's shallow in terms of Texas level talent being in state, but it's shallow just from good quarterbacks being in state. Like yeah. these are the guys I can think of that are FBS off the top of my head. Ty Hawkins who's committed to SMU from San Antonio TCU. Johnson or yeah, TCU, my bad. Um, Sawyer Anderson from Parish Episcopal who's committed to Purdue. Uh, Keelan Russell, obviously. And then Keldon Ryan, who's now at DeSoto, was at All Saints, I believe, this past season. Um, he's committed to Virginia Tech. And then there's uh, – shit, from Belleville, blanking on his last name. They have a QB commit. We had him as a four-star at some point, I believe. Uh, but he's a Baylor 2025 quarterback commit. I can't believe – Showable, Adam Showable. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah. So that's five. I got choked up a little bit. Yeah, that I'm sure. After that, those are the only dudes that come to head as, you know, legitimately power five FBS dudes. Yeah, Lloyd Jones out of Hitchcock's committed to the yeah. yeah, I always forget about him because he's a Hitchcock. I actually saw him play this year. Um, so, and Lloyd Jones might actually be, if I had to rank him, it'd probably be Keelan, Keelan, Ty Hawkins, Lloyd Jones. Lloyd Jones' ceiling is just so effing ridiculous. But at the same time, I've never seen Schobel in person. I'm seeing him next week at the NRM camp in person. That'll be my first time. So I'll have a better read of where he's at, yeah. you know, coming I mean, out of that. If you look at where the and, rankings, if you look at where the rankings committee has him, Jordan, I mean, Adam Schobel's a, an unranked four star and Lloyd Jones is an 89 and three star. So on a given day, you could have one, you could take one over the other. Yeah, and I messed up for anyone that's in Belleville. He's not actually from Belleville. He's from Columbus. Columbus, so I don't yeah. Know why I said that, but same kind of region, I guess. Um, yeah, it's yeah, close enough. But uh, but yeah, so those are the guys in, in the state of Texas where they kind of always had to go out of state. Um, you know, at least early on last summer, and also at the same time, like. I mean, KJ Lacey wasn't planning on committing when he did. Like he told us that he gave quotes about that. Um, it was more so the way he broke it down. He had visited Texas in April with the seven on seven team. Absolutely loved it. Texas had already offered him by then. And, you know, <laughs> when seven on seven teams visit, like the whole team isn't sitting and meeting with Sark, like they're pulling the individual kids yeah. that are actually getting recruited aside and meeting with them. And that's what happened with KJ, um, in April of 2023, when he was in town for the, the OT seven tournament that was in round rock. And then he came back that June for the elite camp. He got invited back to come work out at the camp and come visit. And um, he kind of – I can't really explain it a ton just because he didn't really explain it a ton. Um, but he was like, yeah, my parents don't go on a ton of visits with me. A lot of times it would just be me by myself. But he had told us – he brought his parents with him on the Texas visit because he told them, like, hey, I absolutely loved it and I was there in April and can, like, actually see myself, like, playing here and committing here one day like can y'all come with me so we can see it together so like it can have y'all's approval as well um and that's why they brought him but he told us like they never talked about him committing or any of that so they were there after the camp and he was like this is where i want to go mom dad like i think i'm just gonna do it and that's how it happened with him um I we haven't seen Sark do this yet. I mean, they they went to the portal with Quinn, but to me, that was that was so different. That was a very unique circumstance. Yeah. Our, so I don't know the answer to this question for Sark, but do you think it's more likely, just your opinion, 
you think it's more likely that Sark would reach for a quarterback and AJ Milby would reach for a quarterback? Or if they got in a bind, just say, hey, you know, we can push come to show, we can go to the portal and get one. Or you yes. think they'd rather I, I think they would rather build up their their own guy, kind of do, you know, the grassroots quarterback development. But at what point do you say, you know what, it's just the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Let's just go. If there's somebody in the portal that we like, let's just go get them, get them out of the portal. Um, I, I got to go high school because honestly, I think, I mean, I don't know this for a fact, but I heavily assume they had conversations about that in 2024. Once they realized how hard it'd be to get, you know, a big name dude in there after they landed yeah. arch. Um, and I think, you know, they just decided, all right, let's go figure out who has an incredibly high ceiling and a ton of tools to work with. And let's offer and go get that guy. And that's what Trey Owens was. And Trey Owens went from being this, you know, upside kid who's super tall, long, big arm, but not, you know, super athletic, not in great shape, not an amazing player, not super productive. To his senior year, he's going and beating Katie in the playoffs and sending yeah. him home. Yeah. Um, and he's as a completely different player as a senior is one of the best quarterbacks. He He's a late invite to All-American, and he's in the better half of the six quarterbacks that were there. Um, so the guy that they were smart about ended up making them look even smarter. So in 25, uh, I don't think they'd reach. Also, I think 25 is far enough from Arch where potentially they could maybe flip someone with a big name. Um, I know you said, you know, do you think they would reach? I just want to clarify that Keelan Russell, I know no. he's this number 63 player in the country, but there are Texas fans genuinely that stupid. They're just going to see he's committed to SMU. <laughs> right. Keelan Russell is a Texas level talent. Right. My, and, thing with, my thing with Keelan Russell would be Jordan. Like what if, you know, let's say and timing, timing could work out against you here. Like let's say Keelan Russell uh, commits to Texas A&M. Let's say he flips to A&M in August. Right. Mm-hmm. And what if you lose KJ Lacey like early October, early late October, early November? Do you have enough time at that point to go flip Keelan Russell? And what are, what does your quarterback board realistically look like? You know what I'm saying? Like that's that's the kind of stuff I'm thinking about, like worst case scenario type stuff. But I, I'm with you. I I think I think that's the one position where Sark really doesn't want to look at the portal unless unless there's just somebody in there like Quinn that it'd be like all right we'd be we'd be stupid if we didn't do this yeah um I don't know man like I, I <laughs> impossible to predict the future but uh if Keelan was I guess hypothetically flipped to AM in August um I would shut the door on Texas recruiting him almost just because yeah quarterbacks quarterback flips are pretty rare um but for quarterback to flip three times is is very rare um, I know our top quarterback from last year, Lagway, or not Lagway, Rayola was committed to three different schools, but he wasn't flipping besides once because he had decommitted from Ohio State. Yeah. So, um, but I don't know. I mean, there, there's a ton of flexibility there. And I think Keelan is going to be so interesting to track, uh, especially, be, you know, that door isn't getting open unless KJ decommits, obviously. But yeah. If that does happen, Keelan's recruitment is going to be incredibly interesting to track because I know people firsthand at SMU who have straight up told me they will do anything to keep that kid committed. Here's the interesting thing about Keelan Russell, too, Jordan. He's got all the leverage. Mm-hmm. You know, so he can he can say, hey, I'm gonna. I'm not going to flip. And I, I throw the A&M thing out there. Not that I have inside information. I'm using A&M as a hypothetical, right? Even if he loves A&M enough to commit, you know, why would he decommit until he's 1,000% sure, until you've taken it as far as you can to where, all right, it, it is actually time to sit down and make a decision. You know, he doesn't have to do anything really until now, that first week of December. What is it, this, the 4th through the 6th? Is now the signing period, the signing day? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it again, it, it's going to be crazy to see what happens with him just because, you know, SMU, uh, they don't have – I need to be careful with my words here. 
SMU has a lot of money to put into their NIL program, mm-hmm. um, but they're very smart about the way they do it. Uh, they're spending a lot on transfers, and they'll specifically focus in on guys kind of like Keelan. Um, and I know for Keelan, he's the quarterback in their class. They had him commit early. There is a large chunk of the collective that's already set aside for him for when he's there because he's the quarterback of the future for them. Yeah. That total number for his chunk doesn't have a cutoff. <laughs> you get me? So that said, I think, I think you said it all when you said whatever it takes. Yeah. That said, AM, Texas, Florida, other schools, it's going to be incredibly interesting to see how that all you know unfolds in that part of the recruitment and just the recruitment as a whole. Florida, obviously, you know, you, DJ Lagway, that, that's not cheap. Uh who's who's gonna be co- who's gonna be coaching Florida in 2025? Because it ain't gonna be Billy Napier. Hey, but new staff. Also, like, I don't know. Um, he'll have a spot. He, like Keelan Russell will have a spot kind of anywhere. So and because I actually talked about someone with this in our network last night. Like, let's say he commits to Florida and just wants to be a dumbass, right? Because, <laughs> again, like, I know I shouldn't say that because he's a kid, but, like, committing to Florida right now would be a dumbass move. Yeah, there's no reason. Um, And he was like, well, why would it matter? He can just decommit if they fire Billy. And I'm like, well, not really if they fire Billy. He's getting fired. Yeah. And he's like, also, like, think about it. Florida's been a shit show the last few coaches, like, they're about to lay down some straight cash to get a big name, I feel like, you know? And a number 60 player committed to SMU. What's a better way to make a big splash than to go get a quarterback out of Dallas? You know? Yeah, I just wonder, man. I just can't think of where they would go. It's one thing to think big. Like, I think – this is what fan bases forget with some of these coaching moves, right? Nick Saban, make them say no. Is is what the is what some of these fan bases forget with these college coaching jobs. You can have the money to go get a big name and you can think big name, but there might be a reason why big name wouldn't touch your program with a 10-foot pole. Like you might have all the money in the world of facilities and whatever, but it's like, dude, I I, I I'm not taking that. There's no way. Yeah, and I mean, like, uh, that's kind of what everyone did at Alabama. <laughs> and was like, hey, I'm leaving for Alabama. I need this much money or else I'm going to Alabama. And the school's like, all right, here you go. Yeah. And that was it. Everyone used Bama to get a raise. So, I don't know. And, um, and, you know I, I used to think big name, whatever. Dude, just hire the best coach. Just hire the right guy that you think can win, you know. Was Sark, Sark wasn't the biggest name Texas could have hired. No. But he was the right guy. Mike Elko no. wasn't the biggest name AM could have hired. But man, I I keep mm. saying it, Jordan. Uh if AM fans are just, and I know Aggies have a hard time with this word I'm about to bring up. If AM fans just have a little patience and just let Mike Elko kind of do his thing and don't place these grandiose expectations on him, just be willing to take this ride. Maybe you get to where you want to be with Mike Elko. And, and, and I, you know, if AM, I think if year in, year out there, you know, nine, 10 wins, I think that's that's better than what they've been for most of my lifetime. Yeah. I mean, pretty much uh, every year of your lifetime outside of the COVID year that they love to hold on to. There's that um, one, one year with Johnny Manziel where they were 11 and 2. Mm hmm. And then RC had a couple of them back in the Southwest Conference when it was like A and M and just a bunch of redheaded stepchildren in the Southwest Conference. I mean, nobody could touch them. So, yeah, uh, Antoine asked about the twenty six quarterbacks they've offered. Troy, I've never actually said his name, so I think it's Hoon, but I really don't know. Hune. Hune Troy, yeah, cool. Troy Hoon and Jared Curtis. Um, to be honest with you, I haven't watched film on either one of those dudes. Uh, Likely seeing Jared Curtis. I might be going to the Nashville Under Armour with a friend of the show, Colin Kennedy. Hey. Um, and if I do, then I'll be seeing Jared Curtis then. But uh, we'll get Troy Hoon and Jared Curtis whenever they come in on visits this spring and summer, and we'll talk to him then. But, you know, I personally haven't gone and looked and broken down any of their stuff yet. I usually wait towards it's, you know, closer to crunch time. And 
the dudes are actually have a shot to commit to Texas just because like the way I work with everything is like I have to know like all of the information and obtain all of it. Mm-hmm. So like I'm not just gonna go watch like his five minute huddle tape. You know, I'm gonna pull up, you know, full game tapes sometimes and look at other things, look at videos throughout Twitter, all these other measurements, like testing data we have of them. And also I'm gonna call people on a scouting team and ask what they think and what yeah. they like, what they don't like, what they want to see from him. And that's kind of the way it works for me with going through the different positions, especially quarterback, but I haven't looked at them yet. Um, and yeah, no, sorry. I'm just looking at the urban comment. Yeah. BK, I, I want to go before Trey gets in and you guys start your show. I, I want to kind of go uh, in the, in the flashback machine with you. When Sark was hired, were, what was your initial take? Not in terms of did you like the hire? Did you not? D- did you feel like okay, this guy can win, or were you come? Were you wait and see mode? Do you remember where you were on Sark when he was hired? Yeah, I was wait and see mode. I mean, I was cautiously optimistic, right? I mean, I I had been led astray, run amok, bamboozled, hoodwinked, whatever you want to use to describe the way Tom Herman did me. So I was a puppy with his tail between his legs a little bit. Yeah. But I think- uh, of the three, like Charlie, I, I had no faith in, didn't like the hire. And it was, it was even worse than I thought. I didn't think it'd be that bad, but it, I didn't it, think it would. It work. had a, it had a bad vibe from the start. Yeah. Tom, I thought would work. Like that's, that's why I was kind of like, all right, like I want to buy into Sark, but I really bought into Tom, thought it would work. And obviously that didn't. So I was in between on those three hires, but yeah, cautiously optimistic is, is where I would say I was. You, were you like me where you knew you had to have patience with Sark? Uh, like, yeah. What choice did you have at that point? Like, well, shit, nothing else has worked out. Yeah. I mean, look, I, patience is, is patience. Like if Sark goes seven and five or eight and four, I, I, I don't know if he gets fired or he's going into a year where he gets fired if he doesn't figure it out. So yeah. I was, I was willing to give him three years. I wasn't like fire him after five and seven, but also, in today's college football, you should be able to have stuff trending in the right direction yeah. in a in a quick enough time to where, yeah, I was willing to give him a couple of years, but if year three was not close to what it was, then my patience would have been tested for sure. Uh, I let you know to I, I know we we know very few level headed Aggies, but that that's my thing to A and M fans with with the Mike Elko hire, so, dude. Like you, you know you 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 were pl- you were given blank. You know, blank national championship plaques to Jimbo Fisher. I'm trying really hard to ignore ignore Trey right now. But, you know, you gave Jimbo a, a plaque with, you know, fill in the blank national title, and Kevin Sumlin got you 11 wins right out of the gate. Like, dude, Hey, and the swag copter. Swag copter. Like, just let Mike Elko get something established. And like you said, BK, just say, hey, just give it three years and yeah. see where you are after three. And if it's not going to work out, then at least you gave it three years. And maybe it's in a better place than it was when he took over. Or maybe he's got it going in the right direction. But I've, I've got that's that's proven really hard for people in College Station to do is, is have patience and look at things with the, through a realistic lens. Yeah. I mean, they're desperate. Like Texas fans were desperate because we had, you know, 11 or 12 years of suck and we were tired of it. AM's had decades and decades of suck. Like all, yeah, all they've yeah. wanted to do forever is be, is be where Texas has been. Just like what well, you in a hurry for program. at this point, you know? Yeah. yeah. The, the whole the whole Tom Herman era was like when you're playing with your dog, and Dude. you're like faking throwing the tennis ball, <laughs> and they're like, oh, <laughs> and they're looking for it. Like that's what the whole Tom Herman era was: is giving Texas fans fake hope. Except A and M has been like falling for the like running after the ball. And looking for it for like 20 years. So I understand why they're so like pissed and upset. But I mean, look, if this thing's going to get turned around, it'll be the fastest it's ever been turned around uh, because NIL and transfer portal exists and they can figure that out. You know, like Texas figured that out. So. It's, it's it's weird to think about it. Like, Trey, I'll, I'll bring you in for this one. Like, I, I, I'm i one of those weirdos. Like, I want AM and Oklahoma to be good because when Texas has those rivalry games, I want them to mean something. Yeah, now, that game, those games are always fun, but it's not fun when it's like, you know, eleven and 0 Texas playing five and six Texas A and M. Like, it's it's just, it doesn't it doesn't hold as much weight. I want A and M and Oklahoma to be good. Oh, yeah, can't hear Trey. Yeah, Trey, we can't hear you. No, no. 
We're recreating the Verizon commercial out in downtown Austin today. Is, is he in the middle of the street right now? <laughs> I yeah, see like, the crosswalk he's, is right. Oh, he's, he's been in the middle of the street this whole time. Is on a median? Maybe. Does he have a cardboard sign with him? Is <laughs> Trey going to be panhandling during the show? Will work for meth. <laughs> You know, yeah, I, I'll answer for Trey. We'll get Trey's. Oh, he's behind a construction. That's an orange and white construction sign, it looks like. So that's sh shielding him from the cars right now. Uh, I, I would prefer Oklahoma and Texas A&M to go 0-12 every year. I do not give a shit if, if <laughs> that matchup looks better on paper. Like, I get it. More people probably agree with you than for me than with me, but like I, yeah. I do not care if those teams. I, matter of fact, I root against them every other week of the year. So really, like I don't yeah. care if that's not viewed as a huge signature type of win for Texas because the other team's not good. I would rather the other teams just not ever be good. I mean, whether they're good or not, BK, it's a rivalry game. Like if you win it, it's a feather in your cap. Like who sure. cares? You know, I just yeah. I like the little extra juice on it. Yeah, Jason points out in the chat, Trey, this is your march on the Capitol. What are you marching for? Hey, March 11th. <laughs> march, new yeah, 311 day. That's right, 311, underrated band. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we got you now. Excellent. Uh, does it sound overmodulated? Because I cannot see no. the... All no, right. You're, you're perfect right now, 100%. You're perfect. Ooh, had to run back to the car real quick to grab the headphones that I forgot, but here we are, 11 minutes in. So thank you for your patience. Is this like an Alex Jones inspired bit? Like, what are you, what are you up to today? I just, uh, I have the perfect blockage in terms of this traffic blockade in the middle of Congress, shooting down towards the Capitol. I figured it would be a pretty cool vantage point to get to do the show from today as I continue my coverage of South by Southwest 2024. You should do some man on the street or woman on the street, perhaps. It's 2024. I could do either. I could go Z on the street if I really wanted to. Well, whatever. Hey, whatever melts your butter. Just, you know, get it done. You have a plethora of options for interview candidates, Trey. Put your interview skills oh, to yeah. use. Yeah. Talked to Jesse Eisenberg a little bit earlier about a new film he's got coming out called Sasquatch Sunset. It's a dark comedy following a family of Sasquatches through nature. They don't talk like Harry and the Hendersons. They just grunt and uh, get curious about things and sometimes accidentally eat uh, mushrooms that are a little bit more magical than they realized when they first tried them. So yeah, it was a, an awesome red carpet experience. And now I'm looking forward to chatting with PK for the next uh, 48 minutes or so with Justin Wells coming up here shortly. I was kind of hoping that we would get, you were going to tell me it was like the cocaine bear version, but it's like Sasquatches, like cocaine Bigfoot. So when I first saw this film, like the preview for it, I thought that's what it might be. But no, they play it more straightforward, but it does still have that darkly comedic element to it, like Cocaine Bear does. Dude, it was Cocaine Bear. Jordan, have you seen Cocaine Bear? No, nah, I, I actually never saw it. So. Yeah, you're, you're, you're missing out. BK, you saw Cocaine Bear, right? Mm -mm. The hell, Trey, you saw it. Yeah, I did. Elizabeth Banks directed it, I believe. It was, it was freaking awesome, wasn't it? It was one of the greatest films of our time. Wait, Jeff, when did you see this? Did you go to like the movie theater and let your no, daughter on to see to, this? Like I wanted to, but I missed out. I don't know what happened that I didn't make it to the theater, but I uh was it Amazon Prime or Peacock? I don't remember which one it was that I watched on. I watched it on some streaming service. Mm. Gotcha. I think, I think it's a peacock deal, if I'm not mistaken. Trey, are you on your phone? No, I'm on a computer. I've got my laptop propped up against this traffic blockade device barrier thing. Um, I was trying to hold it in my arm at first. That wasn't going to work very well. I don't have the bicep or shoulder strength to do that. So we'll see how long this lasts for. I may very well be uh, walking and talking at some point during today's show. All I'm right. Well, pull up behind me. I'll get out of here and let you guys get to it. I'm going to actually stay tuned into the show because I want to see. <laughs> Trey, someone, there, there, someone come stream snipe Trey and pull up right next to him. <laughs> somebody you're, you're getting some looks, Trey, wondering what you're doing. I'm I'm I wonder for the first person to come up and ask you what you're doing. It's gorilla fuckery, guys. That's what we call it in these parts. Hashtag gorilla fuckery. All right, we'll be back to do it tomorrow. Trey BK, you guys have a good show. Later, fellas. There they go. Man. <sighs> Are you on a median? Where are you? No, I'm just uh, standing between the 
Here, I'll, I'll show you real quick. Okay. So here I am. There's that way down Congress. There's this way down Congress. There's a oh my gosh. Thank goodness they didn't hit me. Um, so so yeah, I'm, I'm, theoretically, I'm in a lane, but the lane is blocked by this traffic barrier. Okay, so you're in a turn lane, I guess, in the middle yes. of the street. Yes, yes. and we uh, didn't get the chance to tell you this because I texted him right before the show, but Justin is joining us now, and I see a special guest on his end, too. Young Alexander, superstar in youth sports in East Texas. What is up, guys? Give him a hook on. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Raising him right. It's, it's, Alexander. It's, it's spring break, so exactly. this is how we roll. Alexander, at some point you're going to make a trip down to Austin with your dad, and uh, we're going to get you and my seven-year-old son, Calvin, and nine-year-old daughter together. Y'all going to have a blast playing sports and stuff. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's right. Teaching them the uh, teaching them the respect and courtesy early on, even calling somebody like me, sir. I appreciate that, friend. Let me do the video, okay? I'll catch you in a minute. <laughs> that is awesome. Oh, you're trip me. Special you're guest. Not messing with you. <laughs> Hey, start a hey, young raise him right. That's, you. that's, Trey, what are you doing? You almost just got hit by a, <laughs> a Ford Edge. What are if you doing? I get, if I get hit by a car, it is uh, survival of the fittest, unfortunately. And I have not been fit today. Mentally unwell enough to stand in the middle of the street to do today's show. The middle of Congress, as a matter of fact. But I was just drawn into the idea of getting to do a show with the state capitol in the background while standing in the middle of congress too so i think i have the circumstance to allow me to do that i'm putting a lot of faith in austin drivers to not just run into me because they're distracted by phones but here we go guys gorilla fuckery at its finest oh my gosh i don't see any gorillas around there but uh maybe that's a deleted scene for after the show who knows? If you get hit by a car, we get it on camera, and that's good for the lawsuit. Like, there's all the proof we need. So we'll. It's also we'll, good. That, that's just good radio. It's good content. Yeah, it's it's great content. So, it'll it'll top my uh, your mark interview in terms of uh, bringing eyeballs to the channel for sure. Uh, I love it. I love it. All right, Jay Wells. Well, we'll get into plenty of Texas football, but I want to get your thoughts on the basketball team. You know, we we haven't talked too much Texas basketball in the conversations that we've had together, but. Uh, man, it's been such an up and down year for the horns. The regular season is over. They picked up a nice win over Oklahoma on Saturday to cap off the regular season. And well, it feels like the team is, uh, is playing pretty well. They won three of their last four games and now we'll see what they do in the big 12 tournament. But where are you at with this basketball team right now? You think, uh, you think they have a chance to make some sort of run in the big dance or, or is this just uh, kind of fool's gold? What we've seen in recent weeks, you know, eh, eh. I'd love to be optimistic, BK, um, but I, I don't see them making a run through the Big 12 tournament. I, I think the Big 12 is just absolutely loaded. They got a better shot at making it to the Sweet 16 than they do the Big 12 tournament final. Um, it's just such a it's such a gauntlet, like we've always talked about. Yeah, they're playing they're playing a little bit better than they were last week, and so that that's been kind of the notion of this team. It's inconsistent. And what's crazy is how well they can play on the road at times and then how they can lay a goose egg at home. Um, you know, I think Dessou being healthy was a big factor. We, we figured that out after last week with, with the, at, the, at, at the Baylor game. He's okay. Yep. Um, Max uh, Amos and, and Tyrese Hunter are kind of setting the, the tone uh, at, at the guard spot. And when you get into this type of the year in college basketball in March, guard play is, is optimal. That's everything that matters. I just – I don't think they – one, they don't have a go-to score. And two, they don't have a guy to consistently take guys off the dribble. I think they play really solid defense. I think they rebound well. I think they shoot, hit, and miss. It's it's a, it's one of those teams that if they're on, they can beat most teams in college basketball on any given night. If they're off, they can lose to most college basketball teams in any given night. And so I don't see an Elite Eight like last year. But – Again, I could see this team winning a couple games in, in the big tournament and not doing as well in the Big 12 tournament. I think yeah. that one is – that's really going to be a battle, and, and that's going to be interesting to see who comes out of that, Brad, because 
that's really going to determine the seeding in the NCAA tournament. And I, it's going to, it reminds me of those old uh, 80s and 90s Big East tournaments. Like it's, it, it's just going to be a war for three or four days. Yeah, it's a gauntlet for sure. Texas will open up its Big 12 tournament play on Wednesday against Kansas State. If they beat them, they'll have to play Iowa State. Then they'll have to play somebody else really good and then potentially Houston in the final of the Big 12 tournament. So you're right. It's it's probably tougher to win the uh, Big 12 tournament than it will be to make a second weekend trip for the Texas men's basketball team. We'll see how they do. All right, on to football. I saw you post yesterday over at Inside Texas that uh, five-star wide receiver DeCorian Moore will be making his way to Austin at some point in the spring. He's been committed to LSU for a while, but he's from the state of Texas, plays his high school ball at Duncanville. I know every Texas recruiting fan, uh, fan knows his name. How you feeling about DeCorian Moore? Obviously a good sign that he's taking a visit. Do you still feel like there's a chance that – Texas could win out when this recruitment is all said and done. Yes. Texas has a great shot at DeCorian Moore. You know, there, there, there was some uh, apprehension over the last few weeks that he hadn't scheduled any visits to Texas, that he was only going to see LSU. But we tried to let people know, just be patient. DeCorian Moore, listen, DeCorian Moore's recruitment isn't really going to get started till probably November. That's really when you should tune in. He is essentially what he's done now is he's narrowed it down. He's told he's told four schools, you're the four schools I'm going to visit officially in June. He's told Texas, LSU, Ohio State, and Oregon, I'm going to come see you. He's told the rest of the schools, no thank you. He has cut off communication with the majority of the rest of his offers. He's the number one receiver in the country for a reason. He's one of the main reasons Duncanville has won back-to-back -back state championships. Um you know, DeCorian's going to be at Texas for the spring game on April 20th. We broke that yesterday. I got to catch up with his mom at length yesterday afternoon. Uh, she told me kind of how the process is going. We uh, we posted some good stuff at InsideTexas.com on him. Be sure and check it out. But the main gist of it is he's solid at LSU. I think this is a kid that I think would be perfectly fine at LSU. He would be happy if he eventually signs with the Tigers. I also think he's watching what's happening in Austin. And he has been for a few years. I asked him, who is recruiting you the hardest? Coaches involved, players, family. Who is recruiting you the hardest? He said, Colin Simmons. He said, Colin wow. Simmons recruits me harder than college coaches. And that, that, that's, that's that leadership coming out of Duncanville. That, that, that's that Colin Simmons number one edge mentality saying, look, we need to add you to the mix. Um, DeCorian is such a good kid. Just enjoy it. If you ever get a chance to go out to attract me, you need to go watch these guys at Duncanville. They are nationally ranked for a reason. They are phenomenal. And, and that's what DeCorian Moore brings. Just God-given speed, ability, hands. He's the total package. Texas is squarely in it. They're going to see him twice, once for the spring game, another time probably the last weekend in June. But again, fans, just, just hold on loosely. Let's 38 special this thing, man. Just hold on loosely because this recruitment's really not going to kick until probably November. And that's when you're going to see it really turn into overdrive. Texas isn't going to push. They're going to – Sark is going to do – he's going to play the long game like he always does. Chris Jackson has done a phenomenal job in building the relationship with his family. Texas has a great shot. It's just going to take a little bit of time. So just be patient. Yeah, we know what happens when you cling too tightly. So uh, we won't do – Anything like that with the Corian Moore's recruitment. Uh, DeCorian Moore, obviously a wide receiver here. I want to ask you, Justin, just at the class of 2025 in the state of Texas, what position positions do you think are the strongest and are the deepest that Texas can really attack in this cycle? Offensive line. They, they are really good at offensive line, especially in the DFW area. Uh, we saw five stars, Michael Fasusi and Ty Haywood yesterday. Uh, you've got Mesquite Horns, Lamont Rogers. You got Prosperous Connor Cardi. Uh, you've got a 2026 in North Crowley's John Turntime. The offensive line group uh, in Texas is really good. Texas is in the mix for all those guys. They look a little bit better for Fasusi and Turntime than the others. But O line is one to look at. I'll take another group defensive back. And I feel like I say this every year <laughs> the DBs in Texas are incredible. There's a chance Texas could go all Houston area. DB this year. We're talking cornerback Dorian Brew. We're talking Cortland Guillory. We're talking Caleb Chester, Kobe Sellers. Uh, I mean, they're all located with, with, within miles of each other. And then one of the best is probably high terror safety, Cade Phillips. 
And so if, if, if on offense, the best position, in my opinion, is the offensive line. And I think wide receiver could, could make a, an argument. I think running back is decent. I think running back is incredible in 2026. So these would be juniors. These running backs are phenomenal. JV and Osborne, Tredarian Ball, KJ Edwards, uh, Racing Gillery. I mean, those guys are top notch. But right now in this cycle, I like the offensive linemen a lot, and I like the DBs. I think Texas could go an all Houston area DB, kind of similar to what they did in 2018, um, because they're just top to bottom. There's just so much, so much talent on both sides of the ball. Yeah, you brought up Michael Fasusi. I saw your cohort, Eric Nalin, over at Inside Texas make a, a forecast that Fasusi would end up here in Austin. So that's obviously great news. Everyone knows how important it is to build on the offensive and defensive lines, and uh, hopefully Texas can continue to do that the way that they have. Uh, current roster, Jay Wells, as we try to figure out how to get Trey back on from downtown. Maybe he got hit by a car. Maybe that's what I, I'm, I'm worried. You're sitting here taking it all in stride. I'm sitting here calling him going, are you okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's probably what I should be doing, but I got I got faith in him. We got it so, covered. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the uh, the current roster, there were some updates made to TexasSports.com. We got some new jersey numbers. We got some new heights, new weights for the guys currently on campus. I'll give you the floor, Justin. Any Anything stand out, whether it's a jersey number, whether it's a measurable Anything kind of catch your attention with that uh, updated spring roster? I love Anthony Hill at 243. I mean, in, your inside linebacker that can move like he can, get versatile like he can at that weight is tremendous. I like how the, the O-linemen are getting slimmer. There's a few guys that are still working hard, and, and I think spring ball is going to be a good litmus test on on, on how much they, uh, they, they, they do get in better shape. But I think the O linemen are slimming down, and I think that's what they wanted. They bring in large humans, but you gotta you gotta make them stick. You got you gotta develop and and, and produce from from that spot. Um, I like the numbers. I'm a numbers guy. I, I'm always fascinated about that. I like that Jonte Cook took number one, which Worthy was wearing. So Matthew Golden took number two. Isaiah Bonds wearing number seven, and if NCA would let him, he'd put two zeros in front of that seven on his jersey. <laughs> And sell a million of them. Yeah. Um, still could do that. I'm, I'm, I'm. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody made that 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 jersey. Um, Colin Simmons wearing number eleven. I mean, I just had flashbacks of freshman Derek Johnson. I actually mm. had sent a video to his mother. I said, you know, this is what Derek Johnson looked like as a freshman. I said that that's the kind of impact number eleven can do sometimes. Um, but really, it's it's. It, I think the guys. You know, I spoke to a source on Sunday, a, a team source, and and. There's so much buy-in, Brad. There's just so much buy-in, and that's why you see guys getting in better shape. That's why you hear such good – we hear so many good things coming out of winter conditioning. It's just pre-spring, but it matters. The intensity in that locker room matters. How hard those guys are working. The portal guys they brought in, it matters what they do. And so I think at the end of the day, you know, the numbers are – to us, the numbers signify spring ball's coming. Mm -hmm. Now we got to wait a spring break, you know, which, which, which that, 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 that's part of, part of it. I think they worked out Friday morning and then they just scattered. But here's another thing. A lot of these guys didn't scatter. A lot of them stayed close to home and went to work. They're working with trainers. They're working with teammates. They're working out with, 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 with friends. They're the mental, what I, what, what I was told is we don't want to get off course yeah, you want to enjoy the spring break. You want to enjoy the time off, but you don't want to you don't want to go over the top. You want to keep everybody kind of in, on the same page. Keeping everybody in the same area and a lot of people working out together, dude, that's what a team is about. That's how you build great things. And so top to bottom, there's our boy Trey. So much better that he's back with us. I, I, I was worried. I'm not anymore. Well, a little bit. But no, that, that, you know, it's numbers signify spring football, BK, yeah. and, and, and heights and weights. They're always unique and fun to, to look at. Ian Boyd did, had a great story at InsideTexas.com. Check it out on all the heights and weights and kind of the differences from players from year to year. But I'm a numbers guy, and it, and it basically says, hey, spring ball is about to happen. I think we're eight days from it, and, I, and I'm anticipating a lot of fun this spring. Uh, we've got the video of Trey back, but no audio from Trey right now. Right. We're, 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 we're halfway there. There was that random person who was like taking a picture of Trey from behind a moment ago. I don't know. If, I think it was a Karen. I think yeah. She was like, 
I think she was trying to shame Trey for something. I think so. Uh, I can't hear you, Trey. I think he's on his phone now. This, this is what we do here. He's down there for South by Southwest. He is, yeah. He's been there all week. He was there last week, there over the weekend. He did a show from right outside the UT house at Antone's on Friday, and it was okay. all good. But he wasn't in the, middle, wasn't in the middle of a street. Now he's in the middle of the street, and uh, I guess that's causing some sort of technical difficulties. I overheard him say he bumped into the guy that played uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Yes, uh, and I'm a big I'm a big Jesse Eisenberg fan. I'm a big fan. I think Social Network's one of the best movies I've seen. Uh, I think that dude's great. Yeah, he was in a movie a called one. I think it's called Adventureland. Okay, it was like it. it was a movie. It was a movie set in the '80s where he worked at a uh, like a Six Flags, like an Astro World. Yeah, and it, the girl from um, it had the girl from the uh, oh, what are those movies? The real popular vampire movies. I can't think Twilight or something. Twilight. That girl from Twilight was in it. Ryan Reynolds was in it. Um, yeah. yeah. That, uh, Bill Hader. Some of the SNL cast are in it. It's really a funny movie. It's one of those low budget things, but it was it was a good movie. Jesse picks good movies. I like that. All right. Well, <laughs> while we try to figure <laughs> Trey's deal out. Oh, Trey boy. is struggling. <laughs> Taking us for a ride here. I'm, re I'm removing him. Yep. He says, "Not so fast." He's, he's saying, "Please tell me you can hear me." And then <laughs> F, no go, Trey. All right, I'll ask you a Cowboys question, Justin. Know you're a big Cowboys fan. Oh. Free agency doesn't officially start till Wednesday, but it's really already started. Tony Pollard apparently agreeing to a deal with the Tennessee Titans, so he'll be gone. Not that that's too shocking to any Cowboys fan out there, but no. Uh, what would you like to see the Cowboys do this off season? That's a loaded uh -oh. question. I know. I think you spend the next half hour just talking about yeah. that. Well, they're not going to replace the coaches, so that's number one. Yeah. You put them all on one-year deals. That's a lot of faith. So this place is a house of cards. That play Valley Ranch is a is just it. It's a it's a clown show at this point. I I, I just anticipate hearing circus music every time they do updates. Um, I'd like to see him bulk up on the line. Don't let Tyron Smith leave if you're really going all in. Secure the left tackle for another couple of years. Get get he's a potential Hall of Famer. Go ahead and, and knock that out. Um, they need a running back. And the draft does not always produce those guys. Maybe they need to look at a Derrick Henry. You know, he's gonna be a free agent. He's a guy that that would make a lot of sense because I felt like they missed that in between the tackles running back. Zeke Elliott had like nine or ten touchdowns in 2022, and it was because he could score in the red zone. Yeah. And now Pollard didn't give him that ability. And so I think they need to get back to that. Uh, and then on defense, they need to revamp the defensive line. They need to add another linebacker. Uh, losing Leighton Vander Esch looks like he's never going to play again. Uh, they've got to replace that guy. I actually think the secondary is decent. You get Travion Diggs back, Trayvon Diggs back rather. Uh, and, and you had Darren Bland and, a, and, and Stephon Gilmore. You hope to, to bring him back. I like what they're doing at safety. I just – this is probably a five or six win team, Kellner. I, I just I don't see look, their division's terrible. And that's why they can beat Washington and they can beat the Giants. The Eagles obviously are, are one of the better teams in the NFC, but that's what's going to keep them afloat. But this team, this team needs to hit rock bottom because that's the only time Jerry makes changes, is when it's absolute rock bottom. He has no desire in winning a Super Bowl. He has all the desire in making it the most exposure-filled franchise on the planet. It's a brand. They asked Dalton Schultz the other day, the tight end from the Texans, who played for the for the Cowboys, you know, what, it, what it's like. And he said, it's different playing for Dallas than anywhere else. He says, you're out there practicing, and they're giving tours. He's lifting weights, and people are coming in and out of the weight room with tours. He goes, it's just a different mentality. And so as long as Jerry Jones is alive, there's no hope. For Cowboys mm -hmm. fans, it, it it is doom and gloom. I'm sorry, but it was like I felt like that last year. Like I I, I didn't think they were going to make a run out of that last year, and then Dak Prescott had an incredible year, and I love Dak. I think Dak is great. I think C.D. Lamb might be top three wide receiver in the in, in the NFL. He had an incredible year last year. I love what they're doing with Jake Ferguson. Listen, Dallas drafts well. They do well in the draft. Those guys produce for the most part. 
Um, and Jerry's really good at about not letting big guys leave. Micah Parsons is going to get a new deal. C.D. Lamb's going to get a new deal. But Bubba, this this again, this is a house of cards, and this thing is going to tumble at any point. I, I don't have any faith. I'm curious to see how they do in the draft, but it starts on the offensive and defensive lines. Two things that they were really good 10 years ago at building up through the draft. Now where they're back through that cycle where, hey, we need to get we need to get the we need to get back to, to the trenches. Until they do, I, I don't think this is better than a 500 team. Man, how about that? All right, 12 wins, three years in a row. I think now- the Texans have a better franchise. I think the Texans have a, almost a better roster. I think the Texans have a better plan. I know the Texans have a better head coach, and I think C.J. Stroud is going to be a top-five quarterback in the NFL. To give you an idea, I'm not trying to be trying to sound negative. I love – I really like the Houston Texans. I was there their first game. I really like what they're doing. I love the Miko Ryans. Whatever the Cowboys are doing, the Texans are doing the opposite – and it looks fantastic. Yeah, yeah, the future down there feels brighter than it does up in Dallas for sure. Uh, all right, we'll try Trey one more time before I get to another question. Trey? Yeah. Y'all can hear me now. I don't know how good the microphone is, but y'all can hear me, yes. You look like you're sitting on a sidewalk bench, exhausted. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm – discouraged right now because that idiotic idea of mine may have just cost me my laptop i dropped the laptop it looked like a car accident laptop is not turning on now there was an issue with the wireless earbuds that you guys couldn't hear me the next time around so yes now i am on a park bench (laughs) lamenting my own stupidity so uh yeah justin thank you for hanging out for the first part of the show i'm glad uh, (laughs) we had already planned this because it would have been a disaster for bk otherwise Indeed. We're going to call this segment Maniac Mondays. <laughs> Something sure. always crazy on Manic Mondays. God. Trey, anything for Jay Wells? I don't know, man. What do y'all have planned for this spring break? Work. Yeah. <laughs> Still working. Uh, we're, we're headed to the cages here this afternoon. Baseball's mm-hmm. around the corner, so we gotta we got to get into – to, to work and then he's got to get some shooting and dribbling in so we're, we'll hit the gym later this afternoon so he can get in his work on the court but it's gonna i'm gonna be hanging out with a seven-year-old for my spring break and, and i wouldn't have it any other way is alexander starting to emerge as the star for a lot of his sports teams justin because my kid is it took a little bit to click but now he's starting to become the leading scorer in basketball scores a lot of goals in soccer too it's really fun to get to root for youth, youth sports when your kid is the one that's a, a, a amassing point you know if we don't live vicariously through them why do we have them like i mean yeah, i think they serve it too but yes otherwise you're correct that's the point that's the whole point he's in the room so i'm i can't really answer that question without getting his head large oh all yeah, can, yeah all i can because you know he has all i'm going to say is he has a lot of work to do in different sports but he's really aggressive. He is incredibly aggressive, and he likes contact. He's really big in contact sports. And we have three rules. I don't care if you score in anything. I don't care what you do. Three rules. You got to play hard. You got to fight like hell. And you got to have fun. As long as he plays as hard as he can, he fights like hell, and he has fun, that's all that matters. And so right now, he's, he's having fun playing sports, and he's doing pretty well, but we have a lot of work to do. I'm glad you mentioned the aggression thing because my daughter is one of the best players on her volleyball team. It hadn't really translated to the other sports just yet. So a couple of weeks ago, she was frustrated at the end of the game. I'm like, look, you are, you're tall for your age. And I also see how you're aggressive in other sports. You need to take that mindset from volleyball and apply it to the other sports. And you'll start doing some of the things that you want to, you just can't be timid about it. And sure enough, the aggression sinks in. You start to think about how to trick people, if you're talking about dribbling uh, a soccer ball or being first to a rebound, because pretty much every kid out there is hesitant at this age. Yes. So if you can be the one that realizes that even if it hurts a little bit, it's not going to hurt for a long time. And uh, you taking on that mindset leads to you getting more buckets, more goals, et cetera. Then, uh, it's, yeah, it's a pretty easy sell if you can get, it, get them to do it early on. It's the confidence clicker, essentially. Yep. Once you tell them and they apply it and it works, that switch turns on, and then it's just like a sponge. But exactly. you, it's got to click first. 
You can't just turn the switch on. It has to click with them. Once it does, and 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 I don't have to push him. My family and friends think I push Alexander in all these sports. I really don't. He's the one pushing me. Half the time, I want I want to relax. I'm tired. I've been doing everything. <laughs> I'm a single dad, man. I'm doing. I'm washing dishes and clean, doing laundry and everything. I want to rest. And he's like, "No, nah, man, we got to get in our shots. We got to get in our pitching session. We got to get in our our routes because he likes to run routes about thirty minutes a day." And so I just, I just, I'm there to help him, man. He, along the way, he's so much fun. And I, again, I don't care how well he does. He has to play hard. He has to fight like hell. And he has to have fun. Those are the rules in this house. What's his crispest route, Bubba? What's your best route? Quick slant. He likes that, <laughs> that two-step timing slant. Yeah, mm. Calvin likes the quick slant. He also likes the out and up too. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. No, I, I, I'll tell you this. He really like. I tell you the play. He makes this run all the time. He likes play action with the the tailback running a wheel route. He Ooh. loves that because he thinks he can take. He go. He goes in the flat and he's like, I can take this linebacker down the sideline. And so we 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 have to work on that play a couple times a day. Play action wheel route. He's gotten to see Texas running backs be really effective with that route these last few years too. That's that's all he's watching. Hmm. <laughs> that's. If Sark's running it, he's watching it. <laughs> That's awesome. Would uh, would your son opt out of the NCAA football video game like Arch Manning did, Dustin? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> he has been asking me for a PlayStation 5 for a couple of years. I kept telling him, no, not going to happen. You're too young. You don't need one. You got plenty of toys. You got plenty of stuff. I said, when NCAA college football comes out, when they do release it at some point, we're going to get a PlayStation 5. That's going to be what we do. Now he knows that's about to happen. There you go. And so this, this house is going to be turned upside down this summer. Is that confirmed that Arch is definitely not going to be in the video game this summer? It's 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 the rumor. You know, it was reported as such. I don't think that's going to be the final say, though. That's all I'll say about it. Perhaps mm. it's being used for leverage. But at all, PK and I talked about this a couple weeks ago. For a guy who doesn't want to make it about himself, that – that does turn the story weirdly into a him thing more than a team thing. It did, but not by his intention, by others that's, running the story. Because that's a great point. I, I never imagined a click for a video games tweet would, would make that much of a difference. And But that kind of shows you society. It's the lo lowest common denominator. You can tweet about an Arch Manning thing, and you're going to get 4 million opinions uh, all off the wall. Um I, you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if he does opt in. I wouldn't be surprised if he's a part of the game. But I also understand that his family, they're just they're just they're just strict on what they put their name on. And they have to be for a for hundred reasons. And they're they're looking at the long term thing with Arch, not the short term. This is a short term thing. They're looking long term. And so I wouldn't be surprised, you know, that they've done this. But at, again, at the end of the day, I'm not gonna be shocked if he's not on the game. Hmm. Interesting. All right, uh, Trey, any more for Jay Wells today? I think that's it. Thank you for uh, hanging out today, brother. I'll talk to you here in a couple of days for the radio show. Always a pleasure, my guys. BK, nothing but love, brother. Manic Monday, baby. We'll talk to you next week. See you, Alexander. Bye, Say bye. Kick some butt, Alexander. There they go. Justin Wells, InsideTexas.com, the Inside Texas football youtube channel as well definitely go subscribe to them on youtube also check out it for the best in all things texas longhorns sports where uh where are you now you're obviously in a different spot than where you were to start today's program where are you in downtown austin what a fucking disaster this is uh i am currently at the corner of 10th and congress god if i had just my only concern was holding on to that computer because I had like three different things in my hands and uh, that little audio mixer that I borrowed from you, my microphone and the computer. Didn't have to worry about anything else, but at one point I just tried to readjust one thing and it all went crashing down. I wish I'd gotten hit by a car versus my computer dropping to the ground, dude. I'm, I'm much easier to replace than my computer is. Yeah, well, and uh, you know, it was your fault that the computer hit the deck if you got hit by a car any damage you could blame on the driver of that car but now this one falls on you right exactly oh, god are you on your phone right now is that how you're talking to us 
Yeah, how does the audio sound? Eh, average at best. I so I have a um this may be the, the way that I'm broadcasting for a few days. So I'm either going to go get Apple Buds, AirPods, AirBuds, whatever the hell they're called because those do actually sound pretty good in this sort of format or I may go get my wired buds from home after today's show because there's a better way to do this where it doesn't sound you're not it doesn't sound like you're on an xlr mic but it doesn't sound like i'm talking into my phone from a foot away so thank you for bearing it you and everybody else listening right now hey we're making do well your thoughts uh it's up to you if you want to go texas basketball here we got some nfl free agency we could get into some moves being made where uh where do you want to take this thing yeah, let's start with Texas Hoops. What a great way to end the season after the disappointment in Waco several days prior. The Sioux status being unknown. Him getting to play in that last home game was really cool. And just how great of a guy he is at the end of the game, too. Making sure to greet every fan who wants to come up and say hello or take a picture or get an autograph. But for them to have put the beat down on the Sooners like that, leading by, what, excess of 20 at one point in that game. And also to get Tyrese Hunter going, too. On another game where Max Aceman really didn't have his shot is enormous. They need to figure out, and it can be uh, it can be a revolving door, but they need that third guy to step up along with Tassou and Aceman if they're going to find success in March. And uh, the prime candidate for me is Hunter because he has done it this time of year before. So um, I'm cautious right now. I'm not going to express the confidence that I have in him over the last couple of seasons because I'm. I've been through this song and dance before, but if this is the beginning of, uh, of something more consistent for him, then it, it does it does raise the Longhorn basketball team ceiling by a little bit. Maybe into more of a weekend two possibility. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, those were all the, the most encouraging things for me on Saturday. Yeah, I think you hit the two biggest storylines right there, right? Dylan DeSue, number one, he's healthy. Like, he looked pretty yeah. good too, when he was yeah. out there. Only played 24 minutes, but I think a lot of that had to do with foul trouble, right? He picked up his third foul early in the second half. And the good thing for Texas is Texas was able to play well with the Sioux on the bench. You know, yep. that, that aforementioned Again. game against Baylor, they sucked. The, the Sioux, when he got hurt, they completely fell apart. They forgot how to play basketball when they didn't have the Sioux. Uh, this time they were able to go on a little bit of a run, even with the Sioux on the bench. So, uh, yeah, the Sioux being healthy is huge. We know how important he is to the success of this team. But him not really looking limited is is great. And then Tyrese Hunter is obviously the other storyline for him to go for 30. I mean, we, we've talked about it. He's he's just lacking confidence. He's a good player. Is he 30 points a game good? No, of course not. But he, he has not been playing confident at all. And when he's aggressive, he can make some things happen. We've seen it at times. The problem is we just don't see it often enough. So uh, I love that version of Tyrese Hunter. And, yeah, hopefully that goes with this team to Kansas City and ultimately the NCAA tournament because yeah, if Tyrese Hunter can be anything close to what he was on Saturday, then you're right. The ceiling for this team is a hell of a lot higher than it would be otherwise. For sure. And Texas, I know DeSue technically wasn't out of that Baylor game until he went down with that knee injury about halfway through the second half, but he was limited up to that point too, so maybe that was good for them. Uh, yeah. But the big picture is that they, they had to figure out another way to get it done without Desu out there, with him only out there for limited minutes against Baylor up to that point, 10 or so. And uh, hopefully the fruits of that, uh, that found labor, I guess, uh, will be realized over the next week in the Big 12 tournament, which tips off for them on Wednesday. And then once the games really start to matter after that. Yeah, I think uh, you can argue that this team is playing its best basketball right now. I mean, they've won three of their last four games, and the only loss, that game in Waco, they had a 14-point lead playing without Dylan DeSue for large portions of it. So, uh, still a loss, obviously, but no, three three of four, uh, two wins over tournament teams in that stretch. The only loss was on the road against a you know, top 15 team in the country. They're playing well, and we'll see what they do in Kansas City. They got uh, today and tomorrow off. We'll open up conference tournament play. Uh, against K-State on Wednesday. We're getting all sorts of random background noise. What, you got a garbage truck next to you? What's going on over there? No, I've got to keep my the uh, I've got to keep my hand cupped over the speaker and microphone. Otherwise, you get all the ambiance of Congress Avenue and the traffic driving by. 
There you go. Well, Texas finishes the regular season nine and nine in conference play. They uh, picked up their 20th win of the season with that dub on Saturday and they're a lock to make it to the tournament. I mean, I, I, I told people that last week, but with that win over Oklahoma, they will be in the field of 68. Now they're just playing for seed lines up there in Kansas city. So if they win a couple of games, maybe they can move up to a seven. If they win the whole conference tournament, which will be damn near impossible. I think they could be as high as a six, but even if they lose to Kansas State, even if they get blown out by Kansas State, uh, fear not. This team will be in the dance, and I think uh, they're probably an eight or a nine seed if they lose to K State on Wednesday. Uh, all right. By the way, seven straight wins over Oklahoma. I mean, Texas has dominated wow. OU in basketball. Three straight season sweeps, and then uh, yeah, they obviously won the last one in the year before that. So eight of nine and seven straight against the hated Sooners. That. That is always good news for this team. Does Oklahoma have work to do in order to get into the tourney, or are they probably in right now too? Yeah, I think they're also in. I think Texas is in a little better spot than OU, but I don't think OU needs to win in Kansas City to get in the real tournament, but a win for them would absolutely help because they have really struggled down the stretch here in the regular season. Okay, um, do you have a where we at story potentially to get to? Fuck no. Okay, that's Actually, good. Actually, you know what I do? You know what I do? I'm going to go ahead and tell this, and we'll we'll play the audio at some and video at some point. Okay. Well, let's so. uh, give some sponsor reads here. I'll start. AV Consultations, 512-255-8678. That's the phone number to call if you want the home TV setup of your dreams. You can make it happen with AV Consultations. They've been in business since 1988, and they are the very best at what they do home TV systems, surround sounds, whole home surveillance, basically anything audio, video, automation, they can make it happen for you. Just give them a call, 512-255-8678. And a quick TV spot from our great friends over at Covert BK. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Yes, indeed. Shout out to the Coverts. Also, some love to Altstadt beer as well. The best beer that you can find anywhere in the world. But we're lucky enough to have it right here in the great state of Texas. They've got it at HEB Specs, Twin Liquors, 34 Wine and Spirits. Wherever you go to buy your six packs, you can find Altstadt beer. No impurities, no regrets. And we will go. I can do a lot. Spirits. Okay. Yeah, Big Hat Spirits, BigHatSpirits.com. That is the website. They didn't create the cocktail in the can, but they did redefine it. You see the website right there if you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter right now. They have so many great flavors and are really low in the BS. The ranch water, that jalapeno ranch water, the margarita, the prickly pear paloma, blackberry smoke, the Texas mule. You non-alcohol fans, they do have the uh, margarita mocktail and not only does it taste great but important for me and so many others it's low in bs that means even though they're using real alcohol real kombucha no added sugars uh, non-gmo bpa free 100 percent natural real spirits go to the website not just to check out more info and to see all the legendary texas singer songwriters that they are paying tribute to and uh, just Texas legends in general on those cans, but also most importantly to find out where you can get big hat cocktails in a can closest to you. Top of the web page, scroll down just a little bit. You'll see that map of central Texas and you'll see big hat logos all over that map. Click the logo that's closest to you and you will find big hat spirits, those cocktails in a can big hat spirits.com. Yes, indeed. There's that map. If you didn't believe Trey, well, now you've got the visual proof that, uh, there's a map for you on site that shows exactly where you can buy those cocktails in a can. And I think you said you're up for a Pest Wranglers Live. You good for that? Let's go, Pest Wranglers, Pest Wranglers, Pest Wranglers. They have been taking care of pest problems in Central Texas going all the way back to 2006. In that time, they have established a motto, effective, reliable, affordable. That's why right now, as things start to heat up, 
with that comes mosquito season. Yes, the mosquitoes do follow the warmer temperatures. Pest wranglers love to help you out with that. They have a couple of different options here. One is an organic option that is harmful for mosquitoes, but not harmful for the other insects or mammals. That means your dog sniffing around the backyard. It kills mosquitoes that are transmitting all sorts of deadly diseases, and it does so with science-backed technology that's literally been used in Africa for malaria control. If you're looking for something a little bit faster acting, they do have a quicker, more traditional knockdown. If you have a pool party or maybe a backyard party coming up in the next two to three weeks, it is effective for up to 21 days, so you can contact them now. It's next week and the week and beyond, and it'll still remain effective if you are starting to deal with those mosquitoes already. Both treatments are odorless. They are both non-toxic as well and both highly effective. Go to PestWranglers.com for info. Get yourself on the schedule. And Pest Wranglers, of course, is a proud sponsor of... Where are we at in society today? That is right. It is your daily look at stories that show we as a people are headed in the wrong direction. Very occasionally, I will bring you a story that provides a sense of optimism that has us all saying to ourselves, hey... Maybe we as a people are starting to figure something out, but sadly, today is not that day. Need to go back to the youth sports fields for today's story, BK. What time is it, by the way? I cannot see anything going on right now other than your beautiful face. It is uh, 11.45. Oh, wait, no, daylight savings. 12.56. I was about to say, wow, this is not going to take 15 minutes. So let's get ready for a backup plan. <laughs> good, good one by you. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm going back two weekends now. My son was playing in a soccer game a few weeks ago, and his team got smoked. They were getting their asses kicked by this team that uh, – my son's team, for some reason, has 12 players, even though they only play five guys on the field at the time. You should cap these teams at 10 players. They have 12, whatever. They're pretty good. Uh, Calvin is one of the better players on the team, but they get worked by this other team that had like seven or eight total players on the team. And throughout the game, I see this coach who is hard on the kids, but he's been mostly above board so far. Hasn't gone to Bob Knight. I saw him start to show those Bob Knight cracks during the game towards kids. He was yelling at these kids who were doing one thing or another wrong or not stopping the ball or just something not going correctly, which, by the way, is bound to happen with 70-year-old kids. On top of that, there was a referee. Each of these games only has one ref. I'm not even kidding you when I tell you this This ref is probably 75 or 80 years, years old. It's a volunteer league, so he's out there trying to help out. They may be paying the refs, as a matter of fact, now that I think about it. But he's trying to make a little bit of a living as a senior citizen. But he is one person to begin with, and he's also 75 to 80 years old. So he's moving a little bit slower. He's not seeing everything. He's just a little bit behind. He's, a, let's call him two to four steps behind a lot of stuff. Yeah. And so he starts yelling at this ref at one point. And so the ref starts yelling back at him. And the tent, like the check-in tent, where the guy who runs the entire league is next to our field, at one point, he literally starts yelling at the guy who runs the league about how terrible his league is. This is all while the game is going on, mind you. At halftime, he walks over to the tent, and I think there's going to be a physical altercation. I'm standing close enough that I kind of get up and get ready to like jump into the middle if he, he tries to get physical with this guy. And he's just like yelling at him, telling him how bad the league sucks and how... Uh, He's been terrible since he's taken over and some changes that that were made and this and that. And it was tense. And my son's team continued getting their asses kicked after this point, too, unsurprisingly. And I feel like I've gotten pretty lucky up to this point of not having to deal with a whole lot of this other than this fat head coach from a volleyball team a couple seasons ago blatantly cheating in the playoffs to try and get his team to win. We still won that game, by the way. This is the first real ugly example that I have of uh, just what the youth sports culture has become. And this guy is on the verge of getting kicked out of the league now as a result of his own stupidity. So um, I know ev- or most everybody has one of those stories at some point if your kids play youth sports for long enough. And now I have a story to tell myself. This is your kid's coach or the other team's coach? My kid's coach. My kid's coach. What do the rest of the parents on your team think about this? Like, I feel like the parents can band together and say, hey, uh, we can't have this. You're not coaching our children anymore. 
one of the parents wrote a strongly worded email to the league, to the head of the league, saying this is not cool. Um, I have well, who picks you pick league. the coach? Do you pick the coach, or does the league pick the coach? Uh, the league. It's weird. So the guy has been a coach, so you can request him again. But we were on a different team, and we requested a different coach. But he was asked to coach another team in a different division. And so we all got put on the same team. And so it was a by default situation for us. We will not be asking for this coach again at the very least. But like I was going through the motions of possibly coaching Vivian's team and they ended up splitting her team up and putting them on a couple of different teams. So I I am considering saying, hey, if you're replacing this guy, I will step in to help out. But it's also a weird situation where they're halfway through the season now. So I'm not totally sure what to do other than to keep a very close eye on this coach. He's kind of a small dude. He's got a little bit of an Napoleon thing going on. Mm. Um, and so, like, I don't know if it's a conversation with him that I have to have. I, I had to leave. This was the weekend of your birthday, so I ended up leaving before the end of the game. So I didn't have a chance to say anything to him after the game. And I have not seen him since then because – of uh, various things going on. There was a concert that I went to for last week's practice, and now I'm just in the mix of South by, oh, and they, they were off this weekend anyhow. So at some point when I do see him again and I have a chance to talk to him and be like, hey, the way you conducted yourself is completely unacceptable, he may try to fucking fight me because this guy's a total hothead, but I, I do feel obliged to say something, not just on the behalf of my kid, but on behalf of the other parents who realize – how big of a shit heel this dude was being, but they're probably too afraid to say anything themselves. And you said he was a little person who coaches? He wasn't like a dwarf, but he was like five seven, five eight, maybe. Mm. Oh. Not so fast, so yeah, Not uh, so fast. Like a dwarfette? Is that dwarf? I feel smaller. I, I, Isn't a dwarfette like smaller I know than a dwarf? That's that's the irony of that name. It, He's, he's, he's a little bit of a dwarf, so he's a dwarfette. Okay, I like that. So you're going to take over soccer? We're talking about soccer here, right? You hate soccer. My kids are starting to realize, I know, you're right about that, first and foremost. My kids are starting to realize how good of a coach I am. And so they're asking, they're starting to ask me to coach more of their teams. I know that comes across as sounding very arrogant. Like, yeah. but I, for whatever, for whatever reason, I, like, I have a, a base understanding of the sorts of, like, the simple sorts of things that you can put yourself through, drills-wise, conditioning-wise, that really helps you get better pretty quickly, especially if you are the blank canvas that a lot of seven, eight, nine-year-old kids are with sports. Even if they played a little bit in the past, there's, like, simple things that you can do that add to their basic skill level that will put them head and shoulders above most of the rest of the competition within their league. And a lot of it has to do with teamwork because Mm -hmm. look, adults are fucking natural ball hogs. All kids want the glory of scoring goals and shooting baskets. And that gets easier for everybody when you're working together as a team. So it's like in basketball, it's like doing basic passing stuff, soccer, doing basic passing stuff too. Yeah. Volleyball is more the, – the teamwork is more communication than it is passing at the level that we're at right now. But it's like teaching them those little things and how to move their bodies to most effectively accomplish what it is that they're trying to do is um, – it's very fulfilling to get to help out for one. But it's it's so much fun to see just how spongy they are with that stuff and how quickly they take to it too. Very good. Well – I see Chip and Zay in the waiting room. And Zay's one of those selfless players. I know he averaged 10 assists and 7 rebounds per game in his high school playing career. I think I have those stats right. That was the 10 and 7. It was assists and rebounds? Uh, no, not assists and rebounds. Points and maybe five boards. Chip likes to call me 10 and 5, so we'll stick with that. But, yes, very oh. selfless player I was. Thir- 13 and 7 when motivated. Yeah. That's, That's what it was. And what he had a special line against Westlake. What was it? I don't know what you're talking about. I Did you average it. like 18 and eight against oh, in the big games, the rival games? Yeah, it was like 18 and eight. Austin High, Westlake, Lugerville. Yeah, I always stepped up in the rival games. But... A little extra juice. 
Yeah, man. How the hell are you supposed to expect me to do algebra two and then come out and drop 20? That shit doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. Yeah. How do you expect me to do algebra two and then expect me to go watch Zay drop 20? I mean, it's, it was hard for me too. It wasn't just the players. It was hard for the fans. I couldn't do both of those in the same day. Exactly. I had to get, had to get my mind right as a fan for, uh, for the big rivalry games. Whenever Highland Park came to J.J. Pierce High School, we had to get ready. We would rock the, the, uh, you know, the preppy sweater vests and plaid and the khakis. And we had a lot of Jews at my public high school, so they would wear the yarmulkes to the games. It was awesome. It was a huge deal. We had to prepare for that. Oh, I miss those days, man. Oh, man. Bring them back. Bring them back. All right, what you guys got cooking today? And we got Casey Hampton on the show today. No way. Man should be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Yep, agreed. Okay, well, Trey's, Trey's getting destroyed by the wind, so we're leaving. Sorry, guys. I'm going to go talk to Nicholas Cage now. Hey, tell Nick we said hi. And good luck with oh, the declaration. Oh, is my shit. <laughs> yeah, and find the Declaration of Independence, please. <laughs> I'm back. See you guys. BK, appreciate you, man. Hey, any more to words of Judy Brown? Happiness is a choice. We're happy you're spending some time with us, Chip and Zay, holding it down right here in the midday. Um, loaded show today, Zay. We'll be joined by Casey Hampton, who is one of my all-time favorite um, players uh, at that I've ever covered at Texas, certainly, and, and I think one of the best players to ever come through the 40 acres. Um, and... You know, we got a lot to talk about because it was a big weekend for Texas as well. Um, I mean, men's and women's basketball, Dylan DeZoo gets first team, all big 12 honors. Uh, Texas baseball gets a series win at Texas Tech. Um, you know, hell, even... Number 12, Texas Tennis beat number one, Ohio State. Ah, get them. I mean, come on. Yeah. Big week for Texas athletics, man. Great weekend. That's what I'm talking about. That's how it should be. That's why you win those President Cups or whatever the hell they're called because of weekends like this. You know, you expect excellence if you're Chris Del Conte and – just anybody who supports the University of Texas, alum, fan, whatever, that's why you come to Austin, to be one of the best. So, yeah, these weekends, you know, for the normal universities, this is big. For Texas, this everyday shit. You know what I'm saying? This this the norm. This is how it should be, you know? So I'm with it. I love it. Well, um, we also have some – Breaking news, breaking news. It sounds like uh, Tony Pollard is going to sign with the Tennessee Titans. See ya. So we've got uh, we got Cowboys needs in the running back room. Jonathan Brooks. Um, I knew so, you were going to say that. <laughs> yo, let's, let's I, yo, I'm not going to lie. I was waiting. I was like, how long is Chip going to mention with Tony Pollard going to Nashville about Jonathan Brooks going with Dallas? It's been eight minutes, <laughs> and you already threw it out there. I, I'm with you. I love it. It's time, baby. Yeah. We got to we gotta be smart. We got to make sure that Jonathan Brooks is going to be there. Um, unless the Cowboys are going to trade running backs and go sign Derrick Henry. Uh, that wouldn't be bad. That wouldn't be bad at all. No. So, because it sounds like, based on our conversation with Clarence Hill, who covers the Cowboys for the Forward Star Telegram, the Cowboys are looking for offensive line help in the first round of the NFL draft. Um, so that, uh, that would meet up well, if you've got 
that uh, if you've got, you know, King Henry running behind um, Zach Martin, that, that would be good. Yeah, for sure. And now, you know, Tony Pollard, I saw a rumor before this move happened that he might have been willing to take less money to stay in Dallas. And that's obviously not the case anymore. But, I mean, he hurts his leg in that 2022 playoff game. He comes back, and again, that was Kellen Moore's offense. Like Mike McCarthy, yes, he had his say on being the head coach, but there's a reason why Kellen Moore is in Los Angeles and Mike McCarthy's running the show. And it might have suited Dak and guys like C.D. Lamb and guys like Jake Ferguson, but we saw Tony Pollard have a pretty down year. And, yeah, a lot was because of that O-line being weak and a little, you know, geezer can those guys are old man so <laughs> you know it's time for a little mix-up and if you're tony pollard he could probably look in the mirror and say man i don't think i was appreciated like i should like he probably thought he was going to be the man with ezekiel elliott leaving he probably thought yo i'm about to be that dude i'm about to put over a thousand plus and then some i'm about to be a pro bowler like this is my time and it was far from that and then everybody has a sour taste in their mouth from that Green Bay loss. So I, that definitely has a lot to do with it. And we know that culture is just chaos. We saw C.D. Lamb bitching on the sidelines where Mike McCarthy had to go over there and ask, Are you OK? All right, we're fine. It's only the first quarter. So we we know, you know, that C.D. Lamb mama talking about Dak and shit. You know, there's just too many distractions. You know, see, this dude, my man Tony Pollard wants to get that good weight lifted without having fans knocking on the door, fans looking through the mirror, stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Tony Pollard maybe wants a little bit more structure. And again, we know Jerry in his mind thinks he has the best interests of the franchise, but that could get a little discombobulated and all messed up because Jerry thinks different. Not everybody's for that. So Tony Pollard, again, I can see him not feeling appreciated. Okay, maybe in Nashville, they might do that a little bit more. Yeah. I like Tony Pollard. Me too. I always like Tony Pollard. Yeah. <laughs> he's, you know, everyone's like, oh, he's small. I'm like, uh, he's six feet, 209 pounds. He, he's so fast. He looks small, like. He's got the quickness of a smaller guy, but no, no, they used to just seeing Zeke with that gut when he pulls yeah. up that swap top. So that's what everybody's like. Zeke's huge and compared to Tony Pollard, he looks small. <laughs> like that's yeah, that's the difference. Yeah. Come on. But when he's had over a hundred carries in each of his last four years, he's averaged almost five yards a carry. I'll take that. And he can catch the football out of the backfield. Um, 15 touchdowns combined, rushing the last two years, plus three receiving touchdowns. Look, you got to – it doesn't make a lot of sense to break the bank, like paying big money to King Henry. But if you think you're going to win the Super Bowl and you want to take pressure off, hell, you'd be – Good to, you know, sign King Henry and draft Jonathan Brooks. Yeah, so you've got yeah. your, you got your, you got your now and your future. Let's see what uh, what the Cowboys come up with. Free agency wow. starts in two days. Throw him that paper, Jerry. What are you talking about? Throw him that money. Throw King Henry that money. You know, that's a Hall of Famer. Throw him what he deserves. What did he give Emmett back in the day? Were Emmett still mad at you because you out here complaining that Emmett shouldn't have gotten paid? He gave yeah. him $21 million for the last two years. So he paid him ten five each, yeah. $10.5 million each of the last two years. This is 2001. <laughs> <laughs> no one's making ten five million per year as a running back in the league now let alone back in 2001 yo man but hey Emmett, that his body was battered too that body man that's always in the tub hey emmett said he gives the most credit to his uh you know his physical therapist his chiropractor 
he would go in there every every Tuesday is the off day for uh, players in the NFL. I wish I'd ask Casey Hampton about that. I mean, Casey Hampton, that dude is a monster. Now, Casey called me right before the show. He said, hey, I'm with my family at the rodeo. I'm like, <laughs> uh-oh. Well, let's give it a shot if it fall, you know, if we can't get a good phone connection, whatever. What, Houston Rodeo? Is that the one yeah. going on? Yeah. Yeah. So, but. Uh, yeah, spring yeah. break, man. You got kids. Hey, this is when you go on vacation. So, you know, you're going to be gone. You know how it is. I know. I got to take my, I'm taking my daughter since it's her spring break. I'm taking her up to Michigan to see some. Relatives who aren't doing great right now. Um, and then we're going to go. She's going to tour the University of Michigan. So Good for her. we'll see. See how that goes. Yeah. How do you so feel about that, Dad? Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. How do you feel about that, Dad? That's a long I way. I mean, I know. I'm like, how about Texas State? How's that look? <laughs> Come on, man. But hey, I told the kids, hey, you go where you want to go and I'll try to help. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Maybe yeah. she'll get a semester before I run out of money. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, it's look. You know. Um, you uh, you don't have any kiddos, right? Nope. Okay. Right. <laughs> no, I feel like I would talk about them a lot more if I did, but no. Me okay. Well, keep me posted on that, will you? Oh. Huh? No. Oh. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Um. It. Yeah, but it was a big weekend. It was a big weekend for Texas. There's no question about it. And if you're talking about like what was the biggest win for Texas over the weekend? Was it beating OU and Tyrese Hunter going for 30? Was it the Texas women paddling Kansas in the quarterfinals of the Big 12 tournament? Was it Texas baseball snapping a four-game losing streak and taking two of three at Texas Tech? Um, I know this. I got to give an alley pop to my man Max Bellew. <laughs> Max Bell, you had a home run in each game. He had nine RBIs and six runs scored in the three games and was seven for 13. Batted almost 600 in that Thank series and was a monster. Texas won game one, 22 to eight. That was wild. Um, That's I that love like a lot of frustration, like losing four games and just like, yo, we're about to beat the absolute shit out these boys. Like that. That's exactly what that felt like on Friday, and then it kind of came back to life the Saturday and Sunday. But yeah, that was solid bats back series win for David Pierce and the squad. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the starting pitching, it wasn't great again. Um, a bit of a concern. LeBaron Johnson goes four and uh, four and two thirds and had more walks than strikeouts. Um, Charlie Hurley, well, Cody Howard was the game two starter and uh, he didn't, he didn't uh, last. And then good heavens. Um, Charlie Hurley, that poor guy, he hadn't made it. He hasn't made it to the second inning in each of his last two starts in his last three starts. He's pitched a combined 3.2 innings. That's tough. And, um, uh, so they got to get him figured out because he's a talented pitcher. He played, he pitched really well. We talk about that. The game, he went six innings against Cal Poly. He was, he had dynamite stuff since then. Not so much. Um, he and Tanner Witt 
combined uh, to to give up. Well, this is tough, but uh, Tanner, let's see. Yeah, Hurley and Tanner Witt combined to give up six runs on seven hits in the first three innings. Uh, that that's tough. That's tough on your whole team. You know, you want to have confidence in your starting pitching when you walk out on the field. It gives the whole team confidence. It leads to a better product. Instead, you know, two of your guys you were depending on coming into the season, they don't have it. Uh, thank goodness Easton Tumas came in. Settled in, gave you a 1.2 innings of scoreless relief and got the win. And then Gage Bame, who is starting to look like your closer, pitched the final four innings, gave up one run on two hits, three strikeouts. You'll take that. Um, Texas comes back. They were down in in the game yesterday and they came back and won it um, nine to seven. So yeah. gut check win for Texas baseball. Um, Texas softball, that was a surprise. Number one in the country. They go down to Houston, get beat in the first game, and then have to come back and score two runs in the top of the seventh to win game three. Um, Mike White said, well, they had uncharacteristic errors that led to a crooked eight-run fourth inning for Houston. In, uh, Damn. Yikes. Um, and that, that one got away, but I'll tell you what, man, Tegan Cavan, freshman pitcher. She's now 10 and 0 and she pitched game two, complete game, easy win nine, two, and then had to come in and pitch two innings of scoreless relief in the win yesterday. Man. So, all right, we got the big fella. I see him. Big Casey Hampton. Greatest defensive tackle ever to roll through the 40 acres should be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Big Case, how you doing? Man, what's good with you, baby? I'm good, man. I'm good. Can't complain. I mean, it's always good to see Casey Hampton. I know uh, it's it's a lot nicer to see you than, than those uh, offensive players you were manhandling back in the day. You know, just to set the stage for our man Casey Hampton, because we do want to get your take on Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy. Casey Hampton led Texas in tackles for two seasons from the defensive tackle position. That's how much of a baller this dude was. Casey, I still cannot believe that. You led the entire defense in tackles for two seasons at Texas from the defensive tackle position where they're double teaming you doing everything they can to make your life miserable. And you're still making the play. Man, you know, playing next to, uh, Sean Rogers and, and Cedric Wood, and Aaron Humphrey, man, made it easy. And you can, it's like, pick your poison, man. Like you, any one of us gets singled up, you can, you can already talk it up as a tackle, tackle for loss. So, I mean, it, it, they made life a lot, a lot of, really, really easy for us. And, um, Coach, Cole, Coach Bull Reese used to always tell us, and he was a linebackers coach and a defense coordinator. And his famous saying was, "The linebackers on scholarship too. Go get the ball." So, you know, that you can't get no, you can't get no better than that when your when your uh, coordinator telling you line go get the ball like that. Oh man, I mean, I, and I know you were the one who was always like, "Hey, Sean, you you and Cedric Woodard were always trying to get Sean amped up, like saying, hey, man, did you hear what that guy said about you?'" <laughs> Say it's like he said what, but yeah, that, I mean that those were so much. It was so much fun to watch you guys uh, get it done. And then you go to Pittsburgh, you win two Super Bowls, two uh, World Championships in, in Pittsburgh. And we were talking to John uh, McLean, who's a Hall of Fame voter, and I said, "How is Casey Hampton not getting onto the finalist ballot for the Pro Football Hall of Fame?" Guy won. Two Super Bowls. He was the best player at his position for the decade that he played. I mean, Casey, it's got to be frustrating to to have the career you had and and maybe not get the love that that you should have gotten, that you should be getting. Uh, I 
I ain't gonna say it's um disappointing. You know, I ain't gonna never disrespect the game. I respect all those guys who uh put in work and and, and, and were able to make it. You know, um, if I make it cool, if I don't, man, I've had, I've had a great career. And um, like I said, man, I, I can't take nothing away from those guys that are in it by saying I'm supposed to be in it. I just, if it's supposed to happen, it's gonna happen, man. I, I know I put in a lot of work and um, hopefully to be recognized, man. You know, I don't have the stats a lot of the other guys have and things like that, but the importance to my team and, and what I did for my position, I think it spoke, it spoke for itself. Yeah. Yeah. Casey, going to this Texas football team, Steve Sarkeesian, getting to the college football playoff, that defense led by some solid interior tackles and Javon Dre Sweat and Byron Murphy. When you look at those two guys, what do you see, how they impact the game? You know, Who do they remind you of? And what do you think about their futures in the NFL? I mean, you know, you know, everybody want to make the natural comparison to me, uh, me and Big Baby, you know, um, and I can kind of see it a little bit. I, I think um, Sweat is a lot bigger than Big Baby was in college. He's a lot <laughs> bigger. Like Big Baby, Big Baby, three twenty was big for him in college. So, but um, those guys, man, the sky's the limit, man. Byron Murphy, dude, I think he's gonna be an unbelievable pro. You know, and the guy is explosive, uses his hands. Um, I could say he reminds me of me, man, but the dude is – he's a way better pass rusher than I was. I think he's going to be elite, elite at the next level with uh, with his skill set. And, and Sweat, I think the same thing, man. Like, big guy, big kid. I don't know about 366. Um, I really haven't talked to him about the weight or anything like that. Now, you can't really tell a guy what the weight or things like that, but I just know being lighter will help you out at that next level, being able to play more downs and things like that. But – his skill set and being able to play and play hard at that weight, it's, it's unbelievable, man. And being that fast at that weight, I think those guys, man, they they're gonna change the game and, and get Texas back to getting those big time guys at, at the defensive line position, man. Because what they showed, I mean, they got it. Both of them have it, man. I I, I like what I saw that uh, these past couple seasons with those guys. Now, Casey, you probably watch the game differently. I always talk to our friend Dan Neal about this. Dan's like, I'm not even watching the game. I'm just watching the interior line to see who's winning those battles. Um, Alfred Collins and Vernon Broughton, those are the guys who are going to step in for, for Sweat and Murphy. What are you seeing from, from those two and, and what, uh, you know, what you like and maybe what they need to do to take the next step? Uh, I just think it's going to be just playing more and getting comfortable in that role of, of being the man. I think those guys, when when they got in, it really was no drop off, man. Those guys played. I mean, they, have, they had a great coach. You know, what I mean, I, I think they they were well coached, using their hands and things like that. And um, I think that um, those guys are, are going to be really, really good players. I don't, I don't think it's going to be a, a drop off at all. I think they can really get it done. Yeah. Now, Casey, rewind back to Javondre Sweat. As you mentioned, him being 366, that's kind of what scares these coaches and GMs if he can maintain his weight so he can be the elite player that we think he can be. You never had a problem with that. For you to be over a decade plus in the National Football League as, an, as a tackle, like that's so impressive. You obviously took care of your body. What would you recommend Travondre Sweat doing obviously he has to lose weight but how does he go about it how does he keep it off and to where he could get that next contract well i think that uh and that's that i didn't have a problem with it in college but in the nfl it definitely was an issue trying to keep my weight down and things like that so i know that struggle and i i, I just think that the main thing is you don't want to go in with that being a problem like i think that that guys don't understand that like when you go in you want to go in and say, you want guys to just worry about you playing football. You don't want it to be an issue of, man, I got to worry about this guy being this way and being that way. You know what I'm saying? First and foremost. And, and what I found when I played, I played my best years when I was lighter, when I was lighter. You know what I'm saying? Just looking back at the thing, you know, when you're playing, you in it, you don't think about it. But just looking back at it, man, just I, I played my best seasons when I was lighter and I, and I felt a lot better. So. I don't, and, and like I say, man, I don't really, I don't know how he feels at that weight. And he's a big guy. He's tall too. And I'm not that tall. So I, I it's just hard for me. Like, cause Big Baby could, when he was in the NFL, he could play at 350, 
they can get up to 360 and things like that and still move and look good. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, he, he could do it, but I think early on it'd be fine. But I think as he get, gets older, he definitely is going to have to trim some of that weight down and um, to, to play a lot, a lot better. So when you say when you were lighter, what was lighter for you? Lighter when? What, 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 like what, when you what, were playing at your best in the NFL? Uh, Probably like – Probably, probably like 325, 330 when I was lighter. I know in, at Texas, I was probably 310, you know what I mean? But toward the end of my career, I was playing at 355, 360. That's just too big for me, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Me being, I'm only 6'2", so you know what I mean? And then you get older, injuries and stuff like that. So that's a little bit, that was a little bit too heavy for me, you know what I mean? But, you know, that's what it was. All right. Now, I know you're heading off to the Houston Rodeo here, but – the Pittsburgh Steelers, I'm sure you, you know, have, first of all, take us back to when you're winning Super Bowls in Pittsburgh. You're the one technique in a 3-4 defense. You're the point of attack. And tell us what playing on that defense was like, the dudes who were around you and how much fun you were having. That's really what it's about, man. It was really about the dudes around me, man. That, that's what made it fun. You know, playing with D linemen. I had three D linemen that I played 11 years, 11 years with, at least 11, 10, 11 years. You know, I had my linebacker, a couple of linebackers I played with 10 plus years. You know what I mean? DBs, like, that's what it's really all about, man. I, I don't think you really see that in a whole lot of other places where guys at every level I played with for 10 plus years. Like that's and, and and on great not only good defenses, great defenses. You know what I'm saying? Like the, the the atmosphere in Pittsburgh, the family atmosphere. It just made things so different, man. Like it was ran like a a mom and pop shop, like a, a a family business. Like Mr. Rooney was there every day. You can go in his office, what's up, and holler at him. Like he was just up there on the same floor at the the the, the team meetings and uh, everything was on. Like you know what I'm saying? It was. It, it was it was it was different, man. And and going to battle with those guys, man, that that um, you knew their families and loved and things like that. That's what that's what it, that's what made that Pittsburgh experience so fun and so different from I think a lot of guys' experience in the NFL. Yeah. What do you think about Russell Wilson going to Pittsburgh? Hey, man. I, I like it. I like it a lot, man. I, I think. Um, you gave Ken an opportunity, man. I think the team is ready, man. I, I think the team is ready. I think we got all the skilled guys on offense. I just think we need to got to get them the ball and, and get the ball consistent and don't turn the ball over because the defense is good. You know, we're going we gonna to be all right, man. I mean, we, we got a quarterback. We're going to always be in the game and, and be able to compete. So I, I think that's a really good move, really good move for him. It's going um, to change some things around that for us. You think the Steelers – I mean, it's amazing how long – the the coach what they've only had like three coaches it's crazy casey what is it about pittsburgh where people go and they stay it's the organization right it's the, it's the, it's the organization like i said it's, it's man it's a family type of business like you don't get that a lot of places man and, and it's really genuine like you know what i'm saying it's like it's like they're not the most extravagant and you ain't gonna have the the best of things or whatever whatever man but Everything is real. Everything is love, and you and you feel that in Pittsburgh. You know what I mean. And I, I think that's what. Um, and I, and I, that's the only place I played, the only place I've been. But I can only go off what other guys said. That any guy who's came in that locker room has said that that locker room was different than any other locker room, and that organization was different than any other organization they've been in. What's your relationship with Mike Tomlin? Obviously, he's been there a long time and never having any losing seasons is pretty remarkable in itself. But what makes him unique and different than other coaches that you have, which haven't been many, but still? I mean, me and Mike T cool, man. Um, I think what makes him different, man, he relates, he relates to the guys, right? Um, you know, people say players, coaches, and things like that, but I, I think that um, he really exemplifies that. Like, um, he takes heed to what the guys think, what the guys say. He's up to date with everything. He keeps it real with you. He, he ain't going to sugarcoat it. He's going to let you know what it is. And I think as a man, you respect that. You know what I mean? Like, he, he not gonna, he's not going to tell you nothing to make you feel better. He's going to tell you what you need to hear. You know what I mean? And, and keep it real with you. And, and that's all you can That's all you can ask for a coach, man. And, um, and you know he's down with you. He wants the best for you. And he's always going to be prepared. 
You know what I mean? When you when you watch that guy prepare and watch how he uh, gets the team prepared and things like that, I think guys really respect that and they know that they're going to go into the game ready to go. Casey, do you have a favorite game that you played at Texas? Oh, man. Not really, man. That was a long time ago, man. I, that stuff just kind of run together to me, man. Right about now, man. That was a long time ago. It's, it's hard for me to remember all of We just had a good, lot of good times. A lot of, you know, a whole lot of good times, man. Playing with my guys. Flapping I just remember, I remember Sims telling me, y'all were playing at Kansas. He threw a pick six to, and y'all were down 10 nothing. And he said, Casey came over to me and said, hey, we're not having this today. <laughs> We're not having this today. And uh, and Sims, you know, he got it together. Y'all won big, like 51 or something. And, and uh, I think he said he walked up to you after the game was like, hey, we good? <laughs> yeah. yeah, You like that? You like that? Talking to us. Yeah, that was cool, man. No, Sims is a cool cat, man. Them, them dudes, man. I just try to get them guys going, man. Get them rolling. Get them, yeah. just, just get them fired up, man. You know, that, that's just what it was back then. I try to get them going. Yeah, I mean – that you you had you were the best player leader because you were doing it you were doing everything on the field so you could look at guys in the eye and say hey i need more i'm gonna, I'm gonna lead on the field i'm gonna run hard i'm gonna work out i ain't missing no workouts none of that you know that's that's a part of it man you know you can't just be no leader at that level especially you got to lead by example as well you can't just be a great player man and i, I believe in that and i think that you know me cedric you know, Aaron Humphrey, we had some really, really good leaders, man. Like some, some guys who went out there and, and led by example every day and got out there and got it. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was amazing. Like, Makovic did an amazing job of recruiting. Like, if you took all of Makovic's best players against any other generation of Texas football, it's – I mean, he recruited you and Humphrey, Ricky Williams. I mean – Tony Brackens, the list goes on. What, uh, you know, what, I mean, you had some talented dudes around you. Oh, yeah. It, it was definitely some talented guys. You know, it was, but it was him. He recruited some great guys and, and Matt and Mac Brown did too. So, you know, I mean, it was, it was, it was a revolving door. We had, we had really, really good players um, the whole time I was there. Definitely blessed with that, man, because having guys around you that can play makes it a whole lot easier for you, man. Makes it a whole lot easier for you. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the Horns going to the SEC? Obviously, you playing in the Big 12, it's a big difference not playing in Oklahoma State, Baylor, and Texas Tech anymore. What are your thoughts on SEC now? I'm fired up about it, man. I think they're preparing for it. Um, I think it's going to be a, um, a big change, but I think with the bigger linemen, the bigger, the bigger body type guys, they're getting like, like just the big squatty body guys. They're getting the big, tall, long, lean guys and things like that, like the Alabamas and the Georgias have. I think we're going to be able to compete. You know what I mean? I, I think um, I think it's going to be good for us, man. You know, college, college football, man, as long as you have a quarterback, you, you're you going to be in the game. And I think that um, our coach ain't going gonna, ain't gonna to have a problem getting a quarterback while he's there. So I think we're going to always be all right. Yeah. All right, Case, we know you got to go, but – Let's keep this conversation going as the season gets closer, man. We need your perspective on uh, on what we're seeing. Already, man. Just let me know. All right. Appreciate Casey you, Casey. Hampton. All right, man. Y'all be easy, baby. Appreciate you. Um, unbelievable player. I mean, absolutely one of the best players I've ever covered. And uh, that dude was as tough as they come. I think I told you when he was a kid. He's watch. He's like watching TV in his apartment, and a guy breaks through the door and gets shot right on top of Casey. Like the guy came in through the door, tripped over Casey, who was sitting on the floor, and the guy who was chasing him shot him right while he was laying on top of Casey. Jeez, man. And I mean, Casey is one of the toughest dudes you'll ever see out of Galveston, and and just rock solid i mean he wanted to win in every way and he got he made everyone around him better and yeah. still got that smile still got that you know that easy going charm and yeah man that yeah. dude's a legend like you talk about longhorn legend that dude oh he's a is legend. a legend he's a legend for sure
I don't know what you'd compare a defensive tackle leading his team in tackles to in basketball. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know if it's I don't know what it is. a center leading the team in assists or something. I mean, it's just something crazy. You just yeah. don't see it. So it's uh, it's spectacular. Yo, um, man. Yeah, how about this? Come on so, now. Okay. Let's you like it. Okay, the Dirty Birds. Okay, yeah, it is. Kirk Cousins this is breaking news. Agrees to a four-year contract with the Falcons. Ooh, Kirko. Kirk That's what Cousins. I'm talking about. Get you some lemon pepper wings, Kirko. Go to Magic City. Get see them scrippers, man. See them butt naked strippers, booty he never seen before in his life, man. Kurt's gonna be iced out, clean, living good, southern hospitality. That's what I'm talking about. B. John Robinson's actually gonna have a quarterback. I love me some Taylor Heineke, but come on, man. We ain't wasting B. John's years, which they, he don't got long. He a running back. We got 10, maybe, if that. You know what I'm saying? I believe in B. John, but let's just be realistic. We can't waste them. Kurt Cousins. Time to get over the hump, bro. Let's go. Her cousins is 35. He's going to be 36 on August 19th. So this con and he's coming off an Achilles injury. Don't like that. Don't like so that. So this contract will take him to when he turns 40. Yeah. Which used to be ridiculous. Like yeah. 32, 33 used to be old for a quarterback. Now we're talking about Kirk Cousins getting a four-year deal. Hey. At the basically the age of 36, coming off an Achilles injury. But hey. Yo, I just saw Kevin Durant drop 45 the other night. Talk about Achilles injuries. Now I'm not saying Kirko has the athleticism like a Durant, but you get my drift here. Like that's Kirko has every ability to come back and still be dominant in a weak ass conference. You know what I'm saying? Baker got paid too, which was nuts. That's three year, a hundred million that's floating around is insane for a guy that was on scout team for the Carolina Panthers. You know what I'm saying? Playing offensive lineman for scout team. That just, that's just wild. So that conference has gotten, I mean, that division, excuse me, has gotten a lot better and, yeah, man. Let's see what let's see. Let's see what Kirk Cousins could do. Well, I was kind of hoping the Cowboys might sign Josh Jacobs from the Raiders, and now it looks like he's going to Green Bay. Weird. And Green Bay's running back room is already stacked. Because you yeah. got Aaron Jones. Damn. That's a weird move. That's I mean. They're on the up and up. You yeah. Know, they had I love four, Josh Jacobs. You beat the Cowboys, which, you know, blame Dak if you want. They still beat the hell out of them. And then you have the 49ers on the ropes. So Mala Force team, you know, Jordan Love, he looked good. Let's see if they could ride that momentum. And Josh Jacobs, he's been one of the best running backs in the last five years. Yeah. I like it. It's just, I don't know. Is there going to be enough to feed everybody, you know, with Aaron Jones and now Josh Jacobs? Then you got, oh boy, Dylan, you know, how we'll see. We'll see. Running back by committee. Yeah, for sure. That's uh that is a loaded running back room in green Bay. Cause Aaron Jones, what a, what a find that dude was out of UTEP. He is, I mean, you saw what he did in the playoffs. Oh, yeah. He destroyed Dallas and nearly destroyed the 49ers. And now you bring in Josh Jacobs. That's the same division as my Lions. I mean, you know. Got you a little nervous now, huh? You got a, a four on that. Lions defense, come on. I'm waiting on this Legereus Sneeds trade. Uh, yeah, the Lions, come it, on. It might happen because Chris Jones, they had to make a decision who they paying. They chose Chris Jones. So what does that mean for Sneed? 
We'll see. They're going to keep her on that franchise. I don't know if he's going to, you know, does he want to play in the winning franchise like the Kansas City Chiefs? Because you're always going to be in Super Bowl contention with 15 taking the snaps. That's a fact. Like, you could have a bad year as a defense. And especially if you pick up Xavier Wordy or Adonai Mitchell, shit. Don't, don't let Patrick Mahomes get one of them Texas boys, man. Yes, we might be biased on here, but y'all know, don't let Patrick Mahomes get, because now we're talking, oh, this dude, he might catch Brady. He might. Like, I believe in Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Worthy that much, because that's the right system. Andy Reid, that's the right system. You know what I'm saying? Patrick Mahomes, that's the right quarterback, which makes the right system for wide receivers like those two. So if they fall there, hey, Time to get busy. And we know Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell, they're going to come in Andy Reid's system and be able to relate because they were under Steve Sarkeesian's, which is a lot similar. You know, Sark picks a lot of stuff from Andy Reid, and I'm sure they have the same terminology. So both of those wide receivers, if they were to go to Kansas City, it would be good chemistry off the bat. It wouldn't be that big of a learning curve or anything like that. Like right. Sark, that's why they're prepared. That's why these guys go and play for Sark because they know when they get to the NFL, that's what they're that's what they saw at the college level. So yeah, man, I, <laughs> man, NFL never stops, man. Can the season start now? Can we know what happens if the season start now? Like y'all know, I love my basketball. This March Madness is about to be lit. We got conference tournaments and stuff. It's almost time to fill out our bracket, and the NBA is getting cracking. I love that absolutely, but man, NFL. None beats that, man. None beats college football. I'm so ready for football to come back. I ain't watching this USFL, XFL thing. I might see our boy Stretch. If Stretch is coaching, I'll watch it. I'll watch his team just because Stretch is our dog. But other than that, sorry, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I could wait. <laughs> well, here's – that's just the tip of the iceberg. So you can cross off, I think – um, Byron Murphy from going to the Raiders because the Raiders are going to sign Christian Wilkins, the Miami Dolphins um, free agent defensive tackle to a four year, $110 million deal. It looks like former Bills wide receiver Gabe Davis is signing with the Jaguars. Um, uh, Jonathan Grenard, the Texans. Pass rusher. Looks like he's signing with Minnesota for a four year, $76 million deal. You've got, uh, um, let's see here. Yeah, we mentioned. Yeah. Yo, if, I'm the, if I'm the oh, Raiders, the Bears, the Bears are signing DeAndre Swift, who went Ooh. from the Lions to the Eagles. And now it looks like the Bears are going to sign DeAndre Swift. Yo, man, if I'm the Cowboys, you got to get Derrick Henry because you need to be you need to roll through the NFC East. The NFC East is battered like it is like Dan Quinn. He's going to have to do a lot of regrouping. We know in New York. Brian Dayball and stuff. They don't like Daniel Jones. Saquon Barkley's probably not going to be there. And now you got the Eagles who had Fletcher Cox retire and Jason Kelsey. So, and then Swift's gone. Like, the Cowboys, they better jump on these opportunity, man, to just, you know, they're already doing well, but you want to dominate so much that you get a bye at that number one seed so you get as close to the Super Bowl as possible. And yeah, man, I, I, you know, going back to the Raiders, I'd look, I'd still look at Byron Murphy, even though they signed Dawkins, you got Max Crosby, Byron Murphy, you could have the best defensive line in the league and you have to play against Patrick Mahomes two times a year. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it might be worth it to still look at Byron Murphy, especially as, you know, Casey Hamden just said a big reason why he was successful was the person next to him. You know, so I don't know if they're a three, four or four, three. I don't know what they run up there in Vegas, but I would still look at Byron Murphy, uh, you know, just because Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert 
with Jim Hardball now. So I expect Justin Herbert to be a lot better. They're in your division and you got to muck their life up. I agree. If Byron Murphy's there, take them. You can never have enough of those difference making defensive tackles. Yeah. All right. So Saquon Barkley, there are rumors of him going to Philly, but the Texans have also apparently put an offer in for Saquon Barkley. We, you know, we talked to John McClain every Friday. They've obviously got Devin Singletary who came in. Um, the change in offense apparently messed up Damian Sal, Pierce. you're biased. You're biased, Sal. <laughs> but uh, Saquon Barkley to the Texans? I like that. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. You have a one-two punch of Saquon Barkley and Devin Singletary? Yeah. Yeah, because Damian Pierce, you and I both know, we had him on our fantasy team. He was supposed to have so many just high hopes for this year, and he was an absolute dud. I don't know if it was injury or whatever. Well, he didn't – John said he didn't adjust to the zone scheme that D'Amico Ryans brought in from San Francisco – um, so he's got to figure that out because he is a tough runner. I mean, he is an angry runner and a guy who's got tread on the tire. I'd hate for him to go somewhere else yeah. unless Ooh. it's like the Cowboys. Yeah. I, I, you know, I mean, I get it. Everybody learns different and everybody's, you know, you grow accustomed to a certain style, especially where you come from. That's what we were just saying about Steve Sarkeesian and how easy it will be for those receivers to hopefully go to the Kansas City Chiefs. But if you're Damian Pierce, man, you need to be in the lab, bro. You need to get with your running backs, coach. And you need to be like, if you got a girlfriend, baby mama, wife, whatever, you need to tell old girl, yo, this – I'm losing money by not knowing the playbook, by not understanding the playbook. You know what I'm saying? Like, again, I get everybody has their pace, but when you're getting paid, like these are, guys are getting paid over seven figures, that stuff, like not understanding Joe Reeds, come on, bro. That, let, let's go, get in the lab. you got to get in the lab. That's BS because that could have been the difference of that team being tied 10-10 with the Baltimore Ravens, number one seed of Baltimore Ravens. That could have been the difference, him knowing the playbook. Because like you said, he is a good player. We know he's a good player. But the fact that him not understanding the offense is holding him back, that, that's I, don't, I hate shit like that. I hate that. This is your job. Put in overtime. Well, like, scratch Saquon to anyone other than the Philadelphia Eagles because he's agreed to a three-year, $37 million deal. Saquon Barkley to the Eagles. See now, see that now. I wish I could rewind what I said about the Cowboys in the NFC East because that Saquon's different. He's different. But Jalen Hurts, that might be tough because if Swift was good this year and last year, uh, what's my man's name? Gosh, Miles Sanders was good the year they went to the Super Bowl. He was good. Now I know they got their coordinators went off to Indianapolis and Arizona to be head coaches and things were different. I thought that was a huge part of why they took a huge step back uh, coming into the 2023, but Saquon, he's one of those guys that just can improvise stuff gets mucked up. He's that good. It's just about staying healthy for him. So yeah, that made things a little bit harder for Dallas, but I, I still think Dallas is the team to lose in that division. And yeah, we'll see what Saquon does. I like it. Good pick. Very petty by Saquon to go to the rival too. Go from the Giants to the Eagles. That, that's some petty work right there. I, I salute him for that. And you know me, I love petty. I love a good hating story. Like I know there's going to be some serious giant haters right there. How can you not? Especially because the Eagles have had success a lot sooner than you have. Well, I'm going to say sooner, but recently than you have. Them Eli days, I was a while now. You know, like Nick Foles, that seems like just yesterday. But uh, Nick Foles, your boy, my boy, unbelievable. Know, one of the few great Westlake guys, along with KD and Rocky and Sam Ellinger. You know, I could go down the list. Brock Cunningham. Brock Cunningham, what's up, baby? Don't let that thumb phase you. You're still knocking down that jumper. We're starting them out. 
Yo, we're starting them now. Yo, Coach Terry, F that senior day stuff. Dylan Mitchell, you have shown that you could be something off the bench. We're starting Brock heading into the tournament. We, we need that. We need that toughness from jump. You know, we, we can't wait to, for the slow starts and all that shit. No, sir. You saw with Brock in the lineup, this team looks good. Brock's found that rhythm. Brock's found that groove. He is locked in. I was going to ask you about that, and I am I'm fascinated because we did see a, an interesting effect from from that and Dylan Mitchell seemed to come into the game with some urgency yeah I mean I, know. I love the way he played off the bench like he was solid crashing the glass you know cutting that is that right all line. I mean is that all it it's gonna take to get everything out of Dylan is to bring what, him in off the know? bench? Yeah. Why not? I know. Why, like, why, why not? didn't we try I, this earlier? My God, the guy's been on campus for two years. He finally comes off the bench, gives you we, – We thought he was too immature to handle it. Like, we thought he would just, you know, he wouldn't be locked in because he would be so down in the dumps. Again, you know, I always go back to the ignorant uncle. You always got somebody at home – Talking about, boy, you ain't starting. What the hell's going on? That Rodney Terry doesn't know damn thing. He's awful. This and that. Like some guys have that, and some guys just psychologically they can't get over the fact that, oh, I'm not starting. I'm getting demoted. You know what I'm saying? Instead of embracing that, okay, I love this team. If this means that our team is going to get better and I can still be a factor, I'm going to buy in, which that's what I saw on Saturday. Now, Again, going back to psychologically, is he thinking this is only happening because it's senior day and Brock's a senior and this is his last game in Austin, Texas? Is this the reason why it's happening? Or is it really just our team could be better with Brock starting and coming off the bench and seeing the game like before, you know, you get in? Because some guys love that. Some guys love seeing what's going on, you know, just looking at different things, looking at very specific things and then see how they can impact it. Like Ginobili was one of the best at it. You know what I'm saying? Like Pop Pop had Ginobili starting in 05. He makes the all-star team. They win a championship. He put that dude right back on the bench for the rest of his career just because I guess the guys that were already on the roster, it fit for them to start and he knew Miley would be fine. If you embrace it, and understand that, hey, it's not about starting games. It's about finishing them and us winning. Then, man, this Texas team, they can shock a lot of people. They can. They look good Saturday. They look really good. And Tyrese Hunter, that's why he was my big hat spirits player of the game because he. this is the time he loves. He loves March, man. He loves March. His game goes up another And he said night. that. Right in yeah. the post game, he said, man, it's March. You gotta, you gotta come through in March. Yeah, it's time to survive in advance. I was yeah. like, whatever it takes, player. <laughs> Yo, thirty we've ball. Seen you go, we've seen you go three of five shooting in the first half and disappear. You yeah. went three of five shooting in the first half and came out and went six of eight shooting. Oh and man, twenty-two Our points in the second half. Oh, our founder of TSU, Brad Kelder, I remember him coming on the show a month or some change ago saying Tyrese Hunter sucks just straight up. I was like, damn, that hurt my heart because I knew what Tyrese had in him. Right, he's and got it. It. Valid for, it was valid for BK to say, I got it. I understood it, but I knew what Tyrese Hunter had in him. And was, that's why it was so disheartening because you're like, man, this guy, if he could just start hooping and get some confidence – he could be one of the best point guards in the nation. And you saw that on Saturday, like that off the dribble three ball, you know, getting to his spots, dropping dimes, throwing lobs to Dylan Mitchell, like running, getting steals. That's how you have to play, man. And if where the Dylan, hell has that been? I, he, showed fl he shows flashes all the time. That Baylor okay, game in the first half. How much good. of that? How much of that was matchup? Because Zay, Texas is playing K State, and 
they almost – well, no, this, this is good. It's good. K-State beat TCU to elevate Texas to a seven seed instead of playing on the 8-9 line against OU again with Houston waiting for them. Now they're a seven seed playing a K-State team that just pulled off a good win over TCU but will fall apart at the first opportunity. Now Texas, if they win, is going to play Iowa State instead of the Cougs. But can we see this in the K-State game? Because they have excellent perimeter defense. And they kind of locked everybody down in the first meeting, and Texas had to beat them from the inside out. Yeah. I mean, I think that was a tough game. Because wasn't it a Monday night game coming off It was a Monday night game. Yeah, coming off of Tech, if I'm not mistaken. Let me double check that. It was – um actually it was coming off the Houston game coming off the Houston game okay yeah and so, yeah Monday night had, right yep it was a Monday night and Dazu went off he had 20 Tyrese Hunter was three for 10 Max Asmus was three for 10 uh Kendall Weaver was one for four like the perimeter guys struggled but Texas played great defense in that game K-State missed a lot of shots, but I mean, look, Texas finally looked like a home team playing at home against OU. They shot 73% in the second half. Yeah. (laughs) 73%. This is what Baylor did to Texas on last Monday. Baylor shot 73% in the second half. Yeah. This time it was Texas. Yo, you can't deny that Roddy Terry has his team playing their best ball at the right time. You win the yeah. last, you know, three out of four games, and you could argue that Baylor game, if Dylan Dessou doesn't go out just mentally, that team was done because, you know, you're thinking, oh, man, I hope Dylan's all right. If he's out for the season, we're definitely done for. But if he's healthy, we can make a run. And now, thank goodness that he's healthy. He looked good, even though, of course, I'm – oh, my gosh, it's It's, it's nuts. I'm thinking literally, yo, Rodney Terry, get Dylan DeSue out. Right, right when I'm thinking that, this dude gets, hurt. gets the bucket and he like tweaks his ankle a little bit. I'm just like, get him out the game. Get him out the game. He should have been out like three minutes before that. I know, whatever. I don't sometimes you just don't think about that stuff and you're not trying to look at injuries and let him play, but he's just way too valuable. The dude's first team all Big 12, which well deserved. Shout out to Max Ace Miss getting second team. I thought Kendall Weaver got absolutely hosed on honorable mention. That's a joke. There's like 20 people that make honorable mention. And the fact that number two is an honorable mention, that's an absolute joke. Big 12, y'all messed up once again. But Dylan DeSue, he deserved to make it. You know, I tweeted about Austin area hoops because I'm very prideful of my city and where I come from. And we've always got the short end of the stick as far as respect goes compared to the San Antonio's Houston and Dallas DFW areas of the state. And man, we're coming up. We got hoopers here. If you see Jamal Shedd, Maynard, Texas, defensive player of the year in the big 12 and player of the year, Dylan the Sioux first team, Round Rock, Stony Point was just in the state championship game. Well, shout out to my guys, coaches Antoine Thompson and Coach Donald Dallas. Hell of a job this year, gentlemen, putting basically the ATX on your back, Central Texas area on your back, and getting that far and representing. Like, we need more of that. Just, just the fact that, you know, coaches come down here. That's just kind of one of those things. I think coaches sometimes are afraid to come down here and recruit players because they there's a stigma that we're soft. And that's not the case. Throw Brock Cunningham in there. Throw KJ Adams in there. Both of those guys, Westlake guys, like this city. Yes, we're a football state. Yes, we're a football city. But we got hoopers around here, man. And it's very evident with guys like Jamal Shedd and Dylan DeSue, both of those guys, first team, all Big 12, both of them from this area, Pflugerville and Maynard. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, okay, um, Dylan DeSue. How surprised were you that he looked that good? Oh, man. Coming off the knee sprain. It was incredible. I thought he wasn't going to play, you know, and I wouldn't have not Coach Terry for not playing them, even if the doctors cleared them just because of what you have in the future. But, yeah, he looked good. 
knocking down that outside three early on, getting that tip in, you know, when the shot clock was going down, he looked really good and he didn't look like he was laboring that knee at all. So yeah, you need Texas to be as healthy as possible, you know, this tournament stretch, which is why if you're a coach, Terry, you got to be real strategic with the minutes that you're ditching out. That's why I've been preaching all year long, how important having an eight to nine men rotation is like, he's very confident in this eight men right now, even though it Horton basically put up nothing but donuts on Saturday, you still have confidence playing him. That he's not hurting the team. He's not necessarily helping much, but he's not hurting them at this point. So at least you could give God, Guys like Max A. Smith and Kendall Weaver and Tyrese Hunter rest if they get a little fatigue or if they get in foul trouble. You can have It Horton in there, but hey, but eighteen rotation. eighteen minutes is perfect for It Horton. That's fine. Yes, that is that's good. Maybe fifteen. That. Maybe fifteen <laughs> minutes. You're so petty, man. Like at, at least in the teens. And like anything below, I, I think he deserves a little bit more than that because he's been playing hard and his defense isn't horrible. He's keeping guys in front of him. He's rebounding decent. Like he, he's he's playing some solid basketball. And then you saw in the Baylor game, he knocked down a couple of shots. You hope that can translate, you know, in the Big 12 tournament and beyond. But yeah, man, I, I was really impressed with Coach Terry's group on Saturday. They got that 20th win. We're not thinking about bubble team anymore. They're in. Hey, you remember me talking about getting ready for the NIT after they got blown out at Allen Fieldhouse? That oh, yeah. looked like an NIT team. Like that, that was that, that was doomsday talking. Yeah, that looked like an NIT team. I'm sorry, that was an absolute disaster. That's just that those type of things can't happen. That's why. Okay, let me ask you this. Scary. Let me ask you this because Jerry Palm told me last night Texas is in win or lose in the Big Twelve tournament. Like mm-hmm. they've done enough. They're they're not going to be one of those teams to get you know pushed out of the tournament because team like K-State or Ole Miss wins their conference tournament and, and steals a spot from a, an at-large team. Is Texas better off losing to K-State? Um, no. And getting rest um, with the zoo? Yeah, th- there's pros and cons because if you it depends how you lose. You know, if they lose by a last-second shot or if they lose by single digits, Kansas State, Jerome Tang's team's mad desperate. They're super desperate. They, they're going to be scrapping and caught, clawing, and they might throw a bow or two. Like, they are desperate to. And that's kind of a home game for them in yeah, Kansas City. For sure. For sure. So, you don't want to – you want to win as many games as possible because if you somehow win the Big 12 tournament, now you're talking four seed, not five. I'm telling you, here's your five. It may be five. I remember uh, Syracuse, Gary McLamara's squad in um, 06, senior year. They weren't supposed to make the tournament. They end up winning the Big East tournament, and they end up being the five seed. Now, they lost in the first round, so let's not look too far into it. But you catch my drift. Like, you go from a team that might not even make it, which Texas, they're already in. So if they could knock off Baylor and Houston – along with obviously Kansas State or Iowa State, whoever they have next, like, yo, you're you're in? I think that might be four spot. I really do. Like, I, I think that might be four. Winning the Big 12 tournament should get you a top four seat, no matter who you are, unless if you're one of those teams that plays tomorrow. That's nuts. But still, like, that's that this conference is that thick. You know, it's that deep. So – Winning How about Kansas? Kansas something. has to play a second round game in the Big 12 tournament. If they if Kansas is going to win it, they got to play four games in four days, just like Texas. They, I don't trust them going out the second round. I don't trust them. They're just, I don't yeah, know. Furphy, they rely so much on that five, man. The starting five. It's well, and weird. Furphy's lost. He's lost his confidence, or his confidence is taken up. Yeah. Something's going on there. He's not. He's not playing with the slump. same. Huh? Yeah. Slump. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So he was fantastic for them when they were rolling people. Yeah. Um. I mean. Yeah. I. I could see where losing 
to K State might make some sense, but I just hate saying that because I know that's why one of the things you hated about Rick Barnes is that he was always bitching about the Big 12 tournament. And how do you expect your team to go in there and do what Rodney Terry's team did last year as the two seed? Yeah. Rolled people, beat Kansas by 20 in the yeah. Big 12 tournament final. Yeah, because, again, if Texas wins the Big 12 tournament, yes, they might be a little fatigued. We ain't practicing, coach. Everything's walkthrough. Everything's shooting drills. We might get a little bit of cardio and just a little bit, and that's within the shooting drills that we're doing full court. But nothing, no contact ever at this point of the year. It's all walkthrough stuff. You just got to hope and pray the stuff that you did in the offseason where you were sealing up the hoop so the balls won't go in so you could do nuts rebounding drills and the drill doesn't stop until somebody gets the ball even though it goes into the 10th row of the bleachers. Like, you you rest guys. So winning the Big 12 tournament, think about what that does for your psyche. Like, think, think about what that does for your confidence. You know what I'm saying? Like, you be you beat – Houston, you could be anyone. And that's how you got to feel. You got to feel that, hey, no matter who we play, we can beat anyone. And Texas right now sitting at that seventh spot, no two seed wants to play them at all. I don't care if you're Carolina. I don't care if you're Marquette. Like, no two seed is going to want to face Texas. because Yeah, but they got to get off that 8-9 line first. Yeah, true. That one's not going to be easy. Yeah, I, you're right. I'm being a little bit ahead of myself by going. I don't. Back. I haven't seen any That's projections. I haven't seen any projections of Texas as a seven seed yet. Have you? Um, I'm lucky now. No, I don't know what Joe Lenardi's doing. He needs to. He needs to update his. Let me see if he's already done. Yeah, you going at Joe? Joe probably got a family kids and stuff <laughs> he probably enjoyed spring break with his kids like you you know he can't be grinding all Dude, the time this yeah, is I his got, tax season if he was an true, accountant this is, this is where he's supposed to be working all the time i he can't be it. spending time with his kids right now okay wait <laughs> lenardi he updated his let's see where he's got texas i see texas on cbs 9c going against gonzaga love that matchup yeah with tennessee as the game Okay, Lenardi still Lenardi has Texas as an eight seed in Indianapolis. Same, same. Uh, they would play Purdue in the second round. Yeah. In Detroit, eight seed in. Oh no, sorry, in Indianapolis. So that's, that's oh terrible. hell no, home game. No, home game. no, no. We need to no. <laughs> See what I mean? You can't lose this Kansas State game. That sounds awful. That sounds terrible. Because they're just Zach Eady's gonna drop 35 and 16 on the horns if that happens. That'd be brutal. Like, absolutely not. But yeah, that, that's why you have to avoid that. That's why you have to win as many games yeah. as possible against, you know, these quad one teams. You're you're sitting that 20 wins, you got that, you're in, but you can't be satisfied. And that's what Coach Terry has to let these guys know. Hey, we are not satisfied. Yes, we are in. Yes, we know we're dangerous, but hey, we could be beat too. Like we've shown that UCF, UCF ain't going to be playing in any type of tournament besides the NIT. So there's going to be teams that you face that are way better than them. you got to take every game seriously. And again, the Horns are playing good basketball right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. You got to win, baby. You got to win. Um, all right. We'll keep you up to date on everything going on with the, uh, with the NFL free agency frenzy, um, quick word, though, for Apple leasing, getting you into the car you really want to be driving. I mean, they lease every make and model of car, so they don't care what car you pick. That's the beautiful thing. There's no pressure. There's no haggling. Um, they just want you to make sure that you're happy. So you lease any make and model of car you want, and... You're not paying for the future trade-in value of that car, which is the single biggest markup in a new or used car. So you're getting into a better car than you thought you could afford, and it's brand new. Some of you have not driven a new car, maybe ever. If you're like me, I used to buy used cars all the time because I was like, I ain't paying for that future trade-in value. That's why it all depreciates as soon as I drive it off the lot. Apple leasing, you're only paying for the car while you're driving it, so you're getting... A better car that you thought you could afford and you're picking whatever you want. 
whether you want to keep your payments in the $400 range or get a Range Rover, they got you covered. Just go to AppleLeasing.com or give them a call today. 346-9977. Tell them Chip Brown sent you. I figured we'd sprinkle in the the uh, sponsor mentions today. Um, all right, Zay. The Texas women at 4 o'clock today are going to take on K-State. Ioka Lee, the, the K-State six foot six All-American, will be in the lineup. The Wildcats, she was in the lineup for the Wildcats in Manhattan at the start of Big 12 play, and K-State beat Texas 61-58. This is when Deanna Gaston hurt her ankle. Um, Texas, they were calling fouls all over the place. Taylor Jones fouled out. It was kind of a weird game, but uh, K-State won it 61-58. Then when K-State came to Austin, Texas won, but Ioka Lee was not in the lineup. Now, K-State is one of the few teams who can match up with Texas from a, a guard size standpoint because you've got, um, you know, the uh, uh, what's a bunch of white girl sounding names. Um, Serena, <laughs> Serena Sundell, Gabby Gregory. And Jalen Glenn are all six feet tall. Six, two of them are six one. At the guard position, I think this is a incredible matchup. This is a this is like a one versus two semifinal in the Big Twelve tournament. How? Uh, what's your level of interest in this one at four o'clock today? Well, you got to make sure you double Ioka Lee first. You know, if she gets the ball in her sweet spots, that's money. You know, Taylor Jones and Aaliyah Moore are in for a rough day. But if you could double her and just get her out of their spots, you got to do your work early when you face bigs like that. You know, like before they catch the ball, you got to push them out legally before they even touch it. So when they do catch it, they're not in a position where they work on the same move every single day with their shooting coach. You know, you want them to do stuff out of the ordinary, make them shoot, you know, a turnaround shot if that's not their game or just make them uncomfortable and give her different bodies, give her different looks. Obviously, Kansas State's a good team and they got shooters around her. So you got to close out on them, too, when she makes that pass, when the double comes. But at the end of the day, everything starts with her. She's the one that's driving the ship. And if she gets going, it could be a tough one for Vic Schaefer's ladies. But again, you got to stop the horns. Madison Booker, she's just one of the best players in the nation. It's weird because that girl, Juju Watkins, playing for Southern Cal, she gets a ton of love as a freshman. And I don't think Madison Booker gets the national love that she deserves. I don't know why she gets the love in the Big 12, but not the national love that she deserves, especially playing the position that she's not used to playing, going from small four to point. And she's been doing a hell of a job filling in for Rory Harmon, co-Big 12 player of the year. So if she's going to do her thing, Shea Holly and Shailene Gonzalez have to knock down shots. When they knock down shots, that takes Texas game for, to another level. We know Moore and Jones do a great job with their high-low game and scoring inside. That's what Vic Schaefer likes to do, get it to his bit and have them work. But if the horns go deep, and make a Final Four run and potentially play for a national championship, it starts with the shooting with Shaylee Gonzalez and Shea Holly. Yeah. Yeah, and Shayla Gonzalez is back to struggling. Yeah. Um, which makes you a little nervous. But, look, you see that ball go through, um, you know, the first time and – Sometimes it just flows from there, right? Yeah, that's how it gets going. Like, it could be a layup. It could be a free throw. All you have to do is see it go in and know that, okay, I have some points on the board. Now let's get going. And, you know, she needs that. It's been an up-and-down year for her, Rich. I think Rory Harmon is a big effect to that. Like, Rory Harmon knew how to get Shaylee Gonzalez the ball in her sweet spots. Like, that's a big thing. Like Madison Booker, sometimes when she throws certain passes, Jaylee Gonzalez will have to reach for it 
and then get in her shooting pocket. And some people, they can't do that. You know, not everybody's Steph Curry. Not everybody's Clay Thompson, where they can catch it on the freaking ground and get into a very pure jumper. Sometimes it has to be on the money. And Rory Harmon did that better than anybody in the nation, where she would put it right in that bed basket so you could go into your shot as smooth as possible. So that, that's been an adjustment for Shaley Gonzalez, which, again, Madison Booker, like she's doing the best she can. Like, you know what I'm saying? That's not what she was taught to do. She wasn't taught to make those pinpoint passes because she wasn't brought up as a point guard. She was brought up as a scorer. So she'll learn those things over the course of her career. But as of right now, those are just the things you're going to have to deal with. And hopefully Shaylee Gonzalez could get into some type of rhythm. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I, that's the thing, man. I used to, my dad, he would, we would work out. And he would throw me shitty passes and then we would change it up. Sometimes it would be a horrible bounce pass and I'll have to get into my shot. Sometimes it would be just way high where I had to jump for that thing and got into my shot. Like that helps you become comfortable because you just never know in game situations with the defense and how they're playing you, how that pass is going to be. Yeah. So if you're just tuning in, like I guess our man, uh, Dave and Austin, the NFL free agent frenzy is well underway. Um, Saquon Barkley is signing with the Eagles. Kirk Cousins is signing with the Falcons. Uh, Christian Wilkins, the Pro Bowl defensive tackle with the Miami Dolphins, is signing with the Raiders. Um, Houston Texans pass rusher Jonathan Grenard <clears throat> is signing a four-year, $76 million deal with the Vikings. Uh, the Bengals are re-signing uh, running back Travian Williams, and Tony Pollard is expected to sign a three-year, $24 million contract with the Tennessee Titans. That's right, Tony Pollard. You get to work out in peace, brother. Good for you. <laughs> the Bears are signing Eagles running back DeAndre Swift, and, of course, the Eagles are signing Saquon Barkley. Um, and the Colts have re-upped with their receiver, Michael Pittman. And um, and so, yeah. And the Bills center, Mitch Morse, is signing with the Jags. Um, so, I know people don't care much about those offensive linemen, but Mitch Morse is a Trojan man. He went to Anderson High School. Oh, wow. Represent. Uh, and he's been a big-time uh, mainstay in that Bills offensive line with Josh Allen, and now he's going to have Hunter Lawrence's hands under his uh, scrotum. So, Hunter uh, Lawrence? Who is that? Hunter Lawrence, the quarterback for the – or sorry, um, Trevor Lawrence. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, yeah. That's what, okay. um, That's what I thought. Trevor you Lawrence, the former kicker for Texas, will not have his hands in Mitch Morris's rump roast. Okay. Or under his rump roast. So, out of all um, those guys you just named, who pushes the needle for you? I mean, obviously Tony Pollard leaving the Cowboys to go to the Titans, which again says. Who's getting King Hen King Henry? Um, because look, I've had Derrick Henry on my fantasy team for the last five years, and he's been a gold mine. Yeah. And everyone's trying to get the jump on when a guy isn't going to give it to you. Remember when Bill Belichick said, "Oh, we don't need to pay Tom Brady. We don't need to give him another year. He's done." And then he goes and wins a Super Bowl with the bucks. I mean, you don't know what's inside someone's breastplate. And if King Henry is still hungry, then I'd love for him to bring that hunger uh, to the Cowboys. I was really hoping they would get Josh Jacobs, but Josh Jacobs is signing with the Packers. Yeah. He's going to be playing with Aaron Jones. I'm like, dang. But yeah, you mentioned it, Zay. Um, you know, Chris Jones signs a big deal with the Chiefs. Um, let me get the terms on that. 
think it's yeah. a five year, $95 million deal. Like that's, they must love that dude. Like he, I mean, he's, he's good. Like again, after Aaron Donald, he's been the best defensive tackle of the last decade, but he's 30 now. It's not like this is a 25 year old man and he'll be 30 when the contract's over. He'll be 35 when it's done. right. No, this is a, this is a, you know, you're getting the best years of his career here. Um, your, your prime, they say for a pro athlete is 27 to 31. That's your prime, the five years that you're in your prime. Now with today's training and diet, that prime is expanding because sure. you mentioned it. You got guys like LeBron. Now LeBron is LeBron is made of polyurethane. Like God oh. made him and said, you will break the mold. There's been PED rumors going around social media. I'm just saying, I'm not spreading them. Not I'm just saying, there's a lot of pettiness going on in the basketball world on social media right now with a lot of this young generation hating on the 90s and a lot of people now hating on LeBron and certain guy came out and said he does PEDs and stuff. I, I'm not, I love LeBron. Just accusations. That's terrible. It is terrible. Mm -hmm. You're going, you're going straight to hell on a first class ticket for even bringing that up, LeBron. What, about, what do I do? I didn't spread the rumors. Ed, I, what am I? Look, hey, LeBron's a strong. Why are we hating on a man who's who spends millions in the off season to make sure his body is a temple? I'm, I'm just saying, the dude. He, hey, he's defining the odds. Father time. I don't see it with Bron, so I'm just saying it's a little suspicious. Just like I'm a little suspicious of. The Oklahoma Sooners girls softball team is a little sketchy. You know what I'm saying? A little sketchy. I love, I love that that's your PED go-to is Oklahoma softball. Yeah, man. I'm tired it. of them winning, damn it. Something well, going Texas on. Got, Texas got to number one in softball and then lost game one to the Cougs over the weekend, but they won the series. Um, Yeah. Well, speaking of – workouts remember herschel walker um saying he did 300 push-ups a day is how he got his body no that oh yeah thing? that this was way before you were born he yeah. did a he did a sports illustrated um article which now would be more of one of those you know sports science things Herschel was not a big weightlifter. He did isometrics. He did push-ups. He did wall sits. He did, you know, dips for his, you know, triceps and all this stuff. Have you ever tried to do 300 push-ups in a day? Hell no. Like, even if you did 10 at a time at 30 different times in the day, dude, now you know why Herschel was built like a muscle and fitness model. Yeah. Don't really agree with his politics because I don't know what the hell he'd be talking about. He's hard to understand. But his football days, he was nice with it. <laughs> like anybody that has a chance of having CTE shouldn't be running for politics. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I can't I can't take you seriously. Hey, I'm not we're not getting there. I'm just saying I can't take you seriously. I'm, just saying, I'm, just just talking about, shows, I'm trying to talk to you about I hear you. I What's the you. most push-ups? What's the most push-ups you've done at one time? At one like one a whole day? No, the course of like, a day or just once at once? Like it? Yeah, at one time, probably fifty. Yeah, I used to be able to do fifty. Yeah, now I definitely can't do fifty. Now I tried to do thirty the other day, and I came up with twenty. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, damn, I got to get back to it. Yeah, man. I got to hit the deck, drop and give me 30. By the way, we haven't checked in on the weight loss. Where, where, where are you at? How, how'd that go? We're, we're in March now. Where, oh, where I'm happened? down nine pounds and it's kind of flatlined. I got some Girl <laughs> Scout cookies. <laughs> yeah, I can't even hate. Hey, those peanut butter patties. Yeah. Holy 
stripes. Is this true? A hundred at a time. Damn, you're Herschel Walker, Dave. Hundred push-ups at a time. Wow. Yeah, now 15. Yeah, I feel you. Yeah, I got some Girl Scout cookies. So I actually have not even gotten on the scale. I say I've lost yeah. nine pounds, but I might have put a couple <laughs> back on. Yeah, man. You like Javondre Sweat. You might come in pound heavy. Well, why they got to be sitting around outside the, the Walgreens with those Girl Scout cookies? That's how they get you, man. That's you know, I can't say you. no to a peanut butter patty. Yeah, it's tough. I still haven't found my, you know, fresh off the back of the truck. The girl's slanging them because that six dollars. Come on, I know. I get inflation, y'all tripping. Y'all now, tripping. when my daughter was a Girl Scout, the troops only got fifty cents off the five dollar boxes. Oh wow! Like, where's the rest of that money going? Don't be saying to produce the cookies for next year. Let's see, yeah, that's because that. You can get the – no, don't get me started. I just – can we get some more money to the girls, to the troops? Right? Yeah, man, they out here hustling. They need to do it year-round. That's the problem. They only go for about a couple months, if that. We need a year-round, you know. Damn. Keep hustling. Robert's all kinds of hot at me. He says, I'm going to hell if I think that the million-dollar athletes worth billions ain't taking PEDs. That's what I'm saying, Robert. Yo, the best era of baseball, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, battling yeah, it out. That's the that, time, it was legal. Baby. It was legal in baseball until 2002. It was against the law in our country to take steroids, but it was legal in baseball. That's why these baseball players are so stupid. Like, if they would have just said that, like if Rafael Palmero. And Sammy Sosa, all, all those guys would have said, hey, listen, it was legal in baseball to take steroids until 2002. We were all taking them. I apologize. I got, I took them. And I'm not going to take them anymore. Instead of lying, we would mm. look at Andy Pettit. Andy Pettit's like, yeah, I took that stuff. I took HGH. I had an elbow injury. Oh, okay. We love Andy Pettit. Yeah. Because he told the Jeter. truth. Baseball's stupid different. But. Yo, what, what was, Sam, was Sammy's plug from Cuba? Because that skin, I don't know what Sammy was taking. Because I, I hope he's all right. Because that, where, where was Sammy getting his from? I always look at Sammy and be like, if you want to look at an example of how things can go bad, because it can't just be, you know, whatever Michael ha Jackson have or Lago, whatever. I don't know what it's called, but it, it can't be just that. It had to be something Sammy was taking that made Sammy look the way he does now. Because Sammy, he probably had the honeys in Chicago going crazy during that era. And now he forgot he how to speak English when he went to Congress. <laughs> You're talking about like what Michael Jackson was taking that made it where he was born a, a black young man and died a middle-aged white woman? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is either. That's Joe Jackson, actually. That's my strange. favorite, though, was A-Rod, who was like, oh, my cousin in uh, the Dominican was giving me stuff, and I was just taking it. Mm. I didn't know. <laughs> Come on, A Rod. Like, I like A Rod on MLB Network or whatever. On Speaking Fox. of skin, have you seen A Rod lately? No. A Rod's is like reverse. A Rod's getting darker. A Rod looks weird. That tan ain't normal that A Rod has. And he's, I mean, he's got great skin. I, yo, you haven't seen A Rod lately. I'm not saying black don't crack and brown don't either. I, <laughs> hey rod looks like he's 12 Not but no more. are you getting me a bootleg yeah i'm getting you a bootleg um yeah i like a rod as a analyst on that fox with uh big poppy big poppy you gotta love being big poppy all you are is comic relief uh-oh 
Well, he must have been out in the sun. He must have had a big day at the pool. I yeah, he's like tan. He, yeah, he, he got himself some. Tan. He got. He was out. He said he fell asleep. Yeah, he said he fell asleep at the pool. But I believe it. Yeah, but Big Poppy, what are you saying about him? Yeah, I mean Big Poppy is like he gets to just get paid hundreds of thousands to just be the funny guy who hit home runs for World Series teams in Boston. Yeah, like Frank Thomas. I don't know what he brings to that Fox broadcast, but A Rod actually has really good analysis. <laughs> and he's so annoying. Cause he's How like annoying. My cousin in the Dominican gave me the some stuff that I took, yeah. but blame the cousin. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Getting overseas. I mean, it's a little risky, especially the Cuba and the Dominican Republics, where you know. The drugs could be mixed with a little something else. Very risky, but yeah, I like that crew too. Pedro, I think he does a good job. I think Big Hurt does a good job too. And now they brought in Jeter for the World Series and stuff. Yeah. I always love some Jeter. Not as much as Bucky Gobble with his weird ass, but <laughs> at a normal level, I, I love some Derek Jeter, yes. Yes, Victor Conte, yes. And I get it. The PED guys are always – one step ahead. I just, uh, I just, it bothered me that baseball decided, oh, this guy used steroids and PED, so he's not going to the Hall of Fame. I was like, put them all in. Yeah. And then say uh, at the last sentence of the plaque, the guy played in the steroids era. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Because all those dudes, Roger Clements, Barry Bonds, they're all talented as you know what, at what they're doing. And, you know, Roger Clements, come on, seven Cy Young Awards. He's not in the Hall of Fame. Come on, man. Yeah. And I think about the money these guys were bringing in. Like McGuire and Sammy Sosa had people oh, yeah. locked in. They had folks that never picked up a baseball in their life locked in to that run like all the taylor swift fans who now have seen an nfl football game exactly and we're gonna screw them over because the old heads that were watching or excuse me listening to babe roof on radio think that it's wrong get the hell out of here come on all right let's get uh let's get to the commentaries a couple more mentions how about brain vault the mouth guard that is revolutionizing the mouth guard it's not, we're not going to the sporting goods store to get a piece of rubber and throw it in a pot of boiling water. We are going to Austin's dentist, Dr. Greg Eckert, Dr. U-E-C-K-E-R-T. He developed the Brain Vault mouth guard, proven, patented to reduce the effects of concussion. So if you've got a competitor in your house, this is the mouth guard that is going to allow them to play hard, but play safe. Maybe you're that competitor. You play in a beer league, pick up basketball, you need a mouth guard. You don't want to catch an elbow and lose your choppers. You're playing a beer hockey league, you definitely need a mouth guard. How about lacrosse, flag football, cheerleading? All of y'all need the Brain Vault mouth guard to make sure that you're protecting what's upstairs. You know what I'm saying? Brain Vault. BrainVault.com. Set up an appointment, and when you're ready, for the big screen of your dream, surround, sound, surveillance, electronic shades, new lighting, only one place to go. And it's as simple as a phone call, audio, visual consultations, and our man, Tom McKay, who's been doing it for decades in Austin. And look, you call 255-8678. Tom and his crew will bring everything to you, including the best price on big screens. It's just when you're ready. Two five five eight six seven eight, and it's Monday, kids. Monday, which means all night happy hour at Salt Traders Coastal Cooking. Um, if you're in the mood for seafood, about three thirty to six thirty happy hour. One dollar raw oysters and the best selection of oysters in Austin. Best seafood. Their scallops will blow your doors off, but you're getting five dollars off the beginnings menu. That's got the grilled oysters, and you've got the. New Orleans barbecue shrimp, the chowder fries, salt traders, 
Get your seafood on right there off of Mopac at Rolling Wood, uh, at Silker Park, and up in Round Rock from our man Jack Gilmore, who gave you gives you Jack Allen's Kitchen. And if you're thinking about watching the Texas women today at four o'clock, or the Texas men on Wednesday, I think that game's on ESPN Plus. You need to get to cover three. Get a Sean Adams prime rib sandwich. Settle in. Watch your favorite team. Get your buddies together. Cover three, Anderson Lane, um, up in Round Rock. And, of course, cover two at 183 in Lake Creek. All right, Zay. For the chip shot today, I want to give a little bit of love. Um, I'm going to give, I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of sugar across the Texas Longhorn landscape from the weekend. Um Start with Texas basketball. Tyrese Hunter, there you go. Cut it loose. Maybe maybe he just needed to know, oh, okay, we're getting into tournament time. I don't have to pace myself anymore. And he goes for 30 and plays good D. What's crazy about this game is Texas only had 25 rebounds in this game. Um, but Oklahoma only had 28. And Texas beat them by 14. But Texas was making a whole bunch of shots. So I get why Alabama's uh, rebounds were, or uh, Oklahoma's rebounds were low. Um, But Dylan DeZu, first team, all big 12. Let's go. That's that's appropriate. Dylan DeZu has been one of the toughest matchups in the big 12 this year. Comes out after spraining his knee on Monday. Goes for 16. Rodney Terry left him in a little too long. Looked like he might have uh, tweaked that ankle. Anytime Dylan DeZu is hobbling, I get nervous because I was sitting right courtside last year when he went up for a rebound against Xavier two minutes into the game and then left. Little did I know he had already hurt that foot and was just trying to see if he could tolerate it. Couldn't. Of course, he had surgery on that. But that was. Um, look, that was a Texas team that can be a problem for teams because if you get Tyrese Hunter starting to play like that on a regular basis, Texas becomes a more difficult team to defend. If you get Kendall Weaver flying around doing his thing, um, Dylan Mitchell flying around, good for them. Um, sugar for the Texas basketball team finish. Remember, they started at home one and four in Big 12 play. They finished four and oh, and they needed every one of them. I get it. They were games against K State and Oklahoma State and Oklahoma, not the West Virginia, not the best of the best, but you had to win them all because the NCAA tournament committee looks at those home, you get punished more for a home loss than you do for a road loss. So, Texas did what they were supposed to do, and now they're in the NCAA tournament, according to Jerry Paul. Texas women, let's go. Four o'clock today. Ioka Lee in the in the gang. Aaliyah Moore's playing really well. I don't know what she did to treat the tendonitis in her knees, but she needs she needs she's the X factor to me because she's so skilled and tough. Um, you know, Taylor Jones is tall. She's fundamental. She keeps the ball high. Um, but when she's playing against Ioka Lee, it's six foot six. Taylor Jones looks small. So it's going to take a great team effort today. And Madison Booker is leading this team in the postseason. Let's see. Vic Schaefer is the king of the postseason. His teams tend to outperform in the postseason. So let's see what uh, they've got in that Big 12 tournament semifinal today after whipping Kansas in the quarters. Um, Texas baseball, good gut check win. Max Bellew and Peyton Powell, Porter Brown, good on you. You were hitting the baseball this past weekend, and you won 22-8 to in the opener. Um, you lost 7-2 in game two, but you're down 7-3. You come back, you win 9-7 in game three in the last regular season series with Texas Tech in the Big 12, well done. 
there's hope. Even though we didn't see much hope from the starting pitching in this series, the relief pitching actually came through. How about some love for uh, um, guys like uh, Ace Whitehead, Easton Tumis, and Gage Bame, who threw four innings of relief uh, in that win um, for Texas. So, I mean, look got to get it done one way or another and and texas tennis i'll wrap it up with this texas tennis is capable of winning the national championship this year they got as high as number three they had some injuries uh cm woldiab was out um you had uh micah braswell out now they're all healthy and they just beat the number one team in the nation in ohio state keep it going because if they can just do what they did yesterday, that team can win the national championship. So kudos to, uh, we didn't even mention Texas softball winning the series against Houston, but um, good weekend. Good weekend. Yeah. Say, let's get to the right call, my man. Let's get it. Let's get it. Before the right call, though, y'all know we have to talk about Covert B Cave, the Covert Automotive dealerships. They've been doing it so long. I've been doing it at an excellent rate over a hundred years. Some of y'all listening to us, some of y'all listening to the chip might be around a hundred years old. Y'all might have been driving around a covert vehicle. Well, that makes sense because they just do it at a high quality rate. They are committed to giving you a just great selection of new and pre-owned vehicles and you're going to look at covertbcave.com check it out get on your computer you're always on your phone anyway so pull up covertbcave.com go to safari google chrome whatever the hell you have on that smartphone and check out the inventory seven terrific brands to choose from dodge chrysler gmc buick jeep and ram nobody beats a covert deal not now not ever all right, Chip, the right call today. You know we got to go petty. I saw a lot of ignorance yesterday. Where did I see it, you asked? In the women's college basketball SEC championship game between the South Carolina Lady Gamecocks and the LSU Lady Tigers. And they got into a very, very ignorant scuffle. And there's so many ways to look at this whole thing. Let me break it down for you. People that don't know, it's been all over the four-letter network. It's been all over social media. Everybody has their thoughts and opinions on it. But this is what happened. LSU guard, Flajay Johnson, one of the biggest NIL girls in the nation. She raps. She's from the state. Like, she's cool. She, she's a cool girl. She was a big part of their national championship dub last year. Like, Flajay, she could hoop. She... They turn it over. She loses the ball to a South Carolina guard. She holds her. They call the foul, just a common foul. South Carolina girls, they're hype. It's around 73-66 at this time, two minutes to go. South Carolina girls, they see the writing on the wall. They're going to stay undefeated. They're going to win the SEC championship. They're hype. Like these girls, Don Staley's girls, they tough as hell. They're going to get in your face a little bit. Is it friendly? Yes. I think we look at it just because they're women that, oh, this is classes. No, hell no. Let them girls hoop. Let them girls show emotion. If they get a little buck like men do, so freaking what? That's good for the game. That's healthy. That's sports. Uh, everybody that thinks that's just classless and stuff or blaming South Carolina girls for, you know, just setting it off. Y'all are wrong. Like, it just happens. It's competitive sports. Women get competitive, too. So, anyway, Flage, she's walking to her bench. A South Carolina girl's walking past her. There's a little bit of contact, but Flage, she makes it. She initiates it. She kind of gives a little elbow to the South Carolina girl, and this is when it got crazy. A little bit of elbow, swipe through. Flage's going to the bench. Our girl, Chip, that we talk about, on Chip and Zay. Camila Cardoso? Camila Cardoso comes out of nowhere and just completely shoves Flaje on the ground. Just shoves the hell out of her. 
she's gone. A few other girls are gone. Like it, it got crazy. There weren't too many girls left in this game. And I think if you get ejected in college basketball, the next game you play, you're suspended. So a lot of girls for um, Louisiana State and a lot of girls for South Carolina won't be able to play in the first round matchup of the Women's March Madness Tournament, which that doesn't mean anything like South Carolina. They're still going to beat whoever they play by 50. I'm sure LSU is going to take care of business as well. So it's not as bad as what people are thinking. But afterwards, Don Staley, she was very apologetic. She's let people know like every interview that she had afterwards, whether it was the press conference or, you know, on the podium where they're hoisting up the SEC championships. She said she apologized. She said what happened today doesn't reflect on her girls or the culture or the attitude that they try to abide by daily. And she said all the right things. Okay, cool. Again, sometimes it gets a little hostile. Camila Cardoso, she from Brazil, Chip. You know, you know she got some cartel family. You know she's a hard girl, man. She she tough. She she got some family. She's seen some shit. You're scaring you know me. Saying? I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to keep it real. She's seen some shit. So I'm not surprised she was going to have her homegirls back, her teammates back. And hey, it is what it is. Like Flaje Johnson, you wanted to throw that elbow and get all buck. Okay, you got what was coming for you. So Don Staley says what she says, very classy, great way to go about it. Former Baylor Bear women's basketball coach, now LSU's women's basketball coach, Kim Mulkey, says this. It's ugly. It's not good. No one wants to be a part of that. But I'll tell you this. I wish, talking about Cardoso, would have pushed Angel Reese. If you're 6'8", don't push somebody that little. That was uncalled for, in my opinion. Let those two girls who were John, let them go at it. Kim Mulkey, what the hell are you talking about? Kim Mulkey's got a hockey mindset. What? Yeah, what the hell? That's not what it is. No, it's protecting my teammate. Cardoso doesn't care how big Flaje Johnson is. It's not. It wouldn't make any damn sense if Flaje Johnson, who was the one that was involved, goes oh it's time to get buck okay let me go push angel reese who has nothing to do with it that's not what that doesn't make any sense i don't know like I, there's a little part of me which kim mulkey we know she country we know she cajun she's she's from a different part of louisiana we get it there's a little part of me that understands what she's talking about but in this scenario it makes no sense it's very irrelevant cardozo was right. just protecting her teammate which she's an enforcer cardozo's the enforcer on the team Nobody goes down low on South Carolina because Camila Cardozo is in the paint. She's going to be whatever the lottery pick is for the WNBA. She's going to be a top five pick. She's six foot seven. She's the imposer. That's her role. And to protect, you know what I'm saying? Like Don Staley, she said the right things. But if you're Don Staley, you love that in a way. You know, you want to tell Cardozo, hey, if we get into a situation where we're playing a team where we need you, you got to be smarter, but I appreciate you coming for your teammate because that shows us being together and that could benefit for the culture that you have when you make this run, playing for your sisters. But for Kim Mulkey to say that, it's just like the disconnect. What, what you know, like Kim Mulkey, I always had a certain feeling about her. She's always rubbed me the wrong way. Like just the whole, she didn't support Brittany Griner at all to where you can't even comment. You know, I get it. Brittany, Brittany Griner deserved a lot of what she got. I don't think she deserved all of it, but she deserved a lot of what she got. That was a dumbass move, what she did overseas, having the oil pen. But to, for Kim Mulkey to never, ever say anything about her, like, come on, come on, Kim. Like you went 40 and O or something like that coaching Brittany Griner to your one of your first national championships. Like let's you, 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 you could be better than that. You could say that she messed up, but you could also be there for her as a person and as a human, you know, yeah, she, she doesn't seem body. like she builds tight bonds with her players. They all kind of roll their eyes about queen Mulkey. Yeah. Uh, they, I mean, they understand that, Hey, we go there. Which is the way Bob time. Knight was. He yeah. didn't have close ties to his players. They, you know, she feels like you're lucky to have me as the coach. I'm going to take you to the promised land and you'll thank me later someday when you're 
looking at your rings and thinking, how how did I get there? That's how Mulkey is. She's old school, man. She's super old school. Yo, if you go look, she has highlights on YouTube during her Louisiana Tech days. She was cold. Uh, she was cold. That's what they are yeah, like. She had the little she, she was Princess cold. Leia. Little yeah, Princess, yeah, Leia that Princess Leia but no makeup at all. She was hard. She, she looked rough. Like sour. I remember watching her. That's how old I am. <laughs> yeah, when they had the like jerseys that had yeah. the sleeves and shit. Yeah. Yep. Uh, La Tech. La Tech. Yeah, Len nice Barmore was her coach. Yeah, she was nice with it, but yeah, that I, was wild. That was wild. That was wild. The South Carolina LSU women's game. That was wild. Six players getting ejected, man. You don't see that in a in a women's game very often. And especially against like those two marquee programs. I mean, what LSU won the national championship last year, right? Yeah, they won it all last year. Absolutely. And now and now you got South Carolina looks like yeah. the favorite to win it. Which they Don Staley, the girls that she gets, again, not afraid to go overseas and you know, bring girls over, better their life. You know what I'm saying? Like I saw a very touching video on our girl Cardozo and Don Staley brought her parents back that she hasn't seen in years because she's been in the States, brought her sister and her mom over from Brazil to the States just so they could reconnect. You know what I'm saying? Like Don Staley, who I love, like go get, talk about who could hoop. Go back to her days at Virginia where she had that, you know, perm to the side a little bit. Like that perm, it didn't move. And she was smooth. She was giving girls buckets and spin moves and different finishes. And she was on that legendary 96 women's dream team that was in Atlanta that, you know, was very big. You watched that 30 for 30 on the – just introducing people to the WNBA and getting that started. Like Don Staley, she definitely left her mark on women's college basketball. But yeah, Kim Mulkey, I, I can't believe she said that. Like, if, I wish you would have pushed Angel Reese. You know, push somebody that little. What? Flaje Johnson, what? Flaje Johnson knew what she was doing. Flaje Johnson could hold her own. Like, don't, don't mess with the bull. You ain't gonna get the horns. What's that saying? Like, come on now. Shit. And then to top it off, the cherry on top of the Sunday, you got Flage's gangsta ghetto ass brother jumping onto the court. This fool was in the stands and jumped onto the court and got arrested. And now is up for assault. Ghetto ass fool. What you doing? Which for one, it's women, bruh. It's women. You see your yeah. sister get pushed on the ground. What are you gonna do? Maybe what was maybe your sit out. Process? Maybe sit out on that one. Sit out on that one, fam. You look like an idiot. You look like a nutso jumping onto the court, pulling your pants up on some thug activity. That was so bogus, man. <laughs> that, was, that was rough. He deserves everything he gets because, again, like, it'd be different if it was, you know, it still would be uncalled for if it was, like, his brother that was on the court that got pushed on the ground. It would still right. be flat-out ignorant. But – to jump in a woman's battle as a man? Again, what are you going to do? What was the thought process there? That was a bad – they arrested him so quick. They got him out of there so fast, man. And that's just – wow. That was some ignorance right there. It was it was entertaining. I mean, like, I, I, people are locked in the women's college basketball right now. They got some big household names that people are watching. That's yeah. why it's hard for – even Madison Booker to get the credit that she deserves. Like she's been having a terrific year, but Juju Watkins is out here dropping 30 on Stanford at UCLA. And obviously Caitlin Clark is doing her thing and Paige Becker's up at UConn. I mean, the women's game is in a really good place and it's going to be exciting to see who wins it all this year. Like South Carolina. I love when Angel Reese said in the podium, like she said the right thing. Angel Reese is cool saying what she said about not being a afraid of South Carolina. Like we ain't afraid of South Carolina. If we meet them again, we ain't going to be afraid. What you saw today, we ain't backing down, which Angel Reese, she was kind of hurt during that whole, you know, shabacle and she went to the end of the bench. She didn't want to be a part of any of that, but still like she said, yeah, we ain't scared. We want a national championship, right? What we got to be scared of, you know, today just wasn't our day. And she was pulling 
Camila Cardozo's hair during the game and talking shit to her too. Like that's what I'm talking about. F that classy woman stuff. Like they're competitors. Let them compete. Let them hoop. You know what I'm saying? They might have nails. They might have, you know, the lip gloss popping and the eyelashes that go out to here and stuff like that. Cool. That's, you know, look good while doing it. But this whole narrative that, oh, they're ladies, so they have to be classy and curtsy when, you know, they do things and stuff. Nah, man, them days are over with. Let's hoop. Look, up, I got to get Barker in on this, A, because I got to bounce, but B, because my man Zay is going. He's He's got one going. I love it. Wait, fill, fill me in real quick. I, I came in, oh, I came in mid, mid Zay gold rant. South Carolina, LSU, that little squabble yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. See you, appreciate you, man. Great show today. See you, Chip. But yeah, Barker, just that, you know, there's this narrative that women can't be, you know, ferocious and competitive like that. Like when people see that, it makes them uncomfortable. And I love it. Like, I love what we saw yesterday. I don't like seeing people get suspended and stuff, but I love Camilla Cardozo pushing Flage Johnson, going to bat for her teammate. Like, that's what it's all about. You want that as a coach and as a teammate. You want to know, hey, when we go to war, do you have my back at all times? You know what yeah, I'm saying? I agree, I agree with you on this is something we wouldn't make a huge deal about if it were if we're in the men's game. Right. I really, I really don't think we would. And yeah, you, you, you want to see that. You want to see that fight. You want to see, see that it matters. I mean, you don't, well, I should clarify. You don't literally want to see that fight, but when it does happen um, and it doesn't happen often, like, I feel like we're not seeing that. We're not seeing that all the time. And of course, anytime Mulkey or her teams are involved in anything, it's probably going to blow up and be a way bigger deal. And you're going to have people on both extremes, one or the other. And then it's going to lie somewhere in the middle, typically where the, yeah. Where the truth of the matter usually does. <laughs> Yo, obviously we're excited about Texas football going to the SEC. I'm excited about Texas women's basketball going to the SEC with Mulkey and Don Staley. Like those are going to be some battles. And Vic Schaefer coming from Mississippi State. What up, BK? He's obviously familiar with that conference and just being able to recruit in that area. Oh, man, I think that's going to be huge for the Lady Horns in the future. Yeah, and we got to see a little bit of Vic Schaefer versus Kim Mulkey at Texas and Baylor, but that was before Vic really had it humming. That was before Vic Vic got things to to where they are now, to what we, you know, they haven't shown it yet on the court because of injuries the last couple of years and, and all, all those sorts of things. But you hope that, you know, when they go to the SEC next year and we get that matchup, which is a great women's basketball matchup, that it's, it's full on, like, Mulkey's got it humming right now. Uh, Texas should be really good next year. I mean, Vic going in there with a Rory Harmon, healthy Rory Harmon, hopefully, knock on wood, and a, a Madison Booker backcourt duo. Woo, and then whatever, you know, Mulkey's going to put together a good team. And oh, yeah. and she's she wants to beat Texas. We <laughs> we know a lot of things about Kim Mulkey. We know she hates Texas and wants to beat the crap out of, out of the Longhorns. Yeah, I don't know what y'all are talking about. I'm not looking forward to the move to the SEC at all because it's going to be hard. Big 12 women's basketball is easy. SEC women's basketball, that's a different beast right there. I mean, Dawn Staley's doing a Gino Ariema impression with the way that she's building the fake USC right now. And, yeah, I was so excited that Mulkey left Baylor. I'm like, finally, we don't have to deal with that winch anymore. <laughs> clean for me. And here we go. We're following her into the lion's den. So, now I feel good. I mean, Vic's doing a great job. Texas will be able to compete, but yeah, it's it's a major step up in class, as y'all know, jumping to the SEC in women's hoops. Yeah. The only bad part about yesterday's squabble with South Carolina and LSU, I didn't see no weave on the ground. That's it. <laughs> I, I wouldn't see some weave pulling, you know what I'm saying? I like me a good cat fight. What can I say? Like, I like me a good cat fight, a couple weaves on the ground, you know. Well, Zay, L nails. LSU tried. LSU tried in what in what I think was one of the things that went into starting the fight. I don't know if you saw that, that, Angel that other clip that went viral. That was Angel Reese? Yeah, that was Angel Reese. Okay, yeah, I couldn't tell exactly who it was, but, you know, I'm never going to – I'm never going to say – for sure, something was intentional or unintentional, uh, but that that looked like it was intentional. Yeah, it was personal. It was mm. personal. Yeah, 
Right. Kim Mulkey, get out there and fight. Quit telling everybody else to fight. If you uh, if you want to see a brawl, you start some. Go over to Don Staley and start throwing blows, coach. You, Yo, seriously, I, I had a good, good rant, Zay, on uh, the right call today. I mean, Buck and I were talking about this. I heard Shannon Sharp talking about this. Like, uh, women's college basketball making it the first take. Something must be going on. And and not hey, Caitlin Clark related. Bingo. And Shannon Sharp is like, hey, we might have to hold Kim Mulkey accountable for some of the shit she's talking about. And I agree. Like, you, you can't be promoting fighting like that. Like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> like, Dawn Staley's like, this is bad. You know, this is not who we are. We're sorry this happened. And Kim Mulkey's like, Nah, we we just wish she would have fought our better fighter. Then we would have had. Some, it's like <laughs> what? This is like this is this is college. But like, don't promote this. This is not good here, Kim. Idiot. Yeah, yeah she can't help herself, man. Oh. She's from the Bayou. She cannot help herself. But yeah. All right, fellas, appreciate y'all. Y'all have a good show. Y'all be cool. Appreciate it, Zay. Uh, I don't know if Trey informed you, Jeff. But he texted me within the last hour. He's he's going to be running a few behind today. Okay. So he's downtown doing South by stuff, and he's at some red carpet ceremony. It was supposed to start at 2 and end at 2.45, but he texted me at 2.15, and he's like, this thing hadn't started yet. So whenever it's done, he will uh, he will join you for most, if not all, of today's show. But he is doing some sort of South by Southwest activity right now. and. Hey, this is, this is like Super Bowl week for Trey. Yeah, uh, it's bigger. Bigger than the Super Bowl. I mean, yeah, he, he looks forward to this, and he's already interviewed some cool people. He got the chance to talk to Jay Hartzell uh, last Friday, and yeah, he's interviewing a bunch of movie stars and musicians and athletes and a lot of influential folks in pop culture. So it's good content, but yeah, obviously uh, when you're doing that, you're relying on other people's time. And you know how that Yeah, you are on other people's you know. schedules for sure. Yeah, bingo. So, man, a lot to get into. I mean, we got Texas basketball, we got Texas baseball. NFL free agency has been crazy. I mean, it's it, you refresh Twitter every 30 seconds and it feels like some other player is going to some other team. So, I'll give you the floor, man. People have heard enough from me today. What's uh what's on your mind on a Monday? Man, that's that's exactly what I what I texted Trey in the last hour. I was like, no shortage of talking points in NFL free agency right now. I guess we could uh, we could run through some of the the big signings, but I think the most recent, most notable one, which is I was going to say it's Kirk Cousins signing with the Atlanta Falcons, but that's kind of crazy to say given that's the most recent one, and you know it was basically overnight that Russell Wilson signed with the Steelers. So uh, I'll start with Kirk Cousins though. I'm I'm still kind of processing this one. I'm not exactly sure how I feel about Kirk getting that kind of money again. But you know what? Nobody's bet on themselves more in their career than than Kirk Cousins, and uh, it's hard to say. It, you know, it's it's resulted in a uh, or could have resulted in any bigger bag for for my man Kirk Cousins. But it'll be interesting to see him in that offense. I mean, a proven quarterback who you know who you know can get it done at at least a above league average level. I would say. I mean, I'm not going to put him in, you know, a uh, he's never been to a conference championship game. So I'm not going to put him in the, you know, even even Josh Allen category or anything like that. So um, but, you know, in, in the NFC, which you feel like is slightly more open for at least, you know, any given year, weaving your way into the the conference championship game and especially in that division in the yeah. NFC South, where our our Austin guy, not our Texas guy, but our Austin guy. Baker Mayfield signed his his three year one hundred up to one hundred fifteen million dollar extension if he hits all the incentives. Um, so yeah, that that's the one that stands out to me that that just dropped is Kirk Cousins going to the Falcons. Yeah, Any thoughts on that from you? <laughs> yeah, he was the biggest free agent quarterback in this year's class, and yeah, there have been a lot of rumors swirling that Atlanta was going to make a strong push to get him, and they've needed a quarterback ever since Matt Ryan left. Even the last couple of years of Matt Ryan's tenure in Atlanta, they probably needed to go in a different direction. But they have been playing musical chairs at that spot for a while. And it makes sense. I mean, look, Kirk Cousins, I don't know if there's ever been a TV show help somebody out more than the Netflix show quarterback has helped Kirk Cousins. Because pe people shat on this guy for years. And I think he became so likable in that show that everyone's like, oh, no, he's worth the money. Like, Kirk Cousins has won one playoff game in his career, okay? Dak Prescott gets 
more crap than any other quarterback in the league. He's won two. I mean, he's two and five. He deserves the, the crap that he gets for his playoff struggles. I'm not sitting here telling you Dak's some great playoff performer by any stretch, but he's he's got twice as many playoff wins as Kirk Cousins does. And the narrative is like, oh, this is some sort of great signing by the Falcons today. So it's a major upgrade. And you're right. The NFC is open and Atlanta's got a shot and they needed to do something because they've got Bijan. They've got London. They've got Pitts, They've got weapons. They just needed to figure out the quarterback spot. But man, I mean, Kirk Cousins being in that TV show really helped him and also getting hurt. So people didn't get to see how like eh, he is in big games. I think also helped him this past year because that's the reaction to the deal has been uh, overly optimistic for my money. I know the Cowboys fans hate the Dak comp, BK. It's pretty apt, man. Yeah. I mean, even all the way down to fourth round picks. Like, the, if you go look at their stats year by year, even their career stats at this point, they're like border. I don't have it in front of me at the moment. They're borderline identical. Their their career stats. Now, I'll give you that Dak. I also think Dak maybe played on some better teams throughout the entirety of his career with more consistency one coaching change in his career where, you know, cousins has been a little bit more up and down with not playing the, not playing much his rookie year, you know, coming to the same draft, same team as RG three. And then eventually supplanting RG three and then dealing with the coaching changes there, then going to Minnesota on the, on the big deal. Granted, he has the last couple of years had, in my opinion, the best receiver in the league in Justin Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, for for the Falcons, it, this just makes sense because I know everybody talked about them potentially going out and getting Justin Fields, but you were going to probably have to give up a decent amount for Fields, and then you're giving up, you know, you're 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 giving that up, and you're not even getting a proven commodity in return. Sure, the ceiling over the course of time is probably higher with Fields, but I think the floor in the immediate future of one to two years, the first one to two years he's there would have been much, much lower. You know what you're getting with Cousins, and you mentioned the weapons. You mentioned our, you know, Bijan and, you know, Kyle Pitts, Drake London, a lot of the guys that they still have are younger playmakers on rookie deals. I'm not going to call Bijan at the eighth pick last year a cheap deal, but it's still, it's still a rookie deal. You know, it's not a running back. He's not getting Christian McCaffrey money. So that, that to me makes the most sense to allow them to compete. And I think they've got to be the division favorite, you know, yeah. to start things off with probably Baker and his bucks after the Mike Evans resigning as well, being a close second, but the, the Netflix series, man, that, uh, <laughs> that just, if he wasn't already pretty likable to begin with, which I thought he was, I mean, Mr. Cole's cash is about as relatable <laughs> and down to earth as it gets. Yep, he's he's literally one of us who's just really good at football. Like he lives the traditional lifestyle, and he's he's more one of you than one of me because you've got a kid. Like he's a family man, <laughs> married with children. He literally goes about his business like we do, but he just happens to have a cannon for an arm. And look, I I dunk on Kirk Cousins. He's a massive upgrade. Like I like this move for yes. Atlanta, but it's the same question that you have in Dallas with Dak. It's like Dak's about to get a new contract, right? I think he is going to get a long-term deal done this offseason, just like Kirk Cousins did. Uh, and the narrative with Dak is, can he win in the playoffs? Like, everybody knows Kirk Cousins is really good. Dak should have been the MVP of the league last year. You don't believe me? Compare his numbers to Lamar Jackson and tell me Dak shouldn't have finished ahead of him in that award. Like, he was great during the regular season. And Cousins has been great during a lot of the regular seasons. But when you're paid that type of money, you're expected to win in the playoffs. Kirk Cousins has been a quarterback for 12 years, Jeff, longer than Dak. And he's got, once again, half as many playoff wins as Dak. So he's got to find a way to change the narrative. Otherwise, people are going to look back and say, there's another team that paid Kirk Cousins too much money. Well, the difference is the destination right now between those two guys. Dak is on a team with a roster that we believe is a roster that could compete for a Super Bowl. That's at least what you know, the odds makers think what a lot of the talking heads think. I think what a lot of us think. I, I looked at Dallas's roster last year and I didn't say I'm going to pick them to win the Super Bowl because thinking that they look good on paper and have the chance on paper is much different than believing in them to actually go prove that right on the field. But again, the difference is cousins is going to a team that the hump they're trying to get over 
is to just win the division and get back to the playoffs sure. where where winning a game would even be probably you know beyond expectations in this first year. I mean, I think the expectations now for them would be win the division, hopefully win a game in the playoff, if not just get there and give yourself a chance. Whereas with Dak, whether it's fair or not, that's a whole other side argument that we could have there. The expectation is to get back to the NFC Championship game for the first time in more than two decades, and then frankly win the Super Bowl because yeah. that's just that's just part of being a Dallas Cowboy. That's a great point. So, yeah, and look, this, go ahead. No, I'm gonna say there's other there's other pros that that come with that. Whether it's and Dak does a better job of not complaining about it because again, I have so much respect for Dak and just the way he handles himself as a professional and the way that he deals with well one everything he's dealt with in his life but two the outside influences of being a Dallas Cowboy and being the quarterback because I think Dak gets the other things that you get from that the mm-hmm. all the commercials all the extra money I know guys are getting endorsements you get more of that when you're a Dallas Cowboy it's why it drives me nuts when I have to hear Micah Parsons complain about this that and the other thing about all the attention that he's getting the airport thing was the one thing i was with him on i'm like all right everybody settle down that's that's a little bit weird but when he complains about all the analysts and the talking heads i'm like then don't have a podcast dude or frankly if you were on the minnesota vikings as micah parsons you probably wouldn't have a podcast many people would want to listen to but because you're micah parsons with a great personality and great game and you're on the cowboys and you have that brand behind you people want to listen to your podcast that's also going to come with more criticism because you're wearing the star on the helmet and and you're playing for the most iconic brand in the National Football League. Bingo. That's well said, my friend. All right, I see Trey. I don't know if he wants us to bring him on right now. It looks like he's driving. Yeah, you guys are uh, – can you hear me first of all? Yes. Does it sound better than it did earlier? No. Oh, does it sound worse? Yes. God Dude, you, you look like a slick Uber driver. I know, I really <laughs> the, do. The earpiece and those aviators. <laughs> and, I just, <laughs> and I just temporarily, you know what, this is just going to have to do. I may take the earpiece out. Uh, so I just temporarily paid 100 bucks for what was supposed to be a really good earpiece with a uh, microphone. And the microphone is supposed to be the, the most positive quality of this thing. But it is not doing its job right now if it sounds worse than it did earlier with just the freaking iPhone speaker. Yeah, you sound like you're in a cave or a tunnel or All something. Right. Let's, let's change this real quick. Hold on kind, one Kind second. of giving him a little bit of, a little bit of a list. Yeah. There we go. How about that now? Much better. Okay. Well, this is what's going to have to do for today. What's up, guys? Where, where are you? I'm in my car right now. I uh, had to run from... Red carpet. There we go. Oh. Red carpet to uh, to Office Depot to try and find a more sufficient uh, phone mic than just speaking into my phone. But this is this is what it's going to be. Are you pulled over somewhere now, or are you at a stoplight? <laughs> I'm I'm completely stopped now. You just okay. uh, I just started the show while parallel parking, which has taken my gold medal winning Olympic level parallel parking skills to a completely different level, co-hosting a YouTube show while parallel parking perfectly. It's impressive. You got to get the Guinness book of world records people on the case there. I don't know if anyone's ever done that before. It's well done. Thank you. Okay. Are you good to go? Yeah, let's go. Let's okay. go. You're going to get some, uh, let's see. What is this? Uh, I hope he doesn't Ninth get a parking Street, ticket. Ninth street pack, uh, Ninth Street uh, traffic passing by. I heard you get a did get a parking ticket. As a matter of fact, for a long time you could park downtown, even if you were in a pay spot. And their system, which they had transferred it over to partial pay at the box, partial app, like they didn't know how to track these things. But apparently that's changed because I did get a parking ticket a little bit earlier today too. So mm. on top of a computer that may be completely broken, I will be paying a parking ticket in the not too distant future. But this he- this piece of shit headphone her headset is definitely getting taken back after this show yeah i kind of wish you would wear it because you look ridiculous but it does <laughs> sound a lot better without it so i'll wear i'll wear it i'll wear it <laughs> oh man with the shades was just like full-on like south by uber driver came in came in just to make money during south by let's go 
Yeah. <laughs> Important. Where is it that they can take you today? That's an Armenian <laughs> accent for anybody who thinks that I'm culturally appropriating. That is uh, one of my Armenian relatives who makes a living driving from both Uber, Lyft, and they have a cab back in Bakersfield, California. What's What's his name? Last name is Targaryen. First name is Harpo. Harpo Targaryen. <laughs> All right. The Armenian way. You say last name first and then think for 10 seconds before you say the first name. That's right. We uh, we adopted it from our uh, our distant relatives in China so many years ago. Goodness. All right. Well, I'll let you all <laughs> get to it. Y'all have a great show. Good luck with this, Jeff. Hey, I got it. What's up? Trey, this is a this is a treat, man. Are you are you by like the Stephen F. Austin Hotel? Um, no. Do you know what the uh the Joe Hogsett Theater is? I probably S- driven S- by it. SFA Hotel is somewhat close, but I'm not on that same stretch of road. That right there. It's a theater. Oh, nice. There is a uh a nice looking building with columns over there. And uh, yeah, I'm right down the road from the Paramount, which is where I pretty much live this week and doing shows in between. So you didn't get to see this earlier, I'm guessing, because hopefully you are doing something with this beautiful day. Kids on uh, spring break right now, by the way. Yep. Yeah, that's why I got this. uh, It's it's getting a little bit better. That's why I got this pretty gnarly sunburn here. We did Rodeo Austin yesterday. Oh, nice. Went to the carnival. Okay, how was the carnival? Were there a lot of carnies? Oh, it was, it was fantastic. All those rides that uh, I was slightly concerned for my life, looking at uh, how long they've probably been in, <laughs> been in business there. Yeah, With some you are, of those, yeah, you are oh, a little so raccoon-eyed now. Yeah, the, the carnies and the, the technology is very scary as an adult, isn't it? Yeah, and we did the one, the one where I was like, the only one where I was actually concerned was we did the flying one where you're face forward and then you hold on like that. And it basically like lifts you up and spins you around. And I was just like, this is uh, you know, I had the five-year-old next to me and he was just tall enough to go on. I think it, he's like 44 inches and it might've been 42. And they were like, and also the guys running the rides are just like, uh, sure. All right. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> But no, it was it was a blast, man. He got got his first cowboy hat. Uh, my my mom's in from California. I got to show her a pig race. That was fun. Pig they, race. They, nice. they put the different. They did ones where you know they did three races and they have names for them in the first two. Four pigs in each race, and you know it was like Patrick Mahams versus Brad Pig. Fun stuff like that. Well, the last one they put schools like universities. And they had a little, almost like a like a little blanket looking thing that they put over them. Mm-hmm. So they had OU in lane one, Texas in lane two, A and M in lane three, Tech in lane four. Well, the Longhorn Pig got absolutely smoked. Mm. No, no pun intended. And the the Tech Pig is the one that pulled it out, unfortunately. But hey, thankfully, the Longhorns were the there was a Tech Texas Tech actual baseball series this weekend and luckily that was that was not the case so yeah but that's what yeah, i was, was doing while, while that, while that series was going yesterday on. but they uh they come back and win that game credit to them for uh showing some serious gumption there yeah yeah and i think with this team that's what you're gonna have to accept if you're a texas fan right now at least while this bullpen starts to figure it out and even they start to figure out the starting pitching after lebaron johnson who even gave up a few runs of his own in in friday's start you're going to have to accept that there's going to be some games like this. They're going to win some games 22 to 8. They might lose some games the way they lost the Vanderbilt game. Whenever you're watching, however many runs they put up, with the exception of maybe the 22 to 8 lead that they had the other night, uh, felt like that was pretty safe once it got to 12, 14, 16 at one point, I think. That felt pretty safe, but for the most part, man, any lead they have is not going to be safe. So, if you're a Texas baseball fan, just enjoy this team for what they are right now, which is going to be an absolute roller coaster. But at least it looks like they're going to mash the baseball more often than not and put up quite a few runs. It's entertaining, if nothing else. 
So did you like carnival rides as a kid? Because I used to love them as a kid, but riding, whether it's like a Six Flags or even going to the state fair, which is probably even worse when you're talking about the carny element. Like, I don't have the stomach for it anymore. My kids love it right now. I'm just like, no, thank you. Like, I'm nervous letting you guys ride those rides. But I did that when I was your age. So you have at it. But I just, it's not for me at this point. And I'm somebody who would willingly go skydiving if I had the opportunity. That's just a, that's just a technology that feels really, really unstable when you're in the moment. I'm pretty good with most of the rides. Okay. I did three or four good off the top but then like the second i have any piece of food or have a couple sips of a beer or anything like that i'm done like all my rides if i'm gonna go along it's got to be right away because i went on a few after like went and got a hot dog went and you know had a beer and then after that i was just like all right i i got i gotta tap out of these spinny rides after a while (laughs) but he's still at the age where he's not he doesn't want to get on the, or he can't get on the giant roller coasters, but he can get on the ones that the mini roller coasters and the ones that, that spin around. So those at least aren't too bad, but yeah, that's going to be, that's going to be a gut check moment for me, literally and figuratively when I, when I have to get on one of those like, like jackknife ones that spins around one day. And when he inevitably asked me to do that. Mm. So I heard you and BK talking about Kirk Cousins ending up with the Falcons. Is that official now? Uh, looks like it. Yeah, I'm seeing it. Well, I'm seeing that being reported by pretty much every outlet out there. I think the four years, four years, 180 million, I believe. What? Yep. Oh my gosh. Well, good luck to Atlanta. They got a great roster around him, and he's put up big numbers these last few years while also doing a better job of beating competition that was above 500. Because for the longest time, even though Uh, He was a dude that turned heads and uh, made all sorts of headlines with Washington and early on with Minnesota. He did not beat teams that had winning records. That has started to change in part because he had uh, such an electric offense around him. So he gets to step into a very similar situation with Atlanta now. Yeah. And like BK and I talked about, they had two, they had two options. In my opinion, they had the super high risk, high reward option of going and giving up whatever the compensation package would have been for Justin Fields, or they could have done this, which was the safe option. And I think they felt with the talent they have and a new coach uh, that they, they wanted the safe option. They wanted the option that, you know, is, is going to give you pretty consistently at least B to B plus football. I, I, in my opinion, that's, that's about what Kirk Cousins is going to, is going to give you year in and year out. Now, in a big game in prime time, if they ever got to the divisional round and spot in the conference championship on the line, I might feel a little bit different. You know, I might feel different about the guaranteed <laughs> success, you know, that Kirk Cousins is, is going to give you on the field more, more likely than not. But I feel pretty good about knowing what he's going to give you during the regular season. And in that division with young skill guys, mostly still on rookie deals around him that have, you know, definitely Bijan proven themselves I think it's it's an option that made the most sense for them because the Justin Fields option that was just going to be you know having to probably pay a guy a decent amount of money too because his deal was up or having to pick up that fifth year option restructure whatever they were going to have to do and I think the potential floor of what that could have turned into wasn't worth what they were maybe getting in a ceiling from him because I still don't think even though I, I do think Justin Fields can be a solid quarterback in the NFL. I don't think that's guaranteed to happen next year. So they took the safe option. It's so situation dependent, but I think that taking both quarterbacks and putting each into that situation, the ceiling for Justin Fields is higher. For sure. For Cousins. But you're right, though. The potential for it to go sideways is uh, a little bit more in play just because you know Kirk Cousins is a known commodity, whereas Justin Fields – He's got his critics. BK and I talk about this all the time. He does not think Justin Fields is going to amount to much in this league. I had to watch him closely this last year because I had him as my fantasy quarterback. But I've actually watched him for a few years now, and he finally got a decent weapon in DJ Moore last year. And it made an enormous difference, especially once his uh, offensive play caller stopped being such a moron with how he was calling that offense and utilizing Justin Fields' legs 
not a ton, but at least a little bit more because that is a tool in the box that you have to help pick up yardage offensively. So I think that if Justin Fields would have gone gone there, it would have been a great fit for Atlanta too. But as someone who is a Bijan fan and by default a Falcons fan, I am fascinated to see what this team is capable of now that they're going to have more consistent play at quarterback than what Desmond Ritter gave them last year because Desmond Ritter – he had a few moments. Oh, my God, was he terrible when he was bad. Like, it wasn't even like, ooh, that's not very good. It's like, what the fuck are you doing right now, dude? How, how are you such a good college quarterback with how bad you look as a professional? He he is basically me as a Madden franchise quarterback. <laughs> how I play in Madden, except his problem is when he throws three picks or four picks, he can't smash the controller and turn the game off. <laughs> Now makes well, a lot more money than I do to suck, yeah. but more, more controllers can be purchased. True, true, but yeah, Desmond Ritter, man, that was. I thought that was pretty clear before last year that that wasn't that wasn't the move. It's definitely clear now, and I think Atlanta did the right thing. I mean, you can argue, you could argue if they specifically they got the right guy, but they made generally speaking the right move to yeah. move on and 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 get a you know, a, a better quarterback. And I think maybe the scar tissue of that, even though Arthur Smith's no longer in the building, the scar tissue of that just across the organization probably forced them to go out and say, look, we need to go get, you know, to use your words, you know, the known commodity, which is totally the, the accurate way to describe Kirk cousins. Uh, the other quarterback in BK and I were going to get to, but we didn't, which is crazy that it feels like old news now, given that it, basically happened in the middle of the night is Russell Wilson to yeah. the Pittsburgh Steelers 1.2 million a year. And there's so many different ways to look at this because the way that I look at it is it's a great move for the Steelers because it's basically a win-win situation, no matter what, even if he comes in and it's a total mess, he's awful. You know, you're keeping Kenny Pickett around. So you can make those two guys battle it. And if Russ hasn't been humbled already and had a fire lit under his ass already with what's happened the last couple of years, then this, if this doesn't do it, then, then nothing will. And then you'll learn that and you'll be paying him 1.2 million. And even if he ends up getting beat out by Kenny Pickett, I'm talking about lighting the fire under Russ. Maybe this lights the fire under Kenny Pickett that he needs to say, Hey, I'm going to show you that I can, take my game to the next level because if you go through a lot of the backup quarterbacks around the league that have some semblance of a status, I think they're all, I'm pretty sure they're all getting paid more than 1.2 million, whether it's Sam Darnold with the 49ers. I think he was in the fours. Andy mm -hmm. Dalton, I know was making about four or 5 million last year. So a quarterback of Russ's stature, which is, you know, closer to Andy Dalton than it is to Sam Darnold, but he has a Super Bowl. And you're probably not getting 2019 Russell Wilson, but even if you're getting, even frankly, even if you're getting last year, last year's Russell Wilson, which I think was 26 touchdowns and eight picks and not necessarily the most efficient ball ever, but he was learning a new offense again with a coach running the show that did not want him in Sean Payton. So now I think if they, they pour into Russ and, and well, funny how we're going from Atlanta now to Pittsburgh, if Arthur Smith can yeah. build, but I think, he did some really good work with Tannehill in, in Tennessee when, when, when he was there. So I yes, think yes, 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 he did. But he also had Derrick Henry and Tannehill was wildly effective off of play action. And look, that's just a good formula in general, but with talented running backs in Atlanta to maybe lean on a little bit more to help your young QB out, he completely lost his way. And part of that felt like him getting into a sort of grudge match with, the GM and ownership who obviously wanted to take Bijan Robinson, even though he wasn't that thrilled about him, his comment about Bijan being better off as a decoy, I think was a shot across the bow, not towards Bijan. Bijan was a, unfortunately a pawn in that whole game, but was a shot at those guys. Like I didn't want this dude. We had other needs and you chose to spend on a running back, even though I was per perfectly happy with Tyler Algiers, he needs to get back to riding Najee Harris and Jalen Warren a little bit more. And whether it is, uh, whether it is Kenny Pickett or Russell Wilson that is under center, letting him 
letting some of the pressure ease off of him with regards to uh, to faking that handoff before he's looking downfield for a Deontay Johnson, George Pickens, Friar Muth, or whoever else he may be throwing to. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, it'll be interesting to see what he, you know, maybe if he learned his lesson because it's not necessarily Bijan and Tyler Algier, but now he's got two pretty solid running backs to to pair with that quarterback if it ends up being Russell Wilson who starts or you know they go with uh, tiny hands to to really you know prove again that he can be a franchise quarterback so we'll we'll see what happens there but I think for the Steelers if you look at it and compare it to the Falcons situation where they're going to be paying over 40 million dollars a year for uh, for Kirk Cousins and you're paying a 1.2 million for Russell Wilson. So it's kind of one of those classic moves where, you know, you're, you're making somebody else pay for it and you're just hoping that you can maybe fix a guy, but also that happens quite a bit in the NFL where everybody thinks they can fix a guy. I mean, whether Sean Payton actually thought he did, he said he did going into this because maybe he needed to say the right thing. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he thought he could fix Russell Wilson. and We'll see. I mean, this is really, really the last chance for him to maybe get one more contract, whether it's in Pittsburgh or somewhere else. Uh, but yeah, he, you know, hopefully he can be a, a bridge type bridge type guy for them. And look, after I was never a huge Russell Wilson fan, I never was a Russell Wilson hater, but after what happened in, in Denver, I definitely am rooting for the guy to have some success so that this doesn't become just some national media driven Sean Payton victory because he was a total asshole about it and punted on Russell Wilson. Cause I know that'll happen. The national media at every turn will find a way to, you know, gas up Sean Payton. I'd love to know what's the real driving force behind that. And we, I know we talked about this last week with his resume, so we don't necessarily need to go over that again, but yeah, just driving, that this, force, driving force behind Sean Payton being an asshole. Yeah. Like maybe I, I don't like, no, no, but why is the, uh, sorry, the national media, seemingly kind of doing this guy favors and propping him up more than maybe they would a Mike McCarthy who has a similar resume throughout his head coaching career. And he's just labeled this offensive genius. And I, I mean, I don't want to say I don't see it. The guy's obviously a great, I think he's a great offensive mind, I would say, but I don't know if it's to the point of genius to where, you know, he can just fix anything. I feel like he gets a lot of excuses made for him. It's probably the most succinct way I could say that. I think that is a dead on analysis there. He does get a little bit of a pass and yeah, you have a Super Bowl title, but you also had Drew Brees who stats wise is one of the all time best quarterbacks in NFL history too. And you only had that one Super Bowl appearance. It's not like you were making it to the Super Bowl over and over again and not getting over that final hump. You weren't even getting to that final game many years where people had you predicted to do so. Um, I feel like Sean Payton will end up wearing his welcome out in Denver sooner rather than later, because what are they going to do at quarterback right now? I mean, if your answer to that is like, we're going to take JJ McCarthy or we're going to take Michael Penix, man, you thought sticking with Russell Wilson for another year was a risk. I mean, they must, if that's going to be the case, then they're going to have to be invested in Sean Payton for the long haul. Because if you're gonna if you're gonna let a guy do that and make that be the next move at quarterback for your franchise, you're gonna need to give him like, well, look whether or not I like Sean Payton or not. If that's the move to go get a rookie quarterback when you don't even have a high pick, you're gonna essentially gonna be taking the fourth or fifth best quarterback available when you pick or trade up and give up a haul of picks. Which before Sean Payton got there, to be fair, they did to get Russell Wilson, so they're not really in a position to to do that again. So yeah, if they, if they go get a rookie quarterback, be it McCarthy or Penix in the draft, and they're essentially committing to Sean Payton barring absolute disaster for, for a little bit longer than, you know, a year or two. Pure passing talent. Michael Penix would potentially be a great fit for Sean Payton because he makes every throws. We unfortunately saw firsthand, and the Superdome on New Year's night as Longhorn fans, but there's a huge injury risk there. McCarthy is a fascinating one because I don't know if he regressed as a thrower this past season, but he didn't wow everybody like we thought would happen. Then again, he also did make plays when he had to. Now, look, they were blowing opponents out for much of the year, but when the games mattered most in that semifinal and championship game, McCarthy was making plays with both his arm and his legs. I still think he needs at least a couple of years to start fi fi uh, figuring the winning 
thing out. Uh, and certainly that's going to be the case with Denver, who just traded Jerry Judy away, if I saw that correctly, too. They did. They did. Yeah, I think with, with McCarthy, he's such an interesting prospect for exactly what you just mentioned, Trey. I mean, they they weren't exactly in that offense at Michigan, letting him, you know, stand five yards back in the shotgun formation and just sling it around the yard. And frankly, Quinn Ewers, I think, is in a similar situation. I think Quinn has shown a little bit more maybe with his deep ball at times this past year with Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell. But when we were doing, we started doing this during football season, that's one of the things I said about Quinn was it might not be his fault, but I want to see him go out and, and like win Texas a game and go over three or 400 yard passing game. But Tristan Nicholson, which, you know, I loved having him on during football season because he would always, from the player standpoint, kind of put me in my place of like, yeah, dude, but that's not his role in this team right now. He's not being asked to do that because they're running the ball really well and they are passing it well, but they're trying to be a balanced offense. And we know at Michigan, even though McCarthy was there, he took a backseat to Blake Corum and, you know, some of these other guys that were <laughs> putting up crazy yards rushing and, you know, behind a classic Harbaugh family football offensive line. So I think in some ways NFL teams like that because they like the, the, the team side of him. JJ obviously is, willing to put the team above himself. But then there's also going to be a little bit of reservation in the back of their minds saying, Hey, yeah, this, we never had to see this guy take over the game and, you know, throw for three or 400 yards because they couldn't run the ball on a team or because the game plan was just different based on the weaknesses in another, you know, any given opponent, maybe it was the secondary for one team. But I do think if you watched Michigan games closely, which I can only say I did three or four times, he made some really big throws on third down. Like I thought when they needed a play from him, he made it more often than not. Like he certainly was not holding that team back, but he was not asked to put the team on his back and elevate them. So it's a tough spot for NFL teams evaluating. Like, are you holding that against him? I don't know. So, uh, complete transparency here. I am consumed by South by Southwest right now. I am not looking at headlines all that often. Uh, is there any other big news from the NFL today with regards to player movement or maybe guys sticking around with their current team, like what we got a few days ago with Mike Evans re-signing with the Bucks for a couple of years? Well, let's go, uh, let's go a Cowboys-related one. That's probably what the people want to hear us talk about the most. Source Titans giving ex Cowboys running back Tony Pollard a three year deal. Three years, $24 million for Tony Pollard to sign with the Tennessee Titans. That obviously all but confirms what we think about Derrick Henry's future with them. He's unlikely to return after eight seasons. So I don't know if you have any uh, immediate thoughts on that. I don't think that's super surprising in any sense, but to tie it back to the Cowboys. I think they're now going to be in the market for your Derrick Henry. I mean, I, I think that's that's likely that they go out and get a running back in free agency or that they, hey, maybe go get a Jonathan Brooks in in free agency. So uh, your, your all, thoughts on that, If you even if you hadn't seen the headline? Of all the potential running backs to go out and get who are on the free agency market now, I think Derrick Henry at this point in his career is best paired with somebody who is a little bit more explosive. Yes, he's your bell cow, but you find somebody who can contrast his hard running style, his punishing running style. Look, I get it. He is has that unique ability to run you over and also outrun you. Very Bo Jask, uh, Jackson-esque, if you will. But he is starting to lose that speed now. So to find somebody who's a burner – or somebody who uh, isn't as lumbering or isn't as punishing necessarily, but when the defense is a little bit tired and they're starting to take certain angles based based on what they've been facing, <laughs> ironically, a Tony Pollard might be a really good fit here. But to find a running back like that who has that explosiveness, I think is the key for Derrick Henry. I don't think the Cowboys go out and get Derrick Henry. I think they realize that they are better off spending big money elsewhere. As far as Pollard to Tennessee, I think we saw signs in the last, let's call it quarter to third of the season of Tony Pollard returning to that previous form, that pre-injury form. So uh, I'm rooting for him with the Titans. I hope 
that he can figure it back out because man, that, uh, that 2023 season, wait, 2022 season, excuse me, we're in 2024 now, uh, was a lot of fun to watch. And I say that as somebody who does not root for the Cowboys either. Yeah. He clearly struggled early on to get back to that 2022 form this year, but I, I think he's a guy that's very scheme dependent. I don't think he's a guy that's just, you throw him in there. He's an automatic, every offense in the NFL, three down back. So it'll be interesting to see what, what the Cowboys do. I mean, I didn't see any report there, uh, at least in the article that I read about the Cowboys offering him some sort of big money or, or going out of their way to try to, you know, try to match an offer, or really make a big push for him. So it'll, I, I'm really curious to see what they do at running back because I think with Pollard's style, or at least with the way the Cowboys want to play, they need somebody a little bit different than Pollard. Like I actually love Jonathan Brooks in that offense. Yeah. I love, I love that possibility for them because I think Jonathan Brooks, while he may not have the the lateral quickness or maybe some of the, you know, like just bold speed that that Pollard may have. The, that quickness is probably the better way of putting it. I think he's a better overall running back. I, I love his vision. As long as he can get back to full form, you know, you would hope by training camp to have a month to, to ramp up before the season. That's an option. Maybe they go get a Trey Benson, you know, like the best running back in this class may not come off the board until the second round. So it's not like the Cowboys would have to use an Ezekiel Elliott type pick that they did a couple of years ago on, you know, potentially their, their running back of the future, a guy that they could have and, and hope produces at a really high level on a rookie contract. But the draft is looking more and more likely for where they're going to find their next running back because of another reason, two more headlines, Trey. Uh, Saquon Barkley reportedly going to sign with the Eagles and Josh Jacobs reportedly not returning to my Raiders and will sign with the Packers. They released Aaron Jones. So this could end up being kind of a, a carousel type situation, maybe because the Packers got rid of Jones to bring on Jacobs. Maybe that's an option for the Cowboys. Golly, Saquon to the Eagles. That is a fascinating move for them. Mm -hmm. Boy, the Eagles. And they just uh, <laughs> they keep making interesting moves. And I'm sorry, did you say Jacobs is being connected anywhere else or just that he is out in Vegas, which shouldn't be a surprise to anybody? Jacobs uh, expected to sign with the Packers. Oh, with Aaron Jones being gone. Yeah. Uh, I'll look forward to see where seeing where Aaron Jones ends up too. I know the last year was a little bit of a drop off for them. I feel uh, for him. I feel like he still has a little bit of juice left. But I like Josh Jacobs a lot as a player, especially in an offense that is going to appreciate him. Like I think Green Bay will a little bit more than what Josh McDaniel, of course, but then Vegas in general did or did not do over these last few years. Well, I think we saw it with Josh Jacobs and Saquon Barkley whether it's the threat of the franchise tag from these teams, you know, they try to negotiate going into that fifth year, even if they get the, the fifth year option gets picked up. I think sometimes with the way the running back market is right now and the way these guys are treated in negotiations, not saying the teams are doing anything wrong. It makes it difficult for these guys, whether it's a Jacobs or a Barkley to go back to that team because inevitably it's going to get personal. I know the, all these guys say they understand it's business, but these are human beings at the end of the day. So they are going to take, they are going to take some of these things personally. And while you're, while you have an agent to shield you from some of those things, they can only shield you from so much. There's so much reporting out there. You of course want to be involved in some of it because you, you have to sign off to go to one of these teams or play on one of these deals. And I think sometimes it gets personal, whether it's the giants with Saqu Saquon or the Raiders with Jacobs and, it kind of makes it difficult to mend those fences and say, yeah, you know what? For sure. Let's sign a three-year deal or a four-year deal. And you know what? Those are those were probably the two top guys on the market in free agency. Derrick Henry, I, I don't know if I'd put him up there right now. Body of work, I would, up against those guys. I'd put him above those guys. But with his age and the way he runs, and you just don't know how much tread is left on those tires. I feel pretty confident with Saquon and, and Jacobs that – on a deal that's reasonable, those guys have enough tread left on the tires and, and enough speed left. Definitely Saquon to, or definitely Jacobs. I mean, because he's played fewer years that that they have a couple good years left in him. I'm trying to think of a situation that would make sense for Derrick Henry with a younger, more explosive type of guy that I had just described to you. 
going through the divisions right now. <laughs> you know what's ironic is I actually think Pollard and and Derrick Henry make a pretty good one-two punch. You know what? Yeah. If he's willing to take a huge if he's willing to take a huge pay cut to stick around in Tennessee, then you're right about that. Maybe, maybe Miami because they have so many burners in their backfield, but it seems like that's all McDaniels really wants. Uh, he doesn't necessarily want a big lumbering guy. He wants these fleet of foot running backs that are typically pretty good at catching passes out of the backfield, which also isn't Derrick Henry's forte. Trey. Yeah. Looking at my phone right now. Uh-oh. Uh, if, if this is correct, it appears reports say that Minshew Mania is headed to Las Vegas. Oh, congratulations. I am so happy for you right now. I am so happy for you and really for football fans in general. Gardner Minshew, I think he could fit a lot of places, but I love Gardner, the Gardner. One of the best and, mustaches that Mississippi's ever produced. One of the best kind of mullets Mississippi's yeah. ever produced. Now I feel pretty confident saying Mississippi's produced a better mullet than that. But Minshew mania, man. Uh, I don't know what that says for the Raiders or – Hey, man, you know what? N- nothing says I'm more excited for my team's chances to win a Super Bowl when we play in the same division as Patrick Mahomes and the reigning Super Bowl champion Chiefs than saying, hey, we've got a quarterback competition between Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew. Man, I mean, our Super Bowl odds got to basically be like three to one. I mean, we are just a lock. We're a lock to at least make it, right? Unbelievable. Here is crazy prediction time. You ready for this one? Raiders are going to win 11 games. Gardner Minshew, by the time it's all said and done, will have a Rich Gannon type of career. That's right. Not quite as mobile as Gannon was in his heyday, but I think he's one of those guys that's going to stick around long enough. He eventually gets to that right situation where he makes a Super Bowl run. Now, Gannon never actually won a Super Bowl, if I'm remembering correctly. He just got the Raiders all the way to that bowl that they lost to the box. But Gardner Minshew is a damn good quarterback. He is. I I know he has his flaws, but just about everybody does if you're not Pat Mahomes. That is a huge upgrade over Aiden O'Connell. I know. I, I love Gardner Minshew as a serviceable backup to a quarterback I'm really excited about. I don't know if I love Gardner Minshew as the guy that's going to, you know, be expected to start 17 games for my favorite professional football team this year. But it's it's not it's not over yet. I mean, it doesn't mean the Raiders can't go out and get somebody. This to me would line up and say, hey, if you're maybe if the right quarterback falls to the Raiders, they have the bridge guy in place to develop the quarterback that they want to get in the draft. Yeah, that's a because good where way. the Raiders. The Raiders are in a similar situation to the Broncos in terms of where they pick and the types of quarterbacks they would be selecting between at their at their position in the draft. Hmm. Oh, man, I'm so happy for you guys right now. Gardner Minshew had been the quarterback for the 49ers this past season and not Brock Purdy. They not only would have won that Super Bowl, they probably would have won it by like 28 points. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. I wish I had that shirt right now. I know. I, I see it all at, in my office every day. I'm like, how am I going to get this to Jeff? I thought about just dropping it off at, at your station the other day. You and I just need to get together. It's just a matter of having time to do that, which theoretically this this would be a week to do that because it's spring break. But no, that is that is clearly not happening. By the way, uh, humble brag here. This isn't even a humble brag. This is just a straight up brag. So I've been covering red carpets since Friday. Friday, I got to talk to Jake Gyllenhaal and Conor McGregor, which was pretty cool. Saturday, I got to interview John Leguizamo and French Stewart for a movie that they're here with. Today, I got to interview Jesse Eisenberg, who's awesome. He played Mark Zuckerberg in the Facebook movie and is a very talented uh, actor. Picks really good, darkly comedic roles, too, and that's what he's here for South by 4 this year. But the thing that I wanted to not humble brag about, just straight up brag about, was about an hour ago, I got to interview Nicolas Cage for two questions. And one of the questions I asked was intentionally being delivered to be at least a little bit amusing. 
he got a good laugh out of Nicolas Cage, and he said, I've never heard that before, th Like, and he like was complimented me on it. So I got a big compliment from Nicolas Cage, which, considering just the, the years that he's entertained me and so many others, was a high honor from him. Can we get a, a preview of, of what this comment slash joke was, or is that just a, a preview of you got to listen to it on the pod? Oh, no, well, you, you can listen to it on the pod. You, you'll want to see his reaction also. <clears throat> the question was i'm not getting choked up i promise i just need water <laughs> <laughs> this moment was this moment was so emotional you know what that's yeah. how that how you're getting choked up right now is how i'm gonna get choked up first time that a beautiful brock purdy t-shirt lands lands on my skin trail i, am I can't so wait to, i can't up. wait to see it on your person as i will say while, while you while you recover real quick i i'm i'm having a laugh with myself picturing you dropping off the Brock Purdy t-shirt to the receptionist at CBS Austin and then her bringing it back to my desk later on and being like, Hey, someone, uh, and she probably wouldn't even open it, but I'm just picturing her opening and be like, somebody dropped this off for you. <laughs> like basically like quality controlling it. Like, do I need to like wash it first? Like just her thinking that some random stranger dropped this off, which again, you would probably explain like, Hey, I'm a, I'm a friend. I'm a friend of Jeff's dropping this off, but no, I'm, I'm going faux stalker style. I'm like, can you please give this <laughs> Jeff Barker, make it, make it better, fan. <laughs> make it better for the story. Yeah, exactly. No. So, um, the question was, and I actually wanted to ask this a few years ago when he premiered his, uh, his movie, his very self-aware movie, the unbearable weight of massive talent or something where he plays himself. He plays like a histrionic version of himself. Uh, so the question I was going to ask then that I ended up getting asked today that, that he uh, responded positively to was, uh, you are beloved by pretty much everybody. You, you are essentially at a point in your life where you've reached that Johnny fucking Cash slash Bill fucking Murray level of popularity where your unofficial middle name is the F word. What's your secret? <laughs> And he like he thought about it for a split second, and it registered, and that's when he laughed, and he gave a he gave a cool response in return. So, uh, yeah, to get to to get to interview Nicholas Fucking Cage, that is, I don't know where on the uh, the top career highlights list it is, but it's uh, certainly top ten, maybe top five. You know what the Texas football version of what you're saying would be is just a one, just a first name, first name or one name type of player when you just become a Earl. Vince, Ricky, Colt, Cedric, Bijan, Jordan. I guess Shipley's kind of in that, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Quan. Even, yeah, Quan. I was going to say even, I mean, tons of respect to those guys, but even like a step below like the Heismans, the Earls and the Rickies, like, yeah, just Quan, Jordan. So. Yeah, it's funny how, and this is probably generally the case when you talk about football players who get that one name like it's more often offensive guys than it is defensive guys because like even with some of the best defenders of all time it's either last name or initials dj like exactly dj you could say tommy but i feel like a lot of people would be more quick to respond to nobis kate is it casey hampton is it casey is it hampton i don't know what it is there but like yeah, that's just that. Like Michael Huff is not Michael. It's not Mike. It's Huff. Yeah, I guess that maybe it's just a direct correlation between the number of times you visit the end zone, which maybe is so. which is gonna which is obviously gonna skew offensively inclined. Yep. Well, that's should we talk it. a little? Uh, should we talk a little Texas hoops? Let's do it. Did you get to cover the game on Saturday? I did. I did. I was there. Great atmosphere. I'm always. Uh, I'm a sucker for senior day. I'm a sucker for emotional moments like that. I, yeah. you know, I, as, as kind of cynical as, as I can be at times, I am a guy that has that soft spot for, you know, your family being there to see what you accomplished. Even last night, you know, my, my mom's in town. She's a huge movie buff and she wanted to watch the Oscars and I otherwise would never do that. I may watch the opening monologue and then you know, move, move on with my night but it was cool watching the speeches, you know, the celebrations and that kind of stuff, which makes me, you know, go back to senior night the day before. And 
um, you know, whether it's football, or basketball, just just those guys kind of getting to be down there with their families for a minute and then also getting to get a win, too. And yeah. this this crew of Texas basketball players is responsible, along with last year's, for breaking in this building, for putting out a good enough product, especially last year, and defending the home floor to a point where, you know, the corral has something to cheer about, that that Texas now has a home court advantage that rivals some of the best in the country. Outside of your classics, you know, your your Cameron Indoor, those kind of places, you know, that that Texas is maybe going to be on the, the top 10 to top 15 of a list of best home court advantages. So yeah, those guys deserve a bunch of credit for being a part of that, especially Brock and and Dylan, the amount of years, Dylan to Sue, the amount of years that, that, that they've been here. So yeah, just from an atmosphere standpoint or, you know, covering the game, that that's kind of what, what stood out to me outside of the actual win on the court, which I know we'll get to in a minute. Did you stick around on the court at the end of the game as Dylan DeSue made sure to show some love or take a picture or sign an autograph for any person in that building who wanted it. Cause what a cool moment that must've been. If so. Yeah. I got some video uh, at the end of that, of him walking through and taking pictures with fans. Another thing that I think is really cool, a new tradition that they started doing at Moody is they now after the games, they'll go dap up the people that sit front row, which I assume I may not recognize all of them by face, but you know, I think a lot of those are, are donors up there, but then they make their way around from those front row courtside seats around to the, uh, you know, tunnel diagonal of, or the opposite end of where they go in dap up kind of the band people that are sticking around there, the rest of the students that are in that corner behind the basket. And then they go all the way around to the corral to those students that are sitting right there. And, you know, I even saw it, uh, the game before, you know, Kendall Weaver, after he had his big game, the, the last home game, taking pictures with guys, Max Ace taking a million selfies pretty much every game. So that's, that's part of the tradition that, that those guys soak up and especially when it's your last game. But I think that that's stuff that helps in recruiting too. Of just, you, you, you sit down, if you're a recruit, this will, now if you're recruiting recruited by Texas, you're going to go to recruiting visits and see great atmospheres but now that's not going to be held against Texas when they're recruiting some of the best basketball players in the country, especially in the state. That's going to be, Hey, that was on par with when I went to, uh, I mean, I'm going to say Houston, but you know, I mean, I guess right now that's a school that <laughs> is better than Texas in basketball, yeah. but has a great atmosphere too. Or even, Hey, I went to Kentucky. Yes. It's not rough. We know that, but the atmosphere is pretty damn awesome in there. So yeah, really cool to see, see Dylan DeSue and, and all those guys take as many photos as they could. I mean, you know, DeSue said after the game that he, he made it a point to, to handle it, you know, where, where he was taking a picture with every single person that wanted one. It's great to see that out of a guy who, if you have any optimism that this team can exceed their expectations, their postseason expectations, I think a lot of people think that, even though I know some national pundits have said you, you don't want to face Texas in the second round if you're a one or a two seed. A lot of us feel like getting to that second round game is meeting the preseason expectations. So if they're going to get to that second weekend, the biggest reason why they're going to be able to do so is Dylan DeSue. And when your best player is that sort of stand-up guy as well, I think it bodes really nicely for the rest of the – roster in the locker room on the whole we buried the lead a little bit trey the coolest thing of all was that he played yeah <laughs> and that's i mean look he's got a warrior's mentality we talked about it I, you and i didn't talk about it on friday because i ended up not getting to do the show uh because of south by but uh, i talked with i think with bk and maybe with kevin last week where it's like part of me wants to be cautious here and like save him if the, there's any sort of question about the knee, just save him for the big 12 tournament and the NCAA tournament. It's not the type of player he is. I mean, he was trying to play through that stomach illness against Baylor before he got hurt. This guy's a warrior and it's why he has become one of the best players in the big 12. So I don't fault him at all. And the, the, the best part about that is that he didn't look hindered at all. So that's like, that's a sigh of relief right there. Cause you assume they put him through the battery of tests and it's like, look, we want you to play also, but we need to make sure we're doing what's best 
for for you first and foremost, but for all of us in the uh, less immediate term, I guess the short, long, long term, if you will. The TV broadcast may not have shown this, but there were a few moments where you could tell that the, the knee was still hurting. And I didn't oh, think... Oh, is that he, right? I didn't think... Oh. I agree with you in the sense that I didn't think he looked hindered while he was on the court, while he was playing. But if you remember the... First half, Tyrese Hunter, another guy we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah. The spectacular lob pass he threw where his, you know, his legs were almost like Jordan Logo-esque when he tossed that lob up to, to Dylan Mitchell. And they call, OU called timeout after that. Well, on the other end, right in front of my camera, was DeSue holding the knee. Ah. Now, not, not holding the knee like I'm not going to go back in, but holding the knee more like, he said he he went like this after. So he said like what knocked I assume knee. what I assume to mean is yeah, I knocked the knee, but yeah. And after the game he said knee feels good. That that's all he said. He wouldn't go into any more detail, but you can tell it's it's still hurting. And also on the play, I think he scored and then was pulled from the game maybe with under 2 or 3 minutes left. And as he walked back to the scorer's table to dap up some of the guys over there before he got to Rodney and the rest of the bench, he kind of like hobbled a little bit. So obviously the best sign of this is that if there was any structural damage that an MRI showed, he just, he just wouldn't have been out there. Yeah. You know, if it was anything like, I don't even want to say the words, but if it was anything that we all know the injuries that will keep a guy out, uh, even if he can walk and it doesn't look like that may have been the injury because we've seen that happen non-contact more often than I think we've seen it happen over the last couple of years clearly would not have been out on the court if, if that was the issue. And I right. felt pretty confident about it Thursday when Texas brought all their seniors to a, a midday media availability and they gave us kind of all one-on-one -on -one access. It's always really cool when they do that. They just had the guys sitting out and, you know, talking to, talking to people and like you go up, get a one-on-one -on -one if nobody's talking to a guy. So they had all four seniors out there. And when they brought Dylan out for that, I felt pretty confident that, even if it was still a game time decision for him to play against Oklahoma, that there was no structural damage that they were going to try to hide or kick the can down the road. Cause Texas fans, man. And I understandably immediately went into damage control mode for the NCAA tournament birth of like, this is the Florida state situation. Just don't even reveal any information. Even if you know that he's out for the year, just say that, Oh, we don't know. We expect him to be ready to go and then just never play him so that you don't give the committee any reason to knock you out of a nine seed potentially and give it to somebody else who's on the first four out. And then they have the reason to go, well, your best player is not going to play. So the fact that that never even came into actual, you know, realistic conversation is a great sign for Texas. Yeah. Yes, it is. Hold on one sec. Yeah. I'll talk about uh talk about Hold on. Hold on. there's a guy. I, let me see if I can show you this. This guy um he lives in this van in front of me, I think. That van right there. This van's oh. rocking, don't go knocking. It's got a doors sticker on the back. It's got another sticker that looks a little bit sketch. Uh this fan this van was rocking a little bit earlier, Jeff. Afternoon it, some afternoon delight in front of you on a, I, on a Monday I, I afternoon. Don't know. Because the only people that I saw or the only beings that I saw get out of this car were, if you can see him, this guy right here and his dog. So hopefully he wasn't doing things with the dog in a jar of peanut butter, but he was speaking very loudly to him. I don't even know if you could hear him just now, but I had to make sure to roll my window up. So uh, whatever it was that he was saying or doing with that dog did not end up on the broadcast. I could a little bit, I, but what I thought I heard was him knocking and trying to tell you to tell your co-host that that he's had great basketball takes all year and that he thinks this is not a team that you would want to face in the second round or beyond. Is that not what he was trying to tell you? Uh, I don't think so. This, I don't think, look, I don't watch a ton of college basketball in 2024. <laughs> this guy hasn't watched any college basketball in at least a good 25 years. Uh -huh. <laughs> he's uh, he is much busier uh, getting it on in his van with uh, all sorts of species. Rodney says we could hear. All right. Well, good to know, Rodney. Thank you for letting me know that. I can't even see the comments today, so oh, I got I'm you. not responding to the commentary. We're gonna we're gonna get back to more more Texas basketball, I'm sure. But CB helping us rehash here. Um, 
yeah, reminding us Eagles signed Saquon. Yeah, big day for the for the running backs. And I'm I'm a little little what was Saquon's deal. Do we do we have the financials on that one? I was trying to pull that up over here. It was struggling a little bit with the uh internet and trying to make sure that I didn't rehash what happened a couple Mondays ago. Let me try to let me try to pull it up now, see if I can get the details of that contract. Cause that is important for the running back market, not just the rest of this cycle, but but moving forward sure. with non non-Christian McCaffrey running backs and what what they might be getting. Yeah, my guess is he's getting somewhere around what Tony Pollard got with the Titans. He is uh former New York Giants running back Saquon Barkley reached an agreement with the Philadelphia Eagles on a three year. $37.75 million contract that could be worth north of $46 million and includes $26 million fully guaranteed at signing. Barkley okay. now beats the franchise tag number and has maximum average per year salary of $15.833 million, which would be second highest for a running back in NFL history. If he meets the all the salary stuff. Yep. Yep, and then... uh yeah, Rob helping us out here, chiming in. Twenty-six million fully guaranteed. So, I would I'm say running that, back, I'm glad running backs are getting a little bit. I'm glad they're not getting uh, they're not getting left out like a lot of MLB free agents are right now, who have a ton of value and just teams aren't willing to pay. I mean, look, I get it. You feel like you can fill that position in the draft with young, inexpensive guys, but there there is value for a talented running back. Saquon Barkley when he's healthy and he's been healthier than not these last few years is one of the best running backs in the NFL. So this swift worked well for them this last year. I think Saquon Barkley is going to work outstanding for them. And they're probably going to have a good backup plan too, whether it's Gainwell or somebody else. Yeah, absolutely. And, And I think that the, it makes sense for what the, what the Eagles are trying to do with, you know, somebody that can take the load off of Jalen Hurts. You want to, you want to run Jalen Hurts when you can, uh, but you don't want to overdo it. And on the contract side of that too, hopefully this is a nice way that, that teams can meet in the middle as, as the running back market evolves for what teams think those guys are worth. Because if he can, you know, he's getting 26 million fully guaranteed at signing and you're paying him on the upper end of running backs, obviously, but you're also throwing in there too. Hey, there's incentives for you to stay healthy. There's incentives for you to stay on the field. There's incentives for you not to load manage. Uh, the, you know, there's incentives in it for you if we just decide to run you into the ground these next three years. So yeah. I think I think that might be what you see moving forward more more so is throwing in some of these incentives, saying, "Hey, we'll give you maybe more money. We'll, we'll give you similar average per year just on the contract, but we'll guarantee more of it up front, and then you can earn even more if you meet certain certain requirements." Uh, I think that that's a really smart way for everyone to go about this. You're betting on yourself if you're one of those running backs in a league that whatever stupid reason doesn't guarantee contracts is the only pro sport that doesn't do that. It makes no sense considering that football is the most popular and the most physically demanding. But I hope these guys, because I don't really have a dog in the fight. I guess guess I'm anti-Cowboys more than anything. But uh, I just uh, hope these guys – help to reset and reestablish the value for the running back position. Uh, yeah. Themselves and also for guys at that position who are going to need this sort of thing in the future too. Speaking of Cowboys, uh, Aaron, uh, Rob comments, Cowboys go for Aaron Jones or, or King Henry. We touched on that a, a little bit earlier. And I think probably more likely that they, they do go for, for one of those two guys. And maybe that's on a one year deal or a two year deal. And then you pair that with a guy that you go get in the draft so that you make it fit. You make it fit in the salary cap this year with Aaron Jones or Derrick Henry. And those are guys that might be more likely to take a one or two year deal knowing that, Hey, I'm probably on the back nine of my career in terms of, you know, the figurative, like we said earlier, tread left on the tires and saying, hey, why don't I just go get a lot for one year? And for the Cowboys, it's only it only hits them on the salary cap for one season. They get to pair them with, you know, said rookie that they potentially take in the draft, and they get to basically audition that rookie while not putting the entire load on his shoulders and get to say, hey, go out and prove it to us. And then if you prove to us that you you are what in Aaron Jones or Derrick Henry was back in their prime, 
then we'll get rid of that guy because he's on a one year deal and and you know we'll we'll ride you the next couple years. Who would you rather take? I mean, I think the Cowboys, after what I saw last year from their offense and with Tony Pollard, the lack of of you know real ability to consistently run and beat teams between the tackles. I know Tony Pollard can do it. I'm not saying he can't, but I I would probably go Derrick Henry on a one or two year deal if he'd take it because I want somebody that could really run between the tackles. And then you try to go get the younger version of a true, th- you know, three down back in the draft. That, that would be what I would do. But I also think Eric Jones is a great option too. I mean, he, he was awesome for the Packers for a long time. Yeah. I just, I wonder with Aaron Jones, because he is more of a threat catching the football, if that ends up being a determining factor, if the Cowboys are deciding between those two guys, on top of the fact, if I'm remembering correctly, obviously he played college ball at UTEP. Aaron's a Texas native too, isn't he? Uh, he is. He grew up in El Paso. El Paso, okay. Uh, so he actually grew up around El- UTEP as well. And he uh, was a lifelong Cowboys fan. I believe uh, Kevin, who had him as a client at Morgan Stanley, told me as much. Great dude too, from all accounts. Probably lean a little bit heavier towards Aaron Jones right now. Not that... Derrick Henry would be a bad consolation prize. Again, if like what we're talking about, whether you're giving, um, whether you are giving, oh gosh, why is his name escaping me right now? Who is the running back from Kansas State who's on that roster still? Oh, Deuce? Yeah, Deuce uh, Deuce Vaughn, a little bit of a chance. He did remain on the practice squad all year long. You bring a Rico Dowdle back or you do uh, try to address that position in the middle to latter rounds of the upcoming NFL draft. Uh, one of those things to pair with Derrick Henry. But I think generally speaking, all things equal, I'm probably going Jones over Henry right now. Yeah, that's, that's fair. I don't think you go wrong with either of those guys as long as the money's right. Appreciate that, CB. CB says, great hat. Got my uh, Hutto Hippos hat going on here today. Quality hat. Is that a hippo in between the state of Texas? It is, it is. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yep. The – uh roaring hippo if you will hey i think you have an old man rant that you need to give me that you wanted to give on friday first though just getting back to the texas basketball team and what they did to oklahoma on saturday this is we're broken records when we talk about this but this team does need to find that third option sometimes second option if max a smith isn't hitting like what happened again on saturday man if you can if Tyrese Hunter can start to figure it out right now and be more consistent like that going forward, that is huge. And talking about raising this team's ceiling, that would go a long ways in doing so. He's always going to give you that effort on defense. It's not like he's not trying on offense. He just seemed to be out of rhythm, and he was squarely back in that rhythm for at least one game. He is, and we've said this about a couple of guys, he's probably the real X factor for this team's ability to make the second weekend potentially. Yeah. And again, you're not expecting 30 points every night from him. No, but I thought, I thought the way he got those 30 points was, was sustainable, was something that you could replicate. I don't think it was a, uh, he just made eight threes. Like he, he didn't break a program record from three. I think he was three for four from three. Yeah. Made all three in the second half. Had a great bucket early in the first half off of a beautiful pass from Brock Cunningham on Friday. Joe Cook and I talked about that a bunch when we talked a little bit about these seniors that when we get good Brock versus bad Brock, good Brock, really, really good Brock is an awesome passer. Like he really and, helps facilitate the offense. You guys are right about that. Which, is, which is why, yeah, which is why sometimes I know we're talking about Tyrese, but real quick on Brock, which is why sometimes I feel like the reputation that Brock's built takes away sometimes from from how smart of a basketball player I think he really is. And it's not just because he's been there six years. I watched the guy at Westlake. Granted, he was playing on a on a borderline super team with, you know, uh, KJ Adams and Will Baker and uh, Matthew Meyer and, you know, other other D1 prospects. Like, they had so many dudes on some of those teams, man. And They won a championship, oh, right? They won a state championship? They did not. I, they made the, the state Final Four, though. Some of these wow. Dallas teams, man, are ridiculous. I and mean, we saw it this yeah. weekend when Stony Point with Josiah Mosley was going to Villanova. They lost to Plano East. Like mm. these Dallas and Houston teams are next level in basketball and football as well. But yeah, I think that that gets 
taken away from Brock or unnoticed because people just harp so much on this kind of villain role and villain label that, that he's had, but he's been a great, great passer since he was at Westlake. And frankly, he could shoot when he was at Westlake. That's always, I have been very critical of Brock Cunningham going back to his freshman year when Texas fans were losing their shit at how much of a lunch pail guy he was because you saw some of the dirty stuff and it would only be a matter of time before he established that reputation you can still be that sort of player and get under people's skin without being so dirty about it. And unfortunately, for a big chunk of his career, he hasn't been able to shake that label. And he only has himself to blame for it. And as a result, we haven't seen a guy who is as effective in facilitating offense and just being an absolute pest on defense and being able to guard multiple positions and being so good at chasing down turnovers. Like, that's gotten lost in the wash uh, because Brock has been a little bit too big of an on-court asshole at times. So uh, hopefully, I know that the tech thing was ugly, and it obviously there was a little bit of intent there. There's a history between him and that fan base. I hope that was a wake-up call for him. And even the next game, too, by the way, where he ends up fouling out on what they called a flagrant one. Is it, As you made that point last week, is it a flagrant one with 99.9% of the population? no. That's your fucking reputation, dude. I'm sorry. Like they're they're but gonna be. The game shouldn't on be you. called like that. You it, shouldn't be but, okay. Okay. All right. All right. Wait. Maybe to meet halfway. You shouldn't go back to the monitor to then change the call because you're only changing the call. You're only going back to the monitor and changing the call there because it's Brock. You don't even go to the monitor if it's Max A. Smith or. Right. Or Bill Johnson or random player XYZ. Like, it's only because his name's Brock Cunningham. He wears number 30. Just like somebody who has a criminal history is more likely to be rung up on something <laughs> versus somebody who's been charged with a very similar crime who doesn't have that criminal history. That's Brock Cunningham's reality. So let that be in the back of your mind to avoid something that comes close to that. You can still be an effective player without that shit. No, no my, doubt. So I hope I hope for Brock with that Texas Tech thing and then a sort of example being made out of him in the next game that that is a wake-up call for him and we don't see any more of that for however many games he has left as a Longhorn because he is another guy that they need out there as we continue on this Brock Cunningham tangent within a larger Tyrese Hunter point. Yeah, to bring it back to, to Tyrese, just that play of the the, the Brock Cunningham uh, pass to Tyrese early in the first half, it was on a backdoor cut. Beautiful backdoor cut by Tyrese. Great job by Brock to see it. And I think that play is a microcosm, one small example of what this team needs if they're going to win a first-round matchup against a similarly seated and talented team and accomplished team and then potentially beat – a one or two in the next round, depending on their seed, because that play showed me, Hey, this is how you create offense without Dylan DeSue or Max Asmus even touching the ball to make the basket happen. Now, they may have touched the ball at some point on that possession, but it was those two guys creating a scoring opportunity. And that takes so much pressure off of, off of those guys. You know, the, they're the two, the two, the two main horses in Dylan DeSue and, and Max A. Smith there. So uh, Dylan DeSue said as much after the game when asked about Tyrese Hunter, he said, you know, basically we know Tyrese can do this. We know he's this kind of guy. And it was fun watching him light it up like that. And Dylan even said, he goes, it was nice for me to have a rest, especially given what I've had going on this week. He was actually referring more to the stomach bug because he even said whatever stomach bug he had on Monday was still slightly affecting him Saturday in regard, oh. but no, not, not in regard to like what he was actually feeling Monday, more about like just bouncing back to be able to play a division one basketball game and keeping fluids and making sure that he was hydrated. And, and, you know, like I assume even referring to things like having the appetite to eat enough at the right time to get yourself ready for a game. Cause so much goes into having those guys ready to, you know, play a basketball game for, for 40 minutes at that level. Well, when you get sick like that, there's a you get weak too. Like it takes your time, your body time to build back up to get back to full strength. That's why 
I was uh, marveling's maybe not the right word. Like I was a little bit surprised to see him trying to play in that Baylor game. And clearly he wasn't anywhere close to a hundred percent because he only got to 10 minutes before hurting his knee. Like that's, I guess another one of those testaments to just uh, that warrior's mentality that Dylan DeSue has. And he also s- understands that he is a leader of this team, that he's this team's best player and they need him out there against the co- toughest competition, which Baylor was. If that had been, not to take this for granted because they'd lost to both of these teams, but a West Virginia or a UCF or like an Oklahoma State, we may not see Dylan DeSue out there, but because that was Baylor in Waco, he at least tried to give it a go. Yeah. And one last point on on Tyrese too. This is something that that you've brought up previously. And actually, I want to I'm I'm going to be on with uh, with Zay later this week. I want to okay. ask Zay about this. But you brought up Tyrese bringing the ball up and having the ball in his hands and initiating the offense more a couple weeks ago. I think it may have been after the Baylor game um, or even before at some point during the season. And I thought that was noticeable this week too. It was. Yeah. It was a real back and forth between, you know, A. Smith and Hunter of who would take the ball up. And I thought the offense looked great either way. And I think that that could be good for both guys' confidence, especially Tyrese, because I think that's really his position at the end of the day. I even said to somebody on the baseline earlier uh, at some point in the game, I was like, man, Tyrese is a really good passer. It didn't it. There was one play I'm thinking of specifically in the second half where he threw a great pass to Mitchell on I think what might have been a pick and roll and it didn't end up in anything. Maybe Mitchell got fouled and went to the line, but I was like, man, that was an awesome pass. And it was a similar pass to one I saw Ace Miss throw away once or twice during the game. But even Tyrese, you know, maybe late in the shot clock, half court offense isn't, isn't what it, what it is or what, what they wanted it to be. He had multiple times where his aggressiveness and controlled aggression with the ball, taking it to the basket, got him free throws. It was like yeah. a bad offensive possession for whatever reason. The offense didn't work, and he bailed them out by getting to the line. Just purely off of his aggressiveness and willingness to put the ball on the floor and take it at a guy. And aggressive Tyrese is the best Tyrese. He's one of those guys that when he's aggressive and it's clicking on defense and he's taking the ball up the court on offense, that's the best he looks. And if they can find a way to not, not inhibit or, you know, slow down what Max Acemus wants to do offensively and find a way to get him involved and get him shots early. This team is at its most dangerous when they're able to do that. I think it's a great point. All right. We have about five minutes before I'm having to depart again to head to a, another red carpet this time, a documentary on the black keys. So the guys who make up the black keys are going to be there. The director of this film too. And I'm excited about it, but I need to hear, um, the latest story that you gave me a very brief preview of via text last week. What happened? So about, about 10 AM weekday, I'm at the coffee shop, uh, lamp post coffee here in Hutto. Great, great cup of Joe, great breakfast sandwiches, great vibes here in, here in downtown Hutto. And I sit down, I, I'm with, I'm with, with Jace. We're over in the kids section. We sit down they have like these little stools that kids can sit on. There's some books over there. The person right to our left at a regular table is on a Zoom call for no joke, like the entire 45 minutes we were there. And not a Zoom call where, again, I try to be fair. There's different levels to these things. It's one thing to be like, hey, I got to take a call. And it's like a regular company meeting and your department meeting. Maybe there's going to be eight people on it. And you might pop in one time and be like, uh, yeah, Trey, um, you know, I got this, that, the other thing, X, Y, Z we're talking about. All right, we'll circle back, touch base, whatever other business lingo. You talk for a minute, you're done. Maybe a little couple things here and there. She was like full on in some sort of meeting to pitch her business to a potential client is what it sounded like. Maybe that's how long she was talking and how loud she was talking is I basically heard everything. By the way, it sounds like she's got a great business. So happy for her on that front. But yeah, I just want to see where where you and the people are at on on taking a business Zoom call where you are going to be doing a significant amount of talking in the middle of a coffee shop. Because I, I I want to be, if I need to be checked and put in my place and and evolve with the times post-COVID, because I know this is, things have changed with Zoom calls, then I'm, I'm willing to eat it on that. No, that's a horseshit move by her. Now, let me ask you, was the entire meeting audible 
to the coffee shop or just what she was saying? Just what she was saying. She did have headphones in for for what 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 they were saying. It was still I, I guess a that's, lot guess, of talking, and it was loud. Yeah, I guess that that is next level if you uh, allow people to hear what else is being said in the meeting. But the fact that she was essentially leading the meeting and doing so loudly in the middle of a bunch of other people is completely ignorant and discourteous. And it is along the lines of the asshole who walks into a bathroom where other people are in there and is speaking loudly on his phone or loudly into his Bluetooth speaker. It's like, don't do that. Stay outside the bathroom. In her case, go find an outdoor table or go find a quiet space to conduct that meeting. Nobody else will hear your shit. I'm sorry you feel like the, that you are so important that everybody else needs to, needs to put their conversation or lives on hold so you can remain in this coffee shop to have this 45-minute Zoom meeting. It's bullshit. You should have been frustrated by that. And uh, not saying I'm disappointed in you because it's a, an unfortunate, surprising situation. I do wish you had said something to her. I feel like that's the next step in this uh, Larry David progression is that you do actually step in and say, excuse me. Nobody wants to hear you lead this meeting for even a minute longer, much less 30 minutes longer. Can you please take this someplace else? You know what? If, if I was at Mocha Joe's, then I might have I might have <laughs> felt the courage to do that. I may have just shaved off. I may have just given myself the cul-de-sac and dyed the, the, the back part of it gray and just yeah. done the <laughs> LD on him. But what, what, what are we doing here? What are we doing? Yeah, that that's exactly how I felt. Even even Jace right there was going like, like looking over at times, like not obviously not with the uh, the social kind of perspective that I have as an adult, but just sort of being like, wow, like that woman is talking at her computer quite loud. Jeez. And again, one thing to have a normal conversation in there because you go into a coffee shop, you're used to hearing like it background noise. But I never feel like other people at the coffee shop that are talking to each other, I can actually like hear their conversation, like actually make out what they're saying. It's just like nice background noise. Not this lady. That's really annoying. All right, guys, I got to run to a uh, red carpet. BK, thank you for stepping in. Jeff, great conversation. I will be there for the full two hours on Friday. Whether or not I have a computer is a completely different story, though. Hmm. Hey, looking forward to a little extra entertainment, too, just watching people parallel park behind you. I know, right? and and the uh, the uh, n- no no knocking if the van's rocking guy in front of you. No, nobody figured that out either. It's a large space, and everybody was too nervous to parallel park. I don't know if it's because they saw me in the car in front of them and they thought that they might clip me or what. But yeah, people just aren't very good parallel parkers. That's why you guys should appreciate me a little bit more and my Olympic level parallel parking skills. <laughs> it worked. It worked today. Hey, good 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 luck out there. Yeah, have fun. All right. Uh, for the record, I am on the opposite side of the debate that y'all just had. See, this coffee is good. Shop. This is good. We need this, another perspective. That's what coffee shops are for. You're, you're taking you're, a you're Zoom there to call. Get, yeah, you're there to get work done at the coffee shop. If you're not getting work done, get your coffee and get out. But well, how can there, I get work done, BK? How can I get work done if all I hear is this lady getting her work done? Well, prove a point. Hop on your own Zoom call. <laughs> That would have been great to just create a fake Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> just show her how annoying it is. You know? Just, just start yelling. Yeah, see, you know what? I'm I'm in right now. I could be doing this at the coffee shop, but I know that I talk loud as hell and my voice projects and carries. And most people at the coffee shop don't want to hear that. Or if they do, it's because they're listening to Texas Sports Unfiltered in their headphones. Yeah, she at least had headphones, right? Like you couldn't hear both sides. Yeah, th- so that's yes, that's what that's what Trey clarified, and I, I will say, all right, that's yeah. that that knocks her down a little bit. I still think uh, if you're going to be in public like that, at least pretend to be self aware about your volume level. There yeah. was none of that either. It was just talking so loud. Was she? Was there a patio? too like she could have gone maybe outside still part of the coffee shop so she could have cashed in on the free wi-fi but like a little more acceptable to be outside doing something like that i think yes right outside of the gorgeous large windows at uh, lamppost coffee in downtown hutto there are places to sit outside where they put tables out especially this time of year when 
you know, it's spectacular outside like it is tonight. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to defend her, but I'm having a tough time doing so. Like that's it. it so you should not have to do that. Somebody who works at the coffee shop should have gone up and just been like, "Hey, like this is a little distracting for the rest of our customers. Is there is there any way you could take this outside?" Right? Like, yeah, or at like, least, like I said, the la last thing on that is just it's yeah. what what took it over the top is the just volume out like her voice just echoing throughout the entire coffee shop because we went we went there today i drink way too much coffee there spent <laughs> way too much money there but we went today and people were having normal conversations at the coffee shop and like i said when when you came on to trey it's just like background noise you're like oh i just hear people talking it's you know business is getting done but i'm not like oh this person is like doing xyz and like i could i could literally rehash her entire conversation when i walked out i'm like man i hope she gets that client Right. Okay. I know, I know you're married now, but have you ever been on a date to a coffee shop? Yes. Like I, I, I refuse to do that. That seems like a horrible place to go on a date because like you, you can't be loud. Like you just, you have to be, I feel like you have to be talking quietly and there's just, I don't know, there's a certain stigma or a certain way you're supposed to act in a coffee shop that to me is not conducive to a first date or at least an early date. Some people will swear, but I'm sure people who are listening met their significant other and went on a coffee shop or went to a coffee shop for their first date. But to me, that's like, man, I, I don't want to be at a place where I'm supposed to be like professional and kind of quiet. That doesn't sound like a, a fun time at all. Okay. So a hack on that, BK, when you're ready to find the one, you're ready to settle down, huh. you know, maybe 20, 30 years <laughs> with a 20 or 30 year old. Thank you. When, whenever, whenever you're ready to do that, Jasmine and I went on our first date to Cosmic Coffee which is sort of an in-between. Have you been over there? Yes, never been in there, but I know where it is. Yeah, I, I tried to, uh, when she made the comment that there was a strip club on the other side of Congress, I, I definitely pretended to have no idea and never have any knowledge that, that that was there. Even though in my head, I was like, oh yeah, they changed the name and they've got a great happy hour burger. I mean- <laughs> What's a strip club? I don't I even mean, uh, like- I think, they, it's red, they, I think it's Red Rose now. Yeah, that's it's the like one. the sis sister club to to the Yellow Rose, and yeah, I should yeah. probably stop talking. Uh, <laughs> I promise I have not been there since college when they did have a splendid happy hour burger on Fridays. Mm, yeah. But yeah, we I'll say if you can, Austin has quite a few spots like this for anybody out there. That's uh, based on our comments when I'm on with Trey. You know, two married guys with kids. We get a lot of uh, comments from from those people who seem like they're in our boat. But if you're not and you're single. Cosmic or a place like it's great because you can kind of pick the vibe. Like it has the safe coffee shop vibe of outdoors, decent amount of people, but it's not too loud. You can actually hear each other talk. You can get a cup of coffee or you can just get drinks. Like they have a whole menu of mixed drinks, beers on tap. We met on a Sunday at like noon. So I got an Irish coffee because I was yeah. like, I'm going to drink, but I'm going to get a coffee too. So if you're you know, everyone's, everyone's different with that. The only thing I'll say for coffee shops, like a true coffee shop on a first date, what it does is it just verifies like, Hey, while you're in a safe space, you're not a total crazy. And if you were an eight in your pictures, then you, you know, as long as you're at least within a point of that mm. on, on either end, then, okay, we can verify that on both fronts for, for the man and the woman, uh, or, or otherwise, whatever you're in. Yeah. No. Yeah. You can, you can at least verify that in a safe space. And that's an easy, if it's not going well, it's an easy eject at the end of, end of like a cup of coffee or two. That's true. Yeah. You don't feel, I like, mean, you're, you don't feel like you're locked into like, well, we got to have two or three drinks because we're here, you know, and we're at this bar or we're at dinner. That's true. That's a good point, right? Because uh, you're not going to get two or three coffees at a time. You'll get two or three drinks and that adds up time and money but if you're just going on a coffee date it's like you're getting one cup or you're getting one drink and that's kind of the end of it so i don't yeah, know i think i think you're going on that to just simply verify that everything is what you think it is yeah yeah and i'm like i don't know even if i was more of an apps guy i feel like i would still go for the alcoholic beverage over the coffee date but i that's an element that i didn't consider like i'm 95 percent of the first dates that i've gone on are to get drinks yeah. And the oh, only 5% sure. where they're not is like the girl doesn't drink or 
that, that's pretty much it. Like she doesn't drink or she can't drink at the time. So I have to pivot. Like oh, that, that's, it's always where I want to go is to a bar where like the mood is right. And it can, you know, liquid courage is a hell of a, hell of a thing too. Uh, people, people took this out of context when I was single, but I had a strict no dinner on the first date policy. Like we could go somewhere like a cosmic coffee where yeah. food was an option. Yep. But my thought was, I'm not going to get roped into spending over a hundred dollars or close to 200 bucks on dinner and drinks going to some of these places in Austin without even, like I said about the coffee date, verifying that this is what we both think it is. Like yeah. that's important for them too. You know, sending, sending too strong of a message right. early on. Right. That's and coming too in expensive. too expensive. Yeah. And it's too expensive. Right. So if you do that on the first date and it does go well and you get a second date, it's like, well, you can't, you can't go back to something cheap after right. that. You know, you can't set the bar too high. Yeah. 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 Uh, We sound like a couple of gems right now. No, we are. No, we we, we know (laughs) the game. We know people know, you know, the game because you, you won the game, but, uh, you know, I know the game. All right. That's smart. No dinner's too much. Also the weekend is too much. We're giving out free advice to you, uh, single guys out there. Wait, what do you mean? Like people are going on a whole weekend date? No, 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 no. Your first date should not be on a Friday or Saturday Uh, night. Like those nights. Those nights are sacred. Those nights are coveted. And I, I look, people have work. There are obviously exceptions. Th- those might be the only nights where you're free. And if that's the case, that's fine. But if you've got a nine to five, make it a weeknight. You got to you gotta act. Even if you don't have something cool to do on a Friday or a Saturday, you got to act. You got to tell her that you got plans yeah. on the weekend. And you do it Monday to Thursday. And that's, that's how it should start right there. Right. Or if you're going to do it, you got to make yourself – look like you're busy after that. If it's like a first or second date, like a, Hey, I gotta, you know, yeah. Okay. You want to do a Friday or Saturday? All right. We'll do, we'll do a little happy hour. You know, meet you at six, but like the boys and I, boys and I have plans, you know, at nine and Hey, even if the boys and I is, you know, you going home and watching a uh, 30 for 30 again by yourself on a Friday you know, she doesn't need to know that. Sure. Yeah, I got a party to go to. The party could be in your own pants, right? At home, absolutely. Know? But she's gonna be sitting there thinking, like, this, this guy's pretty busy. Like, I might yeah. want to, might want to up my game to weave my way into this schedule. How about a Doctor Ruth segment here on Texas yeah. Sports Unfiltered. You weren't ready for that today. Free advice, though. Yeah, free advice. We're helping you people out right there. Oh man! All right, I uh, heard y'all talking about a lot Texas basketball. Y'all get into baseball at all? Not really, no. Any uh look a nice weekend for Texas to get back on track. I mean, 22 runs on Friday was great. It would have almost felt for not if they couldn't find that comeback win yesterday. Feel a little bit better about uh the state of the program with what you saw in Lubbock? Yeah, definitely. I mean, going out and winning a series on the road, regardless in the Big 12, regardless of what happened the previous week or the previous four games, but given the four game losing skid, the way they lost some of those games in Houston, who they lost to on Tuesday at home. Yeah. I thought it was about as good of a bounce back as you could possibly expect from, from David Pierce's crew. And, you know, even, even big picture, we've talked about it over the last week or so, but David Pierce, whatever you think of him in my mind, he's earned the right to get this back on track. Like if you're a fan, he's the way that they've had some slow starts, but they've found a way to peak at the right time more often than not. I think he deserves the benefit of the doubt. He deserves your trust that, Hey, he's going to find a way to make this work. And while the pitching is extremely concerning right now, it's not to say that teams can't get better and teams can't evolve. Now, obviously this is college. So as much as the transfer portal is free agency, there's no mid season trade deadline. You know, you're not, you're not calling up somebody that's, that's out of, the NCAA tournament picture and saying, Hey, can, can we have your ACE for whatever? Hmm. Of course you can't do that, but these players can evolve, can get better over time, especially with how low the bar is right now. So if you're able to find ways to win with your offense and then the occasional good pitching performance, then that, that would give you hopefully more time, buy you some more time and and even give you more confidence later on down the line when the pitching does get hot, hopefully, and maybe the bats get cold, then, Hey, we we've gone through adversity and we've found different ways to win. And baseball is a sport, even similar to basketball, but much more than basketball. 
it's a sport where you're going to go through ups and downs. It's a long season, a marathon of a season. So to start two and one in big 12 play, you put what happened in the preseason behind you, obviously to an extent from our, from our standpoint, it's going to be something we draw back on to judge this team or judge their progress. But really now moving forward, you're two and one in league play. You went on the road and you played a good team that hates you. And you went out and, you know, did what you need to do. You won the series. Yeah. And now you're coming back to the dish for, for quite a bit of time. So hopefully this is where they can truly get back on track right now. Agreed. Yeah. 10 game homestand starting tomorrow night against the incarnate word. And you've got some easier opponents coming to town as well. So you dip out of conference play this weekend with Washington coming in and you've got Baylor in town next weekend. And these are some games that Texas should be able to win and, uh, they should be able to figure some things out, and hopefully the pitching can come along. I mean, if they can just get a few reliable bullpen arms, and maybe they found them in Lubbock, right? Like Ace Whitehead on Friday out of the bullpen. Texas only needed to use two pitchers in that game on Friday. And I was worried, you know, even when Texas put up like seven runs in the fourth and five in the fifth, I'm like, this might not be over with our bullpen and that ballpark. Like Tech could maybe get back into this thing, but thankfully Ace Whitehead was able to go, what, four and a third or four and two thirds and stop the bleeding. He gave up three runs. It wasn't perfect, but uh, that was obviously all that Texas needed. So maybe he can be one of those guys. And then Gage Bohm yesterday, you know, giving up just one run and four innings in relief to allow the Texas offense to come back the way that it did. I mean, Texas was down 3 nothing, then 5-2, then 6-3. Uh, they could have been dead in the water if they couldn't get a pitcher to come in there and stop the bleeding. So, yeah, I mean, if you're expecting this bullpen to be top to bottom, great. You know, you rarely see that in college anyways, but Texas just doesn't have the personnel to come close to that this year. But, man, if they could find just two or three guys out of the pen, that's like, man, if we need to get some outs, we need to win this game, this is the guy or these are the guys that we can turn to, then I think that's going to change everybody's kind of overall perception of this this squad this year. And I think they have the bats and personalities and leadership to go along with it in the lineup to be able to accept that challenge any given year that may come up this year, it's, Hey, we need to accept the challenge as the guys in the lineup to like play our absolute best to really accept that and run with it and say, Hey, let's put up as many possible runs as we can. And I know that that sounds stupid because it's like, obviously that's what, if you're part of the lineup, that's what you're trying to do all the time. Uh But look, this is a program that's hung their hat for basically their entire existence on pitching and defense. And that might not be the case this year. This it might be a case where, The pitching figures it out later in the season and the bats have to carry the load right now. But you have leaders like even a young guy like Jared Thomas, still a young player. But man, I love that dude's mindset. I love his approach at the plate. The little bit we've gotten to talk to him seems like an an awesome leader. I mean, just willingness to play any position Uh, before the preseason. You know, somebody asked him a, a silly question about about something in like the Yeti yard. And I don't even know what the question was, but his answer stuck with me. He was like, um, something like, yeah, I'm going to go like make, make a catch and save a home run from fo- going into the Yeti yard. And then I'm going to like sprint back to the dugout and I'm going to go get a hit. Like he just, I know that was a terrible way I explained that was like, no, context. <laughs> but if I had the question, it would make more sense. And all of us were just like, damn, like, okay, let's go. And a sophomore to be saying that in front of the cameras, in front of the media. Uh, I mean, that's a guy that clearly is producing and he's, he's a leader too. Uh, and then yeah. dude like Peyton Powell becoming a leader. Porter Brown's getting hot. You know, I think he's got like five home runs in his last six games. So that's awesome to see after a bit of a slow start for him. Max Ballou, another guy who I, oh. I love his approach, his makeup. Um, so I think this team is filled with the right type of guys in the lineup and the leadership there to to really carry this team if, if that's what needs to happen. And to reiterate what I said earlier when we first hopped on in the beginning of the three o'clock hour, like just just accept if you're a Texas fan. It might drive you crazy at times, but try not to let it drive you too crazy. Just accept there might be a lot of 13 to 11 wins or nine. You know, I know they won uh, what nine to seven. I think the other day. I think Sunday. Yeah. But maybe they've been nine to seven loss in there occasionally, or seven to two. You know, where the bats just didn't have it on Saturday. Like just accept yeah. that, that that might happen, and there might be some games that aren't that aren't exactly the you know, epitome of this Texas baseball program over the course of its history where it's, you know, like small ball pitching and defense, kind of the stuff that that Augie and those teams hung their hat on. Shout out to Bob Ballou, his kid, 
just named uh, Big 12 Player of the Week. Last oh, yeah, week. there you go. That came down within the last couple of hours. Yeah, Max Ballou was uh, incredible out there in Lubbock for those three games and was huge yesterday in that comeback for Texas. But, yeah, look, yeah, you said it perfectly a couple of minutes ago. David Pierce has earned the right to turn this thing around. And they were 5-7 and seven last year, and they were some bad lights away from making it to Omaha. They were 7-5 and five in 2021 and did make it to Omaha and had a great year. So they've had some sluggish starts, but more often than not, under David Pierce, they have uh, – been able to turn some things around. And I'll tell you what, if I was a left or center fielder out at the dish, I would, I mean, after every game, after every win, I would have a student toss me a beer and I would chug the beer before running back into the dugout. Like I'd probably do that every inning, but I don't think that would go over too well with the coach. But like after a win, someone's throwing me a beer. If I'm a junior or a senior, of course, and I'm of age, someone's throwing me a beer. Hey, drinking. if you want to, if you want to take a little shot, if you want to do that move and then take a little shot at that too, you could like run up to the guys out there and like show ID. Yeah. Show ID real quick and then have them toss it over. And then like, <laughs> That's a great idea. Yeah. Just make sure the camera sees it like on LA Chen. Like here it is. We're good. And then boom, someone toss you a beer. And then maybe afterwards you go out to left field and have a shot of fireball out there to, uh, to celebrate. That's good. Yeah. David, David Pierce joked the other day, uh, or it was a couple weeks ago and, you know, first couple of weeks, everybody was asking a bunch about the Yeti yard and yeah. cool, cool addition, really cool addition. Also <clears throat> really cool. When the first couple of weeks you got guys on your team hitting home runs into there or even past it. Uh, but he was, he was asked about it and he was like, I got plenty of disguises, you know, like maybe, uh, you know, I get, maybe I'll get tossed clearly joking. You know, as I told, uh, the great SID Kevin, Kevin Rodriguez over there, I was like, K Rod, everyone knows he's joking. Like Pierce has gotten tossed, but everyone knows Pierce is not going to get tossed to go have a beer in the Yeti yard. <laughs> oh, he did the Bobby Valentine bit where he puts I all know, the mustache and the fake glasses. Yeah, we need that. That's what I did on the on the show that night on the on the broadcast. We have these monitors that we can use. And in, in the left one, I had Bobby V doing his uh, 1999 bit where he got tossed and then and then uh, you know put the stash on and was hanging out in the kind of the tunnel of the dugout right there. And then I had just like you know, the Yeti yard file over there. I was basically just like, if you know, if David Pierce gets tossed and you think you see him in left field or you think you see him in the Yeti yard, you know, try to pull the fake stash off him. I got to uh, do a little screen find share it. here. Yeah. I got to do the a Photoshop with David Pierce's face over Bobby <laughs> V here. So Talking good. what an NYPD Mets shirt, the stash, the sunglasses. I mean, that is, that is perfect right there. And just, it's, you know, let's just blue collar Bobby right there. God, there was somebody. Where did I see this? It was in some sport where some manager or coach got ejected and they tried to watch the game in the stand somewhere. I don't remember where this was, and this is not turning into a good story. So I'm sorry. Maybe somebody else <laughs> witnessed this too. But yeah, they they tried to. Maybe they tried to go to the bullpen and watch. I can't remember what sport or where it was, but it wasn't like full mustache. They just tried to go to a place to where they thought they wouldn't get noticed, and they got recognized pretty quickly, and they were they were asked to leave a second time. So it's a good bit. You try. Oh, I'm trying to find it right now. It looks like uh, Steven Strasburg three years ago. Steven, the headline says Steven Strasburg ejected. Gets ejected. Oh no, he was ejected while sitting in the stands. So that's different. Okay. But I guess he was yeah. sitting in the stands for. Yeah. In 2023, yeah, minor league baseball manager exits game through the stands after ejection. <laughs> Bray yeah, that was it. It. Brian. Brian. I don't know. Maybe it could have been something that was old and I just saw it a couple of days ago for the first time, but it was, it was, oh, here we go. Rob. Flyers coach refused to leave when tossed out against the lightning over the weekend. Maybe it was that. Well, hockey Love that action. because that's definitely crossed my mind a few times. Like, what if a coach just goes, "Yeah, great, you can throw me out, but I'm not leaving." Yeah, what do they? What do they get security at that point? Like, you double toss them. I mean, I'm sure there's nothing they can really do. You're just going to end up getting severely fined by your by your league yeah, at the end of the then day. Then you don't just miss one game; you end up uh, missing a few games. That's you know the ejection though. That's paid leave right there. Like if you're suspended, it's usually without pay. But if you're just ejected in the middle of the game, I see why Bobby Cox did that so often for the Braves back in the day. Like that's that's pure genius right there. Could you imagine like if you could just say something to your boss at like one o'clock every day, 
to piss them off to the point where they're like, you need to go home, but not piss them off to the point where they're like, you're fired. Like, it's just like, <laughs> oh, come back tomorrow. And it's all I'll actually pay you for the rest of the day. You can come back tomorrow. We'll act like it never happened. Your coworkers are still going to like you and it's all going to be good. You just keep producing for us and we'll move on. Like, could you imagine if we had something like that in the real world? That was genius by Bobby Cox to keep doing that. And God, that'd be the greatest thing ever if we had that in corporate America. Yeah, I was like, that takes a special person and a special situation to be able to get away with that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Bobby Cox, a World Series manager, one of the winningest managers in baseball history. So he, uh, it, you can't do that shit if you're not winning a lot. If you're the guy who gets ejected 20 times a year and your team's losing 100 games, then you're not long for the job. But if you're going to win it's like 14 straight division titles like he did with the Braves, then, uh, yeah, if you want uh, some half days, you want that paid leave, Every once in a while, you can make it happen for you. Have you ever been ejected from a sporting event in your life, BK? Oh, as a fan? No, no, like when you played. Like oh, right not more likely as a fan. Um, never ejected. No? No, you? No, but I had a buddy. Uh, actually, one of my one of my best friends was a groomsman at my wedding a couple months ago. He was ejected from the seventh grade Babe Ruth League championship game for arguing with the umpire at shortstop about i think if i remember correctly it was like a bang bang call where he like fielded a ground ball and tried to step on second to get the runner out yeah and he ended up like arguing with him and he's kind of a hothead anyway but i remember him getting tossed and his parents sitting in the stands like what the hell is going on like what am i supposed to do just like grab my seventh grade kid and like walk him out it's just like something that you would never think would happen like you see parents like pop off in the stands all the time and that goes viral or even a coach like maybe too much and, and get ejected but like a player in seventh grade getting ejected we still give him a ton of shit for that that's amazing i mean as you should but also he's a legend for doing that yeah i mean we're still talking about it <laughs> like how old was, the, how was the ump like a high schooler ejected i know that kid? That's what we kind of said in hindsight. We were like, he he won't even tell us like what he said to the guy. Like he's like, I don't even remember. Like I was just so hot in the moment. Like he yeah. probably just like he's like, I probably just said he was an idiot or something. And I'm like, okay, even if you called him an idiot, like if you do it once, like that's that's not great, right? You know? It had to be an f bomb in there, right? I know it's seventh grade, but like we knew the f word in yeah. seventh grade, so there had to be. Some sort of language in there that's like, okay, this kid should, this kid should not be using this to me. I'm making like 15 bucks an hour to be an ump here, like not nearly enough, and I can't be mf to my face in a seventh grade <laughs> baseball game. Like By this a guy, twelve year old. <laughs> yeah, this guy just has to leave. But I don't know what you do. Like, what, the parents have to drive the kid home. Like, parents don't give a shit. They they care about their kid. They yeah. don't like the, the oh, we care about the team. No, you care about your kid, and your kid's on the team, so transitive property you're going to care about the team but if the, your kid's not playing you're not staying right you know you got to drive his ass home like what's yeah, he supposed he just, to do just go sit in the stands after that right like i don't know if he's allowed to because he can still chirp the ump from up there yeah you just you drive home you got to act like uh we really want to be here but we have to teach our kid a lesson like he's got to learn from this and really in the back of your mind you're like oh thank god i thought i had like a whole tournament he just got ejected during the <laughs> first game this is the greatest day of my life like that's, oh, I, guess, I guess you leave. I guess you have to. Dude, our guy, I got tossed from a 10th grade basketball game for flipping the bird at the crowd. Oh, good, uh, good buddy of mine in intramurals at UT. He's now a stand up comedian. I'll give him a free plug. Danny Goodwin is his name. Big Longhorn fan. Good local stand up guy here. And uh, he's also a good person, too. There's a shitty joke about being a stand up guy. That's, that's why I'm not in that line of work. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And, in, in, uh, at UT intramurals, this guy was one of the least athletic people I've ever seen. He was, he would just come to our games. He like coached and we'd put him in games. Like if we were blowing the other team out or if we were getting blown out and somehow, some way he got an open look at a three, he took it, he hit it and he blew a kiss and gave the Tom Herman double bird <laughs> to the other team and got tossed. He was in the game for less than 10 seconds. And you can got, be tossed from an IM game. Dude, I, I was a I am ref. I ejected a couple of people. <laughs> Oh yeah. How out of line do you have to be? I mean, it's, it, I, I tried to treat it the way, which yikes, I'm not going to gain any support for this take. I, I, I tried to have the fuse, like a, a very long fuse. I, I was not going to be like Joey Crawford level, like 
Right, especially an in inner mural. Like right. we're, we're I mean, beyond the point know, of. I don't want you to know who I am, but I'm like, all right, it, it'll get to a point where if you're chirping me on every single possession, and I would do it based on like the call. Like there were okay. times I knew I got calls wrong. Of course, like I knew I got calls wrong, uh, and that gave me a whole new appreciation for officials. By the way, because like IMs at UT are like one one hundredth the speed of NBA basketball, and I would <laughs> miss calls. So I get how the NBA refs miss calls, but. If I knew I got the call right and the the frat boy like just wouldn't stop talking and he just kept getting after me and every call that was on his team, he would compl- – it's like, dude, that'd be the first tee. And if that didn't stop him, it's like, I'm sorry. Like, I got the call. There were t- I wasn't supposed to do it. There were times I'm like, I missed that one. My bad. They, t- they told me not to do that. I'm like, I'm going to be real with these kids. I play I am basketball. Like, I, the refs suck. We miss shit. I'll admit that I miss calls. But if it was one that, like, no, it was clearly a foul, everybody except that person knew it was a foul, and they just kept, like, dropping F-bombs on me. Oh, yeah. Now, I, I probably ejected three or four kids during my uh, three years as an IM ref in college. What was your – I know we got to go in a second, but what was your tee-up motion? Like, like were you, a, were you like, a subtle, like, like, in your head, like, yeah, that's right, MF, like, boom, and then, like, point to it real quick, or, like, boom, two? Or were you, like, a, like a kind of, like – Go up to him and then, bah, like hit him with it. Yeah, right in the face. Bang, right in the face. <laughs> yeah, I don't. You're gonna I, like I never, break your own finger. I don't think I ever gave the like quick double T. Right, it was it was one at a time. Obviously, you get two over the course of the game that gets you ejected. But uh, I like the tiny little. <laughs> I go up to him real slow. Just petty back. Just like a little little tap too. Yeah, it's, so, I I love the guys that just blow the whistle real quick, like. Like tweet, blow it, and there's like, yeah, like they yeah, don't even yeah. move. Like, like I think the the ref at Baylor did that to Desue the other night when he thought he was chirping at at Jacoby Walter. Oh. But he was, well, Desue joked later. He was like, he thought I was like chirping at at Walter, or like getting in his face. He was like, I was actually like chirping at the ref. <laughs> oh, really? I, I, yeah, that's like Desue admitted that the other day. We were all like joking. He was joking around about it. He's like, so I guess I did kind of deserve it. But, or, <laughs> or I think he said like. I still don't think I deserved it. And then we were all kind of like, oh, like <laughs> maybe more now, but still, no, you can't, you can't be that short fused. Like the first time yeah. you I mean, imagine how different basketball would be. Like, I, I think when I watch these coaches just berate these refs for 40 minutes in college or 48 in the NBA, it's like, what if they just like the first time you cussed at a ref, it's a tech. <laughs> like, well, you probably I wouldn't have, do it again. Cause you don't want to leave the game. I mean, not like that goes to the Bobby Cox thing. You get that paid leave though. Yep. But still, I like how different the refs have just let this this culture just manifest into what it is today. And like nobody wants the ref to tee people up. You don't go to the games to watch the ref. But if refs like 20 years ago or like if anybody talks back, we're teeing them up. Do you imagine how different basketball would be nowadays? Probably for the better, mind you. Yeah, we've all just let it be part of the game. Yeah. Cats out of the bag. All right. That's going to do it for today. Jeff, appreciate your uh, flexibility working with both of us today. Yes, sir, my man. I hope, hopefully Trey's getting some good stuff. South by Southwest King. The King of South by. We'll be back tomorrow, Jeff. I think we'll be co-hosting with Zay on mm-hmm. Wednesday, which will be fun from 1 to 3. And then, of course, Jeff with Trey on Friday afternoon from 3 to 5. Like always, that's going to do it for today's programming on Texas Sports Unfiltered. We'll be back tomorrow, starting with Bucky and BK at 8 o'clock. Y'all make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet and download the free TSU app. For Jeff Barker of CBS Austin, I'm BK Brad Kellner. And for everybody at Texas Sports Unfiltered, y'all have a great night. Thanks for watching and hook them.